The green-eyed boy was destined to become the hero of his own novel and save the world he created. Now he plays the role of the villain, who grieves that he has lost his banana for dishonoring the protagonist's girlfriend and has less than six months to live. Society turned away from him, believing that he was living off his wife. He is despised by his beautiful wife, and he has never been so close to girls before. She threatens to cut off all his fingers if he tries to touch her. Every day they try to beat him up and make Nalanman disappointed in him. But his advantage is that he knows the plot. He knows like the back of his hand where the treasures are, where the adventures are. This will help him survive. In just one evening, he has reached the maximum level of combat skill and considers himself a genius. His power has grown again. Can he change history and defeat the main character? Will he succeed in preventing the end of the world and thereby exalt himself? The guy on his knees with his hands tied behind his back is Liu Man, a writer. He died and stands in the court of the dead before a strange man on a throne. This is Lord Yan Wang. He is furious and accuses the writer of a terrible sin. The guy justifies himself by saying that he was working on a novel. He was distracted for just a minute to buy ground pepper on the internet. He didn't rob or kill anyone. So what could be the sin? Yan Wang shouts that the writer has forced readers to eat glass. Liu Man doesn't understand what a terrible sin has to do with it. He recently completed a visual novel in which the main character, Ye Chiang, awakened the power of his family and rushed forward destroying everything in his path. However, the main character's line proved to be difficult for readers, and the author received a lot of negative feedback and even threats. The hero was unsurpassed, defeating villains, having fun with a girl. This angered the author and he destroyed the entire world in the novel. Lord Yan Wang is furious that Liu Man does not understand what his sin is. He waited a whole year for the main characters to be together in the end, but the destruction of the world broke his heart. The writer is surprised that the owner has also read his novel. Yan Wang's rage knows no bounds. He silences the writer and says that he would understand if the novel was taking too long to write or if it remained unfinished. The writer was supposed to live 90 years, but he offended the Lord, and he takes away two-thirds of his life. Luman doesn't want to die in his prime. He didn't even have time to get married. The Lord has had mercy and is ready to let the writer go, give him a wife, and return him to the novel to save the world. If he fails to prevent a bad ending, he will be doomed to loneliness. In addition, it is forbidden to even hold a girl's hand. Two guards dragged the writer away from the throne, and he shouted that he had never met such a vile and hypocritical creature before. The guards, a bull and a horse, lead Lu Man to the river of the dead, and he asks to be released because his best years are still ahead of him. He is thrown off a cliff and flies headlong into the icy water. The guards forgot to erase his memories of his past life. In a crowded square in Nalan, a man lies face down in a puddle. The man slowly opens his eyes and returns to consciousness. He gets down on his knees, holds the back of his head, and obviously has a headache. In the reflection in the puddle, he sees an unfamiliar young biofacial handsome man. He is the same dependent from Li Yuguo's family. And if his wife had not been running the city, he would have been gone long ago. The guy is very surprised at where he is and how he got here. Holding a strange gold bar in his hands, he realizes that he has entered the world of his novel. He became a handsome poser. A vile dependent, guilty of all crimes, deceiving men and seizing women by force, and lost his banana for dishonoring the protagonist's girlfriend. Luman checks to see if his body is okay, looks into his pants, everything is in place. The guy falls to his knees and starts banging his head against the column, wondering why he became a villain, and passers-by think he is sick. Luman concludes that whether he is the protagonist or the villain, this world is doomed to destruction. Suddenly, he comes up with the brilliant idea that he created this world and therefore knows like the back of his hand where the treasures and adventures are. He becomes convinced that he is the god of this world. Suddenly he felt a heavy blow to his head from behind. He sits down on the ground scratching his head wondering who threw the box at him. The box says Lumen is the recipient, it's a delivery. In the middle of the parcel is a ground pepper and a leaf. The letter says that the Lord has shown mercy and grants Lumen his order from Alimam, because he, unlike Lumen, is not cruel. Lumen launches the Amimama store. He can choose any product and it will be delivered. A brilliant idea comes to Lumen's mind. He can change the parameters of the game here. The protagonist of the book used the Alibaba system, 
which provided him with rapid growth due to his winnings, and the Alimama system allows you to buy anything. The world will be destroyed in ten years, and it is not easy to change the ending of the book, but Lumen is confident that with the help of Alima and its wisdom, he will cope with this task. Yan Wang was so greedy that he left the guy penniless. Suddenly I heard the distinct tramp of hooves on the road. Lumen squirmed because he hadn't expected this. He felt a chill run down his back, and a girl rider appeared behind him. It was Landman, the wife of the book's protagonist, who was looking for her husband so that he wouldn't run away. Landman Lumen was speechless from the beauty of it. The girl hit him with a whip and ordered him to get on his horse and ride home. Lumen tells his wife that he didn't even think about it. The townspeople sympathize with him because his wife almost beat him to death in the past. Landman is the ninth daughter of a great ruler and commander. At the age of 19, she has destroyed many enemies. She combines beauty and danger. Her husband, Li Yugu, is known as the Abstemious Prince. Lumen's nose caught a pleasant scent, as if from a rose or osmanthus flower. Suddenly he realized that it was the smell of his wife's body. Never before had a guy been so close to a girl. His hand touched her waist. Landman threatened to cut off all his fingers if he tried to touch her again. A young couple arrives at the palace of Nolan, dismounting from their horse and walking along the square. The couple enters the temple of their ancestors, and Lumen looks around in surprise. The townspeople sympathize with him because they see that he has been caught and will probably be beaten again. In the temple, in front of the tombs of their ancestors, the couple kneels down. Lumen feels strange in this position. He has a feeling that he is constantly on his knees. In his prayer, Landman asks for forgiveness from her husband's parents for not being respectful to them and therefore cannot manage Lumen. The boy sees the ritual plaque of his parents in front of him. Li Yugu's father was a god of war and had the nickname Devil General. Together with Na Lanman's father, they were called Two Heroes of Hoyation. Because of this, Li Yugu was married to Na Lanman. Li Yugu is so weak and helpless that his wife won't let him sleep in the same room, so he flirts with other girls and is often punished for it. Six months later, the main character will attack the city of Nalan, and Landman will fight bravely, but the city will fall. It is only when Li Yugu holds the body of his beloved in his arms that he realizes everything, but it is too late. Lumen is thinking about starting to develop Nalan today with the help of the Alimama system, which can make a big difference. You should try to pay with local currency in this system. Landman asks her husband where he ran off to, whether he was courting other women or maybe gambling. Lumen tells his wife that the city can still be saved. Landman is very surprised and does not understand what Lumen is talking about. Holding up his index finger, Lumen asks his wife to give him a couple hundred liang. Landman does not trust her husband's words and is very surprised. She asks if he needs money to play again. Lumen explains that he needs the money to provide a better life for the people of Nalanya. Landman notices that the man's gaze has changed. Perhaps he has straightened up. But Lumen doesn't need to be exposed. As soon as Landman finds out that he has inhabited her husband's body, she will immediately destroy him. Lumen says he has seen people dying of hunger in the southern part of the city, and he does not want the city to become a city of the dead. Landman is disappointed because she thought he had changed, but he only cares about his feelings. She throws him a bag of money. Landman says that he can only give a maximum of 50 liang, because due to the drought, all the money goes to help the victims. And 50 liang is enough because we just need to check whether he can pay with money at Alimama. The princess's friends express fears that her husband will spend all the money again. However, the princess is sure that this will not happen this time because now he is not like any other. Lumen enters the shopping district of Nalan. He will finally be able to test Alimama. He launches a store, deposits 50 locks, which become immediately available to him. He is happy to be able to use local money. Suddenly, Lumen feels a stare in his back. From behind, he is embraced by strong male arms. He turns around with lightning speed and asks the man if it was a robbery or a rape. He sees a trader in front of him who explains that he just smelled black pepper and decided to check if it was true. Lumen is happy because the man is really interested in pepper. He says that he is really trading in very valuable goods. A trader sniffs at the smell of black pepper, squinting his eyes. He asks if Lumen will sell him peppers for 50 liang. Noticing the guy's hesitation, decides that the amount is not enough for such a product, and offers to increase the amount to 100, 150, 200 liang. Luman agrees to sell the peppers for 200 lin and hands them over to the buyer. The trader asks where he got the pepper, 
but Lumen does not reveal his secret, because otherwise he will not have anything to earn his bread. The men get to know each other. The trader's name is Shidakin, and he offers Lumen to sell all his goods to him, to which he replies that he has to test his new friend for honesty. A trader invites a boy to go with him. And once again the smell of pepper drives Shidachin to ecstasy. The vendor brings Lumen to his stall and offers him something to choose as a gift. The guy is interested in the old bottle and is curious about its contents. The bottle contains the seeds of an unknown plant, and Lumen can take them and give them to his wife. The prince thanks the merchant, says goodbye, and leaves, while Shidachin reminds him of his promise of cooperation. Lumen joins his thumb and forefinger in agreement. He comes back again and launches Alamam looking for a new product, namely a moonflower. This flower will help to concentrate spiritual power and improve combat skills. Suddenly, Lumen's gaze focuses on something interesting. He sees that the villain Li Yugu's strength is 2%. The protagonist Ye Chiang's strength is 98%. When the villain's strength drops to zero, Judgment Day will come faster. This makes Lumen think about the common scale of strength of the villain and the protagonist. His thoughts are interrupted by the shouts of bidding. He hears that a sword is being sold. The seller says that the sword is razor sharp and asks for 80 liang for it. The traders lower the price, arguing that the sword cannot cost more than 8 liang and offer to buy it for 10 liang. The seller stands his ground. If his family hadn't gotten sick, he wouldn't be selling this sword, and eventually refuses to bargain and sell the sword at all. The traders start threatening the seller, shunning him and trying to take his sword away. A loud cry is heard demanding an end to the abuse. Among the crowd, Lumen appears, whom everyone recognizes as the dependent prince, and asks why the family heirloom is being sold. The merchants let the sword seller go because Yugu stood up for him. The prince chases the merchants away. Addressing the boy, he tells him to keep the relic and throws him a bag of money. The seller instinctively grabbed the money, and the bandage on his right eye did not hinder him. Luman offers the boy to take this hundred liang just in case. The faces of the perpetrators were distorted with rage and hatred. One of them elbowed the boy in the side, hurting him. The owner of the relic knelt down in front of Luman and said that he, Guan Yun Fan, would never forget this and would serve the prince until the end of his days. One of the merchants sarcastically remarked that the guy might be cheating Yuluo, and was told that if it would help to understand it for a hundred liang, it would be worth it, and shouted at the traders why they were still here when he had ordered them to leave. They walked away, but behind their backs they continued to discuss how much the prince allowed himself. The moon was illuminating the boat with Guan Yun Fan, a noble thief nicknamed the King of Thieves. The prince and Guan Yun Fan begged. According to the book, the King of Thieves was supposed to be saved by Ye Chiang, and they would become loyal friends. It is strange that Lumen met him first. Lumen was pleased with himself. He earned a hundred liang and met the King of Thieves. He could return to the palace. As he approached the palace, the prince shouted loudly that he had already returned. In the yard, dressed in a beautiful seductive dress that emphasized the beauty of her legs, Lanman was practicing. Looking at her husband, she asked if he had spent all the money. Luman, putting his hand in his inside pocket, said no. Taking out a bag of coins, he told his wife that he was returning a hundred liang, with interest. Lanman asks how he managed to earn so much in a day. This is not all of Luman's earnings. He hid fifty liang. A man's voice says that Lanman has obviously cheated in the game. The voice will belong to the main character, Li Yutan, who witnessed the conversation between the couple. Li Yutang is Li Yugu's foster brother who is secretly in love with Lanman. Cold-blooded and cruel, he is involved in the death of Na Lanman. Lanman does not believe that Yugu could really win the money. Lumen says that he only knows how to lose in gambling, and that he really earned the money and it can be verified. Li Yutang decides that it is not a problem to ask and check. Lanman will not check the true origin of the money earned. This time, she decided to believe him. She takes her fifty liang, returns the rest to her husband, and goes to rest. Lanman is pleased with himself and takes the rest in coins. This made Li Yutang very angry. He is determined to force Lanman to make a move on Yugu and conquer it. Meanwhile, night has fallen, and the events take us to the bedroom of the palace. Despite the fact that Lanman and Yugu have been married for many years, they still sleep separately. Li Yugu brazenly climbs into bed with Lanman every night, then kicks her and walks away. That night he wonders if he should do it since she won't let him anyway. So he decides to go straight to bed in the living room, which causes great surprise to his wife. 
Is she too strict with him that he went to sleep alone? In the living room, Lumen decides to look for the treasure rather than compromise himself in front of Lanman. Li Yugu's father, the god of war, had records of a rare martial skill called Divine Yang Wisdom, and he was able to use Yang energy during battle. Given Lumen's novel, these records must be somewhere in this room. His gaze stops on a painting hanging on the wall. Perhaps this is what he is looking for. Lumen found what he was looking for, a book of Divine Yang Wisdom. Martial skills and weapons are divided into five levels. Divine Wisdom belongs to the level of Jijen. This type of skill is the most valuable in Nalan. Lumen threw a seed of a moonflower into the flower garden, which blooms only under the moonlight. The flower bloomed in a moment. It is able to choose strength and is therefore very useful for training. Lumen decides to start training immediately. The flower has absorbed the power and now passes it onto Lumen. The full moon breaks through the clouds and illuminates the night sky. Contemplating this beauty, Landman thinks that she is really too strict with her husband. She feels guilty to the master for this. The next day, Lumen feels that in one night's training he has reached the level of Wu Shi. There is a certain period between levels. Is he a real talent? That there is something wrong with his body, the Yang force gives too much male power. Lumen does not want Landman to see him in this state. Landman believes she caught her husband committing adultery. Lumen tries to explain his tan, but his wife walks away. The man is crying because he realizes how much he has disgraced himself. Lundman thinks Chorvik is a pervert, but it's better than he would go after other women. A man thinks about how to change his wife's attitude towards him and decides that his primary task is to make money. Only if he has the money will he be able to change Nalan's fate. As the moonflower has already faded, Lumen goes in search of the traitor. Moving through the shopping area, the hero is surprised and alarmed by the silence around him. The silence is broken by the stomp of strong hooves. Instantly, he is surrounded by robbers, who inform him that he has been ordered. Lumen asks how much they were paid and offers to give them twice as much. The robbers say that the loser that he is, he won't be able to give them any more money. Lumen decides to show his strength to the attackers. He focuses entirely on the attackers, striking them. Everything happens so fast that it is impossible to track its movements and evade them. One of the attackers flies above the buildings. The rest are confused and do not know what to do next. They are surprised by the prince's level of martial arts, Wushu. Lumen is grateful to the divine wisdom of Yang for his entire battle. He calls the attackers over and wants them to tell him who their client is, and then he will let them go. The robbers cannot believe that they can be defeated by a person at the level of Wu Shi. They are not afraid of the prince. He has a whole army against him. It is pointless to continue the battle. We need a different tactic. Guan Yunfan suddenly appears, shouting that no one has the right to attack his benefactor. The king of robbers instantly changes the battle's hit points, and the attackers split into different directions. Presenting a sword to the neck of one of the soldiers, Guan Yunfan asks who sent them. The attacker confesses that Li Yutan is the customer of the assassination attempt. Lumen is very surprised and refuses to believe it. The robber repented and said that they were giving him half of the loot, that he was covering for them, and that last night he came to them with this request to destroy Yugu. The head flies off the attacker's shoulders so that he cannot report everything to Li Yutang, because Guan Yunfan always completes what he starts. Having no direct evidence against Li Yutang, his friends cannot destroy him because it would dishonor the prince's name. They decide that they need to make money and make Nalan a prosperous city, but Li Yutang will try to organize a rebellion. Guan Yunfan kneels down, ready to sacrifice himself for the sake of Nalan's future. Luman asks his friend to stand up and gives him his hand. The King of Thieves is endowed with the power of Wu Ling, which is equal to the best warriors of Ye Chong, so the power scale should also increase. Amimama indicates that the villain's power has increased to 3%. Lumen explores new features and capabilities and understands why everything the protagonist touches is improving. He wants to become a harem hero like Ye Chiang. Lumen invites Guan Yunfang Bazaar to make money. The midday sun is shining brightly, and despite this, the Nalan market is quite crowded. Trader Shidachin is happy that he has once again received many valuable goods. Lumen brought sugar, salt, and many other spices that he had ordered for Alimam. Hearing about the salt, the trader turns pale and demands to take it away immediately because it is contraband. Lumen recalls that salt was difficult to obtain in those days, so its sale by private individuals was prohibited. He thanks Shidakin for the warning, but the man in black has already overheard the conversation. Selling contraband salt can cost a prince a lot of money. Lumen has four boxes of alcohol that he wants to sell. 
The vendor asks if the alcohol is in folded bottles. Luman realizes his mistake. There was almost no glass in that era, and he brought so much at once. Shidakin begs me to sell him all these bottles. He picks up a calculator to figure out how much he can pay for alcohol. The calculations are not easy. He is ready to pay 80,000 liang. Luman cannot believe that this is happening in reality. The guy had never seen so much money in his life. The merchant gives him 100,000 liang for all the goods. Luman picks up the bracelet and asks if it is really a bracelet of space. Shidachin replies that this is the cheapest model. There are some that can accommodate a whole huge house. This is a very successful example of a life force source. Ordinary people cannot make such things. Luman thinks that the protagonist Ye Chiang also has a bracelet. And he also wants to buy this ritual thing for himself. The merchant showed Luman where the carriage was parked, heading for the capital. There you can buy ritual goods and werewolf slaves. They eat a lot, but the rich like to buy them as servants and to satisfy their lust. Maybe Luman will want to buy a werewolf fox for re-education. Luman described the horrific slave trade in his novel. But in ancient times, it was like that everywhere the slave trade flourished. The Zhou Trading House belongs to the protagonist Ye Chiang. Luman needs to see if there are any products worthy of his attention. Shida Chen shows that Yun Fanyu is here, while Yu Guo chooses something for himself. A guy walks through the rows of a trading house between the cages with slaves. He did not expect to see this with his own eyes. Finally, he meets a man who can tell him about the product. This is Zhou Lioba, the owner of the Zhou Trading House, and you have to be careful with him. Luman saw a girl in one of the cages who was barely breathing, and they wanted to sell her cheaply, but no one would buy her. The guy wonders if the fact that slaves are sold in an unmarried state will affect his business, but the slave trader sees no other way out. Luman needs a live target for training and decides to buy a girl. The vendor thanks the boy and asks him not to disclose the details of the purchase. The slave is lying on the floor, her clothes torn, her hands chained. Luman hands him a green pill and asks him to eat it. The girl decides that she will be tested for a drug. He obediently takes the pill and closes his eyes, waiting for the consequences. This pill healed all her wounds. Luman is standing over her and calls her to go home. She does not believe that she can have a home. Suddenly, an angry man appears and calls Luman a scoundrel. Swinging his sword at him, he orders him to let the girl go. Luman asks the stranger who he is. The guy laughs at Luman's failure to recognize him. The stranger introduces himself pompously. His name is Ye Chiang. He is the heroic hero in the story with the Wu Shi level, and will soon become a Wu Di master. Luman realizes that he is facing Ye Chiang, the protagonist of the novel. Ye Chiang was traveling nearby when he heard that a dependent prince was living here, ready to do mean things. So he came to do justice. The slave girl stands up for Luman and says that he saved her and healed her wounds. He is a good man. The protagonist is sure that Luman brainwashed the poor girl. He is ready to fight evil for the good of the people. The rescued slave asks her master to hide because she senses evil intentions. Luman avoided the first blow, which angered his opponent. The fight begins, in which the protagonist has the advantage of a sword. It's a good thing Luman was practicing yesterday. It helps him avoid strikes. The forces are unequal, and you can hear the sound of metal cutting through the air. But Luman tries to keep up with his opponent. Chiang offers not to resist to hand over the girl and guarantees Luman's life, pretending to be a defender. He wants to kill Luman at the first opportunity to take the girl away by force. A real hero, this angered the attacker and he lost control of his emotions. Luman realized that he had found the enemy's weak point. With renewed vigor, he struck him blow after blow. The sword fell out of Chiang's hands and he flew backwards. Luman took him by surprise. He was not ready to fight back. Luman does not want to destroy the enemy. He lets him go. Chiang is upset. He is an unsurpassed master of true power and does not understand how he could have been defeated. He cries because of his defeat on the battlefield. His true essence, the essence of a terrible beast, awakens in him. Luman sends a girl to find a man with a scar on his face. He hopes that she will not leave him to his fate. Sparks fly in the air as another fight approaches. This time the fight is getting tougher, and you can hear the clang of blows. The sword appears in Chiang's hands again. The forces are unequal. The protagonist's eyes burn with rage, and he shouts loudly. Suddenly someone stops him, touching his shoulder. Which man is his brother? Asks Chiang if he is acting out again. He said that it was not he, but Li Yuguo who had taken the unfortunate girl prisoner. The man looks at Prince Li Yuguo in surprise. He apologizes for his brother's actions, says that he was simply mistaken, and asks the prince to take a pill of true vitality. 
Lumen recognizes the man as the famous Shimenlan, Shimen's mentor. Shimenlan, the master's son, is later the main villain of this novel. This is the kind of villainous solidarity. A king of thieves and a slave girl run out from behind the year. Yunfan shields the prince and asks the men why they attacked him. Mentor Ximen sees the king of thieves, Guan Yunfan, next to Li Yuluo, and it can't be just like that. Lumen reassures his friend, saying that he had already had a conflict, but his mentor showed up on time. Yunfan apologizes to his mentor for not recognizing him. The mentor turns to his brother and tells him that the prince has a bad reputation and that he should not have anything to do with him. Luman asks his mentor not to scold Cheong because he may not understand anything. He praises that he is so young and at the Wu Shu level, you don't often see such people. The master agrees that people like him are rarely born and his progress is faster than others. He thanks Li Yuguo saying that they have to go back, but in a few days he will come to thank him personally. Luman needs to improve his skills faster because Ye Cheong has a great gift. His thoughts are interrupted by a touch on his arm. The rescued girl asks how his wounds are and how he feels. Luman turns to the slave and asks her name. The girl has no name. He decides to name her Jun Shui, a name the girl likes. Yunfan warns that Ximen Lan is mean, shameless, and cunning, and that Luman intends to take advantage of his greed. The prince asks the king of thieves not to address him as a benefactor. They are brothers from now on. Yunfan vows not to let his brother's plans down. Luman returns to the scale. The scale of the villain has changed. The villain's strength is 4.5%, so this fight has raised his scale nicely. After wasting a lot of time clarifying the misunderstanding, the trio went in search of Shidachin. Finally, they found the place where they parted ways. Shidachin encourages his friends to follow him. Together with the boys, he sees a pale slave girl with big eyes and torn clothes. The merchant tells the prince that his preferences are quite specific, and Lumen stops him. Shidachin shows the low-priced goods his friend sells, such as straw sandals, which can replace a fan. He shows a night pot that can be used for water with a capacity of two and a half liters. He drinks the contents of the pot in one gulp, terrifying his friend. The seller asks Li Yuguo to choose what he likes. Lumen and Yunfan inspect the goods available for purchase. Yunfan notes that there are some good things here, too. Lumen picks up a magic fruit that costs a thousand liang each. The seller agrees to sell six pieces for five thousand liang. Lumen buys the fruit, thanks the seller very much, and suggests that they go out for a drink sometime. In addition to exotic fruits, the seller gives the prince a knife. The sun is illuminating the city's pedestrianized square. Lumen gives the fruit to the girl, who asks why it is so expensive. In fact, Lumen was interested in the knife, but he specifically emphasized the fruit so that the seller would not suspect anything. Yunfan discovered an unusual property of this knife. The soft thread, one of the tools of the Celestial Empire, is said to be gone. It seems that the Alamam scale does bring good luck. The villain's scale has changed again and his strength is 5%. Not much, obviously the soft thread has nothing to do with Ye Chiang. Lumen hugs Yunfan's shoulder and gives him the thread. He refuses such a precious and expensive gift. Lumen says that they are brothers and this thread will be more useful to Yunfan so it belongs to him from now on. Overjoyed. The king of thieves embraces his brother, calls him the most generous man in the world, and is ready to die for him. Yunfan's wife and children have not yet recovered, so he must go to them. Jun Shui saw that the king of thieves had disappeared, and he could do it. Lumen gives the girl her new clothes and fruit to strengthen her body. The girl is delighted with the way her master treats her and doesn't know how to thank him. This girl does not yet know that she is the last ice demon in this world. She whispers that she will name her child after the owner. Lumen asks her again because he didn't hear what she said, but the girl doesn't answer. The prince brings the girl to the palace and says that this is now her home. They are met by Landman, who yells at her husband for bringing a girl into their home. Lumen replies that she is his new slave, Jun Shui, and introduces her to the princess. The girl is crouching in the reverence with respect for the princess. Landman doesn't understand why he needs another maid, but all the servants belong to them and Lumen wants someone to be faithful to him. The maid looks devotedly into the eyes of her minion for a minute. The princess is satisfied with this argument, and the prince informs her that he has earned a thousand liang today. He hands his wife a package of money. Landman does not believe that he earned the money and asks whom he robbed. Lumen forgot about Li Yuguo's old reputation for not suddenly bringing in a thousand liang at once. The prince says that he didn't rob anyone. He just sold something, especially since many traders come to their town. He wants his city to prosper. We need to act gradually, 
Nalana has been in this state for more than a decade. It will be difficult to change everything at once. The princess sees that her husband has really changed and decides to start treating him better. She asks if he will also sleep in the guest room tonight. Lumen is going to live there and asks to prepare a bed for Jun Shui. The princess leaves him even though she is good, but the time has not yet come. Night came and a bright moon lit up the sky. Lumen brought his maid some fruit that she had forgotten. He knocked politely on the open door. When he received no answer, he threw them open. His eyes almost popped out of their sockets from what he saw. Jun Shui was taking a naked bath in her room. Having been an otaku for more than twenty years, Luma never expected to see such a beautiful picture in reality. He had seen many beautiful women in his life and asked the maid not to be shy and to get dressed quickly. The girl says that since he saved her, she should show him all her beauty. She is grateful for the life she saved and is even ready to give her life for it. But Lumen said that no such sacrifices are necessary, but you need to eat well. The maid agreed and began to eat the fruit he brought. She squinted her eyes with sweet pleasure. They are an ice demon for nothing. The skin of these fruits is as hard as steel. The soft light from the table lamp illuminates the room. Lumen sits at his desk and studies the pedigree of Liguanyi, an epic-level celestial wolf and fire spider. His heir inherited the servant's genes. We need to look at his mother's pedigree. He reads in the book that Zhen Shur, a disciple of the Shue Temple, is a thunder boa, genes of excellent level. The lineage in this world is divided from top to bottom. There is a big difference between the levels. They are received at birth. The difference between him and his strength and the strength of Ye Chiang will be increasing. Luman had only six months to live, but he wrote earlier that if genes do not awaken, they can be changed. Initially, it was Ye Chiang's way of subduing people, but in the end, it could save lives. The power of genes originates from werewolves. There is a crypt of an ancient cowherd outside the city, so we can take a chance. Someone kicked at the new maid's room, calling her to come out. The door opened and three landman maids entered the room. They began to bully the new maid. They kicked her, humiliated her, accused her of sleeping with the prince. The head maid ran out of the room and down the hall. She entered the judge's room and demanded that Prince Li Yuguo be arrested. The rest of the girls also leave the maid's room and go to see the prince's dependent. Jun Shui gets up from the floor and realizes that her master is in trouble. Li Yutong, accompanied by two guards, walks down the corridor of the palace and calls out to Elf Yuguo to come out. He enters his brother's room and accuses him of selling contraband salt. Lumen wonders if his brother could have seen Shi Da Sheng holding the jars of salt. He needs proof. In the courtyard, there are people handcuffed and holding bags, both witnesses and evidence. One of the men says they were detained immediately after Luman sold them salt. Li Yutong tells the princess, who has come running to hear the scream, that his brother has set foot on a thieves' trail to make money. Landman is not surprised that her husband made money so quickly, he disappointed her. Li Yutang has thought it all through and intends to bring him down, so we need to find a way in. Jun Shui stands up for the prince, saying that the prince is too smart to make money from smuggling salt. The audience considers her a liar and the prince a loafer. Thinking about his maid's words, Lumen found a way out. He says that the girl does not lie and that she has a treasure trove for everyone. Li Yutong is sure that he has been selling salt for a long time, otherwise how could he have so much money? The prince shows the bottle and asks Landman if she knows what it is. He says he got this product from a friend. He earned all this money selling glass. It's safe and there's no need to sell salt. Li Yutong does not believe this. He asks how his brother knows the glass merchant. The prince is constantly mingling in different strata of society and knows many people. Landman asks why her husband hadn't told her where he got the money before. She thinks he's a nobody, so if the prince brought all the money at once, his wife wouldn't believe him. Li Yutang says this does not prove that Lumen did not trade salt. Someone runs up the stairs and shouts that he can prove the prince's alibi. Shida Chen says that he saw a man secretly buy a lot of salt at a salt shop yesterday. Shida Chen is a merchant from the capital and a friend of Li Yuguo, who heard that his friend was in trouble and came to his aid. A salt seller confirms that one of the men in handcuffs bought salt from him yesterday. Li Yutang is very angry about this situation. He starts to rage and destroy everything around him. Everything around is tainted with traces of the massacre. He says that those people framed his brother, and even their deaths will not wash away their guilt. He killed everyone without even knowing the reason for their actions. Having treacherously destroyed the witnesses, Li Yutang apologizes to his brother. It turns out that he made a mistake, just a mistake. The prince thanks the merchant for saving him. He wants to buy Dokken a drink and hears someone calling out to him. 
The princess took her husband's sleeve to draw attention to herself. She wants to talk to him about something. The princess makes excuses for thinking badly of the prince. Prince is used to unfounded accusations. She grabbed her husband's sleeve, but he pulled his hand away and walked away. Lumen, Shi Da Cheng, a salt merchant and a maid left the palace. They went outside, where Yun Fan was waiting for them. It was he who called the traitors to help his master. He asked if the prince wants him to kill Li Yutang. Lumen says that it is not necessary because if he is attacked directly, Lumen will be suspected. Although Li Yutang had already tried to kill the prince several times. The company decides to go to the house of apricots for floral wine. Meanwhile, the maid is dizzy. The prince asks if she has been beaten and if she is in pain. Jun Shui says that the owner is very attentive and knows everything. The prince himself went through all this in this family. He will not allow anyone to insult his maid anymore. The men are waiting for Lumen, and if they don't hurry, all the girls will be taken away. It is a pity that the best girl from the apricot house is Li Eaton's mistress. The men at the table discuss that Li Yu Tong is the general of Nalan. Lumen goes to the restroom, and his companions think that he has had too much to drink and has gone to vomit. The prince went to look for Bai Ling Long, who is Yu Tan's mistress. This is his real purpose for being in the apricot house. He finds Mother John, the manager of the Adrico house, whom he hasn't seen for a long time and gives her a gift. She recognizes him, praises the tobacco he has brought, and asks him what he is doing here and what business he has with her mother. Lumen says that they have a birthday party coming up at home and need to organize entertainment, so he wants to consult Bai Ling Lun. This puts the manager of the Apricot House in an awkward position because Lin Lung is now General Lee's wife. Lumen apologizes for causing trouble for Mother John and takes out another gift. While she's enjoying the scent, the prince goes to the rooms he needs. He opens the door and says it's him. Bai Ling Lun, the head whore of the Apricot House, recognizes him and wants to call the guards. Standing in the doorway, Lumen says that if the girl is not interested in how her brother is doing, he will leave immediately. The girl wonders how the prince knows about her brother. Luman knows not only about his brother's existence, but also about his current whereabouts. Lin Lun says that Yu Tong hasn't been able to find him for three years, so how could Yu Guo know about him? If Yu Tong treats prostitutes so well, why can't he pay 3,000 Liang and buy her back? The girl begs to know where her brother is. Lin Lun's brother is buried in an abandoned cemetery 10 li from the city. The girl does not believe this because Yutan brought her jasper pendants that belonged to her brother. If the girl needs proof, Yuguo suggests meeting tomorrow morning at the cemetery. If the prostitute does not believe Lumen, it can be assumed that he never came. A carriage with curtained windows approaches the cemetery. Lin Lun, accompanied by a maid, gets out of the carriage. She came for her evidence. Lumen shows her the bones, which are the remains of her brother. The girl sees the wounded leg and is convinced that the bones belong to her brother. The characteristic fracture on his neck could have been caused by only three people, Na Lanman, Li Yutong, and the leader of the horse-drawn robbers. The girl asks why Yu Guo is convinced that Li Yutong caused the damage. The proof is the jasper pendants that Li Yutong brought to the girl. The girl is crying over her brother because she lost him. Lumen asks if the girl wants revenge. The prostitute is interested in what she has to do for this. It is necessary to take away Li Yutong's account book, which will bring him to light because it contains evidence that he has conspired with a horse thief. We need to get this book and hide it in a flower pot outside the window. Yun Fan will help us pass it on. The girl had better get back before Mother Jan notices her absence. The girl gets into the carriage, thanks Yu Guo, and drives away. Li Yutang's scoundrels have been dealt with, and now it's time to bring prosperity to Nalan and its people. The palace needs labor. A labor recruitment is announced, paying one dao of flour daily. Only 100 people are needed. Prince Yuguo announces that from today, the official liberation of Lan Ten Li from the city begins. The residents want flour first, and then they want to join the work. The prince fulfills his promise and pours flour on the people, giving the first resident more flour. He asks the residents to line up, and those without a line will not receive anything. Lumen has such abilities that he can now start his own business without the help of his wife. Although Lan is harsh, she is kind at heart. She did not leave him alone until the very end. The princess is surprised at how easily the prince said this awkward phrase. Now the people of Nalani are going to develop new lands. Landman tells the master that he has really changed a lot. It's a nice summer day, the sky is blue, and a bird is chirping on a branch. Three days have passed since the start of the new land development, so it's time to see how things are going. Yun Fan came to Lumen to say that things were bad. Jun Shui was caught. In the country meadows, people are lying on the ground, 
Something has happened there. Horse-drawn robbers organized a pogrom and then suddenly everyone died. After that, the robbers took the slave away and the workers were unable to stop them. Princess Landman and her retinue arrived at the field and asked what had happened. Lifeless bodies look like robbers on a mountain of ghostly snakes. Li Yutang ordered to kill Li Yuguo, but for some reason they grabbed the girl. Lumen has to go to the mountain and save the girl, which is very dangerous because she is just a slave. Lumen stares into the distance and thinks about the slave who stood up for him in his most dangerous moment. He responds in kind and has to save her. Yunfan says that it was not mounted bandits who did it. People were poisoned with the imperial poison. Li Yutang looks at the King of Thieves and tries to understand who he is. He sees a scar on his forehead in the form of a cross. This scar means that he is one of the ten best robbers, the King of Thieves. Yun Fong believes that he was supposed to be killed for his wife and younger sister. If this is not the case, then why did this gang of robbers make a mess of the arable land? We need to solve this poison case. If it is because of the King of Thieves, he must go there alone. The prince is going with him. He will not leave his brother or friend, and they will go together. Landman does not understand why the slave is so important to the prince. He may die on the mountain of ghostly snakes. The maid provokes Landman by telling her gossip about the prince. The woman slaps the maid with lightning speed and she falls down. The princess does not want to hear her servants criticize her husband. Landman catches up with her husband and asks him to return. Li Yutang hugs the maid's shoulder and she regrets that she received a slap on the wrist from the princess because of some prankster. He asks Xiao Kui what will happen if he becomes the ruler. The girl replies that then the city of Nalan will prosper. The man offers the girl to become his concubine, but first she has to help him. The beautiful tent of the Emperor of Poisons is visible from the quadcopter. The top ten robbers have specific tastes. Yunfan says that the Poison Emperor is still normal, unlike the rest. The King of Thieves sees something strange on his friend's head. A poison lover figured them out and mushrooms grew on their heads. The Emperor of Poisons laughs that this purple poison he gave them is very interesting. A dependent prince from the city of Nalan meets the Emperor of Poisons. A slow poison begins to act on the body and you need to urgently figure out how to deal with it. The Emperor of Poisons likes to torment scoundrels like the prince. The princess draws her bow and inserts an arrow. An arrow flies into the face of the Emperor of Poisons. The Emperor sees that the princess was shooting at him while standing on a tree branch. Only she is allowed to torture her husband. The princess is as brave as her father. Landman does not like the sycophancy of the Emperor of Poisons. He is angry and ready to show how kings fight. He uses all the power of poisons against the princess. He's surprised at how the princess holds her own. It is able to bypass the flow of poison directed at it. He likes the way the princess fights, approves of her technique, and wonders why she married such a clumsy man. It is a pity that he has a wife because if she hurt him, he would not be able to resist her. The princess is angry and demands that the emperor be silent. Unable to find the prince, the girl thinks he has run away. The king of thieves stands in the way of the emperor of poisons and orders Lumen to flee. You have to be careful when you fight the emperor with poison. The princess was wounded in the thigh. It helps itself by clicking on battery points to buy some time. If she dies, she will take the emperor of poisons with her. She has such rare golden dragon genes. The princess attacks her opponent again. He tells her to stop because the poison will soon reach her heart, and then even he will not be able to save her. Some petty poison lover wants to kill the princess, and he himself must die. The principal stands between the opponents and asks them to stop fighting. Lumen comes out onto the lawn holding Jun Shui in his arms and wants to say something. The prince left his wife in danger to save this slave. After the poison of the Emperor of Poisons, there is only one road death, and the last words do not matter. The prince discovers the secret of the Emperor of Poisons in bed with his wife. He has less strength. He wants to, but cannot. The Emperor of Poisons does not like his words. The prince is not lying. He knows the King of Medicines and has three magic pills that will help restore potency and strength in night battles. He gives one pill to the King of Poisons. He is convinced that the guy would not dare to harm him. No poison can poison him. He feels that this pill immediately raised his level from Wu Lando to Wu Wang. The emperor immediately felt a change in his potency. If the Yunfangs had gotten this pill, they would have killed the enemy, because the pill not only gives manhood, but also increases combat effectiveness. The poison king decided that they were even because the prince had cured his illness and raised his combat level. He gives the prince an antidote to recover from the poisoning. The princess is holding a pill, and they have to leave. If the Emperor of Poisons helps Li Yugo, he will give him the rest of the pills. 
The Emperor is interested in this proposal and wants to know the terms of the deal. First, we must bless the King of Thieves and his sister. They really love each other. The Emperor would never agree to this proposal. All this time he has been trying to separate them without thinking about his sister. The sister is very happy with the King of Thieves, but when he tries to separate them, the sister cannot live well. She is sick not because of the King of Thieves, but because of her brother. The Poison Emperor sees that Yunfan treats his sister well and finally blesses them. Now we need to state the second condition for the Emperor of Poisons. He has to help defeat the mountain bandits of the Mountain of the Ghostly Snake and the Werewolf. The Emperor tries, but the Werewolf can tear him to pieces. The men reach an agreement. Lumen hands over the pills and says that the next one can be eaten only in six months. He can wait for a few days in Nalan where he will be provided with food and accommodation. Three Viagra pills were exchanged for the help of the Emperor of Poisons, a great deal. You receive a notification that the scale strength has changed. The main character's scale has been restored, and he needs to change his genes faster on the mountain of the Phantom Snake. The owner is so cool, he even knows how to roast snakes deliciously on an open fire. A prince on the shore of a lake is preparing dinner for the whole company, adding cumin and sesame seeds, he likes to come up with strange things. The emperor asks the prince to share his godson with him. The prince says that this cumin is a rare spice, so it is very expensive. The emperor mentions that he has something of value to exchange. He gives the prince a highly toxic knife that has no antidote, can be used only once, and no one can resist it. The prince agrees to the exchange, gives the cumin, and takes the knife. Suddenly he remembers that he forgot to give something to the princess. He hands his wife a small gift he bought especially for her. The princess spends her days training with a sword and doesn't like trinkets. It's a special perfume from the West, and it was hard to get it. He asks the princess to open the box and take a look. The princess takes out her perfume and likes the smell of it very much. The prince asks his wife to put on perfume to make her smell like a real girl. He leaves his wife alone in her thoughts and goes on to prepare the meal. A sudden enemy attack begins, and arrows fly from the mountain. The order is given to immediately kill the dependent prince. The cock's crest on the robber's head indicates that he is the second leader of the mountain. The prince uses a fiery blow of the scorching sun against the attackers. He throws everyone in different directions with lightning speed. The princess sees that the prince has reached the level of Da Wu Shi, and Jun Shui also supports his master. The princess leaves her waiting and rushes to help her husband. The leader takes a swing at her with a mace and wants to take her life. Immediately, a prince comes to her aid. He strikes his opponent in the jaw. The leader falls to the ground and holds his cheek. He wonders if he is really looking at a prince in waiting. Li Yuguo confirms that it is him in person. The princess interrogates the robber about who made the denunciation, and the guilty must be punished. The leader gathers his strength, his eyes sparkling. He makes an unexpected leap in the direction of the princess. The light beam hits the heart of the princess, and life leaves her body. The prince picks up his beloved in his arms. She needs a doctor, and he wants to save her. The leader rejoices in the fact that he was able to destroy Princess Nalan. The Emperor of Poisons puts his hand on the leader's head. His head is gradually dissolving, the thieves are prepared, and the poison fog cannot be used against them. They must flee. The prince sends Jun Shui with the King of Thieves to meet him at the spring. A gang led by Ye Chiang stands in their way. The prince thinks that the students of the School of True Power, together with the robbers, have decided to attack him. Ye Kun would not have messed with the robbers. They injured the princess. It smells like a change of power. It seems that the students were very angry, which is good. A trace of a fire sparkler appears on the ground. Yunfan covers for his friends and orders them to flee. The battle with the King of Thieves begins. He is very cunning and attacks by surprise. The battle allows the prince to escape with the princess in his arms. The pursuers are trying to catch up with them following the traces of the princess's injury. Lumanu runs with the last of his strength, holding Landman in his arms. His forehead is covered with large drops of sweat. Finally, he can put the princess on the ground, leaning her on a stone in hopes that they will not be overtaken. Landman's fever is rising, and the poison has already spread through her body. The prince is desperate and does not know what to do, how to save the girl. He starts looking at it, trying to figure out what to do next. He looks into her eyes and sees a plea to save her. Lumen leans over the girl and begins to perform some manipulations. The prince wants to suck out the poison, otherwise the medicine may not work. Landman agrees to this manipulation and asks him to be gentle. The prince leans over the wound and begins to suck out the poison. The moon appears in the sky and the stars are out and night falls. 
the princess asks if the man knows how to pitch a tent. He knows how because his life was not easy. He had never told anyone about it before. While the princess is sleeping, the prince will be on duty. Landman decides to admit that she was not the one who got engaged to Li Yuluo. In fact, according to the parents' agreement, Li Yuguo's eighth older sister was supposed to marry Li Yuguo. The princess's mother worked in a brothel and her father could not give up his favorite daughter, so he sent Landman. The princess thinks that the prince hates her for this deception. The prince is confused and stunned by this news and does not know what to do next. He started laughing at the princess's words. It's amazing how such a tigress could be turned into a princess. The guy gently hugged his wife's shoulder. When they return, they will build a large, strong wall around the city and prove the king wrong. His words moved the princess to tears. She says she got sand in her eyes because the wind is strong today. In his novel, Lumen did not describe Nalani's past at all. It seems that this world has become real. Finally, Landman fell asleep, and the prince watched his wife sleep with tenderness. In the moonlight, she looks very sweet and defenseless. Something was troubling, and Lumen began to listen to the silence. In the silence of the night, he can clearly hear someone's footsteps approaching them. He immediately puts out the fire, takes his wife in his arms, and runs away into the darkness. Ye Chiang appears in the clearing, checking the fire, which is still warm, which means they couldn't go far. They were found following traces of fluid from the girl's wound, but the prince has a backup. Perhaps the pursuers can be bribed with a fake liquid trick and they will be safe. The prince hears the sound of a flying arrow. He accidentally discovers his hiding place from the enemy. Ye Chiang and his men noticed where the prince was hiding. If not for the people who followed Ye Chiang, he would not have been able to find the prince. The prince trips over a stone, stumbles and falls. This fall stops him and prevents him from running further. He realizes that he has nowhere else to go, but he does not intend to give up so easily. He starts a battle to avenge the evil. Lightning is flying around him, and he suddenly remembers everything he knows about fighting. Suddenly, his pursuers began to run away. They saw something terrible above. They see the werewolf king of the mountain of ghostly snakes, the turtle dragon. He comes out of the lake and tells him to leave the prince as a dependent. The werewolf intends to personally destroy the prince. At dawn, Princess Landman woke up and saw that she was alone. Li Yuguo went somewhere and she doesn't know where he is now. She watches the sun rise over the forest, her heart beating fast. Ye Chiang and his supporters are sitting by the fire, and because of the turtle dragon's treachery, they will not be able to find the snake spring. But they got rid of the dependent prince, and now Nalan will be calmer. The princess heard that her husband Li Yuguo was no longer alive. Ye Chiang is firmly convinced that the prince is gone. The princess thinks that they killed the prince and wants to take revenge by sending them to the grave with him. Ye Chiang says that he saved her from a dependent prince, but the prince had just started on the right path and was constantly being persecuted. Someone intercepts the princess's quick spear and stops her. It's a general and he says that the princess has obviously made a mistake and that he will detain her. Ye Chiang and his men are leaving and the princess wants to stop them. The princess doesn't understand why she was prevented from dealing with her husband's murderers. The general saw that the prince was killed by the werewolf king of the ghost snake mountain, the turtle dragon. The princess asks to order people to find Li Yuguo's body. The obstacle in the form of a prince is removed, and now Princess Lanming becomes Li Yutang's wife. Li Yuguo enjoys water procedures. He takes a healing bath in a magical snake spring. The spring is a real dream of those who seek immortality. It not only healed wounds, but also helped to rise to the level of Wuda Shur. The turtle dragon led the prince to the spring in exchange for dried fish, a delicacy he hadn't tasted in a very long time. As soon as the prince has money, he will buy the dragon even more dried fish. The dragon sends the prince to the other side of the mountainous abode of the celestials. Among the masters buried there is a rich man, but the prince must not escape. The visit to the turtle dragon is so good that the prince does not plan to run away. The prince found something that is hard to find, a cave of a ghostly snake. According to the novel, werewolves are buried here, and the remains of an ancient werewolf must be somewhere nearby. In the cave, the prince sees a thing that belongs to a man from the school of bloody robes. There is also a skeleton of a person from the school in the pepper, which is unknown how it got there. Holding a flashlight in his teeth, he searches for something else of value. He finds a book of martial arts of blood robes and a bloody sword. According to the novel, when Ye Chiang came to the cave, he found the remains of animal bones that are now gone. Perhaps someone removed them. Suddenly the ground under the prince's feet begins to sink. 
A hole appears and he falls to the bottom. The prince hits his buttocks painfully on the stones. He looks around trying to figure out where he is. The ancient werewolf, the clawed werewolf, is chained to the walls of the cave with strong chains. Red flames are still coming out of his head. The prince will finally be able to change his spider nature. The prince returns to the cave to the sleeping turtle dragon. He wakes up the dragon because he has brought it something tasty. The prince asks to be protected while he merges with the power of this werewolf. Merging with a werewolf forcibly changes one's own essence and can be life-threatening. It's like a battle between your own soul and the soul of the enemy. The danger is great, but you have to try, so you ask for help. For his help, he promises to bring something tasty to the dragon every month. The Turtle King sends the prince to the snake spring to gather his strength. The prince's rebirth begins at the spring. Strange changes begin to take place in him. The werewolf's power wants to take away this guy's feelings. The soul of this werewolf is very strong, and if the current essence of the prince is absorbed, he may die. The spider begins to lose its power. The web weakens. A new entity appears, trying to absorb the spider's essence. All that remains of the spider is a glowing web. The new entity is scary and dangerous. She tears the spider to pieces, tearing off its legs. Prince cannot keep this process under control. The golden thread of the turtle dragon comes to the rescue. The turtle dragon swaddles the new entity with a golden thread. The battle between the spider and the new beast continues with renewed vigor. The fire spiral is spinning, which means that the merger was successful. The prince is interested in what this new entity is. It is a real monster described in legends, and no one has ever seen it before. It cannot be considered a werewolf. It is a thousand-armed demon. The prince feels the power of this demon, and his energy level rises to the peak of the Dayushir level. If this force gets out of control, it can destroy the prince. The prince sees someone approaching the cave with the spring. Red ugly tentacles appear near him, which he chases away. Yunfan and Junshui appear near the cave. They didn't believe Li Yutong that the prince had been eaten by a turtle dragon and went in search of him. For seven days, the prince stayed with the turtle dragon in the spring. Li Yutong, in Li Yuguo's absence, has been hanging around the princess all day, dreaming of taking his wife away. Every rav, he tries to kill the prince. Lin Lun has already received evidence of Li Yutong's conspiracy and asks for immediate action. Li Yugo sends his friends home, but he has to stay. He has an important job to do. The prince sneaks into the city and sees a crowd of Jews. Among them, he recognizes his enemy, Ye Chiang. He interrogates the robbers about the location of the fire crystal. Yun San Cheng, a student of the True Power School, holds onto her sword and asks Ye Chiang if he is sure that the crystal is here. The information about the crystal was provided by Li Yu Tong for the massacre of Li Yu Guo. Li Yu Tong betrayed the robbers of the Phantom Snake Mountain, and he will betray the rest of his allies. The bandits of the Phantom Snake Mountain want to avenge their dead brothers, but they underestimated their strength and were rebuffed. Weapons of various kinds converge in the air. Sparks fly. The robbers of the Phantom Snake Mountain are defeated and scatter in different directions. The battle moves to the strength level of the top of the Wu Lin level. Ye Chiang sees that someone is interfering with the battle. He wants to know who is hiding behind the stone. The prince comes out of the hiding place, holding a sword, and says that he happened to be passing by. The princess's husband is still alive. He must be destroyed. He must not be missed. The girl sees the prince holding the sword of the school of blood-robed robes. Are the students of the school also on the mountain of the phantom snake? Ye Chiang is nervous. He thinks the prince is in cahoots with another school. The prince needs to know where he got this sword. In the turtle dragon's lair, there was a group of dead students of the blood robe school and many fire crystals. Mada has no crystals now and the crystals that the prince found belong to him. Ye Chiang demands proof of the crystal's ownership. The prince risked his life to get two bottles of water from a snake spring and a sword. The robbers see that it was a mistake and release the husband of the princess of Nalan. Ye Chiang disagrees with this decision, saying that something is wrong. Li has a conversation with his brother Simon in private without witnesses. The prince beats Shi Men and tells him not to worry. It was Ye Chiang who told him about the fire crystals and it was his fault. The teacher is highly respected in his school, but if this continues, the situation may change. The prince gives one bottle of water from the spring to the head of the school. The loss of crystals should be reported immediately to the school head and elders. But you can't just let the robbers go. Yet Chiang's task is to take the crystals, not to destroy the robbers. The students don't want to get the information about the crystals out in time to avoid getting into trouble. It's good that nothing worse happened this time. A beautiful student has a case for a prince. She wants water from a spring and she can pay for it. 
The prince agrees to sell her a bottle of water for a thousand lire. He is waiting for the girl's answer. The students thank the prince for the information and return home. The girl wonders how the prince could know her name. The robbers thank the prince for putting in a good word for them. He asks if they know why he came. The robber kneels before the prince. He admits that all these years they have been robbing the people on Li Yutong's orders against their will. The robber asks the prince to become his master. Because they are disappointed in Li Yutan, who begins to set them up. The prince asks the robbers to get off their knees. He offers to return to the city together and bring the thief to light. The prince is convinced that this time the victory will be his. The princess stands in the castle leaning on the stone wall. She thinks that the students of the School of True Power destroyed her husband. Li Yutang approaches her and reminds her of his marriage proposal. He wants to do this as soon as possible, so that they can invite people from the School of True Power and find out everything. The princess asks us not to talk about it anymore. She will not marry him. Li Yutang says that he can avenge the prince in this way, but she does not want to be unworthy of Yu Guo. A pillar of dust rises, and a herd of horses can be heard approaching quickly. Mountain bandits are approaching the castle, and they appear at a key moment. Lan Min and Li Yutang watch them rush toward the castle. The princess can't believe her eyes. She recognizes someone. Among the robbers, Kona sees her husband, who has returned. Li Yutong orders the gates to be closed and archery to begin. The princess orders him not to. But the guards no longer obey her orders, which is why Li Yutong did it. He gloats but reverses his order. The princess is furious with Li Yutong, and the earth is burning around her. The traitor will not be able to match the princess in terms of training, but he will be prepared. Behind his back, the guards are holding the princess's maids tied up and want to execute them. He picks up a bow and arrows. Aiming straight for the heart of the princess's maid, the arrow hits its mark. The princess is furious. She didn't realize how mean he was. Li Yutong says he will kill everyone if she recognizes him as her husband. He will take her nanny's life next. The princess watches her husband approach the castle. Tears of despair and hopelessness stream down her face. She accuses Li Yuguo of being friends with the mountain bandits and says they are getting a divorce. The prince is convinced that the princess is in danger and needs to be rescued. He tightens his grip on the handle of his weapon. He does his best to save his beloved wife. In the sunny sky, a firework-like glow appears. The princess sees the prince approaching the castle. Li Yutong laughs, wanting to see his brother save the princess. He sees a flexible blade flying out of his back. She is spinning on the finger of the King of Thieves. A King of Thieves appears near the castle with his wife. Li Yutong underestimated his brother, who ambushed him. The Emperor of Poisons, who destroyed the entire city overnight, will appear, and if he is hindered, he will not be offended later. The castle guards start running away because they don't want to die. Yutan gives the order to stop and destroy the enemies. Li Yuguo realizes that this is his chance. He decides to take the city by storm and take revenge. Firewolves and horse-drawn robbers from the northern lands appear on the battlefield. They laugh at the fact that they are opposed by a prince who is an abstainer. They are surprised that he is going to attack someone. Firewolves and the prince's army converge on the field. The power of the firewolves is equal to that of a Wu Shu master if they attack all five of you without standing in front of them. The wolves persuade Ma Da Hu to come over to their side. The robber recognizes his opponent as an old friend. The prince wants to figure it out himself and not waste words on the scum. He comes to the shelter of five firewolves of the Wu Shu level. The prince summons the deputy general, Yan Wei, along with his wolves. The deputy general says that he wants to take the prince's head to his lord himself. Wolves with their firepower enter the fray. Li Yuguo concentrates all his strength on this battle. Using his magic sword, he manages to drive the wolves away from him. The entire field of the bust is covered with a red viscous liquid. The prince has reached a high level, and the fire wolves are very surprised. He throws away his sword and calls the leader to battle. The deputy general takes advantage of this moment to kill the prince. A red strong tentacle entangles his leg. He does not understand why all his movements are constrained. He must tell Bishop Yan Wang that the prince is satisfied with this peace. The wolf asks to be allowed to live. He has made a mistake and asks for mercy. A murderous energy moves around the prince's hand. The enemy disappears among the tentacles of the worms. The smoke clears and the flames of the battle gradually die down. The attackers tell the prince that it was all their big mistake. Li Yutong forced them to attack him, and now they can take revenge on him together. They are ready to storm the city with the prince and capture Li Yutang. They mounted their horses and began to storm the city. Li Yutong sees that his army has turned against him. 
Lin Long has evidence that Li Yutong betrayed the city of Nalan. She also betrayed her lover. He grabs the prostitute by the throat and tries to silence her. Li Yutong offers the dependent prince a duel, or he will strangle the prostitute. The prince doesn't need this one-on-one -on -one fight with Li Eaton. Lin Lun is his wife, and now he doesn't have to prove that he's a traitor. Li Yutong wants to send the girl to hell right now. By the look of the prince, it is clear that he is up to something. The King of Thieves is closely watching these events. Suddenly, something falls into Li Yutong's hand, which he was about to use to strangle the girl. He lets go of the girl and sees that he is missing half of his hand. His guards run away from him in fear. He realizes that all he can do now is run away. But a prince stands in his way. The prince asks where the general is running from him. The general grabs a spear to kill Li Yuguo. It reveals his second self, who wants to destroy the prince. He does not know that the prince is also endowed with great power. His new self awakens in the prince, and he is ready to measure his strength. The prince gave the general a lot of chances. He even turned a blind eye to his bribes. Two great warriors converge in the battle. Li Yutang will no longer be able to harm the city. Suddenly, a knife appears in Lin Long's hands. She rushes at Li Yuan with lightning speed and stabs him in the heart. She demands that her brother be returned to her. Li Yutang's body falls to the ground, and a girl with a bloody knife leans over him. The prince hugs the girl's shoulder and says that Li Yutang has left this world. The girl thanks the prince for helping her avenge her brother. The king of thieves considers the prince a genius because he managed to calculate where Li Yutang would run. Now that the city is free of Li Yutang, it will begin to develop. Li Yutong was able to embezzle 200,000 lats in silver from the city's treasury. The princess is amazed at the amount of money Li Yutong stole, but it doesn't compare to her reserves. A beautiful bird is circling over the school building in the mountains. He comes down and sits on the arm of one of the students. Ye Chong tells her sister Yun that their brother is now a dependent of the prince and gives his mentor a bottle of water from the snake spring. The girl says he has his own point of view. She has important things to do right now and won't come to ask questions. Her hand clutches the hilt of her beautiful sword. General Li Yutong organized a mutiny in the city of Nalan and was killed. Ye Chiang is convinced that Li Yuguo forced him to betray him. Someone's silhouette is visible on the roof of the house in the moonlight. The prince is sitting with his back to the window and seems to be meditating. He feels that someone is watching him and asks him not to hide but to come out. A figure appears behind him. And the man says that it's no wonder he's the princess's husband, because he was able to figure it out so quickly. The prince asks Sister Yun why she came to him in the dead of night. How did he know who came to see him? All the prince needs to do is smell the girl to recognize her. He flirts with his guest because she came to him in the middle of the night. The girl asks him to shut up because she came to make a deal. It needs water from the snake spring, and it will give it a lot of lyncha. The prince says that he was lucky and was able to steal some water from the turtle dragon. He can take it to the source, but he may die there. The girl will agree to any terms if he goes with her. He hints that he misses contact with women now. He makes an indecent proposal to her as indecent. The girl suddenly starts to feel dizzy. It can be a mosquito-repelling flower or a flower of temptation. This is how a flower with the scent of seduction works on a girl. The prince is very fond of Yun San Chung. She has a divine appearance. He puts his arms around her waist and asks her what happens to girls who break into a man's house at night. The girl asks him to let her go or she will scream. The prince agrees to let the girl scream. This is how everyone finds out that Yun San Zhen, a student of the True Power School, snuck into a man's house in the middle of the night, breaking the rules. The prince hugs the girl. She tries to push him away. The guy is surprised that she didn't hide the weapon. He compliments her on her figure, which cannot be compared to Lanman's. The girl is confused, asking what is wrong with her figure. The prince pulls the girl to him and begins to kiss her passionately. This is finally his first kiss. The girl breaks away and says that she is beating him. The prince realizes that he has crossed the line and needs to calm his guest down. The flower's effect will soon wear off, and he offers her water from the spring. In return, the girl has to find out who will participate in the training in the Black Forest. The girl doubts whether she should make such a deal, but she needs to reach the level of Wu Lin, and without the magic water from the spring, it will be difficult to achieve this. This argument convinces the girl to agree to the terms. The principal offers the girl, and he will help the body gain strength from the fire crystals. The girl asks to guarantee the confidentiality of this action. The prince agrees and thinks that she will ask him to marry her again. The girl takes off her clothes and asks if she is really ugly. The prince has to say where the girl is ugly, otherwise he will not know peace for the rest of his life. 
He pours water into his hand. The girl lies down on her stomach and asks to be gentle because she is afraid of pain. She has very delicate and smooth skin. Perhaps La Yugo is holding a ticket to the school of true power. The girl really likes what the prince does to her body. The girl asks me to be careful so that no one hears or thinks anything inappropriate. The bed on which the girl lies smells like a prince. The prince finished the massage and turned away so that the girl could get dressed. The massage used up the entire bottle of water, and the girl now owes him a favor. The prince says she can pay him in kind. She will find out the list of participants in the Black Forest and give it to him tomorrow. In fact, she is the strongest student in the School of True Power, and she doesn't need any additional power. The girl gets dressed and thinks about the question. Why does the prince need to know such details? He's just curious. She may not answer questions. The girl ties her belt and can answer questions. When she reaches the level of Wu Wang, she will be able to break off her engagement to Chimen Lan, who loves someone else. But this union is beneficial to the family, and this is her tragedy. The prince should understand because his marriage is also a sham. Yes, but the girl doesn't want this stomach. Li Yuguo arranges a sham marriage because landmen saved him from starvation. The prince can enter the school of true power, and the headmaster will not offend him. The prince is satisfied with his life in Nalan, but the girl can visit him at night when she is sad. The issue of the list of participants has been resolved, and we need to think about the development of the city. The townspeople gathered on the central square of the city. The prince announces the start of the city's development. The head of the pirates in the northern part of the city says they support him and will follow all his orders. The prince becomes the general of Nalan. Newly minted general comes into his own. Now the entire population of Nalan must serve for the good of their city. Nuerda has one month and 30,000 liang to build the port. 70% of the profit from trade is very important to the city. The leader of the horse-drawn robbers becomes a cavalry commander and has to deal with the post office. He will receive 30,000 liang so that his family can move to the city and no longer be nomadic. The man thanks the general he no longer has to wander and is ready to serve the city. Ma Daka is given the most difficult task to repair the walls and gates of the city. To do this, mix cement with pebbles and the walls will be strong. It will make the city walls the strongest. The princess likes the way her husband has started to run the city. She sees it differently. The poison emperor left, but left the prince a gift in a box. The prince takes the box and wonders what could be in it. A major reconstruction of the city of Nalan begins. The city's residents agree with this slogan and are ready to work. Yunfan and his wife were assigned to join the army. Prince Li Yuguo opened the emperor's gift of poisons. The box contains a fire crystal that the emperor left to the prince. There is also a map showing that there is a deposit of fire crystals somewhere nearby. There is a stone quarry two leagues from the city, and the prince wants to see it, and his wife goes with him. The stone here is of good quality, which is why they used to mine it on the Phantom Snake Mountain. A fire werewolf appeared in the quarry and killed many people, so no one came here. What they are looking for seems to be right in front of them. The prince receives a direct blow from the scorching sun. All the elements can be used for good, for example, fire can be used to cook food. A strange and frightening picture opens up before their eyes. There are remains of some people in the cave. There are also traces of huge claws. Apparently it was left by a werewolf, so you have to be careful. The prince moves very, very slowly. Finally, they came to a gorge. A burning beast, this animal eats fire crystals. It has a lot of crystals inside. One punch and one crystal is enough to buy an entire city. But the animal opened up and noticed them. The prince takes his wife in his arms and runs away with her. Apparently the beast was woken up by a blow and it's good that it went back to sleep. Landman asks the prince to put her on her feet and he lets her go. The prince activates his combat power. While the beast is sleeping, the prince wants to take the crystals from him and the princess has to hide. Liu Guo cautiously approaches the sleeping animal. He tries to carefully reach the crystal with his spear. The animal wakes up, opens its eye, and sees a person. Things are bad and this monster can destroy them. You have to be very, very careful. The princess cannot stand aside. She wants to help. She tries to take the crystal and defeat the animal. The prince realizes that he may lose the princess forever. She suddenly finds herself in the mouth of a fiery werewolf. The prince manages to knock his beloved out of the fiery beast's jaws. He puts his arm around her shoulder and tries to calm her down. The entire body of this bullfrog, except for the eyes, is covered with armored scales. They have to leave before it gets worse. He takes his wife to a safe place and returns. The prince must show all the power he is capable of. The princess asks him not to do anything stupid. He calls upon all his power to help. It was time for Alamam to show what she could do. 
The prince buys a large amount of dry ice. He begins to fight against the fiery beast. Pieces of ice fly from all sides at the werewolf, but the ice doesn't work on him, and the prince will soon run out of money. Suddenly a snowball hits the werewolf's eye. It seems that this is his weak point. The prince has found it. The werewolf's entire body is covered with pieces of ice. A hundred bags of ice are poured on the fire beast. The cave turns into an ice cave, the beast freezes, and the prince can defeat it. He takes revenge for the fact that the beast attacked his wife. He pierces the werewolf through with his sword. The princess supports her husband and believes in his victory. The sword pierces the eye of the fiery beast. It seems that the sword has absorbed the power of the beast's eye and now has magical properties. The prince killed the burning beast and received many fire crystals. This adventure had to be kept secret so that no one would steal the fire crystals. The prince is confident that they can conduct a large-scale crystal trade. The prince has developed a new perfume that women like, and the city should develop perfume production. The princess finds the new fragrance very pleasant. The city should develop trade with the whole of China. The prince is confident that they will succeed. He has an idea for a perfume. The prince named his new perfume Nalan. Princesa thinks that the name comes from the ABCs of their town. However, the prince is sure that the name has a different meaning. Lumen turns to Alamam for help. Wu Chong's strength has grown to 95% during this period, as is possible. He finds a store of power and I wonder what it is. The power shop shows that additional abilities are available, and the prince learns them. It's no wonder that the three great robbers get everything so easily. They have extra power. Someone sneaks into the prince's room. It's a girl from school. She saw a lot of rare fire crystals in his possession. He did not get these crystals easily. They are not for treating everyone. He says that he bought these crystals for her, but he ran out of black water and she has to go with him to get water. They are leaving tonight, as the water is at its strongest at midnight. They are going right now. The prince has to show them the way and they can fly. Someone is spying on them and sees that they are setting off on their way. The prince has planted so many flowers of temptation, and he has also stolen his sister. So we have to wait until the flowers wear off. The prince and the girl fly to the spring on a magic carpet. The girl says not to let go of her hands, otherwise she will chop them off. The prince lets the girl go for a minute. He almost falls off the flying carpet. He's trying his best to hold on. He nervously clutches at the girl as he almost fell. The girl pushes him away again. The prince could fall to his death. The girl catches the prince in flight and manages to scare him to death. Finally, they reach the spring on the mountain of ghostly snakes. They walk along the path to the coveted spring. On the way, they meet the turtle dragon, who is happy to see the prince. The girl is amazed that she has met a turtle dragon. The prince brought the dragon three boxes of sweets. Li Yuguo undresses and enters the magic spring. The prince puts needles on the girl's back, and she hopes that this will change her body. It can be dangerous if you absorb too much of the power of fire crystals at once, but water neutralizes them along with the needles. The girl is disappointed that the prince doesn't like her or that he hides his feelings well. He has to hold on because he came to clean the canals, but his eyes... He cannot take them away from the girl's beauty. She also thinks about how pleasant it is to be around him. The girl thanks the prince for taking her with him and giving her so many fire crystals. This spring is really magical. You can get dressed and go. The girl gives the prince the bracelet of the Yun land, which is a piggy bank, and this is her dowry. They are watched by Ye Chiang, who is unhappy that his sister is going to marry a prince. Ye Chiang comes out of hiding and wants to shame the boy and the girl. He finds the couple already dressed and shouts what they are doing here. He accuses the girl that he has been in love with her for many years, and she is cheating on him. V wants to destroy the couple, thinking they are lovers. The girl is also angry. She will not feel guilty. She fights back against Ye Chiang, who is terribly angry. She asks him to watch his language. She is still his sister. The prince risked his life to bring the girl to the source so that she could move to another level. They did bathe naked, as all people do. Ye Chiang apologizes for doubting his sister's chastity. The girl is very grateful to the prince and will definitely pay him back when the time comes. The girl is angry with Ye Chiang and leaves, and he begs her to forgive him. He falls to his knees and does not know how to make amends. Out of powerlessness and numbness, he hits the stone with his fist. Now Yun hates him, and it's all because of Li Yuguo. With his head down, he leaves the cave. It's night, and he goes wherever his feet take him. Completely immersed in his thoughts, he does not know how to justify himself. Ye Chiang walks forward without looking at the road in front of him. Suddenly, he comes across an unusual picture. He finds a tombstone with a red belt around it. He recalls Li Yuguo's sword, which belonged to the head of the blood-robed school. 
He doesn't care where the prince got the sword, he still has a chance to destroy it. We are looking at a school of bloody robes where Ye Chiang came on an important matter. He brought the remains of the school head's son. The head of the school says that his son disappeared ten years ago, which is why he has now been brought his remains. Ye Chiang is brave. If he claims that these are the remains, he will not be forgiven for lying. Ye Chiang says that the prince killed her brother, took the sword, and wanted to get rid of the body. The leader of the school of blood is furious at the news. How the prince dared to destroy his own son and cut off the lineage of the Bai family. Ye Chiang has a real chance to destroy his enemy. The leader wants to find the prince and get even with him. In two weeks, Li Yuguo will participate in the True Strength School competition, a good opportunity to destroy him. The murderer of the son of the leader of the school of blood-robed men has no place on this earth. The sister is crying over the remains of her brother, whose bones are mangled. She does not believe what happened. This prince abstainer is a real demon. Ye Kun says that her brother was his friend. He could not protect him, and the prince is doing terrible things in Nolan. He vowed to his brother to take care of her, even if he had to give his life for it. The girl cries and asks him to avenge her brother. Ye Chiang needs to get the support of the blood robes, otherwise he will lose power in the school of true power. The prince was tired of walking, so he had to ask Yun San Chung to give him a ride. His stomach is rumbling and he is very hungry. A prince enters a tavern and asks for a serving of lamb noodles, two glasses of wine, and two plates of vegetables. He places his trophy sword on the table next to him. Behind him, two soldiers are talking. The prince realizes that something is wrong. He is waiting for his order for a very long time. Asks for five meat pies to go, he has to leave. He opens the pie and feels that it smells very strange. He sees human fingers in the pie. This surprises him a lot. He doesn't understand how it happened. Suddenly he was surrounded by the military on all sides. The prince grabs his sword and is ready to fight. The attackers did not introduce themselves and said that he would go to hell today. The prince is sure that there has been a misunderstanding. He wields a sword of the school of blood robes. He is told that it is not surprising that he is scheming behind the young lady's back. An older student at the School of Bloodied Garments says he is a Belarusian and is not good with weapons. The prince realizes that he is of a higher level and has excellent sword technique. He is not his rival. The prince tries to divert attention and says that he does not know any young mistress. The prince is lying. He is holding a sword that belongs to their lady. The criminals must be punished. He must be destroyed. The battle for life and destruction begins. The prince is suddenly attacked from behind. He receives a fatal stab in the back from his opponents. The prince crouches down on one knee, holding his sword. He says that the attackers did not understand what was going on and attacked him in vain. However, they do not listen to him and continue to fight. The technique of the battle shows that the prince has the technique of the sword of blood robes. The prince needs to go to the main street of the city. His pursuers are running after him. He manages to break away from them. The king of thieves is waiting for him in the square. The criminals who dared to wound the brother of the King of Thieves will not come out alive. The King of Thieves uses a secret weapon, a flexible thread. The flexible thread cuts off the attacker's body parts. The prince owns a secret technique of the School of Blood Robes. The leader of the attackers accuses the prince of having killed their lord. He asks his soldiers to protect him. Suddenly an unusual glow appears in the sky. His wife flew to defend the prince and no one dares to attack him in the city of Nalan. The princess orders the dead to be buried and the rest to be taken prisoner. The robbers are very disappointed to have been defeated. Body parts are lying on the ground in the city square. The prince leans over one of the attackers. All the fluid from his body disappeared, this technique of bloody escape. The prince seems to be being pursued by the elite of the blood-robed school. They are dangerous people. The prince thinks that someone with bad intentions sent these people to him. The events are transferred to the school of bloody robes. The murderer managed to escape using the technique of bloody escape, but failed to avenge his master. He was met by strong masters. The school students lost their chance, and now the prince will be careful. Ye Chiang may become a member of the school of blood-stained robes when it's over. The daughter quarrels with her father, saying that he is talking nonsense. Binini and her brother Simon Lan have been friends since childhood, so there's no point in arguing with them. Ye Chiang must first destroy the prince, take back the city, and then he can consider himself part of their family. The school leader thinks that Ye Chiang can be relied on. Bining Yi wants to marry Wu Chiang. Maybe he thinks the girl is not worthy of him. But he is still too weak now. He needs to gain strength. The girl will steal the blood demon technique for her Jun, which can only be mastered by masters of past eras. 
Entrance to the Black Forest, the competition begins. There are several werewolves in the forest. The total score will be calculated by the total strength of the werewolves. Each school sends 40 students, and the points will determine the winner. Three teams are competing for the prize, including the School of Bloodstained Clothes. The main goal of the participants is to search for werewolves and share their experiences. Inflicting injuries is prohibited. The tournament in the Black Forest is declared open. Students take guidance from their mentors. Li Yuguo was not given a uniform, and he stands out among the rest of the participants. He-Men suggests that the prince go with them, as it could be dangerous here. The students know that the prince is here because of his connections with his brother Simon, but he can't do anything himself. Werewolves are very dangerous in this forest, especially in the central part, and you have to be careful when walking through the forest. The prince thanks for the tip. He was going to go to the middle part. In the novel, it is said that there are treasures of one of the masters who died in the forest, and this is the prince's goal. The CA sisters will stay close by in the forest. Few people know that a once kind and honest brother can abuse others. Men's strength allows them to act alone. Women cannot compare to this strength, so they diverge. The students invite Ye Chiang to join them. Yun Fan watches the competition to prevent trouble and protect the prince. He will take care of the prince, and when everything is over, he and his wife will have a child. The princess says that one should not rejoice prematurely because it may not bring good luck. The prince is sitting by the stream, sad and hungry, with no water or food. Suddenly the blades of swords cross on his neck. They want to rob him. He has a bad reputation, so no one will investigate the crime against him, and he is offered to give up his treasures. The road of murder and robbery is too narrow. The prince demonstrates the wonders of combat skills and surprises the attackers. They receive well-deserved blows to the jaw from his feet. The thieves did not expect the prince to have Da Wu Shu. The prince interrogates who sent these assassins to him. They were sent by Ye Chiang, who said that the prince had treasures. The prince received another confirmation of his brother's treachery. Of course, this does not apply to his attackers. The attackers lose their heads, they fly away. He is strong because he destroyed people from the school of true power. The prince is looking for the person who just spoke to him. He turns around and sees Chu standing by the tree. He didn't come to make peace, he had something to tell. Wang Hua died a year ago, the prince could not kill him. Ye Chiang hates the prince and wants to frame him so that suspicion falls on the prince. He also gained the master's favor and the love of his sister. The sister is Simon Lan's childhood friend and is well liked at the school of bloody robes. Ye Chiang has seduced her. The school has a plan to destroy the prince and he has to run away. The prince opens a can of drink. He will not back down. He's not going to let go so easily and he offers Chu a drink. The prince speaks with the words of a real man. This one takes two cans of the drink with him. He warned me and left, and someone overheard the conversation. This is the king of thieves. He can destroy Chu. The prince is against it. The main thing now is the development of the city. Chiu Changshan knows the truth and is in love with Bi Ning. The enemy of our enemy is our friend. Yun Fan saw a pack of wolves surrounding Yun San and he needed help. The friends immediately rushed to find the girl. The wolf's eyes shine fearfully in the darkness of the forest. Opposite the pack are the students of the school. Yun has to distract the wolves and sends her friends for help. She enters the battle with terrible werewolves. The wolves open their guts and click with sharp clicks. The girls run to avoid distracting their friend. The werewolves are too fast. They will soon catch up with the girl. Will she have to use her other self? The situation leaves her no other choice. She was mocked for being a red hen. The girl realizes that she has no other choice. She plunges into her second self and turns into a chicken. Golden feathers fly over the battlefield. The second entity helps the girl to overcome the evil wolves, the werewolves. She managed to cope with the first level. Now she has to deal with the wolves of level and Wu Shu. Two wolves, two alphas are approaching her. She is worried that she will not be able to cope with them. She sees Alpha and Omega approaching her. The prince's voice is heard telling everyone to come on stage. The wolves are attacked by a flock of chickens. The girl sees that they are led by a prince. He spent 500 liang on chickens. The prince grabs the girl by the waist and they run away. He came specifically to save her. The prince is embarrassed to admit it to her. He stumbles over a tree root and falls. They fly together into the forest thicket. The prince finds himself on top of the girl. He asks her to be quiet because someone is here. She covers her mouth with her hand and listens. I think it was just a fly flying by. The prince gets a kick out of the joke and starts laughing a lot. Yun got angry and punched him, and he asked her not to hurt him because she would be blamed. Yun's family considers her a mere tool for marriage. 
The prince asks her to show him a cute bird. This is the first gene mutation in a thousand years, a red bird, and its future is bright. Her name is Phoenix, and although she is still nondescript, she is underestimated. Even if others don't appreciate you, you have to appreciate yourself. The girl thought about the prince's words. Although he is a scoundrel, he speaks the right words. The prince gently takes the girl's hand. She looks into his eyes with trust. He jokes that it's time to catch a fly. The Scorpion King appears on the lawn. He is confronted by four school students who want to run away. Someone's strong claw hovers over their heads. The girl tries to understand what is happening. It ends up on the head of the Scorpion King. The students of the school look at her with love and respect. She asks if the prince meant this fly. One of the students thanks the prince for saving her. Yun was angry with the prince and called him a pervert. The beauty thought that she owed her salvation to Ye Chu, not Li Yuguo. The prince is disappointed by the fame of his enemy. The girl hugs the prince's neck and compliments him. The guy takes her hand off his shoulder and asks who she is really at odds with. The girl is holding a poisonous spider and the prince has guessed her intention. Yun was angry with the girl. They saved them, and she decided to poison the prince. The prince talked to the emperor of poisons about voodoo culture. The girl knows the emperor of poisons. He used to come to their cult and has good relations with her family. The prince can forgive the girl if she considers him her friend. The girls have gone too far into the forest. They need to be careful in the future, and he takes the pill as a reward. The girl will definitely come to visit the prince when she has time. She has a very attractive figure and luxurious hair. The prince will not mind the girl's visit. On the banks of the Li River, Yuguo prepares a meal. Venison is especially delicious this month. Yun did not know that the prince was so good at food. The guy could have died of starvation long ago, especially when he wrote books at home for five years. The girl will need to tell you something about werewolves. She realized long ago that the prince's goal was not a competition, but something else. In the forest, he showed no interest in medicinal herbs. He gave her all the power of the werewolves and very carefully chose a place to rest. The prince forgot that the girl is very smart. He has no hidden agenda, and he has already accomplished his task. Yun is not interested in the task. She is worried that the prince is preoccupied with something. She feels his condition and wants to know the details. The girl touches the prince's hand and says that she's very worried about him. The prince asks Jules not to cry. She will calm down when he tells her everything. The boy hesitates. He assumes that Yun and Ye Chiang might have been alone. He decides to tell everything, relying on Ali Mama. Their conversation is interrupted by the contestants, who believe they have caught the lovers in a spicy moment. Yun looks down at the uninvited guests. Perhaps these are participants of the school of blood robes. Among them is Ye Chiang, who is now convinced that the girl and the prince have a relationship. He yells at the prince because it is the first time he sees Yun crying. Ye Chiang betrayed the school of true power to attack the prince. Bei Nini accuses the prince of killing her brother, and the boy wants to prove his alibi. But Ye Chiang took out the guy who could prove the prince right. The prince cannot believe his ears because he is innocent of anything. Chiu Tian Shan's body is lying on the ground. Next to him is a tin can of drink that the prince gave him. Ye Chiang kicks the can and demands proof from the prince. Yun asks why Ye Chiang betrayed the true power school, since they had a good relationship. The guy says that Simon Lan did not respect him because he took away his fame. He was not welcome at the school of true power, and he decided to return everything that was taken from him. Now the prince has no evidence. It will be difficult to convince Bi Ning Ning, and he has to fight Ye Ching. This conversation is overheard by someone in the dark. Shi Men Lan comes to the clearing. He treated Ye Chiang as his brother and helped him out of trouble. Instead, the prince knows who Nini is to him. I allowed myself to kiss her in the woods in broad daylight. His eyes burn with righteous anger. He unexpectedly strikes his opponent. Ye Kun says that Shi Men is not worthy of a girl. He can break all his illusions with a secret technique. In his battle, he uses the blood demon technique. He rejects his former mentor by force. Simon falls to the ground. He does not feel his true strength. The prince takes Simon's hand and sees that his power has dissipated. If he continues to use his power, he may die. The prince sees that he cannot call for reinforcements, so Ye Chiang uses a secret technique. In his book describing how to prevent the destruction of the world, he did not foresee this Yi Tsun. Can a soft thread help them in this battle? Ye Chiang has now become unreachable and powerful. A soft thread cannot defeat the blood demon technique. Ye Chiang tells the king of thieves, who calls the prince his brother, that he is deceiving him. Yun Fan sees much better than others, and he will protect his brother. Yun Fan will not talk to Ye Chiang. He is ready to attack him at any time. The prince asks not to do so for now. 
Li Yuguo is Ye Kun's opponent and challenges him to a fight, while the others must leave. He is determined to defeat his opponent militantly. Yan does not want the prince to fight alone with Ye Qiang. The prince turns off the girl's consciousness with his palm. Yun Fan has to take the girl and Simon away so that they don't get hurt. The king of thieves will fulfill his brother's request and return. The opponents are left on the lawn one-on-one. -on -one. Ye Qiang doesn't want the prince's friends to go anywhere. He won't let them. He uses all his strength, knowledge, and skills in battle. But first he has to fight the prince in his essence. The prince faces the enemy in his other self. Ye Chiang and Nini don't realize what kind of monster is in front of them. Nini doesn't have to get her hands dirty on the prince. Equin will do everything himself. His advantage is three main secret techniques that will help him. The prince must focus on defense to force Ye Chiang to use all his power. Li Yuguo and his second entity took a defensive stance. Ye Kun's strength is unrivaled. The prince concentrated his power and used almost all of his potential on defense. Ye Chiang says that the prince can only hide. He will use his ingenious trick that the prince will not be able to escape from. The prince fails to repel the enemy's attacks. His defense is weakened and he loses the ability to fight. Ye Chiang delivers a strong final blow. Li Yuguo was on the ground. It is forbidden to hit the lying down. Ye Chiang gives the prince to Nina because he can no longer move. The prince tries to gather all his strength. He concentrates, but he fails. His second nature comes to the rescue. The rivals are surprised by the new, different nature of the prince. The prince is holding three red pills. He puts them all in his mouth and eats them. His power is gradually beginning to manifest itself in him. He appears in all the glory of a new, new entity, yet Chiang underestimated the enemy, now it's his turn to pay. A new stage of the battle begins. The prince deals with the supporters of his enemy. Ye Chiang's legs are bound by tentacles and impede his movements. He does not know how to resist this beast. Ye Chiang is not ready to leave this world. He took advantage of the pause in the battle to have a chance to escape. But the prince and his essence catch up with the fugitive. Li Yuguo has used up all the pills that restore strength. His essence took away all his power. He could not kill the enemy in time. It seems he lost. Will Bishop Yan Wang give him another chance? The heads of two schools stand at the entrance to the dark forest. The school of true power has sent three of its best students and expects to win. Ye Chiang and Bining Yi come out of the forest asking for help. School leaders are surprised and ask what happened. The girl says that the prince killed all the students of the school and molested her. Her father is furious and wants to destroy Li Yuguo. Representatives of the school are furious and plan revenge on the city of Nalin. Ye Chiang says that Shi Men was killed by a wolf pack that the prince set on him. The teacher cannot contain his despair. The master says that the prince will pay with his life. The heads of the two schools discuss these events with each other. Bi Ning Yi is bent on preventing Qi Men from returning, and Ye Chiang is sure that he must die within two days. Even if he survives, he will be torn apart by wolves. Yun and Yun Fan leaned over the unconscious prince. The prince does not understand why he's being slapped in the face. He regains consciousness and is surprised to be alive. What could have saved his life? His life was saved by a bloody escape technique. The prince knocked the girl out so that she would not be afraid of his new self. The girl says that she does not need his care. The prince gives Simon the antidote to the power dissipation. It's a gift from the emperor of poisons who doesn't spare his friends. Shi Men is convinced that Ye Chiang and Bi Ning will not get away with their prank. The friends need to go back and tell the truth to the master. The school of bloodied robes is developing very quickly. They are running out of resources and are looking for new sources of content. Their main target seems to be the city of Nalan. They all need to return from the forest immediately. The friends see that they have fallen into the League of Wolves. A pair of wolves are unhappy that their space has been violated. The company is surrounded by wolves on all sides. The prince promises to deal with the wolves himself. The prince chooses a weapon that can help against the wolves. Why didn't he think of this brilliant idea earlier? Alamama warns him that he is too weak and his purchase is suspended. Lumen is angry with Bishop Yan Wan Wang and he has to rely on himself. Friends are afraid of dying from angry wolves. The mentor is convinced that they will find a way out and show everyone the true face of Ye Chiang. The wolves are angry and crave revenge for the disturbed peace. They begin to sink their sharp teeth into the clothes. Yan chops off the head of one of the wolves with a sword. There is one less enemy. It was time to get even with the others. The next wolf bites the girl's sword in half. This is unexpected. It can't be. The prince lights a loud big firecracker. The loud sound scares the wolves away a bit. They retreated, but immediately returned. The prince wonders why fireworks do not work against these wolves. They are furious and ready to tear everyone to pieces. We have to run to the river.
It's safe there and there are no wolves. Without physical and life force, the prince will not be able to use Alimama. We need to look for another way to save ourselves. A log is floating down the river. It's a great chance for salvation and we have to run to it. You can remove the vine from the log and the prince will cover his friends. He hopes to use fireworks to defeat the wolves. The wolves are clicking their fearsome barks very close by. The fireworks explode and illuminate everything with red flames. The fire blinds the wolves, and the prince is confident of his victory. His friends are waiting for him on the deck. He joyfully runs to them with all his strength, but a wolf suddenly attacks him again from behind. The prince escapes from its jaws and falls into the river. He doesn't know how to swim at all and could drown. Jan orders everyone to weave, and she will save the prince. She throws herself into the water to save him from drowning. The girl wants to bring him to the surface. She is not ready to lose him. The moon illuminates the night sky and the riverbank. The prince coughs. For some reason, he feels very heavy in his chest. He is by the fire, and Yun San Cheng is sleeping next to him. She opens her eyes and looks at him sleepily. She saved him by pulling him out of the water. She had to leave her brothers to save him, and he owes her his life. The prince is ready to repay Yan for saving him. She pushes him away and refuses to thank him. The prince didn't even have time to say how he planned to thank me. Yun asks him not to touch her and to let go of her hand. The prince agrees and releases the girl. There is something cool on her wrist, a band-aid, a design by the prince as a thank you. The girl was injured when she was pulling the prince to the shore and her wounds need to be treated. There are very strange black pyramid-shaped stones in the water. This could be the obelisk the prince was looking for. It has a very refined finish. An old mansion, what the prince came to the Black Forest for. The girl wonders how he found out, and the prince regrets that he blurted it out. He can't wait to see what's inside the obelisk. He opens the door and goes inside. In the middle of the crypt, they see a skeleton. It seems to be someone from the imperial family whom the young woman saw in the capital. They wear white and blue clothes with an ornament in the form of a golden dragon. The floor begins to glow under her feet. She starts to fall, and the prince grabs her hand. A white ghost appears, happy that someone has finally come. Young people are scared and ask who he is. He is the heir to the heavenly, heavenly state of Nalan, and they must listen to his story. The prince thinks that this is a projection of the deceased master. He could have left a will. The ghost said that by the time he was twenty, he had already reached the level of Wu Huan and was envied by his younger brother. His brother sent a female concubine to him, whom the ghost took as his wife. The brother's plan failed, but the priest and his wife had to flee, but the brother found them and amused his wife. The love story told by the ghost moved Yun to tears. In the coffin near the body of the heir, there is a pair of ocean rings hundreds of years old, which can hold an unlimited amount of anything. There is a separate technique of sympathy inside, but only spouses in a state of complete trust can feel it. He can pass the technique on to a couple in love and hopes they find love. On the mountain, wolves are seen chasing them. If they catch up, it will be difficult to resist them. Yun says he urgently needs to learn a new technique. The girl finds the rings. They can master the technique without worrying that their strength will run out. They also find the swords of a man and a woman. Is this the will of heaven? There is no time to think. The prince has to turn away. The girl undresses. He will be able to master a higher level of technique if he thinks only about it. He also takes off his clothes and they fall at his feet. The prince wants to see what Yun is doing. She orders him to sit down and cross his legs. He promises not to open his eyes. They touch each other with their fingertips. The prince accidentally opens one eye. He is dazzled by the girl's beauty, although he did not spy on purpose. Li Yuguo focused on learning new techniques. Meanwhile, the school leaders met with Princess Nalanya. She hits the ground with her spear with force. The princess does not believe what she has been told about the prince. She is told that he killed Simon's brother, yet Cheong saw it with his own eyes. And suddenly you hear Simon's voice asking who died. He appears with the King of Thieves. Yet Xiong cannot understand how they escaped. Lanman asks Yun Fan where the prince is. The King of Thieves failed to protect him. The princesses were confused by the news. His father asks Lan what really happened. Yet Xiong attacked him in the Black Forest together. And only thanks to the prince were they able to escape. Yet Xiong says that Simon was bewitched. He could not harm his brother. Landman objects, Ye Chiang doesn't dare argue. He has tried to kill her husband so many times. She is ready to deal with him for the disappearance of her husband. Benini stands up for Ye Chiang, and no one dares to offend him. The mentor of the school of bloody clothes stands up for his daughter. Princess Landman's arrow is already flying to be. She pierces his arm through and through. He did not expect this from a fragile princess. 
He knocks the spear out of the princess's hands with his foot. No one thought that Landman was brave enough to defy Lord Bai. The Lord praised the princess's courage. Ye Chiang is now under his protection, and the Black Forest is to blame for Yu Guo's disappearance. The head of the School of True Knowledge is shocked by the betrayal. It seems that his son told the truth. He did not expect betrayal. He is very disappointed and irritated by this state of affairs. He expels Ye Chiang from the School of True Power. Ajun did not expect such a decision and is upset, Nini comforts him. From that moment on, Ye Chiang is officially the fiancé of Bi's daughter and a member of the Blood Robes. Shi Men says that Ye Chiang has brought too much evil, and his father reassures him that he shouldn't waste his nerves on a traitor. Now we need to find the prince in the Black Forest, and everyone goes in search of him. The rules forbid her from entering the Black Forest again, especially since the princess is not a student of any school. The guards do not let them into the Black Forest. The prince is on the verge of death, and the princess has to save him. Print. Prince sneezes. Maybe he is sick. Yun asks if he's okay. Angry wolves are trying to come to them. The prince hadn't even had time to get dressed yet. The girl and the prince grab swords that turn pink and blue, respectively. A pack of wolves is waiting for them at the entrance to the tomb. The flow of energy throws the wolves a long way away. Swords help them, but they cannot master the technique of inseparability. Perhaps they need to kiss for this. First, you need to destroy the gray wolf. The prince and the young man hold hands and concentrate on their combined strength. Holding hands, they make the wolf stop. But three formidable beasts come to his aid. The princess's gaze is directed at something unusual. The prince is also trying to understand what it is. Wolves are affectionate. These werewolves can also be loved. They have the mind of an eight-year-old child. Yun says that they have entered the territory of wolves and should be spared. Lumen recalls that in his novel there is an episode of taming a werewolf. They shouldn't be afraid. He puts his hand in his pocket, takes out a pill and gives it to Vovk. The wolf swallows the pill and his wounds begin to heal. Consciousness returns to him and he smiles. A pair of wolves show tenderness to each other. A boy and a girl have invaded the territory of wolves and have to leave. The wolves are grateful for his recovery, walking ahead of him and seemingly calling him to follow them. Although Yun and Yuguo saved them, the girl has doubts about whether to leave in case it is a trap. If the girl has doubts about why she let the prince save the wolves, the girl thinks about it, but obviously the prince is right. They hold hands and follow the wolves. The girl feels happy next to the kick. The wolves lead them to a clearing. This is the heart of the Black Forest, which Lumen described in his novel. In front of them are the huge remains of an unknown beast. It can be dangerous here. The beast has many deep wounds. It was wounded by a Wu Huan level master. When Na Lan Sheng was running away, he ran into this animal. The pair chose a dangerous forest to make a halt, and among the remains is a sign of the Big Sky School. At first, the prince did not pay attention to this sign. They see a purple ball in front of them. This is the power of the werewolf lord. It is the level of Wu Huan. This bullet had been here for a long time because werewolves cannot absorb such power of this level. The prince decides to take this power from the ball for himself. The boy and girl's attention is drawn to something unusual. Their eyes light up with joy. They are rich. They find a lot of treasure and want to divide it in half. One of the wolves grabs the prince by the leg of his pants. It attracts his attention in this way. The wolf also wants the strength of the lingo from the ring. The prince agrees to give them this power. He gives the wolves a lot of magic stones. The girl takes his hand to tell him something. She asks him not to boast about the weapons of the blood robes anymore. Yoon will help the prince sell everything on the black market, and the money is needed to develop the city of Nalan. The prince mentions something and they need to run immediately. Lord B asks someone who thinks he can control life and death. A fiery hand flies near the princess's face. The prince gets a slap on the wrist, doesn't realize what it is because he was just passing by. The king of thieves and his brother Simon are happy to see him. He also sees his wife, Princess Landman. The princess hugs her husband, rejoicing that he is alive, and Princess Yun's friends are also happy to see him. The prince believes that the power of werewolves helped them to return. This year, the school of true power won. The prince rushes at Ye Chiang with a desire for revenge, thinking that he is a student of the school of true power. However, he is now a member of the blood vestments, and we have no right to speak to him. Representatives of the school of bloodied robes leave the lawn. The master of the school of true knowledge thanks the prince for saving his son. He makes the prince an honorary member of his school. The prince can come to school at any time. Yun looks at Princess Nalan with envy and jealousy. The princess realized that the girl and her husband had a special relationship. Princess Lanman and Sancheng stand opposite each other. 
The princess meets the girl and invites her to visit Nalan. Yun has heard about the princess and her sword skills for a long time, and she is eager to learn from her experience. The prince watches the girl's verbal debate. He says that the weather is nice today, so why don't they all eat noodles together? The girl shouted him to shut his mouth. The princess has heard that San Cheng is engaged to Ximen Lan, but she does not like him at all. His girlfriend would not have loved him even if he had showered her with all the jewelry in the world. If she does love someone, he may have nothing. She will follow him to the ends of the earth. The princess has resigned herself to her fate. She has been cold to her husband for three years, and it is cruel. During these two months, the prince changed. He put an end to Li Yutang's rebellion and began to develop trade and agriculture. So she changed her mind about him. Yun wonders whether the princess values the prince or his ability to make money and develop the city. The princess wondered if she really loved the prince. San Cheng decides to hug the princess by the shoulder. She says they shouldn't compete with each other. In the end, the answer is obvious. The girl's words hurt the princess's feelings. The sign says that it is an apricot house. The prince and his friends found themselves back in the apricot house. He met Lin Lun there and asks if she still works here. The girl has nowhere else to go but to the apricot house. The king of thieves says that Lin Long is beautiful and suitable for his brother. But what can she ask for to become the mistress of an apricot house? Happy that the prince saved her. She recalls that she had to talk to the prince about something. She passes on what one girl picked up when she was meeting guests. This is a sign of the bloody robes. They never gave up their plan. The men are worried and ask the prince if their enemies, the men from the tavern, are near them again. Lin Lun tells them to enjoy the drinks and socializing, and if they need anything, they can call the staff. She tells the prince that she will not lock the door at night. The men say goodbye to her until the next meeting. The prince gives everyone a ring to help them reach the level of Da Shur within three months. There are about 20,000 people in bloody robes, and the friends need to raise their level. Otherwise, they won't be able to win. We cannot relax. We must remember that Laney is in danger. A woman's hand stops the prince by his clothes. He turns around to see who touched him. The prince turns around and thinks it's Lenman. This is his maid, Zhe, who has been waiting for him for a long time. She was worried about the owner, but there were people inside and she was embarrassed to go in. The prince strokes the girl's head and offers to return with him. He gives her an ornament with 500 snowfruits in it, which she has to eat every day. They are walking down a dark alley, and the girl is happy that the owner loves her. Since she started eating snowfruits, she can freeze objects with her breath. When she gets stronger, she will be able to accompany the prince on his travels. The girl looks around with her icy gaze and feels someone. She says that someone strange is following them. Their walk is accompanied by three unidentified persons. Prince stops in the middle of the road and looks around. He doesn't know who is coming and why, but he asks them to show themselves. His persecutors say he has a few minutes to live. They are mistaken. This phrase should be said to them by the prince. He is being insidiously followed by blood-colored rats. They want to destroy it and throw everything at the school of true power. The prince is not afraid of attackers. Let them try to destroy him. Pursuers attack the prince. The girl wants to help him. He says he can handle it himself. There are only a few rats here. She can hide. He can handle himself. She is his secret weapon, and as long as she is not, she does not need to fight. The girl is surprised that she is the master's secret weapon. It will eat the fruit to become strong and then protect its owner. The prince will teach her the techniques of blood dressing. He continues to fight with his attackers. He puts one of them on his knees and puts a sword to his body. He will let him live when he knows how many of their people are in the city. The attacker voluntarily stabs himself with the prince's sword. His head flies off, he loses his life. The prince closes the maid's eyes and the warriors of this school are ready to go to the end. There can be many representatives of the school of bloody robes in Nalanda. Li Yuguo and the maid are running. They need to get back to the palace quickly. The moon illuminates the palace of Nalan. The prince rushes into the palace and asks if his wife is okay. The princess is sitting at the table writing something. She is fine. The prince calms down. The princess is fine. The princess says that he has come at the right time. She needs to give him something. Yuguo hopes that this is something good. It gives him a letter, and he starts reading. The letter falls to the floor. It says that he is suspended. The prince cannot understand what has happened. He bends over the princess. The princess hits the table with her fist and asks the prince if he is hard of hearing. She used him to rebuild the city, and now he's been suspended. The prince realizes that something has happened. Landman is not so cruel. The maid says it's a mistake no matter what the reason, and the prince leaves. He takes the girl and they leave the palace. The princess is left alone in the room with her orders on the floor. 
Someone takes her by the shoulder and asks if this is the right decision, and the princess wants to know the current information. Yunfan reports that an attack is being prepared from three directions. From the water, from the forest, and from the south. He did not expect that the Vodou cult would take part in the rebellion, and there were many high-level warriors among the enemies. The situation is critical, and the princess hopes that the prince will have time to leave the city. The King of Thieves believes that if the prince takes part in the battle, they will win. The princess trusts the prince, but she is in his debt. She says that this time she wants to protect him. He is not obliged to do so much for the city. Yun Fan and his wife should leave the bridge. Yun Fan's wife says that they are not afraid. The prince saved them, and they will thank him. The princess allows them to stay, but she wants to take Ye Cheong's life herself. The prince leaves the city with his maid, and she says that the princess is wrong. The girl will always be faithful to the prince and will not leave him. The prince wonders why the princess chased him away. This is not how the plot should develop. He recalls that according to the book, the city is about to be attacked, and he didn't realize it before. The princess also noticed that there were many enemies in the city. The prince's actions changed the course of the book, and the attack could happen sooner. He realized how events could develop further. He runs back to the palace, realizing what he needs to do this time. He is confident that this time he is making the right choice. The princess is also confident in her choice. At the main entrance to the School of True Power, representatives of the School of Blood are lined up, dressed in blood, ready to fight. They are offered to surrender within one hour, then they will shoot. A girl from Kultu Voodoo yawns while sitting on a horse, bored. The bloody vestments made a mistake, and now they are provoking a conflict, dragging the cult into it. If the demand to surrender is not fulfilled, the school of true knowledge should blame itself. The bloody vestments are very powerful, so the cult cooperates with them, and the girl says that her father is simply afraid of them. She gets down from her horse and says she has decided something. At the battle, she is needed. She goes to warn Li Yuguo, and they try to stop her because it is not allowed. She takes a few members of the cult with her, while the rest stay to listen to the commands. One guy asks them to wait because he wants to go with her. Hieroglyphic inscription of the School of True Knowledge. The school students report to the master that the enemy has invaded the mountains. Shimen says they should ask for help from Nalan. They have more than a thousand soldiers. Nalan's army will not be able to fight at a sufficient level. Their enemies want to take control of the northern lands. The head of the school has a sudden coughing fit. Ye Chiang's old illness has disturbed him, and at the same time he needs to figure out his fighting technique. The participants from the School of True Power are ordered to prepare their swords for battle and fight to the end. Bi Jin Xiong is keeping track of time. The time to make a decision has already run out. The enemies chose not to surrender, the guns are ready to fire, and the command to fire is heard. The air is filled with the smell of gunpowder and smoke. Many of the school's students have already gone to the next world. Is the School of True Power still capable of holding back the offensive? Guns can no longer reach enemies from afar, so... The cavalry of the School of Blood Robes is coming. On strong horses, the warriors rush forward. A melee begins between students of the two schools. There are more than 10,000 representatives of the School of Bloody Deeds, and the heavens destroy the School of True Power. The school is suffering losses, and we need to find a way to get to Nalanya. The head of the school gives an order to send representatives to Nalanya. The disciples accepted the order and ran to the city. The School of the True Vestments took this as an escape. He shouts to his disciples to follow their leader. He swings his sword from behind at the head of the school of true knowledge. Yun returns to find out whether his brother or father is wounded. The head of the school says to take the students and leave. Simon does not want to leave his father alone. The school heads enter their battle. B holds two sticks that are supposed to bring him victory. He has to inflict some special wounds on the enemy. Swords begin to fly from him in different directions. The leader of the school of bloodied robes is pleased with the result. A fiery spiral spins around it. Stones are flying from all sides and the sun is shining brightly. School leaders find themselves between the clouds in another dimension. Master B is pleased with this development. The master of the school of true knowledge is viewed from the outside. Simon Lan addresses his father with tears in his eyes. The father stands with his back to his son, his hair blowing in the wind. The master says with tears in his eyes that they will have to say goodbye here. The boy tries to bring his father back but his sister says they have to go so as not to let the master down. Meanwhile, the prince and his maid are still walking. The girl is tired. Although she is tired, she will follow her master to the ends of the earth. 
they hear a familiar voice asking for help. Representatives of the voodoo cult were surrounded by werewolves. The prince orders the wolves to stop and not to hurt anyone. He asks the girl why she didn't warn him that she was coming to the mountain of the phantom snake. He asks the werewolves why they came running from the black forest. The girl replies that her bees know the way, but why the prince is not in town. She says that blood robes will defeat the true power, Nayland's next target. The prince grabs the girl by the shoulders and she has to explain everything. After ten minutes, the maid and the werewolves slept peacefully together. The girl says she risked her life to bring the prince this information. The prince did not expect the attack to come so quickly with the involvement of the true power from the school, and he needed to immediately save the situation. He thanks everyone and tells the girls to wait for him here, passing her a purple ball. He left to bring the best reinforcements. Red flags with a black pattern develop in the sky. The soldiers attack the city wall of Nalan, cannot break through it, and spend a lot of shells. B orders to shoot. He doesn't believe that the wall is intact. Yet Cheong says he has a plan and B needs to hear it. We need to install assault ladders which will allow us to move the guns forward and attack the city from the inside. The princess can surrender or the army can destroy the city. The leader orders the installation of assault ladders along the perimeter of the wall. Ye Cheong wants to take revenge on Li Yugu, win the battle, and gain prestige. The city's army gathered at the wall, led by the princess. The cement wall is really strong and can withstand an enemy assault. The master did his best. The whole wall consists of cement. Landman sent people to fetch her father, and they are now supposed to defend the wall and evacuate the residents. The princess thinks about the prince with sadness, worries whether he is safe. She is informed that citizens on their way out of the city met disciples of true power. The princess wonders what they are doing near the city. Representatives of the school enter the city confused. The chairman of Simon was killed. They wanted to hide in the city, but it is also surrounded. The princess is worried that if she loses, all the northern lands will be in the hands of Bijun Xiong. The students of the School of True Power will do their best to protect the city, hoping for a princess. Yun asks Landman where Prince Li Yuguo is now. The princess replies that he should be safe now. The enemy has become stronger and is rolling his guns closer. They also set up assault ladders and want to get into the city. The fiery crystals will not allow the enemies to get through. You have to wait for the king's reinforcements. Barrels fly at the heads of the invaders. They fall along with the assault ladders. The leader of the attackers sees that the city has a secret weapon. These barrels are very powerful. He gives the order to take the princess alive because he wants to know the secret of these barrels. The princess looks out from behind the wall and hears the order to capture her. The princess is confused. She doesn't know how much longer they can hold out. The maid returns and the princess asks if the king will be reinforced. The maid did not reach the king. She was stopped by the prince and could have been caught. The girl warns the princess to be careful. There is danger. The princess is attacked from behind. The soldiers cannot stop the attackers. They climb over the bodies of their comrades. The princess is disappointed that her father has abandoned her. Its main task now is to protect the city's residents. She asks the soldiers and citizens of the city if they are afraid of the afterlife. Everyone answers her in a chorus that no one is afraid to go to the next world. She orders the soldiers to guard the main gate and take the people away. The rest of us will defend and fight to the last. The soldiers admire the princess's courage and will not let her down. Lanman and Yun will fight side by side. Neither of them will lose. They bravely rush into the battle, each with their own weapon. The enemies continue to strike hard. A large crack appears in the entrance gate to the city. Yakun rides around the battlefield on horseback, encouraging the soldiers. The leader of the attackers can't wait any longer. He orders the red-eyed water dragon to be brought in. The city must pay for its resistance. Warriors on strong chains are pulling something huge behind them. It is a fire dragon with glowing red eyes. Ye Chiang says that the ruler is worthy of being the ruler of the northern lands and should wipe the city off the map. Next, the order is given to roll out the wagons from the lynchin. The fire dragon opens its mouth and a weapon flies out. His fearsome eyes sparkle with lightning. The townspeople led by the princess cannot believe what they are seeing. The dragon releases fire from its mouth, intending to burn the city. The fiery streams reach the strong walls of Nalani. The middle of the wall falls, opening a passage to the city. The dragon is approaching the wall that encloses the city. The princess hopes that there is an afterlife. There she will be able to meet her beloved prince. Huge stones are flying across the city's pavement. These stones fly at the terrible fire dragon. Suddenly, the turtle dragon appears on the battlefield and says that no one dares to attack Nalan while he is here. 
The princess is very surprised to see the prince by her side. The fire dragon has opened its mouth and is trying to take over the city. Princess Landman cannot resist him with her weapons. The prince completely relies on the help of the Turtle King. The Turtle King is waiting for him. He will hold the city. The princess asks the prince why he came back, and he replies that she is a bad actress. Chapter B does not understand why the Turtle King helps the prince. He defeats the red-eyed water dragon. The prince hugs the princess and thanks his beloved. He leads the army and goes to defend the gate. The princess asks him to be careful. He tells her not to worry. He's taking care of the task. The warriors of the blood-robed school are nothing special. Ye Chiang tells the prince that he thought he would hide for the rest of his life, but he has passed. Lord Bai orders to break down the wall and kill all the inhabitants because he thinks that their dragon has already won. The prince replies that he wants too much. A large pack of werewolves appears on the horizon. Prince Zheng Shui's maid came with the wolves. The soldiers in bloody robes are horrified by this sight. They cannot understand what is happening on the battlefield. They have to run away because they are wolves and they attack. One of the wolves runs out to meet the leader of the rebels. He believes that the Wolf King will not be able to have any power over him. He throws a pillar of fire at the Wolf Werewolf. The fireball is aimed at the werewolf and is supposed to send them to the other side. The degree of the battle increases, and a new army appears on the horizon. Leader B hears someone calling out to him, and he turns toward the voice. Prince Yuguo says he is Lord B's enemy and is ready to fight. He launches a circle of fire and tells the prince that he has not calculated his strength. The prince accepts the weapon from his opponent with a smile. The enemies are engaged in a close fight to see who will win. The leader is convinced that the prince should not have repelled his blow. Li Yuguo says that this is only the beginning and the continuation will be unexpected. The prince and the lord continue to fight, and the prince's level is low. He won't last long. The opponents are trying their best to stay on their feet. Energy flows drive the opponents in different directions, and they fly apart. The prince's hands are trembling. He has absorbed the energy of the source and is now at the top of his game. Yet Chiang and Princess B ask if the Lord is okay, the prince can be destroyed by Yi. The ruler is fine. Despite the fact that the prince is repelling blows, he is not his rival. The leader asks Ye Chiang not to make him angry, just to stand on the side. The prince sees B's expression change. On the scale of power, Ye Chiang's energy level rose after the defeat it fell, and the prince's scale rose to 25%. The leader rushes into battle again, trying to destroy the prince. The prince picks up his sword of power. He withstood the blow of an enemy stronger than himself with dignity. The ruler launches two rings of fire aimed at the prince. The prince's friends see that he is in danger of being killed. After the ruler kills the prince, he hangs his head on the main gate of the city. Valera B does not use the blood demon technique, and he ordered the prince to be surrounded. Yun comes to the prince's aid. He thought she was fighting on the side of the school of true power. The girl asks the prince if he thought she had gone to the afterlife. If that happened, the prince would have taken revenge for her. The girl is glad that the prince has finally said something sensible. She asks him if they will use this technique as usual, says the prince, hugging the girl. The sight of the couple hugging infuriated Princess Bi and Ye Chiang. Princess Bi Ningni thinks that Ye Chiang has never loved her. He needs her power. Li Yugu and Yun enter the battle together using their secret technique. An army of students from the school of blood-robed men competes against them. Lord Bijen Xiong leads the battle against this pair. He is amazed at the new equipment they use. The two streams of force directed at it throw it back. Students of the school of bloody robes do not believe what they see. The attackers decide to use the technique of attrition because the prince has the best technique, but there are only two of them. B believes that the exhaustion technique is great, but there may be other options. First, you need to try something else. The attackers can't agree on who will start first. The prince wonders why the school of blood-robed men suddenly became so modest. The attackers decide that they will act together. Yun is quite happy with this continuation. Now the two of them are facing a larger number of attackers. The prince uses his old trick in battle. The ruler knows the consequences of this technique, so the prince will not succeed the second time but it doesn't help, and the rivals meet again. This time, the leader of the attackers was faster than his opponent. The prince did not expect a quick response. Princess Yun sees the danger and asks the prince to be careful. The hand of the attacker Bai flies to the side after a sword strike. His eyes reflect horror and despair. He is losing the battle. The prince's foot kicks him off to the side. Prince and Yun will show everyone what it means to work together. They again demonstrate a common technique of joining swords. 
Leader B is surprised by this technique, which is used at the Wu Lin level and produces an amazing result. The prince says that they can withdraw the troops and he will probably spare them. Yun is not ready to let the attackers go because they killed her master and many of her brothers. The Bai leader tells the girl that he will send her to her master now. A powerful pillar of fire appears in front of them. No one understands what happened and where this flow is coming from. The prince is also surprised by what is happening around him. The previous head of the Bloody Robes appears, who captured the city by battle. Mr. B is ashamed of his father, but there is still much he does not know. To master a pair technique and gain strength, you need to do it simultaneously and in pairs. The previous head of the school of blood-robed men challenges the couple to a fight, and if he loses, he will withdraw his troops. He looks terrible with his red eyes, but if he wins, he will take their equipment. The opponent is insidious, fights deliberately, and does not know the power of the joint technique. Yun says that the equipment is very valuable and should not be traded, and the prince agrees. There is something else the girl has to tell the prince. Prince knows that the situation in Nalan and the school is not optimistic. They may lose even more people. The prince agrees to a duel with the previous head of the school. The girl watches the battle and asks the prince to be careful. At the beginning of the battle, the prince has the advantage, and he actively attacks. The enemy recognizes that the prince has a good sword, but it is not in his rules to retreat. But his Wu Wang strength is very high, and he has a chance to win. The girl cannot help the prince. She has a lower level and will slow down. They decide to continue the fight together, supporting each other. Their swords come together, radiating a powerful force. This force reaches their opponent and breaks through his defense. He gathers his strength and fights back against the princess and the prince. The soldiers begin to shout slogans in support of their leader. Lord Bai is convinced that his father will be able to destroy the prince today because his strength is unmatched in the northern lands. Himen watches the fight and worries that Yun might not be able to stand it. The technique is that they collect the true power and it breaks out after a short time, and the girl is exhausted. Yun confronts his enemy one-on-one, -on -one, and this is how the battle unfolds. Li Yuigu comes to her aid with his sword. The couple unites their two forces against a common enemy. A fireball of powerful energy appears behind them. The wielder has no weaknesses at all, he has Wu Wang strength. His opponents of Da Wu Shu and Wu Lin level have been fighting him for quite some time. He asks if they know why the Wu Wang level is called that. This is the materialization of the bloodline, and it will show them the true power of Wu Wang. The prince feels that they have reached the peak of inseparability and are moving to another level where no one can beat them. A couple holds hands for an unusual joint meditation. Only heaven knows their thoughts, knows their feelings. The leader thinks that they have decided to cheat and disrespect him. It will allow this couple to pass away at the same time as doing a good deed. The owner intends to finish with this pair. Suddenly he sees that something impossible and unbelievable has happened. The prince and the girl have unknown golden wings. The naked prince lies on his back and wonders where he is, whether he has reached the second stage and where Yun San Chung is. He sees a naked girl nearby and notes that she has a great figure. The prince was afraid of his lustful and frank thoughts. The girl calls him a pervert, and he is surprised that she can hear his thoughts. He recalls how good it was at the spring, how soft the girl's skin was, and how he wanted to kiss her. The girl feels embarrassed and hopes that the prince will take responsibility. The girl calls the prince a pervert again, and they have to think about winning. The prince and the girl are flying through the sky. The enemy is aiming at them and says that no matter what equipment they have, he will defeat them. They will not be able to defeat his formidable python. The prince and princess's eyes lit up with colored lights. Yun Sancheng is the first to accept the fight without expecting to win. Li Yuguo immediately comes to her aid. The princess begins her transformation, saying that he was right. Her essence turned into a fiery phoenix. Yuguo never deceived. It seems they managed to reach the second degree of the doubles technique. The pair, armed with swords, are flying in the direction of their enemies. The Lord is angry, wondering where the essence of the Red Phoenix came from. The battle moves to a new level, and the Phoenix and Python converge. A person gets the same damage as his or her second self, and the Prince knows it. The leader of the blood-robed men is convinced that he cannot be defeated. His eyes burn with hatred and anger, and he craves revenge. He raises his sword and is convinced of his victory. He says that the Prince must accept his defeat. The Sword of Fire tears through space and creates a chasm. We have to protect the city's residents from the attack. They have to survive. The prince asks the girl to channel her energy into weapons. They manage to successfully combine two streams of power into one powerful one. 
Residents of Nalani watch the battle from the palace tower. Princess Landman hopes that the prince will survive. Troops are lined up in front of the wall of Nalan. Tired and exhausted from the battle, the prince and Yun are barely alive. The warriors of the school of blood-clothed men are in shock at their defeat. The sword ended the life of their leader, and the smoke dissipates after the battle. B realizes that his father has passed away. The outcome of the battle is clear. The prince asks his opponents to withdraw. Lord Bai cries he does not believe that the prince dared to take his father's life. In a duel, the heavens determine a person's fate. If the prince had lost, the outcome would have been the same. The owner of the B.I. is very confused. Tears are flowing from his eyes. The prince says that if he is not satisfied with something, he can try again. The confused army led by Lord B. mourns their loss. The ruler orders his soldiers to retreat from the battlefield. Princess Landman watches as the prince embraces Yun and the enemy troops retreat. The prince rejoices that the enemies have finally withdrawn from the city. The boy and girl are tired and happy to have won. The princess approaches the prince and addresses him by name. The prince is lying unconscious in bed, and the princess next to him is thinking about the new technique and how Yun San Chung is better than her. The guy opens his eyes and regains consciousness. The princess is very happy that the prince has regained consciousness. The prince asks the princess if they have won and gets an affirmative answer. Yun San Cheng and Shui are happy that the prince has regained consciousness, having slept for seven days. The maid hugs the prince. She thought he would not wake up. The princess asks if the prince wants to go out to the city, and everyone is worried about him. The prince, along with Princess Yun and Shui, goes into the city. He sees the ruined walls that they had been rebuilding for so long and carefully. Residents begin to flock to the square from all sides. The news that the prince had come to the city spread very quickly among its residents. They are very happy that the prince has regained consciousness, calling him a hero and a commander. No one would dare to call the prince a dependent if it weren't for him the city would have been wiped off the map. The townspeople begin to throw the prince up and praise him. The prince bargains with the dragon. He gets a box of fish every day for protecting the city. The dragon agrees and Nure takes him to help build a new wall. The prince realizes that this time he will spend a lot of money on keeping the dragon. Yun puts her hand on the prince's shoulder from behind and he shudders with pleasure. She sold his jewelry and wants him to guess how much she got. Yun sold jewelry worth 5 million silver and 100,000 links. This time, there is enough money and strength for reconstruction, but the city is destroyed, so we can give it a new name. We can call it Tanglin, which means Heavenly Wolf, and Senmin thinks it's a good name. There is no school of true power. Its students decide to join the city of Tanglin, and the prince agrees. They can unite the school and the city and prosper. Representatives of the school of the bloody-robed Dejeuner are insidious, and you should be careful of them. The city will be developing for another five years, and the prince is interested in whether his letter has reached the addressee. The letter arrived, but the recipient believes that Li Yuguo is extremely arrogant. He sent a letter to the School of Blood Robes demanding compensation, but they cannot satisfy the demand. Now Nalan is stronger, the school cannot resist them, and Ye Qing will be responsible for the defeat. Ye Qiong makes the excuse that he did not know about the turtle dragon and its power. The head of the school, angry and stomping his foot on the ground. Why did Ye Qiong convince him to go to war without having information about the enemy's strength? Ye Qiong makes the excuse that he really didn't know how strong Nalan was. Lord B frees Ye Qiong and he can return to Nalan. Ye Qiong has no other choice, so he humbly accepts his father-in-law's will. B doesn't believe him, so there's no point in making excuses. The head really wants his daughter to have such a worthless husband. Ye Chong thinks of Princess Landman. He is much better than the prince. He treated his father-in-law as his own father, but he forced him to do something. Ye Chong realizes that B won't believe him if he really thinks that his problems are only health-related. Three days ago, he started adding a power dissipator to B's medication, and now he is unable to use his powers. The owner knows about Ye Chong's past. His Jasper pendants belong to one of the five main families of the capital. If he goes with them to his family, he will have many prospects. Chapter B is ready to help him with this under certain conditions. Ye Chiang wonders why he hadn't been told about this before. Perhaps they were afraid of losing out on the benefits. Ye Chiang says that he is returning the favor and would be grateful for the assistance. It will not mutilate the body of the owner and leave it as it is. Ye Chiang holds her father-in-law tightly, intent on destroying him. He keeps his hand on his face and waits until he stops breathing. A look of gloating appears on Ye Chiang's face. The demon liquid technique is evil, but it allows you to absorb the cultivation of another person and replenish your own power. 
His eyes shine from within. He has reached the Wu Lin level. He tests his strength near the body of his father-in-law. Ye Chong pulls out a sword and wounds himself and his master. He begins to call out loudly for help. Binini and the guards run to him and ask what happened. The body of Nini's father is lying on the floor, and Ye Chong says that Li Yu Guo sent the killer, and he did not have time to protect Bi. Nini is crying. Her husband promises to avenge the deaths as long as they don't tell anyone about it. Nini tries to find peace in her husband's arms. Ye Chong comes up with a strange idea. He wants to bite Nina and drink every drop of her body fluid. Two weeks later in the capital, the four heads of the Yun family discuss that their niece has Felix's essence. The first head of the family, Yun He, says that his daughter was not talented. The second head, Yun Lawyer, says that the news was brought by the heir of the Yi family, who is not yet 20 years old and has already reached the Wuling level. Yi's family had already been told that this guy was their relative, whom his father wanted to kill, and that he had fled to the north. Yun He orders everything to be ready. He is going to the northern lands, and we need to inform Ye's family. Serious changes are beginning in the five main families of the capital. Above the palace of Tanglin, you can see the glow from the phoenix bird. Yun sits on the roof in his new phoenix vanity. Its essence is powerful. It can absorb power three times faster. A princess comes to the girl and tells her that she has a wonderful view. The princess asks why the girl is not sleeping, and she replies that for some reason she cannot. Shouldn't the princess be at her husband's side? But Yun doesn't know that the princess released him before the attack. She didn't know that he would come to her aid at a crucial moment, and that she had always been dear to him. The better the prince treated the princess, the more her conscience tormented her. The princess tells us that Li Yuguo's father was killed by her father. But is it really the business of parents to deal with their children? The princess asks Yun if the prince will hate her when he finds out. Yun says that this cannot be. The guy seems to be a simple man, but he clearly distinguishes between good and evil. Yun clarifies that if the princess fired the prince, then they are no longer married. Now they have equal competition. The princess accepts the girl's challenge. Pritz fails to break the circle. He is a little bit short of the Wu Lin level. Him and Lan has also reached his level with the help of Lin Xia. Only the prince is lagging behind. He sees Lan Min Yun talking to him and wonders when they became friends. You never know what women have in mind. They might turn him into a pair. Yun Fang has news. The city of fire has become empty. The prince wants the king of thieves to clarify what he means. Seven days ago, Ye Chiang packed up all his belongings and left the city of fire. The worst thing is that Bi Jen went to the afterlife. It is strange that he could go to the forefathers at the level of Wu Ling. It seems that Ye Chiang went to the capital. If this is true, then according to the plot of the novel, Ye Chiang could have caught the threat of his fate. It's night. The moon is full over the city, and the sky is beautifully blue. Several strangers approach the city walls. Yul Hye has heard that the city is a shithole, and he is surprised that his daughter lives here. This city is ruled by Princess Landman, whose illegitimate daughter can be disregarded. The guard and the werewolf ask the uninvited guests if they are not tired of living. Yun Hye asks the guard if he knows who he is. He said that the princess had ordered everyone to go through the gate. The first head of the family, Yun, lifts the guard with one hand and throws him away. He falls to the ground with a hole in his chest. Then in the darkness you can see the head of a werewolf werewolf. Uninvited guests say that Tanglin is a terrible place. The prince's sleep is interrupted by extraneous sounds, and he covers himself with a pillow to avoid them. It's night outside, and these eerie sounds make him wake up. Werewolves give a signal that something has happened. If Ye Chiang finds out about his connection to the Ye family, he will tell the family about Xian Cheng's identity. The prince thinks that tonight's disorder is closely connected to the Yun family. Riding a werewolf, he arrives at the central gate of the city. He asks the night guests who they are. Yun Che is angry that the prince did not recognize him and dared to ask who he was. In the town square, Yun talks to her father, who asks why she hasn't returned home after reaching the level of Wu Lin. She knew that once she reached the Wu Lin level, she would not need to get married. The girl asks why he came in person when he could have sent the letter by pigeon. The heads of five families in the capital founded the state, and they underestimated the girl. At this time, the essence of their ancestors was the phoenix. The father wants to take the girl back, but these lands are not for her. He will give her 10,000 lina for her protection. The girl says that they drove her to the northern lands alone, or they would have come for her with the essence of a yellow hen. The father says that it's all for the sake of the family. She is his daughter and must listen to him. 
The pregnant wife of a guard who has gone off to the sunset appears on the square. The prince says that yun -hee has removed the guard who has a wife and children. Are they not ashamed of their actions? yun -hee sees no problem with the fact that a commoner has disappeared. He will pay gold for him. The woman cries and asks to bring her husband back to life. She grabs the first head by the sleeve and his cloak tears. He was furious, calling her bad names. He says that this robe was custom-made for him in the capital. The woman falls motionless to the ground, and the guards ask if these people have a conscience at all. The guard was a loyal friend. He loved his wife and children. The level of the head of the Yun Wu Khan family. They need one person, and they destroy everyone. He tells Yun that he is staying in the northern lands, that he will not go with them, because she is not their thing. Her father's eyes suddenly flare with anger. Holding a flame behind his back, he asks his daughter if she really doesn't feel sorry for the residents. At first, the girl does not agree, but then she realizes the horror of the situation. She will go with them, but she has one wish that her father promises to fulfill. Her mentor was destroyed by bloody robes, and she does not forgive this. A father instructs his assistants to deal with the offenders of his daughter's mentor. He fulfilled her wish so they can go. The angry guards want to take revenge, but the prince stops them and lets the uninvited guests leave. The guards do not agree with this decision. The prince says that their comrade attacked first. yun -hee asks Li Yuguo if he is really the son of General Li Guangyi. He regrets that such an outstanding general has such a worthless son and orders them to be escorted away. Despite the discontent of the guards, the prince takes Yun out of the city. The prince, Yun, and the two heads of the Yun family are walking through the forest. The Yun family members looked at each other and understood each other. They need to get rid of the prince forever. The second head of the family hits the prince and he flies away. The prince falls to the ground, swords fly at him. Yun Hei stops the girl and asks why he wants to kill the prince. The father noticed that the girl had feelings for him, but this guy was no match for her. The girl asks why they are taking away everything she cares about. Her father shouts in anger at her for daring to contradict him. He says that the girl will do what she is told. The prince asks why he was attacked and is told that the girl appreciates him and when he disappears, she will return home. Yun is needed by her family now because she is their genes and essence. Yun Laoyer thanks the prince for revealing her essence, that she will marry a worthy man. They call the prince just garbage from the common people. Li Yuguo, the prince, asks to be destroyed so that he will not suffer abuse. Yun asks if the prince is interested in knowing how his father died. The merits of his father were greater than those of the rulers, and this led his friend to decide to destroy him. Because of his father's cruel involvement, San Wanye married him to his illegitimate daughter. The prince's wife is the daughter of the man who killed his father. The prince is furious and wants to destroy his enemy, who thinks that the prince should die. The prince is told that the Yun family must not be provoked. The palm strike given to the prince by Yun Laoye could send him to hell. In the darkness, someone's eyes glowed and a voice could be heard smelling human fluid. The voice says that he is hungry. It is the aura of the Lord of the Evil One. He smelled the smell and he can eat Li Yuguo's body. The Yun family will kill two birds with one stone. The body of the Wudashir warrior goes to the Lord of Evil Spirits and he can enjoy it. A gift was left for him, and the evil ones are left to suck the bones. The prince asks the Turtle King why he is taking so long Dan Tang. The prince is destroyed. He will not survive. The prince does not agree with the dragon. He is sure that he will survive. The prince is lying on the ground next to the turtle dragon, and his life is leaking out of his belly. He immediately needs to connect with Alama to save himself. He has accumulated 28% of his strength, and he needs to spend 20 to live. He decides to buy it. Otherwise, he will go to his father. The turtle dragon wonders how this could have happened. He saved the prince by his timely appearance. Lumen did not describe the truth about Li Guanyi's death in the novel, but he should explore this storyline. The events take us back to the suburbs of the city, now called Tanglen. Riding a turtle dragon, the prince returns to his city. He recalls how the residents saw him off and doubts whether they are waiting for him. With a timid step, he walks through the gate and enters the city. He is welcomed with joy by the residents of the city. They are glad to have him back. He was gone for a long time, and they were worried. The prince tells us that his family decided to kill him, and he was saved by a ventriloquist's dragon. Princess Lanman was very happy to see her husband alive. Intelligence reported to the princess that Ye Chiang had taken only 500 trained soldiers with him. The rest stayed in the city. Li Yuguo realizes that last night they all died in a mass grave. Just two people from the Yun family destroyed an entire city for fun. 
Suddenly, the prince's friends realized the threat they were facing and fell to their knees before him. They thank him for stopping the danger, otherwise the two would have destroyed the city. The townspeople realize that these five families do not care about the lives of ordinary people. The prince asks everyone to get to their feet and says that they will remember everything, and now they are directing all their efforts to the development of their city. He suggests that from that day on, everyone should start training, because only when they become stronger will they be able to take revenge. Everyone agrees with him the weak have no place in combat and we need to increase the amount of training. The prince asks if his wife wants to tell him about his father. The princess says that she has found out everything and the prince should follow her. Landman tells him that the truth is that she is the daughter of the enemy who killed his father. The princess says that the prince may destroy her as revenge for her father and closes her eyes. The princess lets her eyes and head down. The prince has never seen her so humble. He gently touches her face with his hand. Then he pulls her to him and she dissolves in his sincere embrace. He realizes how many years she had been hiding the truth, worried that he would die looking for his father. The princess had treated him badly for so many years and fired him. Doesn't he treat her with contempt? The prince did not sign the release document, but drew a seashell on it so it does not count. The princess does not know how to be cunning. When she gave him the document to sign, he immediately understood all her intentions. The girl has something else to tell the prince that his mother is not actually dead. Recently, the princess found her in a city of spring sunshine in the northern lands. The princess began to tell me that after her father's death, there was a big fire in their palace. As if the body found on the bed in the bedroom was her mother's, it was in fact the body of her maid, Liner. After his father's death, the Solat brought a letter describing the circumstances of the tragedy. The maid sacrificed herself so that the prince's mother could escape from the pursuit of the princess's father. The prince doesn't have to worry because his mother told the princess to keep it a secret so that he could live in peace in the northern lands. Confused by this news, the prince says he is not worried. Despite the fact that Princess Landman never thought of leaving the prince, his qualities are rare. The city of Chinyan is 300 li away from their city, and the princess asks when they should leave. The princess is very disappointed with her husband's decision. The prince asks if she will worry or miss him. The prince's face is close to the princess's, and he touches her chin with his hand. They merge in their first sweet kiss right in the garden. They both really like the sensations they experienced during the kiss. The princess reminds him that the prince's wounds have not yet healed. He wants to go alone, and it will be difficult for her not to worry. The prince says that the city of Tanglan is his support, and if the princess watches over him, he will feel at ease. The girl is interested in what the prince intends to do with San Cheng. Members of five families of the capital, they are a minister and mentor of the imperial court, and their strength is as good as the best schools. The commander-in-chief of the Celestial State's troops is San Wanye, and civilian officials are run by five families. San Cheng has awakened the essence of the phoenix. Her family will make every effort to keep her safe until she is pressured into marriage. Then she can cause a scandal. The prince is convinced that he will be able to return San Chen, but not now. The princess asks what they have there, what kind of equipment they have with them, and the prince says that the equipment is to drive away wolves. The princess would not have agreed to this if it had been another woman and not Yun. The event takes us to a palace in a night city, with the moon shining over it. Ye Chiang says that the palace in the city of Ye in the capital will definitely be his. He is convinced that this palace will become the place of his new life. They are greeted by an old servant with a lantern who is glad that the owner, who has been away for a long time, has not returned alone. Ye Cheong says that it is Bi Ning, his slave, who took care of him all the way from the northern lands. The girl lowers her head in humility and looks down at the ground. The head of the family, Ye Hong, comes out into the courtyard and is happy to see his grandson. It takes a while for Ye Chu to recognize the man who came out to meet him as his grandfather. He tells his grandfather that his father is no longer alive and he reassures him and comforts him. It's early morning, the sun is rising, and Li Yuguo is on his way to the training ground to practice his physical education. He stretches, stretches his body, and sets himself up for a full workout. His friends are standing on the playground, showing him their new invention, a fire cannon. The princess says that she was designed by Chen Laogan and others based on the gourmet bloody garments. The prince looks at the new invention with interest and wants to know how it works. Chen Laogong says that this weapon will scare anyone and he has to show the prince how it will work. The muzzle of the cannon looks quite powerful, and fire erupts from the middle. 
One shot from this weapon breaks the stones that were used as a target for the test. The prince admits that this cannon is much more powerful than the weapons used by the students of the School of Bloodstained Robes. A maid calls out to him. Her eyes are big and surprised. Obviously, some kind of force majeure has occurred. Surprisingly, the gun muzzle blew to pieces after the shot. One shell destroys one gun, which is not profitable, so we need to think about how to make the weapon even stronger and more powerful. A woman's hand rests on the prince's shoulder, and he turns his head to see who it is. Landman says that when they go to the city of Chinyan, they might find an iron deposit on the way, but the prince decided that he would go alone. The princess has already solved all the city's affairs that night, and now she can leave with him. On the other hand, the prince's sleeve is being tugged by his maid Sancheng. She also wants to take care of her master and go with him, but she is needed in Tanglan. She obeys her master. The girl promised to listen to her master, and she is forced to agree with his decision, although she is not happy with it. The prince and princess's road is deserted, and it passes a terrible lake with a red liquid. It's a good thing they have wolves, otherwise they wouldn't have spent a lot of energy on the wire. The wolves suddenly stop, as if they have noticed some danger, and do not go further. The princess says that there seems to be someone here, and the prince confirms that he is also very uneasy. The wolves are baring their fangs. The prince shines a flashlight, and the princess says that he always picks up strange things somewhere. The prince illuminates the lake with a red liquid. It is covered with large bubbles. Obviously, it's something big and scary. And the princess says it doesn't matter what it is. They can handle it together. The prince's pupils dilate at what he sees, and he recognizes the creature in the lake. A fiery, red-eyed water dragon emerges from the lake with its mouth open. The prince shouts to the princess to move away immediately to avoid being struck by the dragon. It seems impossible that this animal is still alive and here. The fire dragon opens its mouth wide, and the prince and princess can get into it, but they have to be careful. The dragon is throwing stones around with all its might, and you have to be careful not to get hit. The princess says that the dragon was locked in a dungeon, and there are large wounds on his body that he could have gotten when he was breaking out of the dungeon. He wants to destroy them, and it will be difficult for them to pass this lake with red liquid, and there is only one way out. The prince is determined to fight the monster to victory. The princess fully supports him, and she is also ready to take a punch. The water dragon releases fire from its mouth, its eyes glowing in the dark. It looks like he plans to burn Li Yugo and Landman. The best solution in this situation is to scatter in different directions, so the dragon will not be able to focus on one person. The prince's wings appear behind him, and he is able to fly away from the dragon. An incredibly powerful stream of fire erupts from the fire dragon's large mouth. This time the prince was lucky. The pillar of fire passed him by and did not hit him. The prince teases the dragon with a small worm because it can't even fly. The dragon decides it's time to switch to the princess. The girl is protected by wolves, and she asks the prince to watch his feet. The prince opens his mouth in surprise and bulges his eyes, saying that this is impossible. It is located above a lake, from which other strange monsters emerge. It seems they are finished. The prince has forgotten that this is a lake where monsters like to hide and then unexpectedly attack. The prince asks the princess to be careful because if they get hurt, these monsters will definitely grab them. He tells the princess to focus on the worm behind her back. The prince provokes the dragon to make mistakes, saying that it is easy to escape from such a stupid animal like him. Four hours later, the prince wipes the sweat from his brow and says that he's very tired of hiding. The dragon is also tired, lying with his mouth open and breathing heavily, while the prince picks at his zine from behind a stone. The princess sees the dragon's exhaustion and says that he can't take it anymore. The princess says that her fiery spear will do the trick, she will cover him, and the prince should stab him in the wound. The red fiery water dragon is completely exhausted and cannot resist. The prince accepts the princess's tactics and fully agrees with her. Although the dragon is wounded, it should not be underestimated and you need to find its weakness. The prince saw a place on the dragon through which its power escapes. If this is indeed it, he can completely destroy the dragon. The princess and the prince can defeat the fire dragon, whose head rises above the lake. The body of this dragon has not only wounds, but also a leech that fed on it. The prince says that it was not easy to cope with the fiery water dragon, but God helped them. He stands on the dragon's back and uses his spear to deliver the last fatal blow. The prince is already satisfied with his work, with the destruction of such a powerful dragon. A storm rises over the lake, which the prince did not see. 
The princess shouts at him where he looks. This is not the final victory. The monster is still alive in agony, letting out the last of its fire. The prince swings his spear at him with all his might, and he has to finish off the dragon. He manages to cut the fiery water dragon in half. The prince and the princess go down to the ground and run to the motionless dragon. They're happy that they were able to kill a dragon of this level, and it's good that it was wounded earlier. They say that the scales can be used to make good armor and the meat can be given to wolves. It is a real treasure. Let the wolf leader take everything, and then they will sort it out. The princess agrees. Li Yuguo and Lanmen take large knives and begin to cut up the dragon's carcass. They have almost figured out that the most valuable thing about a dragon is its head. It is a source of power, and craftsmen can create many weapons with its energy. The princess tells the man that she wants to help him get energy. This desire made her eyes light up. She wants to see what the dragon's energy looks like. The prince sees the dragon releasing poison from its mouth and warns the princess to stand aside. However, before she can move away, the dragon's venom hits the princess. She didn't think that this snake could be conscious after being cut, and she had to remove the poison as soon as possible. The princess almost faints and says that it looks like it's too late. The prince assures her that everything will be fine. He will increase her vitality. He came back from the dead to protect her, and if he fails, he will be doomed to die again and again. The princess says that she has been wounded by the poison of a Wuha monster and cannot be saved. He needs to find her mother, otherwise they both may die. She knows how dangerous this place is, not even wolves can take them out. The prince ties the princess to the wolf's back and orders her to take her home as soon as possible and inform the king of thieves. In a city with no anti-venom, Landman can only die slowly. Like a flash, the idea of saving the princess comes to the prince's brain. To save the princess, he urgently needs to find the city of Qinyan. The events are transferred to the city of Xinyang, and we see the city's entrance gate. The central square of the city is quite crowded, with shops, horse-drawn carriages, and people chatting. The prince stands in front of the palace gate, holding his wife in his arms, and the guards mistake him for a beggar and send him away. He asks for help. He really needs to see the Empress of Medicine. The guards laugh at the fact that a dirty beggar has come to the Empress of Medicine. She does not help three categories of people. The guard counts these categories on his fingers. People of unknown origin, the poor, and lovers. Landman asks the prince to abandon her and bury her in the northern lands so that she can see the sunrise every day. Hugging the princess, Li Yuguo tells her that he will not let her die. On his scale, it's only 8%, but he created this world and knows the empress better than anyone. The prince is attracted by a magic ring to generate money. Holding his beloved in his arms, he hands the guards several boxes of gold. The prince says he has information about the poison emperor, and the guards are surprised by the amount of gold. The information about the Emperor of Poisons was of great interest to the palace guards. They let the prince and princess into the palace and show them where to go. The sun illuminates the palace of the Empress of Medicine, drawing fanciful patterns on the roof. The prince's hands twist the towel with the water flowing from it. The Emperor of Poisons and the Empress of Medicine were lovers. One killed people, the other saved them. Then the Emperor of Poisons and they became enemies. The prince looks at the princess with tenderness and hopes that the Empress of Medicine will be able to help them. The Empress of Medicine is still interested in the Emperor, and if you use this information correctly, she can help. The Empress of Medicine appears next to the prince and says that this girl is the Princess of Nolan. The prince looks at the Empress in surprise, wondering how she could know this information about the princess. The Empress continues to say that the girl was bitten by a poisonous snake and that she would not last long. The prince says that the empress is very clever. His wife has suffered from the poison of a red-eyed water dragon, and he asks to save her. The empress says that the red-eyed water dragon is a Wuha level monster, and if the prince wants her help, no amount of gold will suffice. The prince says that he has recently seen the emperor of poisons, but the empress does not want to hear anything about it. But despite this, the prince says that the emperor seemed very tired. The Empress is interested in this information, and she asks what is wrong with the Emperor, and the Prince says that it seems that the Emperor misses someone. The Empress was hurt by this information, and she said that he hadn't used his hammer for a long time. So why did he leave? Poison of this level is not easy to cure, so he will have to pay a high price. The Prince says that the price is not important to him. He will definitely do everything. The Empress of Medicine moistens the Princess's lips with a piece of ice, which will stop the spread of poison in the body. 
She tasks the prince with finding the medicinal raw materials on the list within three days. The prince reads the list, everything will be easy to find except for the 500-year-old ginseng. The princess regains consciousness, opens her eyes, and calls for her husband. Li Yuguo leans over her bed, saying that it was his fault for letting her bite him, and the princess wants to know why he treats her so well. The first thought that came to the princess after she regained consciousness was that she was not worthy of being the prince's wife. The prince does not want to hear these words of the princess and covers her mouth with a kiss. This kiss switches the princess's thoughts in a different direction. Li Yugu helps Lanman because she is his beloved wife. The princess covers her head, blushes with shame, and thinks she hates the prince. The palace begins to move. An earthquake seems to be starting. The princess and the prince jump out of bed. A huge man enters the palace and shouts for the prince to come out to him. The couple did not recognize the fat man. They thought he had come to fight. This is Zhuang Zhuang, an old friend of Yuguo's, the empress of medicine's younger brother, who, like the prince, loves to gamble. According to the novel, after Ye Chiang killed Li Yuguo, he came to the city of Qinyan, and this fat man put obstacles in his way. Friends who haven't seen each other for five years rush to meet each other and hug each other. The fat man compliments the princess, and she reminds him that she told him not to touch the prince again. Zhuang Zhuang says that they haven't seen each other for a long time and offers to go out to play so as not to disturb his princess. The princess holds the prince by his clothes so that he will pay attention to her. She reminds him that his mother is in the paint shop, and he needs to go for her, the prince remembers. The friends have left the palace and are walking along the city's main street. The prince told us that his mother was still alive. A maid was in the fire, and he thought his friend was yelling at him. They are walking along the embankment, and a sailboat is standing by the pier. Zhuang Zhuang explains that these are all people of the Ting Yang school, which monopolized all water resources and is now raking in the money. The prince asks if this school is really based on robbers, that it is impossible to talk about this topic because you can pay with your life. The prince is upset by his friend's response, but he understands. Zhuang Zhuang brings Li Yuguo to the city's paint shop. The prince sees the entrance to a building with a brightly colored sign. Zhuang Zhuang and the prince cross the threshold of the workshop and want to ask the workers for help. The workers run away in fear, shouting that the Silk King has come. Zhuang Zhuang leans over one girl to ask her something, and she screams that she needs to be rescued because she is being raped. The prince asks if there is a woman named Chen Shui, and the woman replies that she is in the backyard, but that he shouldn't go to her because it will make Huang angry. That's the name of the city manager, who usually deals with obscenities. Li Yuguo runs to the backyard. His friend catches up with him and asks him to wait. In the backyard of the studio, a woman is standing with a fat man who asks her why she is shy. He says that if she is his, she will live a luxurious life. A woman with tears in her eyes says that women get better with age. But what does he need her for? She asks him to go elsewhere. He says he's been waiting for her for three months, so she's done being capricious. The prince bursts into the courtyard, saying that Juan should be in charge of city affairs, not seducing women on trains. Juan was furious shouting at him who he was for daring to interfere with him and ordering his servants to break his spine. The prince tells them that they do not have the strength to fulfill his order. The prince hits one of his assistants in the face with his fist. Juan is furious and shouts at the prince that he is from the city palace and if he touches him, he will be sorry. The prince shouts to the steward to get out with his supporters. Juan turns around and walks away, threatening the prince that he remembers him well. The prince hears someone calling his name, and turns toward the sound. The rescued woman asks if it is him. Li Yuguo wonders if she is really his mother. When Lumen saw her face, Yuguo's memories of her immediately appeared in his mind. To make her son feel at ease, she lowered herself to the life of ordinary people, and the once rich woman became a worker in a paint shop. The prince is hurt by the realization of what his mother did for him. He apologizes to his mother for being a bad son and forcing her to endure such humiliation. Ten years have passed since they said goodbye, and the son has grown into a wonderful young man. Zhuang Zhuang is watching them embrace, happy to see his friend reunited with his mother. A woman turns to the prince's mother and asks if this handsome young man is really her son. It's Mrs. Zhao, and she asks Chen Shui if she has treated her badly all these years, and her mother replies that no, she has gotten along fine. Why then did her son dare to hit Lord Huan, a man from the city palace, the prince owes him no apology. 
The prince asks the lady if she is the owner of the shop, and Zhao confirms it, asking if he wants to stand up for his mother because the workers must obey her. The prince says that he is buying her shop and giving her a lot of lynchia. The woman says that he is rich, and now the paint shop will be his, and the mother asks where he got so much lynchia. My mom shouldn't think badly of him. He earned it all himself. Yu Guo and Zhuang Zhuang have been walking around the city for so long and can't find Jin Seng. The fat man suggests replacing it with Chinese cabbage, which is easy to find. The prince asks if his friend knows where he can find Jin Seng, and he says that it will cost 3,000 ling on the black market. Li Yu Guo is satisfied with this price and is willing to buy Jin Seng to save his beloved. The friends go to a shop where the shopkeeper says it is closed, but the prince wants to buy it. The seller asks for 100 liang. The prince gives him 120 liang. The shopkeeper runs out, while Joan says that the store can't be worth that much. The prince shows a hidden grate that opens a secret door in the store. Yu Guo shows the second secret passage that opens behind this lattice. The prince says that there used to be a tavern here where robbers used to hide their treasures. Then the Chinyan school killed the robbers, and this place was never found. The prince learns about this city from the owner of the school of Isthmian power. The friends have found a secret cache full of treasures, and the amount of treasure is impressive. On one chest sits a leaning model of a skeleton, which could be a demonic puppet. Lumen did not write about it in his novel. His friend is satisfied that all the money he lost was returned. Puppets are divided into three types, with the lowest level puppets requiring less energy for the simplest functions. Puppets of the highest level are endowed with incredible power and feed on evil energy. The prince wants to test the energy of the red-eyed water dragon. Then the events move to the red building of the Chinyan school. The head of the school, a family in red clothes, sits with folded arms in meditation. He feels that a Wu Hua level aura has appeared somewhere nearby. He gives his students the task of finding the source of this aura and determining whether it is a friend or an enemy. The prince is amazed that his demonic puppet could release the power of the highest level. We have to get out of here because this puppet can attract other masters. The prince's friend is surprised that they are already leaving. He does not realize how cool this puppet is. The prince has an incredible idea. And then the events are transferred to the care home. Yuguo shows the puppet to his wife and it looks like a human being. Landman asks if he wants to dress her in human skin. The princess accuses the prince of destroying a human being in order to have the skin for this puppet. The puppet in human skin looks natural. It has eyes with a surveillance camera, a speaker system with a set of sounds, and princess clothes. The prince likes this idea, and it needs to be perfected. A puppet dressed in human skin and clothes becomes very similar to a living person. Yuguo hopes to realize his plans with this stunt. He can control the puppet's movements with his mind, and the puppet's skin is like that of a real person. The prince wants to use the puppet to buy him medicine. The marionette went shopping. Her beauty is admired by everyone. She looks like a goddess. The girl is confidently moving forward. She does not worry about spoiled men. The puppet hears someone calling her, and she turns in the direction of the sound. These are students of the Chinyan school. They say that a Wu Huan master has come to town. Maybe it's her. The girl says her name is Gigi Taimei, which means too beautiful. She is one of the five main families, so it is no wonder that she has already been able to reach such a high level. One of the school's students asks her why she came to their place, and she says she is looking for 500-year-old ginseng. The students of the Chinyan school invite her to their house. They have a medicinal field and there must be ginseng there. The girl goes to school. People admire her beauty, say that she has a very beautiful name and it suits her very well. The prince thinks that they have blown it out of proportion. In this world, everyone looks only at appearance and origin. The school representatives thank her for bringing new colors to their lives, and the mayor decided to meet her personally. The prince saw the golden sparrow through the eyes of the puppet, and this is very appropriate now. Huang, warn him not to offend Ji, otherwise their city will come to an end. And in his head, the prince has a perfect plan for revenge against his mother's offender. He hits the fat man with a stream of force through a girl puppet. He falls to his knees and begs for mercy because he does not understand what he has done wrong. The girl says that when she went into town, she saw him harassing women in a paint shop. He justifies that he came to pick up the fabrics he had ordered and asked for help, but the girl does not believe him. The owner of the school says that there is no one in their town with her level of energy, so she needs to be accepted very well. The puppet girl is invited to dinner. 
given an 800-year-old ginseng root, and they hope she will accept the gift. The root is brought in a very beautiful package, and she is surprised that the root is so old. She thanks them for their kindness and hopes that they will accept a fire crystal as a token of her gratitude. The men are amazed at the size of the fire crystal, and they are not surprised that one of the five main families carries such a large, pure crystal. Representatives of the school offer to pay for this generous gift. The puppet refuses wine and food and says she's on a hunger strike. She explains that fasting helps to cleanse the esophagus, and that instead of eating, you can feed on spiritual energy. The students of the school recognize that this is a new level of skill and decide to go on a hunger strike with the girl. One of the students takes the girl for a walk in the backyard and asks her if the capital is big and if she is married. The prince, controlling the puppet, thinks that being beautiful is difficult, but this guy has a love affair. The girl feels the energy of the Wu Wang master. It doesn't look like any of theirs. It must be people from the Yinsha school. He explains that they are at odds with this school for the right to use the clear moon cave. Luman is surprised to find a clear moon cave. He did not describe it in the book. A cave is a place of solitude, and if you have a sufficient root of life, you can get a lot of useful things there. Who kicks the door of the school and shouts that Chinyan school is a snotty school? The boys of the Yinsha school are calling for a fight, and whoever wins will use the cave. The head of the school, Chinyan, says that they agreed to take turns using the cave and will give it back in three years. The guy does not compromise. He says that in three years everything good has been taken away from the cave. He is ready to fight. The girl asks how to get into this cave on a clear moon. The guy looks at her and asks who she is. He is already captivated by her beauty. He asks where such a beauty came from and if she will go with him. The representative of Chinyan school says that this is Chi. She's from the capital, one of the five main families. The boys from Yinsha's school refuse to fight, deciding that it is better not to get involved with the family from the capital. They leave, saying that Chinyan is lucky but promise to return soon. The girl is invited to stay at the school, but she refuses because she has things to do and will not bother them. Maybe she will come back another time. The students of the school ask the head if the girl will join their school. They can fly high. Why would a talented girl stay in such a small place? The fact that she is strong will not change the fact that she is a woman. A student at the school says that a woman's weak point is her feelings, and as soon as he can take control of her feelings, she will become his puppet. Palace of the Empress of Medicine, the prince brought medicinal raw materials according to the list. The empress looks at the ginseng root and says that it is very expensive, and the prince thanks the empress for taking care of his wife's life. The empress takes the root and goes to begin treatment. The prince says he will prepare her a meal. The prince smells food and determines that someone is cooking rice porridge. He follows the scent and finds a guy kneeling in the garden doing something. When the prince came closer, he saw that the boy was simultaneously writing hieroglyphics and cooking. A prince cannot control his own body at the same time as he controls the body of a puppet, and this guy is doing two things at the same time as he does. Li Yuguo takes out the fried chicken leg that his mother had cooked and shows it to this guy. The meat smells delicious, and the prince will give the boy a leg if he tells him how he manages to prepare medicine and describe hieroglyphics at the same time. Holding a chicken leg in his teeth and stirring the dish in a cauldron with chopsticks, the boy says that there are two words, circle and square. A guy with few words draws a circle and a square in the sand with a stick. Then the events take us to the square in front of the capital's palace. Yun Sun Chung raises her hand. The sunlight hits her ring and it begins to shimmer with different colors. The girl is very upset. She misses Li Yuguo. She misses him. Yun Yu Chung asks why she is still worried. If she really liked him so much, he is gone. San Chung tells her not to worry about it, to let her sister think about herself. The Ye family Chong and his grandfather enter the palace courtyard. Ye Chong's return is good news, grandfather says. He has inherited the essence of the dragon monkey. His greens are absolutely pure. Ye Chong is happy to see San Chung, saying that she is getting prettier every day. The girl stops him and says that he could have conveyed the information about Li Yuguo properly. The father demands that the girl immediately apologize to the guest, but Ye Chiang's grandfather says that it's nothing. From the palace, we hear that all five families are present, and it's time to discuss the future wife of the emperor's son. San Cheng was brought to marry the emperor's son. She is a tool for achieving the family's goals, and she will definitely take revenge for Li Yuguo. Bi Ning Yi approaches Yun San Qin and Yun asks why she came to see her. 
she should be with Ye Chiang. The girl says that she feels very bad, Ye Chiang has made her a personal servant and she wants Yun's help. Ye Chiang and Bi Ningni destroyed Li Yuguo, so she won't help, even though Bi loves Ye very much. Kun is surprised at how one can love one's father's enemy. When Bi Ning's father was dying, the servant who brought him medicine saw that he had been killed by Ye Chiang. There is a rumor in the family's house that the turtle dragon ate Li Yuguo. The second head of the Kun family says that this is true, but Ye Kun denies it and is sure that he is wrong. The prince says that Li Yuguo is a known scoundrel and liar. The turtle dragon is his subordinate. He would not eat it. Yun Lao Ye can't believe that this guy could still be alive. Ye is convinced of this, but he cannot be left alive. San Cheng will not stop thinking about him. He is a great threat to them. Yun, he says that this guy is hiding well now, or does Ye Chiang have an idea how to lure him out? Yu Guo's greatest weakness is mercy. He can be blackmailed with his northern lands, and his entire population can be slaughtered. The following events unfold in the Qingyang assistance house. At the table are a princess, a prince, and the empress of medicine, who tells the princess that she is recovering well. The empress of medicine says that it is too early to rejoice. The princess needs a yin-yang flower from the water moon cave to restore her. Zhuang Zhuang, a fat man, enters the room and turns to Li Yuguo and says that he has received a letter. It is an urgent letter from the city of Tanlin, with three feathers stuck in it, signifying the highest degree of importance. The prince opened the letter, started reading it, and was very concerned about what he had learned. The princess asks what happened. The prince answers that there are Yun family spies in the city who have learned that he is alive and can harm the city. The princess says that they need to go back. The prince decides to cure the princess first to bring the yin-yang flower. He asks his friend and the medicine princess to take care of his wife while he goes to get the flower. The princess asks him to come back safe and sound, and he says not to worry. He's been training hard for several days. The puppet girl is sitting in a chair. The prince left a few clues last time and the people of the Qing Yang school will soon find the place. The prince hears someone knocking on the room where the baths are now. The knocking on the door becomes more insistent and the girl says that the guest can come in. She was visited by representatives of the Qing Yang school and they were happy to meet again. A schoolboy sees that the girl is not alone in the room and asks who is with her. She says that it is her brother. He is sick and she came to the city to cure him. He thinks that his younger brother is a great way to get closer to Tai Men. If guests need to talk about something, they can come in. After knocking, the boys from Yinsha's school also enter the room, and they say that Ji found them very easily. Representatives of the two schools are quarreling with each other, and Ji Tai Mei has come to town so everyone can see her. The girl stops the quarrel and says that if they have any business with her, they should speak directly to her. Representatives of the Qinyan school say that a group of their students has not yet returned from the Water Moon Cave, and perhaps they know or have heard something about it. The girl knows that hermits meditate in the Water Moon Cave. They set many traps, and the students could have fallen into one of them. If she knows how to save them, they are ready to act immediately. The girl can go with the elders and they can share the treasure they find there. The student asks if she needed ginseng to make medicine for her brother. The girl answers in the affirmative, and she also needs a yin-yang flower. The next place where events are developing is Chinyan School. The head of the school asks if the fool really came with Tai Mei. The students reply that he has not reached the level of Wu Ling and really looks stupid. Families have a fierce rivalry to prevent the fool from gaining power, so maybe they should change the target. The school principal asks Shui Chinair if she will agree to get closer to her foolish brother. The girl asks if he really wants her to start a relationship with this fool. Valadar tells his daughter that the future of their school depends on it. The head of the school asks his students to take Tai Mei to the Water Moon Cave and invite the students of Yinship School. He has a self-serving goal. If there are many treasures in the cave, let the students from Yinsha's school pave the way there. A puppet girl accompanied by representatives of two schools comes to the cave. The Water Moon Cave is located in a waterfall, and the girl is surprised that it is hot in the city. But here is the realm of ice and cold. Six months ago, a student passed by here and broke a tombstone, and since then this waterfall has appeared, and the student remained in the icy depths. The student's name was Lin Xiao. And he is the main secondary character, and it seems that as Ye Chiang's fate changes, so do the fates of others. The master of the Qinyan school manipulates fire to continue the journey to the cave. Travelers can see a very picturesque entrance to the cave. The girl is surprised that the entrance to the Water Moon Cave is a mirror. 
When they were about to enter the cave, someone called out to Ji Taime. These are Shui Chinger and her friend, and the girls say that the elder told them to look after Li Yuguo. The prince wonders why this doesn't happen to him in ordinary life, maybe because he doesn't have a Wu Huan sister. Everyone enters the cave, and a beautiful spectacle of the Ice Kingdom opens before them. The girl is very impressed by what she sees. She is amazed. The prince thinks that he should return to his body so that he can make a real breakthrough. Suddenly, Shui Kiner, who is supposed to be looking after the prince, starts kissing him. Her friend is angry and asks her why she is doing this, but Shui replies that she is not disgusted by the sick body. The girl replies that she is not disgusted either and wants to kiss him as well. It looks like a representative of a noble family decided to seduce her guest. The voices in the prince's head say that they envy him. The puppet girl looks at the cave and wonders what is happening. It seems that all the lost students of the Qingyang school are in a cave. They have turned into ice statues. There are not only students in the cave, but also pills and artifacts. Perhaps the pills and artifacts were the bait in this trap. One of the boys touches the ice block and asks if there are any pills to strengthen the spirit, and the girl shouts at him not to move. By touching the icy wall of the cave, the boy brought trouble on himself. He became a hostage of the cave and turned into an ice statue. The school's patron saint, Yin Sha Mo Ying, says that the spell must be broken, and if you find the eye of the spell, you can break it. Shui Ching Yu says we need to break all the glyphs. The girl is against it so they can awaken even more prohibitions. She says we need to find the eye of the spell. Ji Tai Mei sits down to meditate, and the elder asks everyone not to interfere with her, but to do as she says. A guy who wanted to chase after a girl is disappointed that she doesn't pay attention to him. In one of the icy depths, he sees a sword of very good quality. He is convinced that if he gets this sword, the girl will respect him. The girl is still meditating, and in her meditation she is already approaching the understanding of where the eye of the spell is. Suddenly something interrupts her concentration and she is horrified. Opening his eyes, he returns to reality and asks what is happening. Everyone begins to look around for something that disturbs the peace and sees Qin Yan. He has a sword. It's dangerous. The ice cave begins to move. A rift forms, and it grows larger and larger. From above, two huge ice monsters are approaching. The girl says she needs to gather all her strength to create a shield. The elder and Mo's patron saint take on one monster. She takes on the second. One of the ice giants hangs over those who came to the cave. The elder gives an order to everyone to concentrate their full strength. Compared to the ice monster, the game looks very tiny, and it engages in battle. The power of the ice giants is incredibly powerful, and it will be difficult to fight them. They scatter large ice chunks that fall into the Periu. The tactics of fighting giants are not very good because the power is spent very quickly, and it has a limit. The prince wanted to save it for the Battle of Tanlin, but now the main issue is to save lives. The elder and these two cannot resist the ice giants for long, even at their level of strength. The elder and the patron are almost exhausted, but they have not yet won. The girl concentrates her gaze and notices something that can help them. Inside the giants are ice crystals. These stones are purer than crystal. It seems that these evil spirits are puppets that move with the help of Lynchia. To win, you just need to get these stones and you're done. Ji Tai Mei flies over the giant, brings his sword over him, and begins to break the ice. The ice block is quite strong and cannot be easily broken to get the crystal. Chunks of ice are falling from all sides, being shattered by the ice giant. She has concentrated all her strength to win. It is a matter of life and death for everyone in the cave. She manages to get to the ice crystal and defeat the giant. The men are amazed at how she destroyed an ice giant with a Wu Hua level in one blow. The elder had never seen such a martial art in all his years at the Qinyan school. With two-thirds of the red-eyed water dragon's power left, the ice crystals can be given to Jun Shui. They will definitely be useful. The school representatives thank Ji Tai Mei for her rescue, and she says that now they need to focus on what to do next. There is more power here than at the entrance to the cave. We need to stay here and then move on with those who can. They will do as she says. Li Yugu closes his eyes and decides to switch his consciousness to his real body. You can't tailgate. Shui Ching Yu hugs the prince, holding him to his chest, and he is extremely pleased. It opens away from the girl's body because it risks suffocation. The girl says that her father ordered her to be with him, even though he is a fool and much better than the impudent and rude son of the town's mayor. The prince gave away his state of mind with his gaze, and the girl was afraid that he might have understood her. Li Yuguo comforts the girl, telling her not to cry, then she becomes ugly, and the girl likes his care. Representatives of the Qingyang school advise what to do next. 
don't take any risks. It's better to start cultivating and let the students of the Yin Sha School scout the road. The elder says that they don't care if the representatives of the Yinsha School die. Meanwhile, students of Yinsha School say that Qin Yan School was theirs. It was taken away by force, so now they have a good chance. Most patron is sure it's time to pay the bills. The prince sits at the entrance to the ice cave and analyzes the events of the last few days. He has finally reached the level of Wu Lin, but his body is not yet able to draw so much energy into itself, so he's still on the middle step of this level. Mo says that they have to go. There are many dangers in the cave. Ji Tai Mei answers to gather the ten best students. The rest can stay here. They continued on through the cave, and the students wondered what the girl would do next. From behind an ice block, one of the students of Incha's school spies on them. The girl and her companions reach the ice warriors, who block their way further. Each warrior is covered by a strong ice shield. The warriors periodically lower their shields and raise their ice spears, all in sync. You have to get through the warriors. There are a lot of them. If the shield breaks, they will simply be destroyed. There must be some kind of clue. Mo says that it is possible to run through the shields when they are raised, but the Lord says that it is not easy. Lord Mo is unhappy that they are trying to provoke him into a conflict. He wants to leave immediately. They try to bring him back, but he doesn't listen, convinced that he needs to catch the right moment. Mo runs very fast through the ice shields of the soldiers, trying to get to the other side. Onio lowers his shields and raises his bayonets upward, and he falls on them. Ice spears pierce his body through, and everything around him turns red. There is no way to get through these warriors. The representatives of the Yin Shur school are desperate for the loss, and their rivals are gloating. A cold, prickly wind rises above the ice warriors. Ji Tai Mei is running with ice shields. They try to stop her. She says that the shields rise when a cold wind comes. She fearlessly flies forward, trying to outrun the soldiers while the wind is blowing. The girl managed to run. The wind died down and the soldiers lowered their shields. Representatives of both schools are surprised by the girl's speed and intelligence. She has reached the outer chambers of the cave, but sees no flower anywhere. Suddenly she sees an icy pulpit with a book on it. The book that the girl approaches is called The Gift of Omniscience. With this gift, you can learn the secrets of the universe, and with the help of yin and yang, you can look into the future. The girl's eyes light up from what she sees around her, and the book falls out of her hands. She sees a lot of high-quality lenses. It seems that all the treasures of the water moon cave are stored here. She sees the ghost of a hermit in a water moon cave, and yin and yang flowers grow nearby. It's great. The prince will be able to save his beloved. The girl is reaching out for a flower. The cave hermit touches the girl's forehead with his finger, and the cave begins to shine. The prince feels that the puppet's frame has become stronger by a whole level, and the power of its evil has increased. The prince loses control of the girl's body, and the prince does not understand what happened. A girl sits on the icy floor in the middle of an empty cave room. Tzu returns, and they ask her what she has found, and she replies that she has found everything, but there is nothing in the cave. The owner says that this place is very unusual and that it is worth returning to, and the girl agrees. Shlala Insha doesn't agree with just leaving. They lost several people to get here and have to look for the scab. The girl says that while they are searching, she will rest a bit and sit down to meditate. Meanwhile, the prince notices that all the people from Yinsha's school have disappeared. He needs to find out what really happened. It's not just for fun. He sees two strong students from the Inca school near the Ice Warriors. Moke asks his assistant if they have installed the artifacts and he replies that they have done everything according to the order. The prince realizes that Yin Shi's school has begun to implement its plan of revenge. Everything that is happening now in this cave can lead to its destruction. The students of Yin Shi school felt that someone had overheard their conversation, and they wanted to find out who it was. The prince has to play the fool again so that they don't realize who he really is. He tells them that his tummy wants to yum, 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 and he wants to drink milk. He plunges his face between the girl's breasts and hugs her by the waist. The students are worried that the prince will bring them trouble, but the girl says that it's okay. He's just an idiot. The prince heard from the school students that the time for revenge had come. They had prepared a formation of 36 stars, and they wanted to kill their enemies. Shui Kinner finds the prince and asks him where he has been all this time. He throws himself into her arms and talks about a line of stars, and she asks if he really means that Yinsha's school is going to attack. She runs to Qin He and Qin Yun, interrupts their meditation, and tells them about the plot. The students of Qin Yan's school gather together and receive an order to prepare for battle. 
The Yinsha school has already placed its atrofacts, 36 stars, all over the cave. Qin Yan's students simultaneously begin to feel weak in their bodies. They don't understand where their strength is going. The Yinsha school has started using a system that takes away their strength. Mo Lin is asked if he is not afraid that Ji will find out about everything, and he replies that she does not suspect anything. The prince is attacked by two students of Yina's school, and Shui says that she will protect him. Although she is forced to protect him, the girl fulfills her duty in good faith. If he succeeds in stopping this battle, perhaps his scale will grow even more. Ji approaches the patron saint of Mo and asks if he can go with her, and he is surprised by the offer. She wants to know why they want to kill the people of the Chinyan school. It's her business. You shouldn't get involved in this feud. The girl says that the cave is dangerous. You shouldn't start a war here. Mo says that he loved the daughter of the old mayor, but she was deceived and he was disgraced and he wants revenge. She asks why he didn't stop them then. Not all the people at the school are bad. She shouldn't stick her nose in. She's already lost a lot of strength in the fight against the ice giants. His eyes light up with anger, and he attacks the girl. He strikes hard, trying to reduce its strength. She is ready for battle and tells him they can play. He throws her to the ground, striking her with all his might. Representatives of the Ching Yang school are watching the fight, and they will intervene, but a little later. When the girl is in danger, they will be able to play on her emotions. Mo shouting, stretches out his arms to the girl and yells at her to come to him. She kicks him in the face, annoyed that he was reaching for her breasts. Her blow made his eyes darken, and the girl screams that she is hitting him. Another blow and he flies off to the opposite corner, losing consciousness. Mo regained consciousness after the blow, saying that it's no wonder she's at Wu Huan level. Her legs hit very hard. The girl, looking into the eyes of her opponent, asks if he's ready to continue the battle. With eyes burning with hatred, he replies that he is not ready. He says that it is already coming to an end. He knows what he will do next. Ji's hand is stuck with several pins of poison that Mo had stuck in it. Mo laughs that this is the poison of the Yadi Emperor himself, and even a Wu Huan master cannot bear it. Representatives of the Qin Yan school run to Ji Tai Mei's aid. At this time, the girl makes a powerful leap and pierces the enemy through with her spear, creating a large hole in his back. He did not expect such an attack and does not believe it is possible. She says that you have trained her to be resistant to poisons, and that these drops will not kill her. A puppet has no flesh, so poison is not terrible for it. The princess wins this battle and sends Lord Mo to the next world. The girl is holding a pill. She has little strength left after the battle, and this pill will compensate for her lost strength. Representatives of both schools begin to flock to the battlefield and ask what happened. A representative of Yinsha's school says that the main patron has always been impure in his thoughts, so he attacked the girl. He says that his actions have nothing to do with the school and asks her to forgive them all. The girl's goal is to get the yin-yang flower, and she will not blame anyone for what the main patron saint did. She pulls the poison needles out of her hand and throws them on the ground. She warns that if they decide to do away with her, she will not miss her opportunity. Shui Ching Yu asks Mo Kei if he is not afraid of Ji's wrath, and he replies that he is not. By then there will be only one fool left as a witness. Mo Kei hears the order to stop fighting. Ji Tai Mei has already destroyed the main patron. Mo Kei throws his sword to the ground, lying alone in the ice. He cannot believe that his father is gone. While the friend comforts the boy, the representatives of the two schools agree that they need to talk. The Ching Yang school had a disagreement with its main patron, and since he is no longer there, the feud can be ended. You can marry Brother Ji, who loves to Shui Ching Yu and Mo Ling, and then they will become relatives. But why would the Ji family, one of the five main families of the party, be from the lower class? The owner of the Yinsha school says his opponent's catchphrase that what he has done cannot be undone. The prince sits on his bed and reflects on the fact that he sent Ji Tai Mei to fetch the yin and yang flower. After he left the water moon cave, a technique called the gift of omniscience came to his consciousness. He closes his eyes and concentrates on the new technique. This technique allows him to see fluctuations in force and energy. Someone knocks on his door, obviously a woman. With his new gift, he can see through objects to the extent that he is strong. He is not supposed to give himself and his new gift away, judging by the figure behind the door of the Shui signer. A girl enters the room holding a box. She sees the boy lying on the floor and asks him where his sister is and why he is lying on the floor. The boy says that his sister has gone to do her chores, and he is on the floor because there is a worm. The girl asks him to get up as soon as possible. She has brought him something to eat. She is glad that Ji Tai Mei is not in the room right now. 
Otherwise, it would be difficult for her to realize her plan. She pours the wine, says it's very sweet, and gives him a glass. Shui then begins to undress seductively, taking off her clothes. She says she's going to take a bath and asks him not to drink all the wine. The prince wonders what she's going to do, if she really liked such a fool. He suspects something is wrong with the wine and swaps the glasses just in case. He is very interested in what else he can do with this gift of omniscience. He swears that it's just for the sake of training. He wants to see what happens in the bathtub. The girl was undressed and standing by the bathtub, which the prince could see through the closed door. He is wondering what other surprises await him with this new gift. The girl is sitting in a vat of water. She has a wonderful figure that the prince likes. You have to be careful with technology because it makes him anemic. The girl comes out of the bath in a translucent robe and says that she has already washed. Shui comes to the table and asks the prince why he hasn't drunk the wine, and he says that it's bitter and tasteless. The girl takes his glass and tries it. The guy is surprised that something is wrong with both glasses. The girl says that the wine is sweet and wants him to try it. The wine was poured from one decanter and something is wrong with all the wine. The prince refuses to drink wine from the girl's hands and shouts that he sees a worm somewhere. He hides his face in her chest, cries and says that he is afraid of worms. The door to the room opens and a girl enters. Mo Lin asks Shui why she decided to seduce the fool in this way. Mo says that she came on her father's orders. They have to be with this guy. She has been waiting outside for a long time and is very thirsty. The girl takes a glass and starts drinking the wine poured into it. The glass falls to the floor and breaks. It was an aphrodisiac that causes arousal. Mo bought it on black. The girls look at each other with loving eyes and tell each other how charming they are. The prince did not interfere with them and quietly left the room. The girls are lying on the bed, confessing their love to each other. The prince leaves very quickly. What happens in the room does not concern him. The prince sits on the stairs and studies the strength scale. His scale has risen to 19%. No wonder he went to the cave. Yi Chiang's scale rose by 2%, so it looks like he also got lucky. The princess goes outside and wants to return home. He asks her not to go so fast, to gain strength, to which she replies that she has almost recovered. Zhuang Zhuang's fat friend and the prince's mother run to them, shouting what happened. They received information that five families had sent a group of trained men to the northern lands to attack the city, and they needed to return. The princess tells her husband that they need to leave as soon as possible, and he agrees. The prince thinks that Ye Chong has guessed that he is not dead because he knows his relationship with the turtle dragon. The prince thanks the Empress of Medicine for her help in treating the princess. He gives her two books and some plants that he had found in the cave and apologizes for the modest gifts. The princess is very happy with the gifts he brought her from the cave. The Empress of Medicine gives him a book that describes hundreds of different medicinal plants. The prince is very pleased with this gift and thanks for the treatment. The King of Thieves and the maid San Cheng are standing near the city walls meeting someone. They see that Prince Li Yugu and Princess Lanman have gone to Tanlin. Yunfan asks why they returned so quickly. The prince says that five families are preparing to go to the northern lands. The prince gives San Cheng ice crystals, and she gratefully accepts the gift. Then he whispers something to her, and the girl does whatever he says. Then he takes out a bag and hands it to the princess, saying that it is for her. If she is in danger, she has to open it, and no matter what happens, it will always be there. Lightning flashes on the horizon, and it seems that a terrible storm is approaching. One of the guards says that the turtle dragon on the mountain of ghostly snakes was attacked. The turtle law protects the city, and if it is gone, the city will also be finished. The prince will definitely take revenge for everything. Li Yuguo orders everyone to gather, and they go to save the turtle dragon. The turtle dragon lies on a mountain, surrounded by the best warriors of the five families. He was wounded in the head. You can see the wounds, but he is bravely holding on. He defends his mountain and the city of Tanglin from the attackers of five families. He is being attacked from all sides, dealing him powerful blows. He dodges the arrows that fly at him, but the soldiers do not retreat. Yun thinks that the dragon is no longer capable of anything. Li Yuguo is gone, and the dragon has no need to protect him. The dragon will not submit to the soldiers and will defend his mountain and city. A powerful explosion is heard, and everything around is illuminated by a flash, which is how the new weapon works. The best soldiers of the army of the five families are scattered in different directions by the explosion. The Tanglin army enters the battle, and the prince says that he will deal with the head of the Yun. Yun Laogong tells the prince that he wanted to destroy the city to lure him out and did not think that he would show up on his own. 
The second chapter gives the order to take Yu Guo, and his soldiers run to fulfill it. This is the Eagle Watch, a specially trained combat unit of five families. The warriors of the Eagle Watch are all above the level of Wuvan, and the family is eager to deal with Yu Guo. The order to start the battle is given, and there are many arrows in the air at the same time. An assault takes place and many soldiers of the city of Tanlin did not survive it. Eagle Watch soldiers killed more than 20 people with a single shot. The prince sees that things are bad. There is a very big difference in strength. The morale of the soldiers has dropped. They may lose. The prince picks up the gong and makes several powerful strikes to draw attention to himself. Demotivated by the defeat on the battlefield, the soldiers gather around him. The prince says that the Yun family has repeatedly humiliated them. They have killed them and they will continue to allow them to commit outrages. Yuguo's words give hope to his soldiers and make them think that he is right. Residents of the city realize that there is no turning back. They have to take up arms against Tanglin. The princess takes an active part in the battle. She calls for fighting for the city, and the soldiers support her. The townspeople, led by the prince, are ready to launch a new assault. Their determination made the second head of the Yun family think about the further course of the battle. He orders his soldiers to change their position and prepare for a new offensive. The command to open fire is given, and the Eagle Patrol launches hundreds of arrows at their enemies. Residents of the town of Taglian defend themselves from arrows with shields, keeping their swords ready. Even the wounded soldiers courageously attack the Eagle Patrol soldiers, continuing the battle. The number of casualties on both sides is growing, and the soldiers are moving to close combat. Cannons are rolled out onto the lawn, a new development for the Battle of Tangmen. A fire cannon is being prepared for battle, and soldiers are loading the cannons with fireballs. The prince commands his army to start firing. All the guns are fired simultaneously, and powerful explosions are heard. The eagle archers are scattered by the new weapon, and the explosions do a lot of damage. Yun Fan reports that the victory in this battle is theirs. The prince is in the middle of a battle, with spears flying at him from all sides. The princess successfully covers her husband's back, for which he thanks her. The city's leaders, along with their subordinates, are united in this battle for their city. President Yun considered the people of Tanglin to be a bunch of losers, but today he has changed his mind. He shows his crown number and insects come to his aid. A swarm of locusts descends on the battlefield in a dark cloud, and there are a lot of insects. There are a lot of them, forcing soldiers to flee the battlefield. Yuguo knows that Head Yun can control these insects with his eyes. The soldiers who suffered from insect bites shout to the others to run away immediately. Locusts cause a lot of damage, leaving painful marks on the body. The prince immediately buys from Alimam the means to kill the insects. Now with this tool, they will be able to destroy all locusts. The prince gives Yunfan 20 boxes of this remedy to distribute to everyone. The townspeople start spraying the spray, asking the prince what it is that kills insects. Stray successfully copes with his tasks and the warriors clear everything around him of locusts. Chairman Yun is angry and recognizes that this time the victory is on the side of his enemies. He decides to fight Li Yuguo one-on-one, -on -one, knowing that his skill level is higher than the prince's. In his other essence, he appears before the prince, and the master's power restrains the prince's movements, and he cannot move. New air comes to Yuguo's aid. He wants to protect his master. However, Yun directs his power at him, and the warrior fails to resist. Yun inflicts a wound on him that is incompatible with further life. Seeing this, New Air's friends rush to his aid, hoping to save him. But in this battle, the forces are unequal, and the advantage is on the side of the Yun leader. The destruction of his friends makes the prince very aggressive, and he will definitely take revenge for them. He will never forgive the destruction of New Era, Niedra, and Mata. His essence is awakening in him. The head of the Yun does not recognize the essence that has awakened in the prince and does not know how to deal with it. Meanwhile, Lu Yuguo strikes his enemy from the back. The head of Yun's group was injured, preventing him from continuing the fight. He gathers his strength and grabs Li Yutang, asking if this is all his strength. Prince wants to break Yun's grip on him, who is holding him tightly by the neck. Head Yun, confident in his powers, squeezes the prince with all his might. Lan Mei and another entity come to the prince's aid. Head Yun intercepts the spear that the princess has pointed at him. He says that with such a blow she will not be able to destroy or injure him. The princess didn't take into account that a Wu Huan master is not so easy to destroy. He strikes with lightning speed, and the princess did not expect it and missed it. The impact throws her off and she hits her head on a tree. Yun grabs the prince by the neck and says that they no longer have a chance to win. 
He hears someone behind him shouting at him that he is a liar. Head Yun turns toward the voice to find out who is speaking to him. A sword blow pierces his body from the back, creating a wound. The girl says that all he needs to know is that he will go to the next world today. The wound in Chairman Yun's back is very large and his life force is leaking out of it. Yun cannot control his body and says that he is a representative of five families. For the girl, it doesn't matter. He insulted the weak and killed innocents using his power. She is not interested in Li's relationship with San Cheng. Striking again, the girl says that Yu Guo may or may not know San Cheng. The girl brings a sword over his head and says that these are his last moments of life. The head asks her to stop, but sees Feng Chin Yun flying to his aid to save him. Feng Chin Yun asks the girl to let his uncle Yun go, otherwise her entire family will be destroyed. The girl says that a watch of 8,000 eagles can destroy not only the city, but also the highest level sect in just one night. Yun says that she knows too much. He doesn't care what kind of relationship she has with Yu Guo, but she needs to get out. The girl says that this is a very generous offer, but she does not accept it. She gives the head one final blow and says that he must be destroyed. Feng Chin Yun says she's very smart and brave, but she destroyed a man from five main families and no one will forgive her for that. He warns her that she is the next target and should prepare to go into hiding. A fight begins between the girl and a family member of five families. The girl has to survive this fight with Feng Chin Yun even though he is stronger. This battle is watched by the land of Princess Lanman and the thief king Yun Fang. Yun Fang says that with the destruction of the Yun head, all the northern lands came to an end. The king of thieves asks the princess what she's going to do next. The princess is holding the letter that Li Yuguo told her to open in a moment of danger. She unseals the letter and carefully reads everything it says. Her determination wakes up again. She has already made up her mind and she hits the ground with her spear. The princess orders the soldiers to launch an attack and not to retreat under any circumstances. The warriors of the city accept a new battle that will decide their future. There are a lot of casualties on both sides of the battle and it is hard to say who is winning now. The girl who destroyed the head of Yun warns the soldiers of the danger. Feng Chin Yun approaches her and tells her to take care of herself first. He has to personally destroy the one who took his uncle's life. In the middle of the battlefield, the maid San Cheng Shui stands and asks what she should do. In her hand, she holds ice crystals from the water moon cave that the prince gave her. She recalls that if she eats them, she will forget her past, become a different person, and save the city and herself. She puts the crystals in her mouth and says that she will not let anyone harm Yu Guo. Yun Fan, the princess, and the warriors watch the girl transform into another person. They ask her to stop this transformation and return to them. But the girl has already shown her new icy self. Everything around begins to freeze and become covered with ice. Ice frost descends on the battlefield, covering the trees and grass. The enemy soldiers freeze. They are chained in ice blocks and cannot move. The princess, Yun Fan, and the townspeople watch the maid's transformation. The thief king realized why the prince was so protective of Jun Shui. She was the goddess of snow and ice. The girl changed in appearance. Her ears changed shape, and two ice horns grew on her head. She does not understand who she is, what is happening around her or why she is here. The prince wanted the girl to grow up slowly, but since there was such a great danger, he had to wake her up early. Since this one has been awakened, her memory can also be restored, and she can leave the city and go to her native place. Through the eyes of the puppet girl, the prince looks at the transformed and unrecognizable maid. He looks down and thinks that she will probably leave him too. Disappointed by this realization, he lies on the ground and watches the maid. A girl who has turned into a snow goddess recognizes her lord. The puppet girl's eyes show joy and she is happy that the girl recognizes her. She did not forget her master despite her reincarnation. The girl tries to understand what power she has and what she can control. The goddess takes off into the air and the surrounding space is transformed around her. The light of the new reality hits the eyes of the mannequin girl and blinds her. The prince seems to be waking up and analyzing what has happened recently. The heads of the five families will discuss how they did not expect so many interesting things to happen in the northern lands. Head Hua asks if this Li Yuguo has destroyed Uncle Yun, and Head Yun replies that when he is destroyed, everything will fall into place. Feng tells Ji that rebels have appeared in these places, and that it is necessary to take control of the northern lands. The snow goddess asks the heads of the families not to touch her master. In revenge, she will be able to freeze everything around her, and the wine will be destroyed. 
The head of the family wants her not to overestimate her true strength. She is hit by a powerful blow and her image of a snow goddess begins to disintegrate. It is very painful for a girl to transform to her previous appearance. It falls down on the way, losing its ice crystals and its power. The prince manages to catch his favorite maid, Jun Shui, in his arms. He asks why she returned to her previous appearance. When she began to feel that she was forgetting the prince, she spat out one crystal. The turtle dragon senses the aura of the five masters. Someone wants to destroy the northern lands from the face of the earth. The prince at his level will not be able to resist masters who are three levels stronger. He has only one way out. The puppet is discharged. The prince will give it a pill of Lord Yun and it will continue to function. The prince has a plan. He picks up his sword and sets off on his journey. He comes to the heads of five families for a frank conversation. The head of Yun says that he is a brave guy, and Li Guanyi did not live his life in vain by giving birth to such a son. The prince knows that the families have something to do with his father's death. When his father was betrayed, everyone chose to ignore it. The princess was offended by his words, saying that if it hadn't been for her father, he wouldn't have lived to see this day. The prince says that he does not love the daughter of his father's murderer, but only used her. He has nowhere to run to. Did she really think she was going to have a happy ending? He pierces her through with a sword and says that she will go to hell with him. He squashes a bag of red liquid near her body and her clothes are stained red. The prince apologizes. He doesn't want the whole town to go to the next world with him. The princess realized that her husband wanted to take the blame and save the city. Waving his sword, the prince shouts that everyone should immediately disappear from this world. The head of the Hua family is angry that the prince has raised his hand to his own wife. Suddenly, the turtle dragon appears to defend the prince. The prince asks him why he didn't leave, and he replies that the mountain of ghostly snakes is his territory, and he won't watch his friend being destroyed. The turtle dragon opens its mouth and a green egg rolls out. The prince deftly catches the egg in his hands and realizes that he holds the future of the mountain in his hands. The dragon is coming to an end. The future ruler of the mountain of ghostly snakes, the prince, is in the egg, and he must urgently flee. The prince promises to take care of the egg and the little turtle that will hatch from it. He calls Junxia to him, and they have to flee immediately. The turtle dragon gathers his forces and covers their retreat. Chairman Yun seems to have killed a girl with a Wu Huan level, and we must not let Yu Guo escape. They are hindered by the turtle dragon, who confidently covers his friend's departure. The angry Yun asks the dragon if he wants to die immediately. His power pierces the turtle dragon, but it continues to resist. It seems that the dragon decided to self-destruct and take them all with him. Chapter E concentrates his powers and uses them to save all family members. He creates a fence around himself with a large number of fire swords. These swords are aimed at the turtle dragon and have to destroy it. They pierce the dragon in many places, causing permanent wounds. The dragon's life ended with dignity. He says goodbye to the prince and leaves. The earth opens up beneath him and he flies into the abyss of eternity. The smoke and dust that had been hovering over the battlefield gradually dissipated. A huge sinkhole was formed in the place of the turtle print. The heads of the families are not happy with Li Yuguo's quick escape and want him to be caught immediately. The prince and his maid cross the suspension bridge and find themselves on the other side of the abyss. The girl is confused and asks the prince where they should go next. The prince says that she is the queen of the northern state, the goddess of ice and snow, and must return and take everything that belongs to her. The girl says that she can't do anything, and the prince consoles her that her strength should be enough to defend herself. If they continue to walk together, they will definitely be caught and will not be able to defend themselves. He also asks her to call him brother because he treats her like a sister. The prince asks to avenge him if he is gone, and if he survives, they will definitely meet. A hunch warns the prince that someone is spying on them. He tells the girl to leave because someone is here, and she goes across the bridge. Ji Wushan, one of the heads of the five families, comes out to Li Yuguo's lawn. The prince is pleased with this meeting, and it seems it's his time to get even. Chapter E wonders why the prince betrayed his wife if they had always fought side by side. He bends down to the red puddle, the liquid left after the battle is still fresh, which means the wound was real. Did he really use the landmen on landmen? The head asks if the princess knows the girl who killed Lord Yun, and the girl has a hunch that it might be his mistress. He tells the princess not to grieve. Yu Guo is not worth her tears, and the heads of the families have already gone in search of him. Together with the watch of 8,000 eagles, he disappears and the girl looks after him. 
Lan Men begins to cry as she recalls her last conversation with her husband. The King of Thieves leans over her, asking what really happened. The girl holds out the bag Li Yuguo gave her when they returned to Tanlin. The bag contains a note that says she must give it up for the sake of the city's immortality. She swears that if something happens to her husband, she will make five families pay for it. The prince and the head of the Tzu stand opposite each other near the abyss. If only Ji Wu Shuang is with the prince, they have scattered their search. A prince with his level has no chance of winning. He has to fake death and run away. Ji says that Yu Guo is very clever because he was able to confuse the heads of the families. The prince attacks first, but the head stops him and does not support the fight. He says that we need to make his death look more realistic, and he will have a chance to save his life. The head needs the prince's help. They have long been dissatisfied with the Temple of Heavenly Spirits. He warns Yu Guo to beware of the treacherous Ye Chiong and not to make his friend suffer. The head's gaze changes. He focuses and takes unexpected actions. Ji attacks the prince, who does not expect the blow, flies away, and falls on his back. They are approached by the heads of the families, and it is good that Ji decided to act separately, otherwise the prince would have run away again. The prince wonders why the boy who was accepted into the princess's house and is now being hunted by five large families is so lucky. Chapter G points a sword at the prince and asks if he will admit his guilt. Let the attacker act. The prince says that he has acted according to his conscience all his life and is not guilty of anything. He is ready for his marriage. Ji's sword pierces through the prince. The head did what Yu Guo asked. Ji whispers that if the prince survives, he must travel to the east and find a man called the leader of the wolves. He discreetly places a gold ring in Yu Guo's hand. The body of the prince, pierced through with a sword, flies away from the head of the Ji. He flies from a height to the very bottom of the abyss, head down. Last time, the prince pretended to be dead, so they had to fight him themselves. Ji Wushuang asks Chairman Yun if he doubts his strength. A servant runs to the Yun and tells him that Sun Chung has escaped from the palace. Chairman Yun, he has to go home. He has to look for his daughter. Ji Wushuang is sewing over a precipice and looking down at the river. The body of a prince floats in the water, face up with his eyes closed. His face is pale and a red liquid is leaking from his split lip. Sanchin runs as fast as he can through the forest, trying to escape from a possible pursuit. She hears someone's footsteps. Someone is trying to catch up with her and bring her back. She tried to be careful and avoid places where she could be caught. Ye Chiang comes out to meet her and tells her to go home because he doesn't want to use force against her. She replies that the support of Yi's family and the fact that he has a higher level will not stop her. Ye Chiang convinces the girl that she is mistaken and Li Yuguo is not worthy of her. Five families have gone in search of him and he may be gone. Sun Cheng does not believe his words. She is convinced that no one could harm the prince. She tells Zunz to shut up. Nothing could have happened to Yu Guo. These words make him angry, and he doesn't understand why someone like Li would be so mean to her. His second self bursts out of him, shouting that San Chen should belong only to him. He repeats to the girl that she can only be his. San Cheng crosses swords with Yi, saying that he is a hypocrite who believes he is always right and stops at nothing. The boy replies that if it does not belong to him, then Li Yu Guo Wan will not get it either. The essence of the worm monkey is very angry and cannot control its jealousy. The girl strikes the monkey's head with all her might, and it staggers. Ye Chiang does not understand what he is doing wrong that the girl is so cruel to him. They are locked in a fight, and no one is going to give in. Bi Ning Yi approaches Ye Chiang, and she wants to say something, but he shouts at her and orders her to leave. The girl is persistent and does not give in. He shouts that she did not hear his order and raises his hand to strike her. Suddenly his sword falls from his hand and falls to the grass at his feet. Binini punches him in the stomach with all her might, causing a large wound. She accuses him of not loving her, using her, and killing her father. The girl asks why he deceived her. She had expectations, but it turned out that she had let a wolf into the house. Ye Chiang grabs the sword and tells Binning that she will go to the next world with him. A stranger comes to the girl's aid and fights with Ye Kun. He cuts off his arm up to the elbow and it flies off to the side. Ye Chiang screams in fear and terrible pain. His wound is open. Bei Nini asks the stranger why he saved her, but he doesn't answer. He goes over to San Cheng to see if she's okay, and she says that the others will be here in a moment. They need to go. The stranger's voice sounded very familiar to Bei Nina, and she wonders who it could be. Ye Chiang was mortally wounded. Not even a miracle can save him, so they leave him here. Yi asks him not to leave her. They have been friends for three years. Has she forgotten about it? He tries to get up gathers his strength and says that he will live. 
San Cheng and Bi Ning and the stranger reach the river, and San Cheng says that she will go on alone. There are a lot of people here who can expose her, so it's better for her to go on alone. The girl thinks about Li Yuguo's fate and hopes that he is okay. The stranger asks the girl to be careful, but he has to keep going. Bei Nini recognizes the voice. It is her brother, Simon. The girl takes his hand and asks why he ignores her. He asks her to let him go. His mission was to save Sun Chung and let Bi Ning think about how much they loved each other as children. From that moment on, they will be apart and never meet again. She is left all alone in despair, does not know what to do next, and begins to cry. Then the events move to the city of Tanlin, the palace of the princess. Soldiers are training on the parade ground, practicing their spear skills. The princess is very unhappy with the way the soldiers are improving their skills. With such poor training, they will not be able to defeat the Eagle Watch of the five families. They need to train more. Yun Fan runs up to the princess and asks if there is any news about Li Yuguo. The King of Thieves is sad to report that there is no news. The princess needs to rest, but she says she's not tired. The prince sacrificed everything for the city, so she wants the city to become strong. Then the events are transferred to an ordinary village hut under a straw roof. Li Yuguo is lying in bed with his grandmother fussing over him, asking when he will regain consciousness. The guy starts coughing, regains consciousness, opens his eyes. The grandmother calls out to someone and happily says that the boy has finally woken up. Li Yuguo does not know where he is. He remembers falling into the river after being hit by Ji Wu Shuang. A man comes into the room holding the prince's belongings. This couple saved him. Jun Shui is in a snowy kingdom wearing a fur coat and wondering where she has ended up. The prince also remembers the girl and thinks about where she is now and what happened to her. Ji Wushin knocked him out with a single blow, and now he has no strength to heal his wounds. His rescuers ask him how he feels, give him his things, and he thanks them for their care. The grandmother tells the boy to rest, and she will cook him something to eat in the meantime. Among his belongings, Yugal finds the ring that Sue gave him. He takes the ring in his hand and the rays begin to emanate from it, forming a projection. This projection he sees in front of him seems familiar. G congratulates him on his survival and tells him that he will get answers to his questions later. All their lives, the G family worked hard for the Temple of Heaven. Ji's aunt fell in love with Nalan Sheng. He became Ji's uncle. He was always just, but Nalan Jie betrayed him, and eventually he died a cruel death. Aunt Ji was then also ruthlessly murdered and sent to the next world. The entire Ji family feels hatred for the Temple of Heaven because they sent a man from the family, Nalan Shen. To train your puppet, you can try the glass sword of the gift of heaven, but the master sword of love and the sword of thoughts must not be seen by the concubine. Ji knows about Ji Taimei because the prince used this name in the city of Qinyan. Shui Qinger and Mo Ling married, and the fighting between the Qinyan sect and the Yinsha sect ceased. The prince is surprised that the two girls got married. They have such an open relationship. The projection says that San Cheng has fled to Jiangsu and she may be caught there. Li Yuguo has to meet the girl immediately. She needs his help. As long as the prince was in the north helping Jun Shui, nothing would happen to San Cheng. The prince urgently needs to meet Xian Cheng. The road from the capital to the city is long. She needs to be counted, and now she must be in the forest of sages. He asks his grandmother what kind of place it is, and she answers that it is a village in the mountains in Donghai County. From here, the prince will quickly reach the forest of sages with the help of the flying sword. The rescuers are disappointed that the guy is leaving. They suggest that he rest for a few more days. He says that he has important business to attend to, thanks you for your concern and asks you to accept his modest gift and leaves a chest of gold. Yun San Cheng continues his journey, which runs through a dense forest. She notices that a wooden monster is chasing her. The monster shouts to the girl to give him wine. The girl falls to the ground and asks the monster to stay away. The wooden roots entangle the girl's arms and legs, and the monster continues to shout at her to give the wine back. The monster says that he can smell the wine and wants the girl to give it to him. Out of despair and hopelessness, the girl begins to cry, tears rolling down her face. Suddenly someone comes to her aid, cuts the roots and frees her arms and legs. She finds herself in the arms of a puppet girl and thanks her for saving her. Yun loves the beauty of the girl who saved her, but she feels like a monster next to her. San Cheng tries to remember where she might have seen this girl. She asks her rescuer if she is involved in Yu Guo's disappearance. The girl says that in that case she would not be talking to her now. Yun sees the girl holding the prince's sword and asks her who she is. 
Tzu replies that they are almost one and the same and suggests that the girl guess who she is to the prince. Yun realizes that this girl may be Yuguo's wife. She has his sword of love. San Cheng is facing a threat that she hasn't noticed, and the girl warns her to be careful. She manages to intercept a huge wooden fist that was flying towards San Chen. The impact of the falling sword knocks it out of her hands and she screams that her mood has been spoiled. No matter how much Ji fought in the northern lands, she still lacks the energy of evil. The girls think about what to do. Their level is not enough to defeat the wooden monster. It is extremely large and the girls see no way out but to die. Yun is convinced that she must survive to see Li Yuguo again. The monster points its huge paw at the girls again. Suddenly, the monster retreats and the girls don't know what happened or what my reason is. The monster smells a scent that catches his attention. He smelled the wine and it was driving him crazy. The satisfied monster lags behind the girls and enjoys the wine he has found. San Chung hears someone in the forest calling her name and she is surprised. The prince comes out on the lawn and starts talking to the girl. She turns toward the sound, sees the prince, and cannot believe her eyes. She clenches her hands into fists, trying to control herself. The girl comes up to him and starts crying. The guy hugs her, trying to calm her down. Yun says that she was worried about him, and he apologizes for being delayed on the road. Wiping away her tears, the girl asks for what has just happened to her. He points to a puppet lying on the ground and asks what its words mean. Li Yu Guo takes off the puppet's wig, shows that it is not a real person, and the girl asks him not to joke around anymore. The girl closes one eye, she is wounded, and the wound bothers her. Yu Guo is concerned about the wound. He will take her to a place where she can be treated. Holding an umbrella, the prince asks the girl to hold on tight. The girl embraces the boy, he opens the umbrella and she picks it up. The steam flies up to the clouds high in the sky, leaving the forest below. Night falls and a bright moon and stars appear in the sky. A tent stands in a forest clearing, illuminated by moonlight. There is a guy and a girl in the tent and the girl asks the guy if he really doesn't see anything. San Cheng blindfolds him and the prince swears that he sees nothing. This gift of omniscience allows him to see even through blindfolds. The girl takes off her clothes, and the prince remarks on her beautifully shaped figure. San Cheng Yun has undressed and is ready for the prince to treat her. As he pours the medicine into her hand, he notes that her body is very exhausted, and she needs to activate blood circulation and eliminate blood stasis. The girl's skin turns red from the intense rubbing. She asks me to be careful because the rubbing hurts her. It is difficult for the prince to control himself. He has a brain explosion, which he feels while rubbing the girl's body. He says she has a small tummy, but that fat is so appetizing and her skin is very soft. The girl jumps up and says that the prince is a womanizer, and he excuses himself by saying that he didn't see anything. San Cheng Yun is angry with the prince and asks him not to touch her anymore. The prince says that a woman should have a tummy so that she can give birth and feed her children better. The girl excuses herself by saying that she doesn't have a belly and allows him to check it. Prince says that she is flat as a board and obviously puts something under her. Yun takes his hand, touches his body with it, and asks where it is a plank. The prince's hand accidentally touches the girl's breast and she is outraged. She doesn't like his promiscuity towards her. The girl starts to fight. The boy asks her not to hit him so hard, otherwise he won't have children. Meat is being roasted on a lawn. A girl asks the prince why he is smiling, and he replies that he won't wash his hands. He likes the smell of her body. It reminds him of his mother's smell, and the girl calls him a fool. Yuguo Prince asks the girl to calm down and offers to eat a fried wing. The girl asks why the forest monster was chasing them. He was a forest king, an alcoholic, and he was attracted to the smell of her perfume. The guy has a new idea and asks the girl to give him her perfume. The owner of the forest is very smart and strong. You can use his addiction to alcohol and make him defend the city. The prince takes the perfume and generously sprinkles it on the ground near their tent. The aroma of the perfume spreads through the forest. It has the charms of the lord of the forest. The forest king smells alcohol and immediately goes in search of wine. The events are transferred to the city of Tangmen, with guards guarding the central gate. The ground is beginning to crumble under the feet of the city's residents, with cracks and fissures appearing. Roots sprout from the ground, which the city's soldiers mistake for a new attack. Princess Landman asks who dared to attack her city of Tanglan. The alien has the Wu Huan level, and the battle with him will bring many victims. The Lord of the Forest asks the princess if she is on Lanman, and is glad that he has finally reached her. 
He was sent by Yuguo to defend these lands, and in return he was to be given good wine every day. The forest king tells him that the prince is alive, wants to gain experience, and has gone to find Lan Ju. He hands the princess a ring and tells her that the prince asked her to prepare the city and the army well. The princess is touched by the prince's actions, who cares about the city even in danger. The Lord of the City The Lord of the Forest is getting used to his new city and likes it. From now on, he will live here and will be given wine every day. Meanwhile, Yun and Yuguo walk through the desert, avoiding mounds and craters. The city is far away. It would be faster to move around with a puppet, and we need to find a new source of power. The prince wonders where to look for the source of the evil power that the forest lord has damaged. Ahead of them, they see people surrounded by a lion, the beast holding a sword in its mouth. The Wu Huan lion swordsman has a medallion around his neck that could have belonged to the person lying next to him. People around the beast are shouting that it has eaten poisoned meat, it must be destroyed immediately, and the sword must be taken away. The criminals attack the animal from all sides, encouraging each other with loud shouts. The lion is confident in his strength, clutching his sword tightly in his teeth, his eyes burning with hatred. His partners don't understand where the beast's strength comes from after being poisoned. Their leader points to the remains next to the lion and orders them to take out their bows and arrows and prepare all their weapons. The soldiers are preparing their bows and arrows for battle, and the command to start shooting is given. Many arrows fly at the lion from all sides, reaching the target. One of the attackers sustains a serious injury that is not compatible with life. His brother shouts in anger that he will go down and destroy the beast. Yuguo and Yun watch the battle, noting the beast's courage and the cunning of its killers. The boy gives the girl a mask to wear so that the criminals cannot recognize them. The swordsman received many wounds and he probably lost this battle. The attackers loudly celebrate their victory, throwing their swords into the sky. Yugu and Yun come to the animal's defense, blocking the road with their swords. The leader of the attackers asks who they are and why they dared to interfere with him. Lumen recognizes the leader of the criminals. He described him in his novel. It is Zhang, the son of a big businessman from Zhangdu who, according to the novel, molested Yun and died at her hands. The prince takes the girl's hand, attracting her attention, and has something important to say. These people are not worthy of unworthy sympathy. They should not be left among the living. Jang gives the order to disembowel the boy and the girl and advises them to save their lives and stay out of trouble. Holding swords, Yuguo and San Cheng say that they will punish the criminals for their actions. Several criminals with their eyes open lie on the sand in puddles. The Vernas are furious that masters of the Wu Lin level were able to kill a master of the Wu Wang level. They run away. Jang shouts that he paid them and they reply that they don't want his money. The guy is left alone. He doesn't know what to expect from these two. He doesn't know who is hiding behind the masks. Jang assumes that they were sent by Oi Fu to take revenge for his daughter, with whom he had been having fun, and left her with a child. It could be retribution for the grandfather selling firewood who was too slow. The third option could be revenge for a relative who did not want to have fun with him, and he buried her alive in the garden. Jang asks to be released, for which he will give a lot of money. In an instant, his face twists with horror. He realizes that there will be no mercy. San Cheng Yun pierces the guy through with his sword, and he goes to the other side. The girl says that people who do not value other people's lives have no place in this world. The prince goes to the lion for help, and the girl asks him to be careful. The prince stretches out his hand to the lion, who is trying to protect his master's body with all his strength. As a sign of respect, the prince gets down on one knee and bows his head. He asks for permission to pay homage to the swordmaster Din and gives his name. Yuguo says that he respects the master because he helped the weak and did not pursue fame. He is the prince's idol. The lion has been on guard for more than 20 years, and the prince asks for permission to help him. The lion is touched by the prince's words, tears run from his eyes, and the sword falls from his mouth. Yun remarks that the sword is magnificent, and the prince replies that it is not suitable for humans. After death, the body has to be buried, and they dig a hole for the master's body. The master of swords defended himself alone to give the peasants time to escape, was exhausted and died. The lion mourns for its master, and a terrible cry erupts from its mouth. He gathers all his strength, his eyes flash, and he throws himself into the pit. In this last flight, he is happy because he has served his duty with dignity. With all his might, he hits the coffin and smashes his head. 
The prince says that Leo was waiting for the moment to reunite with his master in the afterlife. The prince hopes that the lion's energy will help activate the puppet. Yun reports that five families think he is dead and are looking for a puppet that can replace his body. The prince likes this idea so no one will recognize the puppet. A guy chooses new clothes for a girl. It is not an easy task to change a puppet. The updated puppet is very good, and it will help things go better. The prince notes that while he controls her, he cannot control himself, and Yun hears this. Yuguo embraces Yun, looks at her with a lustful gaze. He is out of control. They hit their foreheads. Both of them start beeping, and he reminds them that he is innocent. The couple is staying close by. Tomorrow they will be in Jiangda, and he is not sure if he will know Lan Zhu there. The girl takes his hand and reminds him that no matter what happens, she will always be there for him. Then the events move to the city of Jiangdua, which is located on the banks of the river. Yun didn't expect the city to be more turbulent than the capital. While they are eating, the girl tells us that a family of emperors lives in the capital, so everything is more restrained there. But here there is more freedom. Yun notices that someone is following them, and the prince suggests that they turn into the alley. They enter the nearest alleyway, trying to get away. Their pursuers are confidently following them, and they are not retreating. The prince turns around and sees a lot of people in front of him. He asks why they are following them. A man hiding his face asks the boy if he is Li Yuguo. The prince is interested in who this man is and why he needs his name. The prince turns to his gift of omniscience to see the man's strength. The energy of the person attacking him is concentrated in the leg, and the stick is a distraction. The prince is forced to fight his pursuers. The attacker is holding a stick and the prince is punched. Napadnik says that it is not surprising that Yuguo is the son of his brother. His fist hits with enough force. This word made the prince think that he was looking for Lan Zhu. In the novel, he is the strongest of the Lan family, and even in Wu Huang he has connections throughout China. Li Guangyi passed on to him the spirit of heroism, and he began to fight with him. The prince does not hide his joy at finding Uncle Lan. The relatives hug each other. The uncle is proud that he hasn't seen his nephew for several years, and he is already at the level of a Wu Lin. Uncle Lan asks who this beauty is and if she is his girlfriend. Yun doesn't like these words and decides that she must hate this criminal. Lan is proud that the prince could win such a beautiful woman. This is not the place to talk. You have to follow him. After Li Guanyi's death, Lan went into hiding and gathered an army to take revenge on the Temple of Heaven. Lan Zhu will lead a large army to the temple, but will be defeated, and with his help the temple will disappear from the face of the earth for ten years. In a quiet setting, the prince asks his uncle how he has lived all these years. It was not easy for him, and he dreams of destroying San Juaner, because they lost many people because of him. He is helped by the Ji family. The prince has returned, and it's time to do justice. Li Yuguo asks if Uncle Lan has a plan for revenge against the Temple of Heaven. Lan talks about the Heavenly Temple and the Heavenly Martial Arts Institute and asks why Yuguo came with his wife. Yuguo says that the girl ran away from her family for him, but she denies it. She ran away because she didn't want to be a puppet in the hands of her family. My uncle insisted that they would be safe at the Celestial Martial Arts Institute. There is an awkward pause between the prince and Yun, and the prince does not know how to justify himself. They end up in the Institute's library, where there are many books that even family members of the five families study. Uncle Lan gives the task of finding the Sword of the Sun and Moon. The prince has never heard of this sword and asks Lan to tell him more. The sword belonged to the prince's father, later passed to the Institute, and it contains an important secret that needs to be found. Lan also warns that if a one-armed member of the Yi family is going to college, you should be careful. This news frightens Yun, the one-armed apprentice may be Ye Chiong if he manages to survive. A group of people dressed in white gathered at the entrance to the Celestial Martial Arts Academy. The inscription on the entrance to the school was written by the emperor himself, which means that the academy has a noble origin. Yun is dressed in white clothes and asks the prince if he will recognize her in these clothes. The prince asks her not to worry. She is so bandaged that no one will recognize her. The aunts from Lan's family pulled her down very hard, and she worries that if she takes them all off, she will become smaller. The prince jokes that she will remain seductive. The girl calls him a pervert. It is now Yu Guo and Yun's turn to see if they are a good fit for the institute. The school administrator asks them to touch a stone steely that will show their level. Stella points out that Yu Guo, now called Ji Guo, is at the Wu Lin level, and he moves on. Yun, who now goes by the name Yun Wang, has a Wu Wang level and she also passed. 
Applicants have a high level of competitors, but one level is not enough. There are tests ahead. The prince will say that he did not expect such great progress from Yun. The next step to be accepted to the school is to pass a test. The teacher informs them that 30 steps are enough to get into the sect, and that after the 50th level, they will have a separate room. He advises me not to relax, but to keep trying my best without stopping. The prince is pleased with the news of the opportunity to live in a separate room, but the girl does not plan to live with him. Before the tests begin, the school applicants warm up in the courtyard at the bottom of the stairs. On the platform at the top of the stairs are representatives of the school who will monitor the test. The mentor Su Li and the spiritual head of the school announce the start of the tests. All applicants simultaneously begin to climb the ladder rapidly. Yun asks Yu Guo why he's staying standing. It's time for them to go too. The prince feels that each level has a different fluctuation of force, with less energy being expended on the right side. It is very difficult for applicants to reach even the 30th step to get into the sect. They do not understand why such a simple test turns out to be a failure for them. Yun and Yugu also climb the stairs, but they do so almost effortlessly. The mentor and the spiritual leader rejoice in the spirit of the couple, wondering if they will be able to reach the hundredth step, or if only Ye Chiong can do it. Shu Li likes a girl from the Yun family who does not accept the circumstances but goes against her fate. The guy and the girl have reached the 90th level and continue to move on. Yun's strength is exhausted. She is tired and cannot go on. The prince asks her to give him her hand. He will bring her to him. The girl refuses, saying that this level is enough for her. The prince does not intend to leave her alone. They will reach the very top together. Yun is crying with anguish, unable to continue up the stairs. Yuguo takes her hand and leads her upstairs, urging her to pass this test. In his past life, Lumen was afraid of challenges, hid from people, and couldn't finish the novel. In this world, everything is different. He is convinced that a person's main enemy is himself. If a person cannot defeat himself, he cannot defeat anyone. Thanks to a lot of hard work, the friends reach the 98th step. The 99th step causes shortness of breath and a desire to stop. On their knees, Yun and Yuguo climb up to the hundredth step very exhausted and without strength. The prince is pleased with the result and hopes to move up to the next level of Wu Lin. This result surprises everyone. At the hundredth step, the pressure of spiritual power is 30 times higher. Yun reprimands the prince for allowing himself to swim through life, dragging her along with him. They are sitting on the stairs, and the spiritual leader comes up to them and says that the guy smells like a puppet. He wonders if the prince also knows how to use a puppet. Yuguo says that he has studied, but compared to the spiritual head, it's just for fun. The spiritual head is angry at the prince's disdain for the puppet. For the spiritual head, puppetry is more precious than life. He had just become the best, and he had already incurred the wrath of the spiritual head. Yuguo justifies himself. Creating a puppet requires a lot of money that he cannot afford. The head asks him to explain how he uses the puppet. The puppet allows the wizard to move to another level. But if the enemy is smart, he will attack the wizard and not the puppet. The spiritual director tells the prince that he understands a lot about puppets. He asks the prince to come to him after he has solved the problem with his housing. Yun was afraid for the prince, who had just begun to make progress and was already contradicting his elders. Her mentor, Shu Li, asks Yun if she would like to become her student. The students are amazed at their mentor's offer to take on this strange boy as a student. Yun has just entered, but it is enough for her mentor that she has reached the 70th step and dared to leave against the will of her family. Yun wonders if her mentor knows who she really is. The girl kneels down and thanks her mentor for showing interest in her personality and for the offer. The prince walks through the school and thinks that his mentor Xu Ling's sword skills are among the best, which means that San Cheng will learn a lot from her. He regrets that he won't be able to share a room with her. He has been lonely for a long time. The prince's search for the room is interrupted by a fight and he wonders what is going on. Students at the school bully the boy for taking eight pills instead of ten. Even in this place there is bullying, but the prince is not interested in it. He moves on. The guy justified himself by saying that he had enough raw materials for five pills and they demanded ten. Lumen recognizes the boy who is being bullied. He is one of the characters in his novel. Ye Chiang complained about this guy Bai Jishan. He has a lot of merit. He's terrible at martial arts, but he's very smart. And if the prince can lure him away, he'll be useful. His abuser stands over the boy and threatens him, saying that he knows the rules. 
The prince intercepts the attacker's arm, and the latter is surprised by his strength, even though they are on the same level. Yu Guo wants to reconcile the guys. He has 20 Lingcheng. That should be enough. The attacker says he is from the Yang family. His name is Yang Tong, and he has no right to interfere in their affairs. The prince punches him in the face and asks him to repeat what family he is from because he did not hear. The students of the school notice how Yang Tong flies away with a single blow. They have never heard of Yu Guo before. Yu Guo asks about Bai Zhishan's health and he says that he is fine, but the prince seems to be in big trouble. Li is convinced that even his maid can beat Yang Tong. Ji Tai Min appears on the school grounds and shields the prince from blows. The disciples were impressed by the girl's karma and surprised that such a beautiful girl was this guy's maid. Yang Tong will not calm down. He is furious that the prince has called for help. Li offers Thun a fight in the arena, convinced that he will move him up in the rankings. Yang Tong arranges a meeting in three days, and if he wins, he will take the girl. Yugu agrees that if he wins, he will take Yang Tong's ancestral frost sword of emerald waters. Bai apologizes for causing trouble, and Yang makes friends with the best students in the school. The spiritual director was watching their conversation, and he was fascinated by the girl's beauty. He says that this puppet is beautiful and looks like a real girl. The mentor explains the risks the prince faces if the enemy exposes him, but the prince has no choice. Puppets are divided into three types, spiritual stone puppets, energy pills, and evil energy puppets. The puppets of spiritual stones are the simplest. You need to cast a spell on them, give an order, and they will go into battle. For a puppet, it is advisable to use a pill of energy from a dead hermit. It will be able to hold the energy itself if you add the soul of a living person to it. The spiritual director orders his new disciple to follow him. Yu Guo gives Bai the keys to his apartment, tells him how to know him, and asks him to wait until he is with Li Huang. The tutor brings the prince to the backyard of the palace, where the cleaning is going on. All the creatures are puppets. What he sees surprises the prince, and he realizes that he knows very little about puppets. One of the puppets approaches the spiritual director and addresses him as her father. The prince is surprised. His mentor has to explain everything, and he tells the marionette to wait for him inside. The mentor's daughter and wife died, and he brought his daughter's soul back with the help of magic. The prince says it is forbidden. Li Huang shows three bodies from which he is skinned, but human skin deteriorates very quickly. He falls to his knees and asks Li Guo to explain how he created the skin for his puppet. The boy asks if this is the only topic his mentor wanted to talk to him about. In exchange for the secret of creating the skin, the Lord shares with Luo his experiences in the field of puppetry, and the prince says that it is not human skin. In this world, science is very primitive, and if he starts explaining chemistry, he says it's a special kind of sap from the tree that won't rot for hundreds of years. It's called silicone. The prince again reminds us of the prohibition against making puppets with the souls of living people. Or does his daughter feel comfortable with it? The spiritual director loves his daughter very much and does not want her to leave him. The daughter asks her father to come to his senses and realize that she is already dead. She cannot eat, drink, feel, and does not need new skin. She can't feel touch. She's a walking dead man, and if it weren't for the pill, she would have been dead long ago. She knows that her father loves her, but she cannot cry because every time her father creates her new body, her soul suffers. The father does not want to lose his daughter. He needs time to create the perfect doll that can feel everything. Luo says that the mentor is making his daughter suffer, and he should let her go. The prince had heard that Lin Huang had previously studied puppetry. The girl knows that her father used magic for good, and she thought he was noble. After her death, he became different. He is in great pain. He shows what he has instead of a heart. She takes the pill that kept her alive and hopes that her father will be able to accept the new reality. The girl is passing away, but her father will always remain a great man. Thanks to Li Guo, she has the courage to say this. Her soul is liberated, and she hopes that her father will not suffer. The girl asks her father to be strong and promises to always be with him. The puppet's body begins to fall apart. Its soul has already flown away. Standing at the grave, the prince asks his mentor for forgiveness, and he replies that he is to blame for his daughter's death. The mentor intended to offer Li to be his student, but now he does not consider himself a decent person. The prince offers to become friends. If the prince is against it, the mentor will not insist, and the prince will accept his offer. Lin Huang knows about the fight with Yang Tong and warns him that he has a strong older sister. 
The school is gossiping about a fight between Li Guo, who has risen to the hundredth place, and Yang Tong, who is on the top of the list. Some people think that a new student is chasing cheap popularity and is looking for adventure. They wish Yan good luck. They've placed bets on him, and he has to defeat his opponent. He specifically called a lot of people to intimidate his opponent in the arena, but Li is ready for that. Jan asks the prince if he will call his maid so as not to be embarrassed. The prince suggests that they stop hammering with their tongues and start fighting. Yang Tong is the first to enter the fray, swinging his sword at his opponent. He releases his other self and shouts that the prince must disappear. Li observes this and determines that Yang's essence is true water. He is also ready for battle, skillfully wielding his sword using his experience. The prince's eyes burn with determination. He must win the battle. The prince turned out to be stronger than Yan, and he misses the first blow. He is trying to take revenge and defeat Li without losing his rating. However, the prince has better skills with a sword, which he uses to strike at the enemy. One of these blows hits the target, and Yan did not have time to react in time. Yang Tong finds himself on the ground. The sword falls from his hands. The students of the school who supported him are bewildered. No one expected such a defeat. The prince raises the frosty sword of emerald waters from the ground. Now this sword belongs to him. He points the sword at the elder and asks why he is silent. He is ready to write down his name. The elder officially announces that Li Guo is the winner of this battle. He also changes the rating board on the school's roof, and the prince takes first place. From somewhere, a knife flies at the elder and he falls from the ladder he was standing on. Rising from the ground, he shouts to everyone who could have done this. A girl's figure appears on the horizon, and all the students look up at her. Next to the prince is a very tall and beautiful girl who says that she did it. A rumor rises over the school that it is Yang's older sister, a witch, 30th in the sex ranking. The school's tutors consider it unfair that a student with a high rating is interfering in this match. The battle revealed a lot of Li Guo's talents, and his mentors are wondering if his strength will be enough here. Xu Li says that Lin Huang has taken a liking to this guy. Lin hopes that the prince will not use a puppet. Addressing the girl, the prince asks if she is the one who is called the witch Yang Ning, and the girl says that she is. This sword is her family's heritage and her dowry, and she cannot give it away but asks for another thing in return. The prince is ready to exchange the sword for 20,000 Ling Shu, which is too much for the witch. The guy won the sword honestly, has witnesses, and will be able to sell it for more on the black market. The girl offers one more fight, and if the prince can defeat her, the sword will be his. Lee wants the girl to become his servant if he wins, and if she wins, then his life belongs to her. Yang Ning is annoyed by the guy's proposal and calls him a womanizer. The girl starts fighting, her swift sword slicing through space. Li was confused. He did not expect such a quick start to the battle. The beauty calms down her main skill and releases a deadly wave. This blow is capable of killing the enemy in one go, so it looks like the prince is about to be finished. The girl directs a deadly wave at the prince, and this power has a devastating effect on him. The prince calls for help from the tentacles of a thousand-armed dragon. The tentacles successfully cope with the deadly wave and hold it back. The girl understood the prince's intentions and how she should proceed. Her legs are wrapped in tentacles, and the sword falls from her hands. No one expected events to unfold in such a way. The girl's arms and legs are wrapped in tentacles, and she has no strength to break free. Her brother gets up from the ground and asks the prince to let his sister go immediately. He has no right to abuse the girl. Li Guo asks him to admit that Yang Tong provoked this, and if he pleads guilty... The prince will release his sister. The prince puts the thousand-armed demon's claws on vibrate. The girl's body, wrapped in vibrating tentacles, wriggles from the vibrations. The students scan that Li has done well. The usually cold Yang Lin is now tied up. Yang Tong shouts loudly that he admits defeat. He and his sister have lost. The prince is satisfied with Yang Tong's public statement about their loss. He frees Yang Nini from the tentacles of the thousand-armed dragon. The boys at the school admire Li Guo and want to call him brother. The girls' opinions are divided. Some think the prince is scary, while others want him to be their boyfriend. Yang Ning will never be his Li. He asks for a sword or something. He says that she is his target. He has no time to figure out who is right and who is wrong. On her knees, the girl says she hates him. Prince says that many people hate him, so she is not the first. He leaves the sword and says that he has met people who do not take anyone's opinion into account, but he does not hurt girls. Yan Nini Tova to become his maid because she lost. The students at the school are amazed by this turnaround and consider Brother Li to be a true strategist. The prince doesn't need any sacrifices, 
and the girl wonders why he changed his mind. Yang Tong asks his sister not to humiliate herself and give him the lins, and the prince agrees. The girl tries to bargain. 20,000 lire is too much for her, but the prince does not give in. She insists that he should give in to the woman, and hears in response that she has no signs of a girl except for her breasts. Young Nini can't help herself, but her brother restrains her and asks her not to touch the prince anymore. Suddenly they hear a voice saying that a disciple of the outer temple has no right to humiliate the disciples of the inner temple in public. A man appears next to them and says that this dispute cannot be counted. His name is Qin Yu, and he is ready to teach Li Guo instead of Yang Ning. The prince mentions that this is one of Ye Qing's heels, it should be in the top ten. Suddenly Qin Yu is kicked in the face by a woman. He is attacked by a puppet who warns him not to touch its owner. Qin Yu puts his hand over his face and says that it doesn't count because the girl attacked him unexpectedly. The guy saw the beauty of the puppet, and his mouth fell open in surprise. The girl's beauty is won over all the students at the school, and they all want to be with her. The girl flies away, Qin Yu asks her name, and she introduces herself as Nei Xiao Qin. All the boys in the school fell in love with her. They call her a goddess and argue about who she is. The prince knows that they are fools and will never win this girl. Yang Ning gives the sword back, because if Li has a girl of her caliber as a servant, they should be friends, not enemies. The prince promises to help Yang's family if the girl is so smart. He knows this from his sources, and the girl is ready to spend the rest of her life with him if he solves their problems. It is late, and Li invites the girl to come to his place at night to discuss everything, and she agrees. Yang Ning is confused by this invitation and does not know what to expect from the overnight visit. Li Yuguo chooses a house on Alamim to live in in the near future. A large carriage on wooden wheels stops at the stairs of his house. Yang Tong, Yang Ning, and Qin Yu emerge from it, and they are delighted with what they see, and Yang tells her sister that she can become the mistress of this place. The girl hits him on the head, and he justifies himself by saying that she put Li's sword away, so he is now his future son-in-law. To meet them, the prince comes out of the house and says that he has already forgotten about this dispute and that it can be disregarded. Yang Tong thanks the man for his generosity and understanding. Qin apologizes for the misunderstanding that occurred between them. He respects Li, so he came to visit him with his sister and brother Yang. The prince thinks that this fat man who showed up uninvited is very impudent. Since all three of them had come to visit him, he invited them to go home with him. On the territory of the estate, there is a grass of primordial chaos that collects spiritual energy, and it is believed that it has disappeared. The prince offers to stay with him. The house is big. There is enough room for everyone. Yang wants to use the herb to make rapid progress in his practice, and Qin wants to see Xiao Qian every day. All four of them are sitting at a set table, and the prince did not expect so many delicious dishes. Yang Tong boasts that his sister cooked all of this, that she did her best, and that she is a great person. The girl makes an instant throw and food flies at her brother's head. She wants him to close it. Yang Ning wonders if Li will really help. He's going to the trading company tomorrow, and Tong thanks him for not holding a grudge. The evening continues, with young people enjoying themselves with dancing, singing, and alcohol. There was too much alcohol. Yang Tong and Qin Yu fell asleep at the table and Li took Yang Ningyi outside to prove that she was not drunk. The guy walks the girl to her room, supporting her all the way. The girl is interested in learning more about him, but if he doesn't want to talk, then don't. She doesn't need to know. She can get into trouble. He puts her to bed and plans to go to the trading company tomorrow, hoping that he will be able to solve their problem. Despite the fact that Lumen is the author of a novel, even he cannot cope with everything. The girl seductively sits on the bed and invites the guy to drink wine with her. The guy asks what kind of wine it is, the wine of the imperator's second wife, prepared by her mother, who always carries it with her. Yuguo drinks the wine and notes that it has a rather strong effect. He can quickly become intoxicated. The girl takes off her clothes to seduce the boy, saying that if he helps solve their family's problem, she will spend the rest of her life with him. The prince notes that this girl's figure is very exciting and beautiful. Hugging the guy, the girl compares C's to Nei Xiao Qian. She is quite sincere. She does not let the prince go to the shower. She asks not to wash. She likes the smell of his body. The guy can't control his sexual desire. It is extremely strong. Giannini allows him to touch her elastic breasts, which excites the prince. He takes the girl in his arms and carries her to the bed and hears the door to the room opening. San Cheng Yun enters the room, and the scene she sees makes her incredibly angry. He asks the girl what she's doing here, and she replies that he's embarrassing her and Landman. 
She sees an open bottle, probably a potion of seduction, and wonders why Nini is clinging to it. Nini is surprised by the girl's sudden appearance and asks who she is. The prince covering the half-naked Nini tries to explain everything to Yun. She was very hurt by what she saw and believed that the prince had been bewitched. The prince begins to realize that what is happening to him now is independent of his will. Yun immediately causes him to vomit and he gets rid of everything he has consumed during the day. The girl grabs the sword to immediately avenge him. The guy stops her, asks her to wait. He has to explain everything to her. In fact, it's not what she thinks. The truth is something else. Nini wanted to tie him to her in this way because he is now the only hope for their family. Nini thought Lu Guo was a man from the Imperial Palace, but she finds out that his real name is Li Yuguo. He is a guy who is hunted by five big families. Yun Yu is the girl who ran away from her family. Ning won't give them up because he helped her. Yun forgets the incident in the bedroom and asks him not to do it again. Yun asks if there is a room for her in the prince's house and receives an affirmative answer. The prince takes the girl by the hand and asks her to follow him. He will show her room. The room looks very nice and the girl likes the luxury she has found herself in. Sitting down on the couch, she says that the bed is very soft and comfortable, and the prince corrects that it is a sofa. He explains that there is a clock on the wall to keep track of the correct time. Next, he shows how the lamp works it is needed to light up the room. The girl thanks the prince. Even though she doesn't understand everything very well yet, he says that there is something better. And doesn't she want to try it? Despite his insolence, the girl is no longer angry, and the prince is interested in why she left the palace. She was supposed to practice with Shu. Yun reports that she immediately realized that she was a girl, knew her story, and told her about Ye Chiang. Ye Chiang is the main disciple of the Ye family, so he came to enroll in the Heavenly War Institute, but it's just for show. Yun says that she did not hide her identity. She releases her constricted chest. She is so uncomfortable. The boyfriend is furious that the girl has opened her breasts. He does not understand why she is seducing him. In three months, the heavenly tower will open with many demonic doors inside, and only disciples from the inner temple will have the right to enter. Within three months, he must become a disciple of the inner temple, otherwise she will not spare him. The prince wonders what she will do with him in that case. The effect of the seduction potion has not passed, and the prince approaches Yun half-naked. The girl immediately kicks him in the face and tells him to get away from her. The next day, Yang Tong, Yang Ning Yi, and Qin Yu meet in the courtyard of the prince's house. You practiced a lot yesterday, he even forgot the time. Yang Tong got so drunk that he slept until lunch. He wet himself in his sleep and couldn't go back to sleep, so he practiced as well. And the effect of the herb of primordial chaos is quite good. The prince warns that only they know about the herb, and it must be kept secret. Yang Ning asks the prince if Yun is not coming today. Yun has business today. All four of them get into a carriage and go to the city to solve their problems. He hands Nina a book that describes the peculiarities of her family's sword ownership, thanks her, and asks her to tell him what happened to them. While transporting the payment to the military, my father lost it. He is now in prison. The family has sold all their property, and there is still a hundred thousand lina left to compensate. They arrive at the Jiangdu City Trading Society to solve their problems. The members of the society condemn their visit, and the father's act caused the Navy's displeasure. Li Yuguo lays his brother and sister to rest, and he decides what they should do. An incredibly beautiful girl comes out to meet them and greets Ning. This is their sister Xiao Yue. Ning is very surprised by this meeting, although she is happy. Xiao Yue asks Nina how she is doing. She hasn't left the Heavenly War Institute for a long time, and thanks to her sister, Nina is doing well. The prince watches the sister's conversation from the outside. He does not get involved. The girl noticed his interest and came up to him to introduce herself and say that she was an auctioneer. According to the novel, the current head of the trading company is sick. The business is managed by assistants, and the situation can only be resolved through the head of the Wang. The girl asks him what he is interested in, and when she evaluates the prince, she sees him as just another guy who is obsessed with her beauty. The prince wants to sell ritual items and a puppet. The girl wants to examine the puppet. The girl likes the puppet and asks if he is a master of puppetry. Puppets are in short supply now. They are in great demand. The girl offers to cooperate with him, and the prince asks what happened to her because he is concerned about her appearance. The shareholder tries to seduce him with her long legs and insists on cooperation. AI is surprised that he doesn't react to her beauty and wonders how he knows what happened in their family. 
if the masters can read minds. The prince is aware of the illness of the head of the family, and he may be able to help. The girl asks him if he knows who he is and why he came here. The guy wants to establish long-term cooperation, become partners, and to prove his honesty, he will help solve the family's problem. If he can cure his father, it's worth the risk. If he doesn't, the trading partnership will collapse. The girl agrees to the boy's proposal and invites him to follow him. They are at his father's house. He doesn't want to see anyone. The prince asks if he has trouble talking and his internal organs seem to be on fire. The girl wants to know where this information came from, and the prince replies that it is a secret. The youngest concubine of the palace, Wang, comes out of the house and asks to call. The head of the trading company doesn't want anyone to know about his condition, but the enemy has already managed to harm his most loyal family, the Yangs. Ning's father was harmed on purpose. The enemies want to seize power over the trading company. The Wang family was the first to be attacked, and now the Yang family is also under attack. Head Wang asks the prince who he is and how he knows such details. There is poison in the man's body, and he needs to be treated immediately. The two sisters want to know if Li Yuguo can save their parents. Ning's father is safe until the head of the company changes. If he shows up, Ning's father is finished. Van must not die. He is the hope of two families and thousands of people throughout the trading community. This makes the chairman of the company think he is responsible for the lives of thousands of people. He has to be cured, and if the guy helps him, he is ready to give everything he owns, even his daughter. The prince asks him not to get excited. He will save him anyway. The guy conducts diagnostics on the patient and sees a heavenly eye inside his body. The man asks what the prince has found, whether he needs to feel the pulse, and the prince says that it is voodoo magic. He asks his daughter to bring the boy's urine, and she doesn't know where to get it. The guy sees her confusion, takes the pot, and decides to do it himself. He hides from uninvited eyes and pees in the potty to get his medicine. Young Tong grabs his sister's sleeve and asks her to take a closer look at Yugu, who is a moral man, strong in battle, and a good husband. Ning doesn't like her brother's talk and asks him to stop. The principal brings a bowl in which the boy's urine and ashes are mixed, just as he asked. To complete the treatment, you need to prepare a roaster. He uses a brush to draw a hieroglyph on the patient's stomach that is supposed to heal. Something unusual happens in a man's body, as if a worm appears. He screams and wriggles on the bed, and the prince asks to tie his hands and feet. The man is in pain, asking for an end to his suffering, and his daughter asks him to hold on. A thick black liquid begins to come out of the patient's body. The prince asks to bring the brazier and the prepared medicine again. He once again manipulates the fire on the patient's abdomen. The man is so exhausted from the treatment process that he loses consciousness. His head is covered with drops of sweat. A red worm comes out of his body, which is immediately thrown into the fire and burned. This worm sucked out the man's strength, and his daughter does not know what kind of cruel person could do this to her father. The entrance to the basement of the trading company, the basement door is open. The prisoner who is there is told that his daughter has come to visit him. The man is very happy to see his children and asks what they are doing here. Li Yuguo gives the head of the company a pill that will quickly put him back on his feet. This pill is very expensive, and the prince just generously gives it to the girl to treat his father. Now she understands why Ning trusts him so much. He has a sense of justice and is very capable. The prince says that the patient needs to rest. Ning will save her father's reputation and get him out of the basement. Her father is interested in where the prince got the sword and whether he threatened his daughter. The guy was not threatening the girl, he was just temporarily taking this sword. Ning gave the sword away herself, and her father asks why and how he will be able to look into their mother's eyes now. Yang Tong lost the sword in a fight, so it is now in the hands of the prince. Father Yan thanks him, and the prince wants to know if there was anything unusual about the cargo he was transporting. Usually the ship floats very low in the water, but this time it floated quite high. The thieves were water thieves, but they looked good-natured. Before, it was always people from the imperial household who loaded the goods, but this time it was the five main families. Yan's wife could not stand the ordeal and committed suicide, and her father knows about it and forgives her. Yan Tun has to take the prince to their mother's grave. The prince needs to dig up that grave and see if everything is okay. And these words shock the prisoner in the basement of the trading company. He thought the prince was a good man, but he wants to dig up his wife's grave. The prince reassures him. His wife was strong enough. She did not leave him and the children when he was taken into custody. The boyfriend wants to check whether there was an attempt on her life that led to such an ending. 
The moon illuminates the cemetery, where several people are digging up a grave. They put down their shovels and take out the coffin they are interested in. They open the lid and smell a person who has already begun to decompose. The characteristic spots that should be on the lower part of the body are on the upper part, which may indicate that someone is trying to confuse the traces. There is a cut on the left side of the body, so the person who killed her mother was left-handed. Toon is crying. Her mother was kind to people. She had no enemies. The prince noticed another feature on the woman's body that he had to voice. His mother was sexually abused, she resisted, and Toon knows a commander who is left-handed. Yang Ning is also crying, ready to find her mother's abuser and deal with him. He should not scare the offender away now. If it is a commander, someone else may be behind him. The friends develop a plan of further action, and a woman who lives with the Wang Lord falls under suspicion. The prince noticed that she had blisters on her hands. As if from poison, she could receive instructions and would return to look for her contact. They will only be able to find out when they follow her. From behind the reeds, the friends see a woman in a black cloak approaching the pond. The prince pulls out his smartphone and explains to his brother and sister what it is, hoping to have proof from the outside. The woman walks to the edge of the pond, takes off her black cloak, and it is clear that she is waiting for someone. She takes off the mask that was hiding her face, and you can see that she has no nose. The company was surprised by these transformations, but they reinforce their suspicions. The girl puts her finger in her mouth and whistles to announce her presence. Circles spread across the water. The leaves of the water lily begin to move and the reeds look like an air tube. A young man emerges from the water and asks her why she came if she was forbidden to do so. The girl tells him that Li Yuguo is alive, studying at the Heavenly War Institute, and has cured Lord Wang and that he needs to report it. A guy hugs a girl, they have to tell everything, they will be rewarded, their happy days have come. If they manage to remove Vanya, they can be together. The couple kisses passionately, not realizing that they are not alone and are being watched. Tong thinks it's better not to bother them. Li Yuguo has a different opinion. He will be bad and teach them morals. He walks up to the couple and touches the guy's shoulder, drawing attention to himself. The guy turns around and swings his fist at the person who disturbed him, shouting not to distract him. The girl's face changes. She doesn't want to be noticed. The prince, hiding his face with a mask, beats the boy and a bruise forms on his forehead. Lightning is flying around. The boy and the girl are frightened. They are very scared. The prince's eyes glow with fire. He says that they are traitors. He will skin them and make puppets. The girl explains to her lover that the prince is a puppeteer. He can make a puppet out of a living person, and he also does evil and destroys people. Lee was angry that she had slandered him. He is very kind and gentle, but he will cut off their ears so that their heads will look like a boiled egg. The girl falls to her knees and asks for mercy. She just follows orders. He doesn't seem to understand what kind and gentle means. The prince needs to know who owns her. She starts to answer, but is interrupted by a guy. He says that their master has been sent by the imperial court, the commander of a trading company. Falling to his knees, he shouts that he should let them go. They were forced. They need to take care of their parents. The couple are voodoo practitioners. They dated for a long time, then decided to get married. The girl lost her nose in childhood, learned the art of masks in the sect, and learned to transform into a beauty. No one knows about it but him. The guy doesn't reject her. He didn't know he would fall in love with her. He went to work as a laborer. His mother fell ill. He had no money. And Lee's sister became the mistress of the head of the Wang. It made him very angry because he went to work and she cheated on him. And he even wanted to leave her. His father gave him advice. The boy was afraid that he would leave this world. His sister was very hard. But the main thing is that he loves her. The guy talks a lot. The prince needs the main information. The girl continues the story and says that they appealed to the commander, who said that if the head of the Wang dies, they will receive freedom and money. The prince is interested in who gave the order to kill the head of the Wang. San Wanya gave him an order to kill the head of the Wan. He wanted to take over the trading company. The Wang and Yang families were an obstacle. The lovers asked to be spared because they have told everything. A cry is heard that this will not happen and the recovered head of the Wan with his daughter and archers appears at the lake. Wang orders the archers to immediately destroy these shameless people. The prince asks the head of Wan to take his time to stop his men. But he doesn't have time. Arrows are already flying at the couple, wounding them. Embracing, they fall to the ground, and the guy tries to cover his beloved with his body. The head of the Wangs killed them because they had not acted meanly to him, and the prince says that you were only following orders. 
Wang Xiaoyue says that he had not been so cruel before, but he could not spare him or they would have killed him. The head orders his men to remove the bodies and leaves. The girl apologizes for her father's actions and the prince realizes that he was in over his head. The concubine is still alive, and she gives Li the paper, saying that this is what he needs, and asks him to bury them together. The prince takes the letter from her hands and promises to do everything she asks. He reads what he has written and cannot believe his eyes. Yang, the family's father, thanks Li for his rescue and says that this feast is in his honor. Wang Xiaoyue enters their yard, calls Ning over and asks what happened. Lord Wang is going to attack the Yang family, and he has already arrested several elders. Yang Tong does not believe that this can happen. Lord Wang would not do this. Lord Wang wants to make his family the sole ruler of the trading community. Jan Tum asks if they can do something because they can't just sit and watch everything. Meanwhile, in the courtyard of the Yang family's palace, Lord Wang appears with his soldiers and pretends to be happy to meet them. Lord Wang demands that the Yang family give up the beginnings of their home for the sake of the stable development of the trading company. The Yang family seal was passed down by ancestors. The families cooperated to prevent dominance. Wang wants to break the ancestral laws. But Lord Wang has made a decision, and it is not subject to discussion. He gives the order to capture the Yang family. The soldiers carry out the order of their lord, while the Yang family and the prince feel confused. The prince convinces Lord Wang that it's time to unite, that the society is in trouble, and that it's not the Yang family's fault. They were betrayed, too. Lord Wang is grateful to Li for his rescue, but advises him to mind his own business. The daughter also tries to convince her father that he shouldn't go to war, that Li has been faithful to him, but he doesn't want to listen to her. The order is given to capture all members of the Yang family and kill those who resist. An unequal battle begins where the warriors of Lord Wang are opposed by the Yang family, Qin Yu and Li Yuguo, who seek to protect their lives. The man in the hat asks the head of Wang what to do with Li. He saved the Lord's life. The Lord needs the Yang family, not him. The boy is wanted by five families, and Lord Wang will be able to exchange the prince for the favor of the five families. One of the warriors aims a crossbow at the prince's back, and he is so engrossed in the battle that he does not notice the danger. Sayuye shields him, and an arrow hits her chest, endangering her life. The prince holds her in his arms. She apologizes for her father and says that he was deceived. When the father saw that his daughter was injured, he shouted to everyone to stop and immediately stop the fight. Gathering her strength, the daughter asks her father to admit his mistake and let the Yang family go. Wang sobs over his daughter's body, and the head of the family, Yang, expresses his condolences. The ruler, in despair and anger, shouts that he will destroy everyone, leaving no one alive. The next victim is the head of the family, Yang, who is insidiously attacked from behind and pierced through with a sword. At the last moment, he recognizes his killer, whose name is Shifan Tongjing. The killer takes his sword from the body of the head of Yang and watches his last moments. The prince shouts to everyone to return to the house, and they figure out how to proceed. Shifan Tongjing is one of the strongest warriors. They can't handle him. Head Wang, holding his daughter's body in his arms, orders Shifan Tusin to keep going and kill everyone. The man in the hat immediately rushes to fulfill his master's order. Qin Yu wants to give his friends a chance to hide in the house, shouting that he will apprehend the killer. Their strengths are not equal. The guy realizes his risk, and he has friends behind him whom he is trying to save. Suddenly, something appears that catches the killer's attention and distracts him from the battle. She is a beautiful puppet who has come to the rescue to protect her friends and save their lives. Jin Yu lost control of himself when he saw the girl and was overcome with romantic feelings. The puppet sends him inside so that he doesn't disturb her, and he agrees. Shifan Tuxing doesn't care who is in front of him. He will destroy his opponent anyway. The girl unwinds her umbrella, which is both a defense and a weapon, and the man fails to pierce this defense. The sword comes into play, and Xiao Yue strikes the man with it, not yielding to the man's words. The killer realizes that he has underestimated the girl. He is facing a rather strong opponent. The girl lunges forward with her umbrella, aiming for his face, and the man does not know how to deal with her. The puppet provokes the man by talking to him, reminding him of a quarrel with his brother Shifan Udi over Hu Inlo. Who is this girl, and how does she know such details of his private life? Inlo was his woman, but his older brother took her away, and a beautiful Suerin can help him. Given this situation, the man became a mercenary for this jerk, Lord Wang, and risks running away for the rest of his life. The man disagrees, saying that those who simply run away are cowards. They are similar, 
And the girl can't accept a lot of things either, so they can use their power together and win back what they've lost. The Lord of the On Age promises the man 10,000 linshi if he destroys this woman, but money cannot buy him. Shifan Tuxing waits for further orders from the door. She demands that the head of the Wang be killed. The old man does not believe that the man will fulfill this order because he has sheltered him. But the killer does not hesitate to follow the girl's order and destroys Lord Wang with his sword. From today on, the Yan siblings become the heads of the trading company, and no one objects. The girl makes an appointment to meet the killer at sunset at the post office in a tea house. The brother and sister thank her for her help, but she says that they should thank the prince. The Yang family thanks Lee. The trading company obeys his orders from now on. They continue their father's business, and Yu Guo leaves because he has another business. The prince is very sorry for Xiao. He misses her and feels guilty because he was supposed to die. In the tea house, Shifan sits at a table and waits for the arranged meeting with the girl. Yu Guo comes up to him. Xiao Qian is busy right now, so he came instead. The boy asks the man to take off his hat so they can talk. When the man took off his hat, it turned out that he had almost no hair on his head, which made the prince laugh. The man is uncomfortable with this reaction. He stops. The prince apologizes he did not intend to offend. The guy wants Shifan to tell him everything he knows about Hu Yinglo. He wants to know what kind of person she is. Shifo says that she is a very good girl, beautiful, generous, kind. The prince is convinced that his interlocutor is mistaken and that this woman is a real bitch. A man grabs his sword. He will not allow anyone to humiliate his woman. In fact, this woman is his brother's wife and the daughter of the insect emperor, and perhaps she just fooled him. Kunhu did not think that the woman was trying to mislead him. He and his brother had been inseparable for many years, and then suddenly they quarreled over a woman which raises suspicion. The man recalled that she gave him a decoction to improve his health, and when he refused, she switched to his brother. Obviously, she wanted to poison her husband, but she failed, so she poisoned her brother, who became a puppet in the hands of this woman. The insect emperor's venom is difficult to deal with, and if his brother doesn't listen to the advice, he will have to be destroyed and regain the title of killer king. The man is upset that he couldn't have guessed this earlier, constantly being told by his brother and how Inlo. It is time to face this problem head on and solve it. For this advice, he gives the boy a sword pill as a reward, which is one of the ten great secret weapons. In turn, the prince gives the man the Yang herb, which gives him strength and is supposed to help him at the decisive moment of the battle. The man accepts the gift, thanks the boy, and hopes that it will save his life. He gets up from the table, puts on his hat, and says goodbye to the prince, hoping to see him again. A student of the school tells Yu Guo that he is now tenth on the earth's list and will soon become a student of the inner temple. The prince dreams of practicing in the sky tower, but the prince also wants to practice the technique of winning sympathy. The boy's task was to find the herb of the golden spring while the prince went to practice on the wine spring. Zishan warns that in the evenings, Si Kunhu, which is the first on the earth's list, is usually practiced here. The prince approaches the spring and sees a boy practicing in the spring. He decides that he will not distract Sikunha. It will not harm his cause. But he felt that someone was near him, asking who dared to disturb his peace. He asks Yuguo, who is the tenth man of the land, if he wants to fight him. While taking a meditative pose, he said that he didn't mean anything by it, but he had some advice. The boy does not hear the prince and decides to attack and destroy him. The tentacles bind Sikung's hands and he cannot move or strike his opponent. The prince throws up his hands and says it's not his fault. The guy asked for it. Now he can go away. The prince has other business at this spring. Si Kun Hu will not forgive this defeat, and he will return to settle the matter. The guy puts on his scuba diving gear, and all he has to do is go into the spring. Ordinary people would get drunk to death in this spring. Without Alama's help, no one would have been able to learn the secrets of this spring. The prince swam through the spring and found the entrance to the cave. He rises to the surface of the water and sees a palace in front of him. He has found what he was looking for. In a cave, the guy found a wine pill that instantly helps to make excellent wine from ordinary water. Behind him, he sees a sword that emits light, obviously a drunken sword. The sword begins to vibrate, flies out of the stone in which it was stuck, and the prince flies into the corner of the cave in surprise. The guy is amazed by what he sees, as he was not familiar with this technique before. The imprint of the art of the drunken sword remains on his forehead, and he observes these changes in himself. 
He picks up the sword and begins to perform various exercises with it, and he has reached the top of the Wu Lin level. The prince tells Zishan that they should go for the grass at night, because last time he beat Sikunha, and he will not stop beating. There are many wild animals on the mountain of the stone monkey. The student must be careful and wait for the prince here. There are many cylindrical columns on the mountain, and a stone monkey sits on each of them. The guy starts teasing, making movements typical of monkeys having fun. His activity disturbed the monkeys, who began to climb down from their poles. They surround the guy, take him in a circle. He doesn't know what to do with them. He throws the pill into the lake, hoping that the wine the water turns into will attract monkeys. The animals smell the wine, climb into the lake, and start drinking it. The prince runs away from them and rejoices in the fact that he is lucky this time. Further on his way, he meets a large sleeping stone monkey, and the grass of a golden spring grows near it, which he needs. The prince has to take the herb as quietly as possible so as not to wake the stone monkey. The monkey opens its eyes, the boy tries to pretend to be a monkey and greets the giant. The animal is furious that it has been disturbed and is trying to deceive, takes a large rock and throws it at the boy. This king of stone monkeys is very strong and it will be difficult to resist him. If the boy continues to fight him, there is a chance that he will die. Another huge K-man ball is flying at the prince, which can destroy him. With his sword against the stone balls, the prince feels helpless, unable to deal with them. We need to invent something new that can defeat the giant monkey king. The guy plans to use his new drunken sword technique against the king. Without special equipment, Li Yuguo dives into the lake to continue the fight. Swimming underwater without equipment is extremely difficult, but the guy is persistent, is approaching the monkey king again, full of strength, energy, and a desire to win. His appearance for the second time surprises the stone monkey. He expected to have destroyed this man. The monkey king is very angry. He gets to his feet and starts fighting with the prince. This time the guy uses the drunken sword technique, which the unsteady king cannot dodge. The prince decides it's time to end this fight. The monkey is hovering over him and wants to grab him with his hand. Yuguo takes a few sips to enhance the effect of the drunken sword techniques and defeats the monkey king. Tired and exhausted from the battle, he sits down near the remains of a stone monkey to rest. After drinking so much alcohol, the prince feels sick. It was better to drink vodka. The guy hears a noise in the clearing. Several people tied Zishan to a tree and interrogated him. They need to know where Li Guo is now when he comes and the guy says that Kun Hu might get hit in the face again. The guy didn't like the mention of his defeat very much, and he is still the first on the list of the land. Kun Hu, in his rage, swings his sword at the tied-up disciple and shouts at him to shut up. Yu Guo immediately comes to his brother's defense and asks him not to hurt him. The big man returns and tells Li Guo that he is the one he was looking for. The prince wonders why he needs him. Perhaps he wanted to spend the night with him. Maybe Li Guo's secret technique is bisexuality, or maybe he just drank too much. The prince's words made Kunha even more angry, and he shouts at the prince, otherwise he will kill him. Li Guo seems to be really drunk, so it's time to attack him. Yu Guo continues to court the boy, calling him handsome, complimenting him, flirting with him. He doesn't know how to react to such statements, shouts in anger that the guy is going to die. Yu Guo is amused by this. The angry tackler makes mistakes, and the guy successfully attacks him and deals damage. He injured a student of the internal school, and this incident must be reported to the institute. A table is set in San Cheng Yun's room, and Shi, Yu Guo, and their friends are having lunch. The prince is asked not to get drunk anymore because then he becomes uncontrollable. He apologizes, says it was an accident, it won't happen again. The girl congratulates the prince on the rapid achievement of the goal, but he just really wants buns. He is an incorrigible rude man, and the girl complains that her mentor sisters make fun of her because of him. Zishan asks Nurse Hu to teach her techniques, but maybe he wants to talk about more than just learning. The prince noticed that the boy was hitting on the girl, and it looked very funny from the outside. A red star is falling in the sky, which is not a good sign and may indicate that things may happen sooner than planned. Lumen's arrival in this world changed the course of events. Ye Chiang left the northern lands earlier, and the prince and landman are still alive. Only the centennial river of monsters is worse than Ye Chiang. Lumen has to stop it. San Men Yun saw that the prince was preoccupied with something, and she wondered what he was worried about. He doesn't know what wish to make, what he wants, and that's what he has to make. The boy asks the falling star to try bigger buns. The girl beats him for this desire and says that he is going to die. Someone called Yun, and she turned toward the voice. 
In front of her is a girl who looks like two peas in a pod, like her sister, twin. Zishan doesn't understand why there is another Yun Sanchin here, but the prince says that it is her younger sister. It was not for nothing that the prince wished he had big buns. San Cheng approaches his twin sister to ask what happened. The sister ran away from her own wedding. She doesn't want to marry the emperor's son and sacrifice herself to the family. She also wants to have her own life like her sister, and soon they will both be free. My sister says that Li Yuguo is very handsome. No wonder he captured San Cheng's heart. The sisters are beautiful. Zishan is jealous of the prince. He is very lucky. Primp is going for a walk with San Cheng. She always said that she and her sister have a bad relationship. At home, they got along well. They are twins and have telepathy, which interested the prince. They can sense each other at a distance, and if one is injured, the other will feel pain. Suddenly, the girl's legs give out, and she starts to fall, as if she is losing consciousness. The prince picks her up and asks her what happened. Maybe she drank too much wine and got dizzy. While in the embrace, the girl asks if the boy has thought about them both. I don't need to remind them of this. They have a lot ahead of them, she says, punching him in the chest. The guy says they will do a lot more together, takes her chin, and looks into her eyes. They embrace, standing under the moonlight while a starfall continues in the sky. The prince's hand gently moves up the girl's thigh towards the target. He covers her body with kisses and she moans with pleasure. The caresses become more open. The guy caresses San Chung's breasts, and she likes everything that happens between them. Meanwhile, her twin sister decides to take a bath to wash away her fatigue. She is enjoying the peace and quiet. Her sister has not returned yet. Suddenly, the girl feels as if she's being electrocuted, and she begins to feel everything that is happening to her sister. She says that the prince is a fool for doing this to her sister, but she also enjoys it. She is unlucky with her body, which reacts to Li Yugu's caresses intended for her sister. She feels her orgasm approaching, just a little bit more to go. The girl moans and wriggles as if the love game is happening to her, not her sister. The sisters were satisfied with the feelings and emotions they received. Six hours later, the lake shore, the smooth surface of the water, the trees around. The moon is shining on the lake. Lu Yuguo and Sun Cheng Yun sleep on the grass on the shore of this lake. A tiny turtle comes out of the lake and sits on the girl's chest. She wakes up from her sleep, picks up the shell, wakes up the boy to show him her find. The prince barely opens his eyes, asks the girl why he is awake in the middle of the night, what woke her up. She shows him the turtle that crawled out on her chest. It looks like the turtle king is alive. Yugu recognizes the baby turtle king and that he has been spying on their love games. The boy takes the turtle in his hands and jokingly asks if he was good last night, demanding an immediate answer. The young couple embrace. The prince compliments her, tells her that she smells very nice, and leans on her shoulder. A girl sits on top of a guy because she likes it that way, asking if he minds. They continue to make love. This time the girl is on top. New sensations overwhelm her. The lovers rise to the peak of pleasure. They completely surrender to each other in sex. As a result of last night, Zenshin can't walk normally. The night of love has tired her out. An angry sister runs out to meet them, pointing her finger at them and saying that she has a conversation. The prince is confused. The girl reminds him of her telepathic connection with her sister, and he needs to explain everything to his sister. The girl waves her sword, behaves like a fury, says words that humiliate the boy. He asks her not to be angry. I want to explain everything that happened between him and Yun. The sister is not satisfied. She shouts that he has dishonored her sister's honor and will be destroyed. She is furious with the men's lies. And then her sister didn't let her rest, but had sex all night. It seems that the girl has lost her mind, and the prince feels guilty about it. He has no choice but to tie her up to calm her down. The tentacles wrap around her body, restricting her movements, and she doesn't like the sticky feeling. My sister, caught in the dragon's tentacles, should have calmed down by now. The girl continues to scream that he is not human, he has killed her sister, and now he is going to kill her. He frees her from the tentacles of the thousand-armed dragon, and she falls to the ground. I think he overdid it. He shouldn't have offended his sister. He didn't really mean it. The girl screams that if he dares to touch her, she will not forgive him. She steps back, suddenly tripping over a stone, losing her balance. Behind her are cut bamboo trunks that are very sharp, and the prince warns the girl to be careful. He grabs her by the clothes, saving her from danger and injury, and prevents her from falling. The girl did not expect such generosity from the prince and sincerely thanks him. She does not understand how such a person can be both good and bad at the same time. 
The prince's eyes involuntarily stop on the beauty's breasts, and he is ashamed of his thought. His consciousness is clouded, and his thoughts refer to the impossible. Night falls over the city, and in one of the houses two sisters are discussing what happened the day before. Yuechen didn't like Li Yuguo, he insulted her by using the essence she doesn't understand why San Qin liked him. The prince bravely defended the people of Nalan, fought against enemies, and is the best of all people. San Chung asks her sister to go to bed early, but she needs to talk to the prince about tomorrow's visit to the Sky Tower. Yu Chung wonders how Li Yuguo was able to attach her sister to him so strongly. The prince and San Cheng Yun are standing in front of the entrance to the Heavenly Tower, intending to go inside. The prince has moved to the lower level of Wu Wang, and the girl is interested in why he touched her sister. As they approach the tower, a student watches, thinking the prince is a joker, and Yun Yang is handsome. Addressing them, he says they hug like a gay couple. The prince scornfully tells him that he is a real mutt. He wonders how they are going to pass the celestial tower if even strong masters die there. But if Yun serves him well, he will allow them to join his team. The prince reminds us that all the teams ran away from him. They don't need a watchdog. San Qin wants to go to the tower to train as soon as possible to find Li Yuguo's father's relic. The guy is angry. He wants to see what these two are capable of in the tower and how they will cope with the obstacles. Li Yuguo and San Qin Yan overcome obstacles to reach the fifth floor of the Sky Tower. There they are met by a stone monster, who without giving them time to prepare, immediately attacks them. A boy and a girl use a paired sword technique against him. But against this stone monster, this strong technique is not effective, it has a powerful defense. This monster has not only immunity, but also impenetrable armor. It is stronger than those on the first floor. Their level is not enough here. The girl suggests that they return. They have collected enough monsters, albeit white. The prince has another proposal that will increase his level. He extends his hand to the girl. Holding her around the waist, he suggests that they practice a little more, hinting that they should have sex. The stone monster will not attack if they do not approach it. All of the girl's white clothes fall to her feet, and she is ready to continue her practice. The prince's hand is between the girl's legs, and they have sex. A student who met them at the entrance to the tower watches them from behind a stone mountain. He is very surprised that Yun San turned out to be a girl. He's happy that he learned about this secret. It may come in handy in the future. Yuechen felt that Li Yuguo was with her sister again, and she was ready for revenge. Again through her body she feels everything that is happening to her sister. San Cheng said they went to the Sky Tower so they had sex right there. My mother used to say that because of their peculiarity girls would fall in love with the same person. It's not fair that while one sister is enjoying herself, the other has to suffer. Yuechen has tears in her eyes, and she is burned to feel everything she feels in Sanchen Yun Tower. Sitting on the floor and hugging her knees, she has to come up with something. She can't go on like this. If her sister is convinced that Li Yuguo is a traitor, she may leave him. Bai Jushan is sitting on the doorstep of the house, and San Cheng Yun is approaching him. The guy asks why she came, and the girl brings the prince something he forgot. She enters the house with the intention of finding proof that the prince is a womanizer and showing his sister his true face. The girl is disappointed that in half a day she has not found any evidence of the prince's dissolute life. She finds the boy's bed very comfortable and it was foolish to give it to someone like Li Yuguo. She sits down comfortably on the guy's bed and decides to take a little nap. Meanwhile, Li Yuguo says goodbye to San Cheng Yun, who is about to go to her room because her sister has been alone for a long time. Zishan doesn't understand what's going on. He saw San Cheng just enter the house, and now she's back here again. He tries to tell the prince, but he interrupts him, asking why he doesn't study medicinal herbs. The guy starts to speak for the second time, but the prince interrupts him again, saying that he understands everything, that he shouldn't speak out loud. He has to give the prince the promised pill, and the prince will look after him in the meantime. Zishan tried to warn Yuguo, but he wouldn't let him, so he shouldn't be offended later. The prince opens the door to his room and stops dead in his tracks at what he sees. On his bed is San Chin, who was supposed to go to her sister's house but came to him. He is overwhelmed with desire, ready to make love immediately and lies down next to the girl. She asks him what he's doing and he's ready to practice. The girl wants to explain that he has misunderstood everything, that she is not really San Chen. But the prince doesn't want to hear anything. He covers her mouth with a kiss and begins to caress her. San Cheng feels aroused and touched by her body even though she is alone. She realizes that it is obvious that her sister is having sex with someone. The girl cannot contain her excitement and influence the process. A characteristic stain appears on the sheet, 
These are not women's days, but something else. He is horrified to realize that he was with Yuechen, and the girl explains that she was looking for her sister, fell asleep, and then he came. The prince cannot forgive himself for what he did to his sisters. Yuecheng reassures him, saying that in fact it has been ready for a long time. Two sisters like the guy at the same time, and because of the peculiarity of the girls' bodies, they will be able to marry the same person. Suddenly the door opens and San Cheng runs into the room demanding an explanation. She is furious and suggests that they beat the boy up together for his actions. Zishan is standing near the tower and asks the prince how he is feeling now. His lower back hurts. Zishan has to take a pill as soon as possible, and Yokin suggests going to the tower another day. This year, the tower will be counted, and only ten teams will be able to participate in the Spiritual Hill Challenge. It is an island in the South Sea where, according to legend, the masters killed a Wujun dragon and both sides suffered. There are many ghosts on the island, and each institute gathers the strongest students and sends them in search of the inheritance, where you can achieve great success. The guy at the entrance of the tower scoffs at the fact that they want to make it to the top ten. He tells the girls that they are beautiful, but that the guy next to them is no good, and invites them to join him. Lee looks back at the guy. He will definitely make him keep his mouth shut. The prince offers a bet that if his team wins, the opponent will give him his family's star medal. If the prince loses, he is ready to give his maid to a beautiful woman. But the guy says he doesn't want a maid. He wants something else. Pointing to San Cheng Yun and her sister, he says that if he wins, he wants them. All those present are surprised by his decision, as he thinks that he can have a good time with his beautiful sisters. Leaning over to the prince, he informs him that he has seen everything, and if he does not agree, everyone will know that Yun San Cheng is hiding in the institute. The prince is forced to accept this condition, and notes to himself that having sex in the open air was a bad idea. They climb to the fifth floor to the stone monster they couldn't overcome last time. Yoi Chung wonders if this stone monster really did not allow them to move the tower further. Zishan reads a book that says that the stone king is outwardly strong, but his crystal is hidden in his back and this is his weak point. Zishan got this book in exchange for pills from another student. The prince confidently takes up his sword, and this knowledge gives him an understanding of what to do next. He and Nia Xiaoqian will distract. Now his level allows him to control two bodies. The rest enter from the back. The stone monster wakes up. He feels that danger is approaching him. The prince and the puppet attack the monster from the head while the others wait for the right moment. The guy's tactics worked perfectly and they manage to defeat the stone monster. Bai Zhishan gives all the participants in the battle restorative pills to replenish their energy. For the prince, the pills are like cookies and it also perfectly restores lost strength. The guy needs to sell these pills, and he is working on making the pill a substitute for a daily meal. There are no strong opponents on the next floors, but on the tenth floor there is a swamp ghost that needs to be defeated. The prince asks his friend to stay close by, but first they have to go through the rest of the floors. The friends end their journey through the sky tower and go outside. They have overcome nine floors, and the only thing left is a swamp ghost that knows how to disguise itself well. After an exhausting day, Yuguo feels like taking a walk. He wants to sell something and make more money, and Yukin is very eager to go along. San Cheng Yan asks the prince to look after his sister. She is going to rest. Yugu reminds his friend not to forget to sell the Stone King crystal, and he remembers. A boy and a girl are riding in a carriage through a picturesque mountainous area. During this time, the prince's scale grew nicely, while Ye Chiang's scale fell by 20%. He is thinking about how to improve his level while the girl next to him sits silently. The guy studies Ali Mam's panel and sees that a new button has appeared on it. There are also a lot of wonderful things of the highest quality. He did not expect the celestial eye he found in the cave of the celestial moon to be so expensive. In addition, it can be enhanced and be able to see through bodies and materials. It is possible that after improvement, it will have additional functions in addition to X-ray vision. The girl who had been sitting quietly by the boy's side closes the curtains on the carriage window. The prince asks her what's wrong. Maybe she's worried or in pain. The girl sits down very close to the boy and takes his hand. She's eager to practice right here and the prince does not refuse her wish. The carriage arrives at a trading company. A boy and a girl get out and Yang Ning's sister walks towards them. She notices that there is something unusual about the boy's appearance. He is too red. Li Yuguo greets him and says that he has a valuable product that he wants to sell in the trading company. The girl asks if he is feeling well because she is worried about his appearance. 
he asks her to look at his products that she will definitely like. The prince turns to his magic golden ring for help. Ning is presented with ground pepper, cumin, glass, and ceramics, and she asks him where he got it all. Leaving the goods at the trading company, the prince leaves because he has other plans, and he will see Nin another time. The girl compliments his companion and emphasizes that he has a good relationship with the opposite sex. Li Yuguo and Yuichen come to the premises of the Changdu Stone Shop. Here they sell stones that can have lins, and you can either make money or lose everything. So many people cry in the store. The prince notices a young man who looks familiar. This is Gao Fu Hao. He seems to be very happy to see Li Guo and San Cheng in the store. He wants to give the prince some stones that he bought for himself. The prince is happy to accept such an original gift from Fu Hao. They come to a table with many stones on it, and the prince can choose one. The girl asks if he knows about such things, and he is sure that his intuition will not let him down. It's great to have X-ray vision and the ability to use it when needed. There are a lot of stones, but only a few have lenses, and the probability of finding them is very low. The prince points to the selected stones. Gao Fu Hao takes the rest and offers to break them. The guy's stones turn out to be empty. He is disappointed and only luck helps him. He asks Li Guo how he's doing with his stones. All ten stones have lenses and the boy is considered lucky. To the surprised looks of the store's visitors, the guy replies that his eye is trained to see valuable items. Gao Fu Hao asks Li if he has any secret technique, and he replies that it's just a matter of wit. The guy says goodbye, it's time to go back, and Gao hopes to see him again some other time. He didn't believe the prince's words about his wit, and suspects that it was something else. He instructs his servant to find out everything about Li Guo. The girl admires Yu Guo, and he replies that he deliberately decided to give himself away. The couple is walking down an alley, and they hear someone calling out to Li from behind. Hoppitz realizes that his plan has worked, he has been exposed. Gao asks if he should be called Li Guo or Lu Yu Guo. He notes that they quickly learned about his true identity. He didn't mind being exposed and wants to be told directly what is required of him. The prince is very smart, so Gao Fu Hao wants to make a deal with him. Li Yu Guo is interested in the terms and details of this transaction. Gao's father is about to die and his brother Gao Fu Shuang, who is a Wu Wang master, is to succeed him. Yu Guo is offered to take out his rival for a reward. If he agrees, he will receive a good reward. If he refuses, five families will know where he is. Yocheng asks if they are being threatened, and he is sure that it is better to agree to such conditions. Gao Fu Hao gives the boy the armor of yin and yang, which will be useful and protect him. This armor of yin and yang is a real treasure, and the prince is as happy as a child to receive it. A real blue steel stove is brought from the Bai Zhishan Trading Company. The assistant is very happy. With this oven, he will be able to prepare pills faster. Yochen is tired from the trip and goes to bed, while Bai Zhishan happily goes to prepare pills. Sancheng learned that Gao Fushuang had reached the 20th floor and had already lost three people. They immediately need to figure out a way to pass the 10th level. The girl often dreams of a black hole that sucks in all life. She thinks that the prince is hiding something from her. The prince sees that the girl is very smart, so he decides to tell her the whole truth. In fact, he traveled to this world to save it from the disaster that would happen nine years later. His arrival here changed everything, including the girl's fate. Despite the shocking confessions, the girl hugs the boy sincerely. She doesn't care who he really is. When they first met, he was the same person. The friends are in a sky tower on the tenth floor, and the prince asks if everyone is ready. They should act in accordance with a previously agreed plan. Yuguo is the first to fight the monster guarding the tenth floor. The monster, confident in its power, calls him to it, and the boy passes through it. This maneuver causes significant damage to his opponent. Bai Zhishan quickly shackles the monster with heavy-duty metal chains. He asks the boy to act quickly because the formation will not last long. Yu Guo uses the superpower of a new power, the Heavenly Eye, to fight. The Heavenly Eye pierces through their opponent with X-rays. With a terrible scream, the monster dies, struck by the ruthless X-rays. He disappears forever in a powerful radioactive explosion. As a reward, his friends get the crystal that contained his power. The victory was possible thanks to the information he gave Prince Bai. Li Yuguo has a headache, and his eyes are suffering from a significant strain. He covers his face with his hands. His friends ask what happened to him. It may be the consequences of using this magic, and he should rest. His sisters were really scared for his health, and he jokes that he is ready to go to the next floor. They reach the 19th floor and catch up with Gao Fushui. Only Gao Fushua and his team reach this floor, and the labyrinth changes here. The walls have a barrier, so you can't fly over. 
You have to look for a way out, and since there are many forks, it's better to split up. The guy gives the girls a walkie-talkie and explains that it is an artifact capable of transmitting voice. San Cheng picks up the radio and reminds him that their connection is much stronger. The girls go in different directions and ask each other to be careful. The use of the heavenly eye can cause blindness, and the guy has a headache. The guy started having headaches again, probably because he had too much sex. San Cheng turns on the radio and says that there is a problem. The prince responds he wants details of what happened. San Cheng reports with tears in her eyes that her sister is missing. Yoikin is in a clearing among the flowers and is captivated by the beauty of the labyrinth. She bends down to the flowers to enjoy their beauty and examine them closer. White Indian dope turned out to be beautiful flowers with a bright aroma. She looks up and sees Gao Fushuang, who had been following her all along. Given that it's just the two of them, he intends to have fun with her. He is not only a pervert but also a stalker, and the girl asks him not to touch her. The guy approaches her, intending to carry out his plan. His entire team died, and he was left alone on the 20th floor. He waited for a long time for someone to separate from the others to disrupt their plans, and finally waited for her. The girl says that this labyrinth is confusing. Someone is coming to her, and she defends herself with a sword. She suddenly brings her legs together, seemingly in great pain. The girl falls down, and there are poisonous ones on the lawn that cannot be recognized immediately. She really regrets that she did not bring a walkie-talkie for communication. It would have come in handy now. Using her telepathic abilities, she writes the boy's name on his hand. Sanchin feels a sudden pain in her arm, and she receives a notification from her sister. Hieroglyphs appear in her hand, signifying the name of their opponent. The girl tells her friends that Gao Fu Shuang has caught her sister and she needs to be rescued immediately. The prince is boiling with anger. He will punish Gao for daring to touch his woman. Then the events are transferred to the Gao family's house, with a guard standing at the entrance to the house. He watches an aggressive group of people running toward the house. Yu Guo, San Cheng, and Zhi Shan try to break through the guards and into the house. The guy deals with the guards who prevent him from getting inside the house. They are greeted by Gao Fushuang, who asks what kind of stray dogs are making a fuss in his house in the middle of the day. He asks the prince if he has come to admit defeat because he could not pass the heavenly tower. Li Yuguo and San Cheng Yun demand that Yue Cheng be handed over immediately and die with dignity. Gao informs him that the girl is not in the house, and they have to leave the house before they make things worse for themselves. Fu Shuang realizes that the prince will not leave this house without the girl. Yu Guo is determined to find and take away Yue Chen, and nothing can stop him. Gan reminds us that he's at the Wu Wang level of spice, and it will be difficult for Li to resist him. Hearing a noise in the house, the head of the family, Gao Fuwen, comes out to them. He is confident that everything can be resolved amicably, so he offers to sit down and discuss everything that happened. Yu Guo also does not want to quarrel. He knows that Gao Fuwen is a good man, but his son has taken the prince's wife and must return her. The father is convinced of his son's honesty, and the prince can check the house. The guy knows that everything is fine with the girl, and if something bad happened, Senshin would feel it. With his X-ray vision, he scans the house. The girl is not here. She seems to be somewhere else. The boy refuses to search the family's house out of respect for Lord Gao. He says goodbye and leaves. Gao's servant, through San Chin, handed an envelope to Yuguo, perhaps containing valuable information. The boy opens the letter hopefully, hoping to find the girl's whereabouts. The letter was handed over by Fu Hao's older brother, with whom Yuguo has an agreement, and he writes that the girl is now in a prayer room. The boy is ready to go to save Yuqin, and Bai Ji Shan and San Cheng Yun have to help him. The prince goes to a prayer hall, hoping to find a girl there. He knows that the girl is fine, but for some reason his heart is uneasy. He has to stop because he feels a severe headache. Leaning on the bridge railing and still conscious, he hears that he has freed someone from the abyss. Surprised, he looks around, trying to find the person who addressed him. In the water, he sees his distorted image, but he is looking at himself from the other side. Frightened by this vision, he falls to the ground and screams, and passers-by think he is sick. It may be a hallucination that arose as a result of his overwork. He continues on his way to the prayer room because the first priority is to save the girl. But the voice in his head does not disappear. He asks to give him Yuguo's body. The prince thinks that this is his essence, but a thousand-armed demon cannot become the essence of a person. He intends to experience another world that exists outside his cage. Since Lumen discovered the truth about this world, his cage has begun to open. The guy does not understand what he has to do and what the unknown monster wants from him. 
The headache is growing, and it seems that his brain is flying apart. The people around him feel bad energy. They need to move away. This guy has problems with his head. While in the boy's body, the thousand-armed demon destroys people around him. The boy asks to stop killing innocents, but the demon thinks he is freeing them. Then the being in the body of a prince goes to the prayer room to enjoy a normal meal. Yoshin is tied to a column and asks the guard to let her go immediately. He was ordered to protect her, so she shouldn't cause any problems for him. Finally, Li Yuguo appears in the prayer room looking strange because he is controlled by a demon. The girl rejoices because she is convinced that it is the real Yuguo who has come to free her. The guard tries to protect the girl, but the tentacle pierces his body. The prince's body approaches the girl, and she freezes in terror. The girl asks not to be touched. She does not recognize this creature, Guo, as the one she knows. Being held captive by the dragon's tentacles, the boy asks to be released, and the dragon says that he will help him get rid of it. The red, slippery tentacles approach the girl, and she tries to turn away. The prince can't control his body. He struggles, but that force is much stronger. Gao Fushuang appears in the prayer room, convinced that the boy will not be able to save the girl. He will show Li Yu Guo his true Wu Wang skill and destroy him. The demon is irritated by the praise of a Wu Wang master, and he must die. Gao does not recognize his opponent. He has been very skillful at hiding his true strength. He has to destroy Yu Guo today no matter what, so he continues to fight. The eagle's paw should have caused the boy life-threatening injuries. No one gave Yu Guo the right to be insolent. The dragon, although it has removed the seal, cannot eat this guy's power. Despite this, the monster considers his opponent to be small trash. Gao continues to fight, but with every passing minute, his strength is leaving him. He realizes that he is lost. The tentacle pierces him through and through, and he wants to take the prince with him. The eagle spirit is ordered to burn his enemy, and he attacks Yu Guo. The hundred-armed dragon also begins to disintegrate, leaving the body of the prince. The guy is freed from the demon and regains consciousness, and his friends ask him if he is okay and where he is hurting. Hugging his twin sisters, he says that he is fine. He is just tired. He thinks that the demon's power has not been fully restored. Otherwise, he would not have lost control, and he needs to find the reason for its awakening. Gao Fu Hao approaches them. He envies the prince because he is surrounded by such beauties. The guy brought the promised reward. He is always honest in his dealings and gives Yu Guo everything he needs. Hoping for further cooperation, he leaves so as not to interfere with the prince's enjoyment. Yu Guo explains that he agreed to this cooperation because even if Gao Fushuang had lost the dispute, he would not have fulfilled its terms. Bai Jishan wonders if they will continue to conquer the Sky Tower. They need to conquer all 20 floors to qualify. On the 20th floor lives the Ice Phoenix, whose clutches killed all of Goa Fushuang's comrades. The boy thinks about the tactics of their actions in the fight against the new challenge. A huge white bird approaches them from the mountain, which is the Ice Phoenix. Instead of feathers, it has sharp ice icicles, and its eyes glow with moonlight. The prince throws a fire pill at it and hopes that the bird will catch it. Guided by instinct, the bird swallows a pill that resembles a grain in its shape. As soon as Yuguo activates the sword pill, the ice phoenix's head explodes. The prince activates the pill, but nothing happens to the bird. The pill could have broken or phoenix could have frozen it inside his body. They run away. Their legs begin to be bound by the ice, and it seems that they are dead. Sanchen comes to the rescue and melts the ice around them with a fire sword. Forming a circle of fire around the boys, San Cheng attacks the ice phoenix. Her fire phoenix essence inherently suppresses the ice phoenix. The girl asks her friends to stand back. She can handle the phoenix herself. The ice phoenix gradually begins to melt away from the girl's fiery essence. But the ice bird does not retreat. It flies away from her at a dangerous distance. From its beak come streams of icy air that freezes everything around. The boys warn the girl to be careful because the frosty air can harm her. A fiery phoenix appears behind the girl's back, its heat depriving her of strength. In the fight, two elements of equal power, fire and ice, come together. Yu Guo notes that San Cheng wins, no wonder she is a fiery phoenix. The ice phoenix bursts into flames and San Cheng manages to tame it. She signals the prince to enter the battle, realizing their previous plan. The sword's pill was supposed to melt from the fire and the guy activates it. There is an explosion that tears the phoenix's head off and leads to its destruction. Then the events take us to the main hall of the Institute's errands. Here, Guo is congratulated on passing the 20th floor and to qualify, he must fulfill the sect's instructions. Bai suggests choosing the easiest task, but Yu Guo decides to choose the most difficult one. 
In the village of Tanghua, a blue-blooded wolf eats babies, usually appears when demons attack, and they need to find out why it appeared and destroy it. The prince returns the book with the tasks and shows which one he is going to do. At dinner, Bai laments that H. Meyer likes a strong guy and is inferior to him. Yuguo advises him not to worry, to be sincere, and sooner or later he will win her heart. Yuchen serves the prince dinner, and he must eat well because they have to run errands tomorrow. A guy sees a bull's penis on a plate and asks the girl why she cooked it. This girl squeezes all the juices out of him, forcing him to make love often, and only the technique of divine wisdom helps him to hold on. Sanchin also puts a plate in front of him, and he did not expect such attention. He has to eat a kidney. They are going to practice doubles technique today. The twin sisters force him to eat, and he can only listen to them. He takes the plates and eats, looking like he's going to have a hot night and a lot of practice tonight. The village of Tianhua resembles a horror movie, with charred trees and dilapidated houses on the streets. The girls see that the prince's nose is bleeding. He must have overdone it a bit yesterday. They do not meet people along the way, there are no elders, and they have a bad feeling. Bai Jishan notices a well ahead of him, with a girl sitting by it. They approach her and ask if she knows where the village elder is. The girl returns and her friends see her face disfigured by ulcers and blisters. Zishan is terrified and mistakes her for a demon, but the prince reassures him that she is just a girl. The girl says that her name is Jun Xiao Xiao, and that all the villagers have hidden in the mountains because monster hunters are coming. Her parents were killed, she was not taken to the mountains, they said she was a monster. Yugu hugs the girl, asks her to calm down and not cry, and promises to protect her. Several burly men approach them through the empty large village. Among them is the elder of the village of Tianhua, and he asks them what they came for. Yugo says that they are here on behalf of the Institute of Heavenly Power, and the elder asks them to follow him. He leads them to the monster's lair. Its strength is about the level of Wu Wang, and they have to be careful. A blue-blooded wolf usually ambushes you in caves, so you need to come up with a way to lure it out. Zhishan reminds us that the wolf loves small children, so we can use the girl as bait. Yuqing says that children should not be used as bait, but Yuguo will not let the girl be offended, and they will be able to finish the task as soon as possible. After thinking about it, the prince hugs the girl and says that this method is really good. A tied-up girl lies at the entrance to the cave and screams, luring a blue-blooded wolf away. The wolf hears this cry and takes the bait that has been set for him. He comes out of the cave and sees a girl, who asks him not to approach her. The wolf takes her in his hand, she begs him not to eat her, the wolf says that she is not his to command. Taking advantage of the wolf's attention being focused on the girl, the twin sisters attack him. The wolf leaves the girl alone and defends itself from an unexpected attack, scattering the sisters in different directions. The prince sees that the girls need help and comes to their aid. He manages to repel the wolf's first attack and throws it away from them. The wolf is very strong. Its strength is about the level of Wu Huan. They have to be careful. The wolf is furious at the unexpected attack on him and the fact that they want to destroy him. He calls his attackers idiots and throws large, heavy stones at them. Sanchin sees that her sister is in danger and yells at her to be careful. The wolf caught the girl from behind. She did not notice it, so she did not have time to defend herself. With all his strength, the wolf strikes them and the girl flies off into the depths of the cave. Everything happened so fast that San Cheng and Li Yugu did not have time to react and come to the rescue. San Cheng is suddenly pierced by a pain in her stomach. Vina crouches down, their bodies synchronized. The prince is furious that the blue-blooded wolf dared to injure his wife. Despite the difference in strength, he enters the battle, striking the wolf with his sword. This makes the wolf very angry. He says that the boy will soon be finished. The red tentacles of a thousand-armed dragon appear from the ground and the wolf asks what kind of monsters they are. Taking advantage of his confusion, Yuguo stabs him with his sword. The opponent's forces are unequal, and the wolf manages to bite the prince's sword in half. He delivers a powerful blow to the guy who loses his balance and falls. The guy is sitting on the ground near a tree, holding his chest, unable to overcome the wolf. The beast advances again, confident in its strength, which the boy lacks. Suddenly, Xiao Xiao runs out to them on the lawn, wanting to protect the prince. She stands between them and tells them that the monster will not hurt Yu Guo, who asks the girl to run away. In anger, the beast clutches the girl tightly with its claws, and a large red wound forms in her back. The boy was desperate. The girl wanted to protect him and was seriously injured. Her body is lying on the ground, and he runs to her, hoping that he can still save her. 
He takes the girl in his arms. She asks him to get her new clothes, and he likes her. Gathering her strength and closing her eyes, she asks me not to worry about her. The boy asks her not to fall asleep, saying that everything will be fine, and the girl wipes the tears from his eyes. She walks away, falling to her knees, and he shouts her name to the whole forest. He is haunted by a demon who asks him to take his power and avenge this girl. The wolf does not understand the boy's grief. For him, the girl was just another monster. The prince's body gradually begins to incarnate his terrible demon. The wolf sees a red liquid flowing out of the girl's body and rises up. Fast red whips are flying around the animal, and it does not have time to dodge them. The wolf is attacked from behind by Yuguo, who strikes him hard. The blow to the head breaks the wolf's jaw. He did not expect such force. The demonic essence has completely taken over the boy's body, and the wolf has no time to fight back. He wants to know who he is and where he got this demonic power from. The prince's friends are watching this dangerous and powerful battle. After defeating the wolf, the boy falls to the ground, very tired from the fight. His body still does not belong to him, it is controlled by his demon. The demon asks him to merge into one, to give him his body and his anger. Sancheng runs up to him. She asks who he is talking to, and he says that he is fine. Obviously, after Gao Fushui's blow, this monster was quite weakened. As night falls, her friends buried Sun Saoxia under a tree and paid their last respects. In the cave of the blue-blooded wolf, friends found many remains of bodies. They also found the elder's clothes. They were absolutely intact, but they could not find the elder. Yuguo admits that this elder could have been a blue-blooded wolf. Zishan brings out the bone of a Yao animal from the hole and asks the prince to look at it. It's like a game show dice. It's possible that the monsters may come sooner than expected. The wolf needs the red fluid of the human body to make a weapon out of this bone. Bai Zishan says that this bone looks scary. The wolf didn't have time to improve it. The prince will find a way to destroy this monster. The friends return to the city and are met by Lin Huang at the palace's threshold, and something has obviously happened. He holds an urgent letter from the city of Tanglin and hands it to Yuguo. The letter says that there is trouble in the city of Tanglan. Nalan Men asks him to return urgently. Outside the city of Tanglan, it is night. The city is surrounded by the tent camp of the prince's army. Prince Nalan Ju of Nalan City is having dinner and drinking wine in his tent. A servant enters his tent and informs him that the emperor's second son is inviting him to a feast. He throws a plate at him and yells at him to go away, does not accept his invitation. He is angry with his brother and resigns himself to the fact that the throne of the emperor will belong to him. In the army commander's camp, a servant reports that his highness has ordered him not to be distracted from drinking wine. The main heir to the emperor, the second prince, says he doesn't care. He has an army of 100,000 strong soldiers. Ye Chiang reports that Tanglan already belongs to them. The city gates are blocked, and there is only a few days' worth of food and water left in the city. By that time, they will not need an army, and the deposit of fire crystals will be theirs, and then the emperor will understand to whom he should give the throne. The second prince promises that Ye Chiang will become the chief official after they capture the city. Ye Chiang dreams of destroying Nalan, defeating the city, and seeing what Li Yugu will do then. The forest king meets Li Yuguo and his friends and is happy that he has finally arrived. There is a meeting in the palace of Teng Men. There is no food and water coming into the city. It will not last even a few days. Nalan Men is interested in what suggestions we have. Yun Fan reports that his majesty is interested in the fire crystal deposits, and even if Yuguo returns, he will not have the strength to fight for it. Lanmen is convinced that there must also be a way out of the situation. Yuguo enters the palace and says that if they summon an invasion of demons, they have a chance to overcome this crisis. The princess is surprised by the appearance of her husband. She is very happy to see him and expects him to support her. They wake up, and the guy assures her that she has already suffered enough, so he takes care of the rest of the city. Yun Fan asks how the demon invasion will help them, and Yu Guo replies that someone needs to throw the bone of the Esks into the black abyss of demons, which will cause a century-long invasion. At the time of the invasion, the enemy army will be on its knees and ask to be allowed in. Yu Guo and Yun Fan discuss their next steps, and the prince asks his friend if he has thought carefully about whether there is a chance of dying in this room. Drinking wine, the guy says that the prince underestimates him, that there are few people in this world who can compare to him. 
If the demon invasion solves the problem, the demon leader will attack the camp. Both sides will suffer losses, but the walls of their city are very strong. The guys continue to drink wine, convinced that with them the city of Tanglin will overcome all difficulties. Upon his return, the king of thieves will make the prince the godfather of his child. He is confident that with such a mentor his son will be the strongest and then they will serve the city together. The prince accepts this offer, he will wait for him to return with victory. Friends are enjoying a chat after a long time apart, hugging and drinking wine. Their party continues with songs of praise in honor of the city of Tanglin. The prince realizes that when demons invade, it is imperative to take care of escape routes. Two soldiers stand guard on the watchtower of the wax camp that is holding the siege of Tanlin. One of them notices that the sky is becoming restless. A flock of birds is rising and something is approaching the camp. He wakes up his partner and asks him to tell him what he sees in the dark. A wounded man is approaching the camp, and there is no need to be afraid of him. It is the King of Thieves, Yunfan. One of the guards sees that the man is running away from someone and asks the other to make sure. What they saw shocked the guards, and they realized that the pursuers of the wounded man were a threat to the army. You must immediately stop this person and prevent the monsters from approaching the tent city. Yunfan ran more than 30 li to bring the demons under the walls of his city. The soldiers understand the threat he poses to the entire army, and they need to destroy him immediately. Ye Chiang strikes at the King of Thieves. He is sure that this is the best chance to destroy the enemy. Yun Fan smiles gloatingly. Ye Chiang does not realize the danger of the demon invasion. On the battlefield, the order is given to launch an attack and destroy the person who brought the monsters to the army. Yu Guo has a vision of the King of Thieves thanking him for saving his family from starvation. Also the moment when the King of Thieves saves him by carrying him off the battlefield. The next memory is about the King of Thieves' joy at the news that he will have a child. We can also see their last meeting, where the King of Thieves says that his son will be the strongest with such a mentor. He hears his friend saying goodbye to him and hopes that in the next life they will become brothers again. Yoikin notices the prince's condition and asks him excitedly what he saw. From the city walls, you can see the invasion of demons, and the residents hope that now their problem will be solved. Li Yuguo does not hide his emotions, crying for his friend, he will definitely avenge him. Horrific events unfold in the tent camp as a demon invasion destroys everyone in its path. The warriors bravely destroy the demons, but they are outnumbered both in strength and in numbers. Demons inflict damage on everyone, regardless of who is in front of them. No one expected that being a brave and strong warrior could be killed by a bunch of monsters. Meanwhile, the army's numbers are decreasing, and the number of wounded and killed soldiers is growing. The soldiers report that they need to come up with something, because they will not last long. The commander-in-chief does not understand where these monsters came from and what he will say to his father about the loss of such a large army. One of the soldiers sees a flame appearing over the city and calls for the command to show them. At first, Ye Chiang thinks it's the burning city of Teng Men and gloats about it. Then they realize that this is how Li Yuguo gets their attention, by giving this sign. The number of demons is several times higher than the army's strength, and the commander-in-chief believes that the best way out of the situation is to retreat. He speaks to his soldiers who trust him and have a way to protect them if they go with him. The soldiers understand the real situation, express confidence in their command, and are ready to go along with it. They form a detachment and, led by their commander, approach the walls of the city of Tanlin. The prince of the heavenly state asks them to take them in and they promise not to attack the city anymore and to defend it. Ye Chiang does not agree with this decision. He suggests that they fight a battle right now to win. This will give them a chance to survive. Yugu is surprised by Ye Chiang's indifference to the lives of his subordinates. They have already lost many people, and they may lose them all. Yuguo's appearance on the wall surprises Ye Chiang, who was convinced that his enemy was no longer in this world. The soldiers are angry that Ye Chiang is the cause of their comrades' deaths. They want to punish him. They have families, too. Ye Chiang tries to deny this, but Yu Guo says that he wanted to cooperate and develop the city. Ye decided to seize the fire crystal deposit and destroy everything around him. Yu Guo orders his soldiers to open fire and destroy the remnants of the enemy army. Ye Chiang does not believe that Yu Guo can take advantage of someone else's misfortune to win. Hundreds of fiery arrows fly over the walls of the fortress, designed to destroy the remnants of the enemy. The warriors are left to their own devices, running away from arrows in a panic, 
protecting themselves with their shields. On the other hand, they see monsters approaching the city walls. The army commander-in-chief orders everyone to immediately drop their weapons and enter the city. Princess Landman informs the prince that he needs to go down to the city gates and save all his enemies. The prince hopes that the monsters have had enough and will go away, so we can say that the crisis is over. He is very sad about the loss of his best friend, the King of Thieves, who saved the city at the cost of his life. The prince's thoughts return to Yunfan, watching the tent city of his enemies burn. He imagines the last moments of his life and the suffering he had to go through. He recalls their promise to drink wine together after their victory. In his mind, he hugs his friend and asks why he did not keep his vow. If he had been there for his friend, he would have helped him and saved his life. The friends watch the fire and smoke dissipate on the battlefield and are amazed by the picture. The bodies of warriors and demons are scattered across the field, the power of the monsters trampling people like ants. Bai Zhishan is in awe of this view, which should have evoked sadness. Ye Chong and the army commander-in-chief are looking for Li Yuguo. They want to leave the city. Yu Guo doesn't let them leave the city even though the monsters are gone and the danger has disappeared. If they want to leave the city, the prince will let them go, but he has one condition. His enemies and at the same time his captives are interested in what this condition is and whether they can fulfill it. The guy wants Ye Chiang to kneel in front of his late friend and bow to him three times. A member of the Yi family refuses to comply with this demand. Yu Guo is not afraid of his enemy's soldiers. They will not be able to harm him. Ye Chiang is furious. He shows the prince his fist. Sweat appears on his forehead, and he bends to the prince's will. But the commander-in-chief orders him to bow, and he is forced to obey only because he wants to keep his place in the family. Making a tremendous effort, the boy kneels before the body of the King of Thieves. The prince warns Ye Chiang that if he dares to attack the city again, he will send him to his ancestors. The coffin with the body of the King of Thieves is standing in the hall of the Palace of Tanlin and the last rites are being performed. Nalan Jue asks if they can go free. Ye Chiang complies, and Yu Guo lets them go. They turn around and leave, but Ju comes up with a brilliant idea. Meanwhile, Ye Chiang wants to explain to him what happened and justify herself. At the same time, he is convinced that the day will come when he will get even with Yu Guo. Nalan Jue and Ji Wu Shuang go to the palace because they have an important conversation with Li Yu Guo. They express their admiration for him and say that enlisting the help of monsters was the best decision. Their words flatter the prince's ego and he is convinced that he is not worthy of such praise. The boy realizes that this prince does not play favorites, but he has his own ambitions, and it seems that he is also against Yu Guo. The heir to the throne offers to become sworn brothers with Ushan. This proposal surprises the prince, but the city of Tanglan will be able to withstand enemies and will be protected from the five families. He decides to use this opportunity to disrupt San Juan's plot. Vic says out loud that such an offer is a great honor. He cannot refuse it. Nalan Jue feels that Yuguo has a great mysterious power. He will help their family become one of the five main families. The prince offers to become their brothers right in front of the body of the king of thieves, calling him as a witness. They take cups of wine and declare their oath in front of the body of the king of thieves, and Nalan Jui is the first to speak. Kneeling in front of his friend, Li Yuguo joins him in his words. The third person to raise his cup and call out his name is Ji Wushuang. They say together that from now on they have become brothers and will stand shoulder to shoulder until death. They call upon heaven and earth to witness them and swear allegiance to each other. At night, Prince Li Yuguo cries over his friend's browstone and asks why he did not keep his word. He is grieving and asks why his friend is now lying down and cannot get up, even though he promised to drink with him in the city palace. Lenman finds him in such a terrible state, and she says that the King of Thieves would not want to see his friend drunk. The guy is crying. He sacrificed his life for him. He will not be able to return to his wife and see his son grow up. He blames himself for his friend's death. If he had had enough strength, he would not have had to endanger Yunfan. The girl hugs him and says that all this time he has endured her bad attitude and even sacrificed his reputation for the sake of the city. The princess embraces her husband and begins to kiss him passionately. He did not expect this from her, but he accepts her caresses and they begin to fall in love. The guy is glad that today they will truly become husband and wife and thanks her for not leaving him. He frees his wife from her clothes and they start having sex right there on the grass. They surrender to each other and a real fire of passion breaks out between them. San Cheng Yun is sitting at the table when Wushan enters the room and she is surprised to see him. 
The girl asks him if he came to see Yuguo, and the boy replies that he came to see her. Yun is surprised because they don't have anything in common, and waits to hear what he has to say next. He informs her that he has received bad news that her mother has died. A carriage drawn by a single horse, driven by a groom, rides along the sunny streets of the city. Sitting in the boat, the prince reflects on the cunning and deceitfulness of the rulers and does not know what to expect from the audience. Three young men who have been married pass through the square and approach the palace. They bow in respect to the emperor, and Zhu reports to his father that he has brought Li Yugu. The guard Nalanjie orders the guards of the Imager to enter the hall. They obeyed the order and took all three boys into the ring with their spears. Yuguo asks him to stop. He has something to give, asks his highness to look at it and then make a decision. The emperor is ready to listen to the boy's arguments. But if he dares to deceive him, his bones will be ground to dust. The boy bows his head in submission to the emperor as a sign that he agrees with his decision. A lot of chests generously stuffed with fire crystals appear in the palace. A gift from a prince to an emperor. Fire crystals are an excellent material for making various weapons. The emperor accepts the boy's gift and asks him what he wants in exchange. Getting down on one knee, the prince says that his only wish is for order in his city of Thailand. After a while, the emperor offers Yuguo to become a general, hoping to benefit from it in the future. The prince does not want to become a general. He would rather defend the borders and clear the city of Loon of obstacles. The emperor believes that the city is very poor and that its mayor was killed by bandits. The prince knows that there are many treasures in the city. He is not afraid of difficulties. He is ready to clear this city of robbers and restore order. The emperor entrusts the city of Long to the boy's hands and hopes that he will be able to restore order in it. Brother Ju has some more news for the prince that should make him very happy. The prince went outside the palace and recalls this unusual proposal. Ju suggests that he take his sister as another wife, and the boy is not far behind him and actually wants to follow him. Yuguo climbs the stairs of the house. He has a headache. He has already had three wives. He recalls that he had arranged to meet with San Cheng today. He needs to get home early. This palace is so big that the guy gets lost and needs to find someone to help him out. He smells Sao Tse and enters the room, hoping not to disturb the princess or concubine. The guy sees that he has entered the room of another girl and immediately runs away. A girl with pink hair, whose room he entered at that moment, was taking a bath. She was surprised by the unexpected visit of a stranger at such a time. The boy rushes out of the room like a scalded man. The girl screams and covers herself. He finds himself in a room with a princess who threatens to kill him and calls him a pervert. The prince has no choice but to ask Alima for help and buy something for the girl. Her room is filled with brightly colored rubber ducklings for playing in the bathtub. The princess liked the new toys very much. She immediately switched her attention to them. The guy will say that it's his special gift for her to cheer her up. The princess is pleased and offers to meet him, asks his name, and the boy introduces himself and apologizes for his impudence. The girl says that his punishment will be to play with her for a few days. The princess comes out of the bath and asks the boy to wait for her. He turns back in surprise, as he had not planned to have fun with this beautiful girl. She takes him by the sleeve and asks him not to leave so quickly, to stay with her for a while. Finally, the prince managed to escape from the princess, even though it was very difficult. They agreed that she would let him go, but next time he would bring her a hundred funny things. It's good that he has an Ali Mama and can buy a thousand different toys there. Finally, the prince came to a huge palace belonging to the Yan family. At the door, he is stopped by a guard who does not let him in, and the prince informs him that he is a son-in-law. The man does not believe him. He is convinced that girls will not look at him and orders him to throw him out. Yuguo is very divorced and is forced to turn to his essence. Yakin runs out of the palace to meet them, happy to see Yuguo and asks her husband to stop. The girl hugs the prince, asks why he took so long, she and her sister have been waiting, and the boy complains that he was not allowed in. Yoichin explains to his uncle that Yuguo is their husband. He shouldn't be offended, and the guard apologizes. The guy will say that they shouldn't quarrel with the watchdog. They need to go because their sister is waiting for them. His mother's body is in the coffin, and the prince has come to pay his respects to his mother-in-law. On his knees, the boy promises that he will take care of the twin girls, her daughters. The prince's x-ray vision played a cruel joke on him. He saw something he could not and should not have known. Yoi Chung asks what happened to him, and he tells her that he has a secret and is not sure that they will believe him. They step aside so that no one can overhear their conversation, and the girl repeats her question. 
The boy saw that her mother's breastbones were broken. She did not die of a disease. She was taken away. The girl's uncle, the brother of the deceased's husband, overhears this conversation and is furious that the prince is defiling the body of his brother's wife. Yuguo asks if he did it because he was so excited. The emperor of divorce is upset that the boy desecrates the memory of his wife and humiliates his brother. The guy asks me to look closely, holds a knife, and intends to prove his point. Yuguo apologizes to his mother-in-law, and he is forced to cut open her chest. The incision shows that her ribs in the chest area are indeed broken. Everyone present is amazed by what they saw. They are interested in how it happened and who did it. The emperor states that his wife really died of a broken bone. The prince is surprised by the emperor's calmness, pointing out that his wife's chest has been opened. The boy touches the fresh wound to investigate the real cause of his mother-in-law's death. The powder of spiritual stones, ginseng, and water from a mountain spring formed a sleeping pill that the killer could use to put the woman to sleep and complete his work. Suspicion falls on the concubine who had been caring for the deceased, but she denies her guilt. The interrogator's brother hits the woman in the face, repeats his question again, and says he has no other suspects. Yuguo is convinced that the man is trying to eliminate the witness, as this woman would not be able to do such a thing. Yue Cheng asks his uncle to explain why he is so sure that this woman is the culprit. The uncle won't explain. The girl just didn't like that he wouldn't let the prince into the palace. Suddenly his uncle's head is detached from his body, and Emperor Yun appears behind him. The prince looks at his uncle's severed head and asks his father-in-law why he did it. He explains that his brother had long been after his wife, so he was now punishing him for his wife's death. Yun he says that everything secret has finally become public and suggests that we should end it here. Yuguo notices that something is lying next to his uncle's motionless body, apparently falling out of his pocket. He bends down and picks up a crumpled piece of paper with something written on it. This is the recipe for the poison that killed the woman, written by Lao Suntu from the western part of the city. Yuguo convinces the Yun to go to the man to find out everything. The emperor sends the boy and his daughter, and he wants to be with his wife. The prescription sheet indicated that it was written at Lao Jantu Pharmacy, which is not difficult to find. In the middle of the pharmacy, the body of the pharmacist is scattered under the wall. Something happened here. It seems that someone knew about their visit and got ahead of them, and the prince is worried that Lao Jantu might have been visited as well. They decide to look at everything in the pharmacy and find a woman. This is the mentally ill wife of a pharmacist who managed to escape the execution. If they had managed to cure her, they would have learned the name of the real criminal. The prince feels the woman being placed in the western room, and he asks the prince to inform him as soon as she regains consciousness. Suddenly, the prince sees a vision and announces that he knows who really killed his mother-in-law. He sees the killer entering the palace and entering the room of a sleeping woman. A woman is lying in bed, a man leaning over her, holding a weapon. He swings at her with all his might, trying to strike her, but fails. The woman intercepts his hand with the weapon, and says that she has been waiting for him for a long time. Pointing to the head of Yun, the prince says that he is the murderer of his wife, but they do not believe him. One of the sisters hits her father in the head, wanting to avenge her mother's death. The emperor loses his orientation in space due to an unexpected blow and he is controlled by several faces. The prince takes the initiative in the battle and hopes that his strength will be enough to defeat the killer. The emperor is sure that a Wu Wang master cannot defeat him, so he will win. A puppet joins the battle, protecting the prince with an umbrella weapon and striking the emperor. Although Yun He thinks the puppet is good enough, it is not omnipotent. The emperor is unable to use his sword to defeat the umbrella wielded by the puppet. A prince comes to the girl's aid, who in turn also strikes at the emperor. The prince strikes the emperor, but they do not reach the target. The emperor puts up a powerful defense. The guy's hand stops just a few centimeters away from the man. Around the imager is a wall that lights up when touched, and the man asks the boy not to overestimate his strength. The twin girls are terrified of this battle, but they support their beloved and believe in his victory. Yun once again strikes Yuguo, and the boy flies away and hits his back. The man gloats that even if the prince survives his blows, he will forever remain a loser. The boy listened carefully to everything he was told and disagreed with the emperor. The emperor expects the prince to have the strength to stand on his feet after his strong blows. The guy was saved by his new armor, which helped him withstand all the blows. The man is very angry. He doesn't understand why his rival is still alive and threatens to kill everyone. Out of the corner of his eye, Yugu sees that Sanchin, who had been watching the fight, is up to something. 
The girl releases a pillar of fire into the sky, signaling that help is needed. The soldiers of the Eagle's Watch flock to this sign from all sides and they fill the entire space. With his arms crossed over his chest, the man mocks that the Yun family has a lot of little grains of sand. The warriors point their hands at him, from which energy emanates that can damage the Emperor's defense. A protective circle is formed around him which the power of the Eagle's Watch cannot yet overcome. The man says that he was able to destroy even Yun He, a Wu Zun master, and the Eagle's Watch will not stop him. Yuechen asks why he did this because her family did not wish him harm. The imposter replied that their father did not know how to treat women so he used her instead. When the girl's mother found out about this secret and wanted to tell everyone, he had to destroy it. If it weren't for his status as the girl's father, he would have loved to have fun with his sisters. His words make the girls angry and Yu Chung tries to defend his honor but the prince will sort everything out. The man is firmly convinced that he can wipe someone like Yu Guo into dust with a single blow. The imposter feels his defenses weakening and the power of the eagle's watch breaking through. The eagle's dose is not able to stop the emperor but what Yu Guo is using now will definitely be able to. The man clutches his heart. His chest feels like it's on fire. He can't cope with it. Li Yun was in charge of human lives, so when he destroyed Yun's wife, he thought about the consequences. The man is begging for mercy. He knows the secrets of five families that will help him take revenge, and his disappearance will help Yugu's enemies. The boy says that the man talks too much. He knows better what happened between San Juaner and the five families. The warriors of the Eagle Watch are devoting all their efforts to destroying this imposter. A high concentration of energy combined with a pill leads to a powerful explosion. Yugu shields his sisters to protect them from the destructive force of the explosion. It's a good thing there's a hatchling watch here. Otherwise, the explosion from the pill would have hit everything around. The explosion created a deep crater, and one of the soldiers shows that there is something inside. There is a corpse in the sinkhole, and it looks like it has been there for several years. Despite the fact that the corpse has been lying there for quite some time, a scar is still visible on his arm. Sun Ching recognizes her father by his scar, which he got when he was preparing medicine for her. The sisters kneel on the edge of the sinkhole and cry over his remains. The prince hugs them, asks them not to be afraid, and promises to always be by their side. Yu Guo is standing at the door to San Cheng's room, worried about whether she has managed to cope with her experience. He gently knocks on the door and says it's time to eat. Unexpectedly, Yokin opens the door for him in a seductive pink robe. The girl invites him in, takes his hand, and leads him into the room. Sen Cheng is sitting on the bed, and it looks like the girls are going to have fun. San Cheng and her sister want to hug him and cry into his vest. Yuekin sits the boy down on the bed next to him, notices that he is tense, and offers to help him relax. A guy feels uncomfortable around two girls at the same time. His sisters asked him if he wanted anything else, so he made them something to eat and came to call them to dinner. Girls today are strange. Maybe they just want someone to be close to them. Although the sisters are hungry, they have a more interesting offer for the boy, and they undress him. At this point, they think that they have to stay in the family even though they love him. Yuekin wants to divorce the prince, but she will be with her sister. The three of them indulge in lovemaking, the last gift from their sisters. The twins look after the carriage, and San Cheng is not ready to leave the prince and lock herself in here. The girls were happy to meet him and believe that it is mutual and their family needs them now. San Cheng cries the decision to let the prince go was not easy, but now it is the right one. The sisters hug each other, hope to meet their loved ones, and swear to be by their side until the end. The prince watches his dream and is euphoric after a pleasant night. When he wakes up, he doesn't realize where he is because he fell asleep in San Cheng's room yesterday. The boy asks the coachman where they are going and where San Zhen has disappeared to. The girl ordered the prince to be taken back to Tanlin and handed over the letter that was in the wagon. The boy finds the letter, reads it, and the girl apologizes to him. They will stay in Yun's house, finish their studies at the institute, ask him to return home, and they will meet in the city of Long. The boyfriend believes that San Cheng will lead the family to the top and promises to protect them with his sister. The prince changes his route and orders the coachman to deliver the letter to the city of Thailand so that his wife can meet him. He decided that he was going to the city of Lund to put things in order and sort things out. Ye Cheong is walking down the street. He looks like a beggar. He stinks and passers-by shun him. The vendor he approaches takes a swing at him and drives him away. The guy lost his authority in the family. He was pushed out, and he hit rock bottom. The vendor says that this beggar wanted to attack him, and if his family had found Cheong, he would not be alive. 
The guy is looking for a person who will help him get up and take revenge. A girl meets him at the house and the boy says that he has come to see the Emperor of Evil. He tells the beauty that he has come to the wrong place. The girl does not have any crab cakes. Ye Chiang is furious. He wants an evil emperor, one of the ten robber kings. The emperor comes out of the room to see them and few people know where he lives. The person who came to visit him had to be more than just a simple person. The guy asks me to teach him the art of transmigration into another body, and he will serve in return. The emperor asks if he only needs the art of transmigration of the soul. Ye Chiang bows before the evil emperor and thanks him. The emperor puts his hand on the prince's face and intends to take his body. He was looking for a new body to resettle, and here it came to him. The prince resists. He has big plans. He has to take over the country and take revenge on Li Yugu. The spell of the evil emperor began to work, and fire comes from the prince's eyes. The emperor's hand is on the boy's head, and soon his body will become the emperor's body. Ye Chiang hears a voice from the abyss saying that it loves greedy people like him. The entity wants to become his, and in return it will help him survive, take revenge, and kill Li Yugu. The prince wonders if he can now have unlimited power of evil. The new entity will help him rise to the top, people will worship him, and the prince will give his body. In return, he receives all the boundless power and strength of the new entity from the abyss. The emperor of evil loses his many-mouthed essence. He is not suitable for it because he is not greedy enough. The emperor could previously move into the body of any creature, but now the prince is forcing him to die. From now on, the essence of the evil emperor becomes the essence of Ye Chiang, and he is satisfied with this result. From behind, he is embraced by women's arms, and the girl says that there is a flow of great power in his body. She presses herself against his body, and the closeness of such a beauty excites the guy. He asks her if she now has the crab cakes he came for. Flirtatiously lowering her dress on her chest, the girl says that she already has pies. The guy hugs the girl, pressing her to him, asking if it's really true. His hands squeeze her buttocks and he wonders if she likes this strength. The girl kneels down in front of the prince and satisfies him. The guy really likes the unexpected oral caresses. He is satisfied. Entrance to the city of Long Yuguo and Landman approaching the city. The girl says that the transfer of management of Tanlin went well. The new manager seems to be honest. The couple is drinking and the guy asks if his wife is tired from the long journey. Bai Jishan found out that people were being charged a fee at the entrance to the city of Long. The prince gives the boy a drink of water, but he can't talk anymore because his mouth is dry. The person who collects the fee is called Wang Lao, and the amount of the fee depends on the appearance of the person entering the city. Yu Guo decides that it's time to go into town and meet Wang Lao Wu. They are greeted by a man who looks like a robber and they have to pay 1,200 silver to enter the city. The prince is furious at such a high salary. This money can feed ten people. The robber has his eye on Landman, saying that it should be an honor for her. They can leave the girl as a deposit, and when they have the money, they can buy her back. Yuguo grabs the brat's hand and asks him if he's bored with life. The robber is in pain, rubbing his hand and shouting to kill his offender immediately. Someone runs to the entrance to the city very quickly, demanding that the outrage be stopped immediately. A man appears at the gate, belligerent and ready to fight. This is Wang Lao, the head of the bandits, who allegedly killed the previous head of the city. The guard is happy to see him because their brother is very strong, so the fellow travelers are finished. The robber's gaze resembles that of an eagle, showing that he is the true ruler of this city. He unexpectedly beats the guard, who did not let his friends into the city. Wang Lao warned him that he should be polite with the beauties, and he would make excuses that the man was dressed expensively but did not want to pay. A robber lets a girl into the city without money, and the men have to pay. The city guards close it for the day, the girl goes in, the men stay. Bai Jishan is annoyed that they were not allowed to enter. The prince says that they will come in at night. If the girl is in the city, the robbers will let their guard down, and Yu Guo will get the information he needs. The guy has thought of everything and now they have to go because there is something else to do. As night falls, Yuguo and his friend enter the city unhindered. The lights are on in the house, and they see Nalan Meng and Wang Lao, who is not worth the girl's little finger. Bai Jishan thinks that the man has succeeded in seducing the princess, and the prince is confident in her loyalty. Through the window, we can see two figures approaching each other closely. Li Yuguo is furious that the robber can touch his wife. The guy enters the room. Lenman and the robber are sitting at the table holding hands. Yuguo grabs his opponent's chest and threatens him for touching his wife. 
Landman asks the man to let the robber go and stop his rampage. A guy feels that his opponent's chest is soft. It could be a girl. And so it is Wang Lao calls the guy a pervert and rejects him. The previous head didn't like women, so Wang Lao killed him, and now she takes the good from the rich and gives it to the poor. Holding his swollen cheek, the prince tries to understand everything his wife has told him. Landman introduces them to each other and informs them that Yuguo is the new head of the city of Long, and Lao apologizes. The prince likes the girl's character. She could be his older sister, but the girl is only 18. Then she will be his younger sister, and he has one request. Then the events move to the cave where the ancestors of the city of Lun are buried. There is a tomb of the emperor of the last dynasty, Tashanko, and many treasures are hidden here. Yuguo asks Zishan to be careful. Accidentally touching something could be a trap, and then they are finished. In front of them hangs a coffin, bound by strong chains with a monster inside. The inscription says that this tomb contains the emperor and craftsmen who died in a battle a hundred years ago. The rebellion of traitors in the past changed the course of history, which is indeed written by the victors. Bai Zhishan touches the image on the wall. It looks like an eye. He wonders what it means. All similar images start to glow, which is a bad sign for the guys. The coffin with the monster in it starts to move, and Bai says that he did nothing. The tomb is torn open, and an entity comes out of it and Bai hopes it is not Zongzi. The coffin falls to the ground. The boy hears the voice of the Eye of Hell, and the demon rejoices that he has waited for them. The Hell's Eye's aura is similar to that of a thousand-armed man, and it is one of the seven great demons. This demon has the ability to influence consciousness, so you have to be careful. The Hell's Eye wants the boys to give him their bodies along with their hearts full of envy. Yuguo defends himself. He does not intend to give his body to this demon. The demon wants too much, and the boy has to overcome the demon's resistance and not become its prisoner. The Hell's Eye is amused by the guy's stubbornness. He feels much stronger, impossible to defeat. Despite the danger, Yuguo managed to defeat the demon, and Bai is proud of his cool friend. You have to be careful because such big demons cannot die. The demon awakens. Bai is too close to him. The prince asks to be careful. Confident in his safety, he approaches the demon and tells his friend not to worry about him. The purple color of the essence of the demon of the hell's eye penetrates his heart. The entity then concentrates on the boy's head, and he watches in amazement. Losing consciousness, the guy sees his friend running to his aid. Holding Bai Zhishan's hand, Yuguo does not feel anything unusual in his body. Yuguo does not know what effect the hell eye can have on his friend's mind. Bai Zhishan regains consciousness, and the prince asks if he recognizes him. The guy is surprised by this question. He is fine. He recognizes his friend. Despite the attack of the Hell's Eye, Bai has no traces of injury, and there is nothing serious in his body. As long as the Hell's Eye does not control Bai Zhushan's mind, he is safe. Yugu leaves the room and asks him to let him know if Bai's health changes. Bai Zhushan is lying on the bed, looking at his fist and feeling a change in it. Opening his palm, he sees the mark of the Eye of Hell on it. The entity has penetrated him. Realizing his peculiarity, he does not yet know how these changes will affect his future life. Then the events unfold in the imperial palace of the city of Lan on a sunny day. Yuguo shows his wife the treasure map that Teitaishi hid when he left this world. No one must know about these treasures of the whole state. Otherwise, the city will be in danger. That is why Yugu wants to give this card to his wife for safekeeping. He kneels down in front of his wife, hands her the ring with the map, and asks her to keep it. While putting the ring on the girl's finger, he admits that he trusts no one as much as she does. Such sincerity and frankness move the princess to tears, and she accepts his gift. Rising from his knees, he embraces the princess, his lips close to hers. Their lips merge in a passionate kiss, and the couple forgets about all the problems that await them. Landman reminds him that the trial will start soon, and asks when he is going to join it. Yuguo will join the challenge after the two of them have played around. Tai Ping, the younger sister whom Zhu proposed to Yu Guo to marry, enters their room. She is happy that she finally managed to find him. Her appearance was unexpected for Yu Guo, and Landman asks how he knows the girl. The guy seems to be in an awkward position. He needs to explain everything to his wife. The girl says that the boy spied on her in the bathtub and did not bring the promised toys. One toy is not enough. She wants a thousand, so you agree and give her the toys. Princess Landman is very angry at this news, and on his knees the boy wants to explain everything. Shouting can be heard from the house, the couple loudly arguing, and then loudly making up. Bai Jen reminds them that they don't have a team now and need to find someone. 
Smiling mysteriously, he says he has someone in mind. The prince thinks about the twin girls. He misses them and hopes they are well. Someone calls out to Yuguo, calling him a friend, and he turns to see who it is. The man takes off his hat and says that it is his bald friend. He returned to the city to thank the prince, who helped him by revealing the truth. Shifan Tongxing is willing to work like a horse to thank the prince, and he is forced to kneel. Yuguo stops him and tells him that he shouldn't work like a horse, but he has a suggestion. A company of five people is standing on the square, and their team is formed and strong enough. Shifan Tongjing and Nei Xiao Qing are in the team, so it will be much easier to pass the test. Bai intends to go home, but is stopped by the prince because he has questions about Hu Meyer, who is now on their team. Bai fabricated evidence against the guy she liked, so she changed her mind. Shifang Tongxing asks if Yu Guo knows that young Ye Ziyu committed suicide. I think the guy's name was Qiong. He was a student at the Heavenly War Institute, and it seems he drowned in the river. Ye Qiong's strength scale hasn't disappeared, so something is wrong, and he's probably alive. Behind his back, the guy hears him ask if his team still needs people. A burly, gray-haired man whom Yu Guo does not know wants to join them. Then, the events are transferred to the ship, where the students sail to the test site. Yu Guo explains to Zhishan that he took an unknown person to the team because of his Wu Wang level. They need fighting power. In addition, the stranger's face looks familiar to him, but he cannot remember where he came from. The head of the School of Celestial Arts tells the students that they will soon arrive at the test site. This time, students will be able to choose any equipment or artifact from the treasury as a prize. This prize suits the prince. He knows what he needs to take from the school's treasury. Lin Huang takes Yu Guo aside because he has something to tell him, and he is ready to listen. The school principal wants to remove Yu Guo from the list. Ye Qiong has disappeared, and the principal has long disliked Li Yu Guo. The guy thanks Lin Huang for the warning. He will take it into account. The ship with the students of the School of Celestial Power is approaching the place where their test will take place. The test will begin tomorrow, and the team is camping on the shore to spend the night. There is not enough space in the palace for everyone, and Hu Meyer will have to sleep with Bai Zhishan. Shi Fan grew up by the sea and was very homesick, so Yu Guo offers to go on a treasure hunt with him. There is a shipwreck near the island, and a new member of the team, Kai Jia, is invited, but he refuses. Shifan is jealous of Li Yuguo's ability to swim underwater and breathe, and he swims in a mask. They go down to the bottom and find a sunken ship with treasure. Perhaps this ship belonged to the Pirate Sparrow, who controlled all the seas and disappeared 30 years ago. Yuguo can't imagine who else but Sparrow could have built such a perfect ship. On the way you come across skeletons without heads, you need to be careful here something is wrong. Ahead of them, they see a closed hold. Obviously, something is hidden there. Opening the door, they find many skeleton heads. Shifan suggests that after they find the treasure, they return to the mountain. Yu Guo finds a coffin-like box that is wrapped in strong chains. It is guarded by an underwater monster with strong and friendly eagle-like claws. It is difficult to practice with a sword in the water because there is too much resistance. Shifan comes to Yu Guo's aid, taking the underwater creature's blow on himself. He successfully manages to avoid the water creature's attacks despite the water's resistance. He delivers several blows that prove fatal to the water monster. They manage to take the box away. Without Shifan's help, Yu Guo would not have been able to deal with the monster. They open the box, and there is the sword of the sun and moon that belonged to Yu Guo's father. This sword of the sun is hidden in the Celestial Warfare Institute, and Yu Guo managed to find it during the test. At the start of the test, all the students of the School of Heavenly Power gathered to prepare for it. Yu Guo is here with his team, and someone is calling him. A family of shamans from the southern state stands next to him with their princess. This world followed a completely different scenario. Princess Manier was supposed to appear much later. The princess says her name. She knows that the boy is very strong, and she suggests that they go together. The gates of the Divine Hill are open, and the disciples can begin the test. Their life is under the authority of heaven, and if they are afraid, let them give it up right away. After they go inside, the gates will be closed for one month. The entrance to the test is very beautiful. The sun is shining brightly, and this sight fascinates the students. Night has fallen, and they need to set up tents to rest and gain strength before the test. Yu Guo sends his team to rest, and he takes a turn on guard duty. At the campfire, the boy thinks that the beast's legacy is on the island of the Divine Hill. He does not know which animal guards it. The prince's thoughts are interrupted by strange sounds coming from the bushes. The boy cautiously follows the sound to check if there is any danger to them. 
He unwraps the branches and looks for the cause of the unknown sound that distracted him from his duty. A princess is sitting on a lawn, taking advantage of the darkness to fulfill her natural need. Trying not to give himself away, he recklessly steps on a branch that snaps under his foot. He is exposed, and he makes excuses to the girl that it was an accident, hoping that she will believe him. The princess was confused by the boy's appearance at such an unexpected moment. By jokes that Yuguo stretched out his hands to the princess, who asked him not to say anything stupid. Panic breaks out in the camp and everyone is running away from some monster they can't handle. Bai suggests that the students have encountered a Wuzong-level animal, and Yuguo suggests that they go check it out. The prince's team stands on the lawn in front of a huge beast. Their rival is a huge stone beast with a strong and sturdy body. It looks very warlike. Shifan is trying out a new sword, interested in how it will behave in battle. The sword strikes the stone body of the animal, and Shifan ricochets upward. The beast is holding a cold, fiery stake, which is its weapon. He throws a bullet toward Shifan, who tries to defend himself with his sword. The man suspects that the new sword may not be able to withstand such a battle. With his sword, he cuts through the energy flow of a war bullet flying at him. Kaijia, their new unknown team member, joins the battle. He has a chance to show his best side in battle, and he defeats the beast. Yugu and Bai are impressed by the new team member's fight, saying he's cool. Yuguo smells a familiar odor from the newcomer, but again can't remember the reports. Kaijia hides his face under a mask and does not take it off even in the presence of his team members. Li Yuguo wondered where he could have seen this man before and not noticed the threat. A stone monster attacks him from behind, but he manages to deflect the blow. Yuguo decides to deal with this monster first and then turn to the newcomer. The monster hits the boy with a huge stone axe, and he fights back with his sword. But this beast is not alone. Another one appears behind the boy. This time, a stranger from their team comes to the rescue again. He has taken on one beast, and Yuguo is dealing with another. The forces are unequal. There are many beasts. Watching each other's backs, the boys decide that Yuguo will look for an eye to break the formation. Kaijia is left to hold the line and kill the beasts whenever possible. Bai Zhishan and Shifang Tongxing hurry to the floor, and together they will hold out. Bai manifests the essence of a packet eye. He is ready to destroy his enemies on the battlefield. All the animals rush to catch up with Yuguo, and he asks his friends to be careful until he breaks the formation. Yuguo climbs a large tree to assess the situation and see which way the eye is. He sees which way the eye of the formation is, and now he has to find it. The road leads him to a cave where a strange spiritual energy comes from, and the eye is there. Yuguo goes inside the cave and looks for a place where the eye can be. He finds a skeleton in a cave from which a stream of spiritual energy comes out, which is the heavenly eye. The skeleton sits on a stone in a lotus position. The energy of the eye moves away from the stone. He holds an artifact in his hands, and the boy carefully takes the book away. The skeleton belongs to the famous mask and puppet master Li Kui. Once upon a time, a master created a puppet of the element to destroy a Wu Tsun beast that everyone feared, and after the master disappeared, the secret was lost. In the book, Yuguo finds the information he needs to destroy the eye. He concentrates, swings his sword over the fire energy to break the formation and the eye. Using this knowledge and holding up two fingers, the boy says a spell. The beasts his team fights are self-destructive, so Yuguo was able to break the formation. He leaves the cave with the realization that he is not far from the beast's inheritance. Princess Malier wonders why Yuguo called her at night. Perhaps he wanted to play a joke on her. In the forest, she accidentally comes across a couple who are having sex using a tree as a support. She hears their moans and recognizes the man as Kaijia, a member of their team. She is very ashamed that she witnessed his carnal pleasures in the middle of the night. After finishing with sex and hugging her lover, his partner asks when he is going to attack Yuguo. The guy tells the girl that he will soon deal with Li Yuguo. The princess unwittingly witnessed this conversation and heard that Yuguo was going to be destroyed. She decides to warn him as soon as possible and runs through the woods giving herself away. The girl will use her secret weapon against the uninvited witness. The princess feels a blow to the back of her head, she is confused, does not understand anything, and falls to the ground. Kaijia recognizes the girl as Princess Malier and praises his companion. He asks if they will send a present for Yuguo, and his mistress is delighted with the idea. It's still night outside and a signal guard is burning at the entrance to the tent. In Yugu Yu Bai and Shidachin's tent, Li is angry with his friends because they take explosive pills whenever they want. The men justified that they hadn't fought for seven days, and if he covered them, everything would be fine. 
The guy has no choice but to forgive them and promise that this will not happen again. Yuguo's ears pick up some strange noise around their camp. He goes out of the tent and onto the street to see what's going on. It's quiet near the tent. No one is there, and the guy is walking around the area. There's no one else there, either, but a strange premonition does not leave him. He sees a vision of women's arms tightly wrapped around his waist. He is hugged by the princess of the southern state of Mali, and he is surprised. The girl courts him, tenderly addresses him by name, and longs for intimacy. She asks him to take off his clothes, and Yuguo asks what she is doing here. The girl takes off her clothes, exposing her breasts, and the boy puts his hand over his eyes to avoid seeing her naked. We can't let anyone see him with the princess. She's probably been kidnapped, so we have to find her immediately. Suddenly, the princess appears near the boy in reality, repeating his vision. He breaks away from the girl's arms and runs away so that no one sees them together. The princess's retinue finds him and accuses him of defiling her honor. The boy says he also saw a silhouette, but he was not with the princess, and the retinue does not believe him. His words can be verified when the princess comes to, and they will always have time to destroy him. The princess arrives at the clearing, confirms his attack, and orders her retinue to capture the boy. A man approaches them, shouting at them to stop and wait. Kaijia says that it will be possible to know the real intruder after the princess regains consciousness, but there's no way to escape from the body. The retinue takes his agreements, and they wait until the princess comes too. Li Yuguo thanks Kaiju for saving his life for the second time, but he waves him off. The boy came to the princess's tent to see how she was feeling. He leads the dream to the girl guarding the tent to see the princess. Mailer is lying in bed. She is very weak. Someone is definitely controlling her. The sleeping girl looks extremely beautiful and seductive, and she needs to be woken up. The boy touches the girl's hand. She opens her eyes and wakes up. Meyer sees Yuguo and says that the man in armor is plotting against him. She saw them making love in the woods and heard that Kaijia said he wanted to destroy him, and Yuguo did not believe the girl. The princess is disappointed by his disbelief. Everything she says is true. She is not lying. Perhaps this situation is a setup. He cannot be wrong because he does not know how to proceed. He asks the princess to pretend that she is still unconscious and to act according to the plan. A pillar of light appears on the mountain of the gods of war. Perhaps the pill of the beast is there. The team goes to get a pill. His friends are tired. It seems to be a side effect of the explosive pill. He leaves them to rest and continues on with Kaijia. With the last of his strength, he climbs the mountain in the hope of finding the pill of the beast there. They find a cave with an entrance in the shape of a beast's mouth and many skulls lying at the entrance. The boys go inside the cave and look around. Yuguo can't help but feel that they are in great danger inside the cave. They are met by a huge blue dragon, which immediately attacks the boys. You need to think about the tactics of fighting the dragon and coordinate your actions among team members. A river flows in the cave. Yuguo and Kai are on rafts, and a dragon swims in the water. It rises to the surface, making large waves and emitting a powerful loud cry. Yuguo is focused on his tasks. He has to get what he came for. You have to kill the dragon right here. Otherwise, they will die and replenish the skulls at the entrance to the cave. Yuguo tells Kai to kill, that he needs to kill the dragon. He takes on the firepower. Kai has to find a weak spot. The guy climbs into the dragon's mouth, taming the fire, and the cue comes out of it. Kai is looking for a weak spot on the dragon's body. The dragon is large, and the task is quite difficult. Finally, he manages to find it, and he strikes at that place. The dragon's body disintegrates into small ice pieces, and he is defeated. Yugu and Kai sit tiredly in the cave, watching the dragon's last moments. The prince finds the pills he came to this mountain for. He gives Kai a crystal that fell out of the dragon as a reward for his help. Yugu wants to know if the boy likes such a treasure, waiting for an answer. Kai shouts that he's done playing tricks, demanding that the dragon's inheritance be given to him. Addressing Kaijie, he wants to know the reason why he betrayed him. He says that his only desire was to destroy him. Kai attacks the boy who is forced to defend himself to save his life. The enemies are facing each other, both possessing strong techniques and ready to fight. Kai is wearing metal armor. He wants to see if Yuguo can hide from him. Yugu recognizes the art of the Yi family and the technique used against him. The guy recognizes Ye Chiang as his partner and asks if it's really him. Ye Chiang says it's really him, but Yugu realizes it too late. To protect himself, Yuguo uses a jade water frost sword and an ice wall. He soars over his wall, looking for Ye Chiang's weakness. The opponent is defending himself while someone else is attacking him. A girl with a gun appears next to him. Yi asks who she is, and the girl jokes that she is his father. 
The girl throws a metal umbrella with metal tips at Ye Chiang. The guy declassifies his attacker. He realizes that the girl is just a puppet. The girl says that he has a demonic aura about him, and she will have to use a different technique. The technique is called a cascade of heavenly petals. Its umbrella opens into many metal spikes. These sharp metal particles fly out and pierce Ye Chiang's demonic essence. They penetrate deep into each eye of the demonic entity and cause dangerous wounds. The demonic entity spins into a vortex and disappears, dissolving into thin air. It manifests itself again on the outskirts of the island, on the shore of the lake. Ye Chiang was in the mouth of the many-mouthed creature, and it frees the boy. Chiang asks why the demon took him away at such a bad time, as there was an opportunity to destroy Yu Guo. The entity replies that the thousand-armed man is his old enemy, but the time for the decisive battle has not yet come. Until the thousand-armed man is fully awakened, Chiang can do other things, such as develop his greed. Ye Chiang dreams of becoming the ruler of the whole of the Celestial Empire, and he orders the many-mouthed man to return to the capital. Yu Guo stands alone in the cave, not understanding what happened to the monster and why Ye Chiang is there. The special power of the great horned dog is its ability to transport its owner to another city. He is the greediest of all the demons and the strongest rival of the many-armed man. Yu Guo did not expect Ye Chiang to take such a step and make a deal with the demon. The boy can't defeat it on his own, and the thousand-armed man can help, but Yu Guo doesn't want to make a deal with the demon and give himself to it. The guy holds a pill of the dragon's heritage in his hands. The wine looks like a globe. He needs to get this inheritance as soon as possible to prevent Ye Chiang's plans from coming true. He didn't decide to do it immediately. He sits down in a cave, and golden energy spills out around him. A bright glow comes out of the cave where the boy is staying. Two armed guards stand at the gate of the prison in the capital. There are rodents running around in the cells where prisoners are held, and they feel at home. The second young prince, who is in prison, is told that he has a visitor. He rejoices because he thinks that his father has sent a messenger for him, and he will be rescued. He approaches the bars of his cell and is disappointed to see a woman visiting him. She is a servant of the former evil emperor and the mistress of Ye Chiang, and she has evil intentions. Using her power, she exsanguinates the second young prince. The man's body is weakening, his life force has been taken away from him, and he falls motionless to the floor. A house in the capital that houses the residence of the third young prince. The door opens and a girl who has just been in prison enters the house. She sits on her master's lap and congratulates him on the fact that the second young prince has gone to the afterlife. Looking into the girl's eyes, the boy asks how the first young prince is doing. She replies that everything is ready. We have to wait until tomorrow. The couple embrace, their caresses become more open and passionate. Ye Chiang is pleased with the results and soon he will become the ruler of the whole of China. A thunderstorm begins and lightning strikes the tiled roof of the emperor's house. Large drops of rain hit the roof. Thunder is heard from time to time and lightning flashes. The emperor wakes up, sits up on the bed and tells his wife that he feels as if he is about to be killed. The door to the room opens as if from a protoge and the emperor thinks it's a demon and calls for help from the guards. An intruder kills the guards, their bodies lying on the floor in red puddles. Covering his wife, the emperor asks the demon who he is and why he came here. Lemon has come to destroy Nalanjia and take the throne, and the emperor does not believe what he has heard. Stabbing the emperor with a bloody sword, the uninvited guest repeats that he has come to take the throne. The weather is raging around the castle, and despite the weather, the guards are on guard and do not hear the screams coming from the house. The story then moves to the Mountain of the War Gods, where the tests of the School of Celestial Warfare take place. Shifan and Bai are waiting for their friend. The test is about to end, and he hasn't finished yet. The guy still sits in the cave and accepts his heritage. The space is permeated with cosmic energy of yellow and white colors. These flashes reach his friends, and they are frightened and do not understand what is happening. The sacrament in which Yu Guo participates is completed, and a smile appears on the boy's lips. He finally accepted the inheritance. All the cosmic energy from the pill is now in him. His friends congratulate him on his mid-level Wu Huan and his adoption of the Golden Thunder Mantra. Alamama also congratulates him. Now he has even more weapons available to him. He can even take a Gatling gun to help end the conflict with an old enemy. Yu Guo saw something else that caused him a storm of negative emotions and great anger. The strength of the protagonist, Ye Chiang, has increased to 80%, while Yu Guo's is 60. It's obvious that Ye Chiang is using the demon's power to raise his level. 
Students and the school principal gathered at the entrance to the island of the Divine Hill. Di Yugu received an inheritance. He moved to the middle level of the Wu Huan level and is envied by the students of the school. The school principal presents the boy with a gift and does not believe that he could achieve such a victory. Veer hands the boy a box with a nagger and walks away, disappointed with the outcome of the test. Someone takes Yuguo by the sleeve. He turns to see who needs him. This is a princess of the southern state. She needs to return home. She invites him to visit her. Hugging her, the guy says that they are friends now and he will definitely come to see her. The princess did not like the fact that the guy said they were just friends. She had other expectations. The girl gives him a box with a heart protection pill from her country. Mahler says goodbye, waves to him, and reminds him that he will be waiting for his visit. The guy accepts her gift and repeats his promise to come back. The story is set in the city of Jiangsu, where the school's treasury is located on the main street. Yu Guo found a case of the Sword of the Sun and Moon on the sunken ship. The sword may be in the treasury. The guy goes into the treasury. He can take whatever he wants from it, according to the terms of the last test, and a man comes in after him. He addresses Li Yong by his first name, and the boy wonders who he is. The First Lord's bodyguard, he tells us that the second young prince died suddenly in prison. The First Prince was accused of this without evidence, and he was sentenced to death. He attacked the Emperor for no reason, spoke of treason, so he was sent to death row. The Third Prince found poison in the palace. The First Prince could not prove his innocence, and he was hanged. Yuguo recalls that the third young prince was not interested in politics and suddenly such a change. The kneeling guard asks for help to vindicate the name of the first master so that his soul can rest in peace. The guard hands over a tablet from the empress that protects against death and asks the third young prince to take care of himself. La Yuguo holds the sign in his hands and thinks about what he has heard. He has some guesses and will help the guard. First of all, you need to find the sword, which is the key that opens the lock on the door to the treasury. The treasury of the Celestial Warfare Institute contains the largest number of training methods in the entire Celestial Empire. Among the many artifacts, the guy has to choose one, so he uses his celestial eye. The guy stands in the center of the treasury, scanning the entire room to find what he needs most. In the floor, he sees the Sword of the Sun and Moon, which he needs. The floor is made of crystals, and if you use brute force, you can destroy the entire treasury. The guy can't make any noise. He has to find a switch that will open the floor and release the sword. Yuguo finds a glass ball in which a switch may be hidden. Despite his best efforts, the guy can't move the thing even a millimeter. He uses the Golden Thunder mantra to turn off the switch. With the help of the mantra, the glass ball is moved. It begins to emit energy similar to the sun's rays. All the books in the library begin to glow. On the shelf, Yuguo finds a book with the sun and moon signs and he needs it. Behind the book on the shelf is a button, and the boy presses it. The floor of the indexes begins to move apart in the place where the magic sword is hidden. The guy watches what is happening around him in the treasury. Finally, he gets the sword of the sun and moon that once belonged to his father. After completing all his business in Jiangdu, the boy goes to the capital to fulfill his promise. The guy needs to come up with a way to bring the third young prince to light. At the entrance to the city, there are armed guards checking everyone who enters. The guards recognize Li Yuguo and have orders from the emperor to detain him. The third prince is looking for him, and the boy shows him the sign and asks him to take him to the emperor. The emperor and his wife are outside. The husband is drinking morning tea. A guard comes in and reports that Li Yuguo wants to see him. The emperor was not expecting this visit, but allows the guard to let the boy in. Yuguo bows his head in reverence, and the emperor accuses him of rebellion and inciting his son to murder. The boy asks whether the emperor thinks that his son's case looks very suspicious. The emperor is surprised by this question and asks the boy to explain what he means. Yugu explains that the prince was the heir to the throne. He had no need to attack him. Perhaps it was someone's insidious plan. The son always treated the emperor with respect, so the ruler also thinks that the prince was framed. The second young prince died suddenly, and the third began to interfere in the government, although he had never been interested, which seems very strange. The emperor understands the boy's thought process and his suspicions about the third young prince. A third young prince comes to them, called by his father. The guy is quite tall, but he does not look physically strong. He looks confused. The father says he wants to hear what official Lee thinks about this, and the boy is happy to join the conversation. The third prince is well-mannered and cultured, but weak in body and unskilled in martial arts. Yuguo decides to test his physical stamina and strength and strikes him unexpectedly. 
The third prince is furious. He did not expect Yuguo to beat him. The boy is unable to respond with a blow, and the emperor asks them to stop immediately. Yuguo doesn't listen to him. He continues to test the boy's strength and power by striking him. The blow to the jaw burst blood vessels in the guy's eyes and made his mouth water. The owner demands that the fight be stopped immediately and calls security. But Yuguo intends to see how much more this guy can take. He needs to defend himself with inner strength because his physical strength is not enough. The battle provoked by Li continues and the third prince uses his inner strength. He receives another punch to the face but Li's fist does not reach its target this time. Yuguo now realizes who he is. His old nemesis has given himself away with this maneuver. The emperor shouts that Li Yugu has no right to beat his son and will certainly pay for it. The boy says that they are just exchanging experiences, but the prince disagrees and asks him to punish the boy for his crime. Given that Li has a protective wheelchair, he will not be sentenced to death, and the yogi is sent to prison. The boy is handcuffed, and the third prince threatens that he will pay for humiliating him. The emperor notices Li Yugu's pleased face, and this raises many questions for him. The prince is in prison, and without the necessary evidence, the emperor will not believe him. Someone unlocks his cell door with a key and enters. Ji Wushan enters the cell, and the guy is very happy to see him. He asks what his brother is doing in prison, and he replies that he came to rescue him. Wushuang says that the emperor suspected something and ordered a secret investigation, so he was imprisoned for a reason. We have to be very careful, because the power is actually in the hands of the third prince, and even the eagle watch of the five families is on his defense. The information he hears confuses him, and he wonders how things are in San Cheng. The death of their father broke the girls, and because of their wisdom they left the capital, and Wushan has no contact with them, and does not know where they are now. Wushan has bad news. San Wanye is on his way to the capital. He is expected to arrive in three days. There is very little time left, so Yugu must find the evidence as soon as possible. The situation is complicated. San Wanye is in charge of border defense, and only the Eagle Watch army can defeat him. Yugo needs time to analyze all the information and decide how to proceed. Meanwhile, a big banquet is taking place in the Imperial Palace. The third prince raises his glass to his father's health. One of the invited guests reminds us that the Osmanthus Festival is coming up, and Yoyer is the best at reciting poetry, so he has something to tell. The prospect of participating in the festival does not make him happy. He breaks out in a sweat. The emperor and the guests ask him to announce something, as he always does. The guy hates the old lady who first suggested the idea. The third prince has no choice but to go public and ask that his performance not be judged harshly. He recites a poem about how fragrant this year's mantis is and how it can be used to infuse vodka or make soup. He adds chicken to this soup and the flavors take him to heaven. The audience applauds and the emperor realizes that his assumption is confirmed. A tear runs down his cheek. The old woman thanks him for his support but says that this is not Jueyer's limit. He can do more. The boy realizes that he has exposed himself by performing the poem and is extremely close to failure. He disappoints the emperor, who advises him to read more books, and the boy agrees. Yet Chiang sees that the emperor is beginning to suspect something, so he will have to act earlier than he planned. The emperor is sitting on his bed holding his head, and his wife asks him if he is still worried about his son. The man says that he has been acting very strange lately. He even had a headache. His character has changed a lot. He doesn't look like their child anymore. The empress suggests that her husband drink a soothing decoction and go to bed early. The man takes the cup from her hands and begins to drink the tea offered to him. Suddenly he feels sick, falls down, clutches his heart, and the cup falls out of his hands. Li Yugu is sitting on the floor next to his puppet. He is upset. It will be difficult to restore it. The guy is holding a pearl of heredity and he can try to use it to restore Xiao Qing after the bite of the many-mouthed man. He inserts the pill into the hole in the puppet's head and hopes that everything will work. The pill helps. The puppet is infrared scanned, the video recording function is turned on, and the small arms function is activated. He doesn't manage to finish with the gun, but he is satisfied with the result of restoring his puppet. Someone runs into the prince's room and shouts that there is a trouble. Everything has become bad. Ji Wushuang enters the room. The emperor has been poisoned. He is unconscious. The third prince has sent the empress to prison. The whole court is in chaos. San Wanye will arrive in a day. If the emperor dies, Ye Chiang will become the new ruler. Yu Gu is confident that while he is in the capital, Ye Chiang will not take radical actions. 
There are a lot of guards near the house where the Emperor's chamber is located. The soldiers smell some kind of gas, but they have no right to leave their post. The unknown gas has a soporific effect, and the soldiers fall asleep right on the square in front of the house. Yugu takes the Empress of Medicine into the Imperator's chamber and thanks her for coming. The girl says that the Emperor was poisoned by the poison of a lost soul, and his spiritual energy in his body decreased by half. The treatment can take more than two weeks, it's a long time, it's not known when Ye Chiang will decide to act. Li Yuguo will consider all possible ways out of this situation and possible solutions. He gets an idea and asks if the Princess of Medicine can wake up the Emperor. A servant makes a remark to an heir who behaves unbecomingly immediately after the death of the Imperator. The boy replies that he is the Crown Prince. The throne already belongs to him, and if they disobey him, he will send them to follow his father. The courtiers inform the third prince that he will now rule the country. In the throne room, the third prince assumes power. From now on, he rules the country and is wished eternal life. But Li Yuguo disagrees, confidently entering the hall. He says that Ye Chiang started celebrating his victory too soon. Ye Chiang accuses Li of having conspired against the emperor and now deciding to trap himself. Yu Guo has evidence to back up his words and he shows everyone present his phone. All those present hear their new emperor say that the plot will not be exposed because the technique of transmigration into another body is very powerful. The technique of soul transmigration is black magic. Someone used it on the third young prince. In fact, it was Ye Chiang. The guy says that it's not true. There is no transmigration of the soul. It's all set up. He denies the evidence and accuses Li Yuguo of conspiring with the first prince. The newly minted emperor orders the Eagle Watch to capture Li Yuguo, and a voice is heard in the hall objecting to this order. The real emperor enters, looking healthy and unharmed. The appearance of the emperor surprised Ye Qing. It was like a bait to catch him, because evidence alone is not enough. The head of the guard kneels down and apologizes to the emperor for his betrayal. He says he was deceived and forced by the Yi family, and the emperor demands that the entire Yi family be punished. Ye Chiang says that the emperor cannot punish his family. Today he will be punished, and the boy orders the Eagle Watch to destroy the emperor. The emperor says that the Eagle Watch has no right to attack him. He is still alive. Ye Chiang tells the emperor that he does not control the Eagle Watch. The emperor's throne does not belong to the Nalan family alone. The Eagle Watch follows the order, and arrows fly at the emperor's soldiers from all sides. The Iron Dragons of Nalan come to the aid of the current emperor, ready to defend his honor. The emergence of a new army was not part of Ye Chiang's plans, and he was confused. He decides that the best technique is to escape. The command to flee is given, and the throne room instantly becomes empty. Ye Chiang and Li Yuguo face off once again, this time with Yu Guo's inheritance of a divine temple giving him an advantage. Li is full of hatred for his opponent, saying that he will leave this world today. Ye Chiang scoffs, confident in his victory, and that his opponent knows nothing. He turns to his demon and says that he has prepared something delicious for him. The demon is ready to start. He has been waiting for this for a long time. Yu Guo has to resist the stranger demon and remember what power he has. The demon feeds on his strength. There is no point in resisting. Yu Guo will soon lose his mind. According to Ye Chiang's calculations, his opponent should have been dead by now, but he continues to stand. Yu Guo laughs that Chiang tried so hard, but he was unable to absorb the puppet. He was outsmarted. Ye Chiang is furious, his distorted face screaming the name of the enemy. Li is ready to fight again, having managed to exhaust the demon's power. The demon continues to kill victims from the emperor's guard, but Yu Guo is no longer available to him. The boy picks up the sword of the sun and moon that belonged to his father. He feels confident and delivers precise blows that cut through the air. Sparks fly from the sword in all directions and stones scatter. The demon barely has time to react to these blows. He protects Tsung from damage. Yet Chiang can absorb all the blows of Yu Guo Li. He is difficult to defeat. Li needs the help of the thousand-armed demon because he sees no other way out. Ye Chiang is convinced that this demon will not be able to defeat him. He is confident in his strength. In a decisive battle, two strong opponents come together, a life-or-death struggle. The silhouette of the victor of the battle is visible against the background of a fiery eye surrounded by flames. Ye Chiang was injured many times. His eyes were burning with hatred, and a red, viscous liquid was flowing from his mouth. A torch is burning in the prison cell, and the screams of a prisoner being interrogated are heard. On the wall hangs a lot of weapons that prisoners use for interrogations. 
Ye Chiang says that if Yugu destroys him, he will never know where the Yun sisters are. These words arouse hatred in Li Yugu's heart, and he is ready to destroy the enemy immediately. He punches Chiang in the stomach, but he cannot respond because he is shackled. Ye Chiang won't die, Yugo will slowly take revenge on him for everything he did. The guy turns around and leaves, leaving the prisoner alone to come back tomorrow and continue. A raven flies to the cell window. Yu Guo underestimates the enemy. He will not be able to hold Ye Chiang in this way. The raven turned out to be not just a bird, but the soul of Ye Chiang had moved into it. It's night outside. Li Yu Guo is leaving prison. A crow flies overhead. The emperor's bedchamber. The emperor's body is lying on the bed. He is dead. His wife is kneeling by his bed, crying, and his three concubines are crying with her. A new ceremony of initiation of the emperor in the throne room of the imperial palace. Those present at the ceremony wish the new emperor longevity and health. Ji Wushuang and Li Yuguo also join in the congratulations and wishes to the new emperor. Ye Chiang has just escaped. The old emperor has died. Wang Saner has come to the throne, and things are moving very quickly. The boys have an audience, and once again personally greet and thank the emperor. Suddenly, he announces that Li Yu Guo has conspired with Ye Chiang and killed the emperor, and he sends him to death row. This decision is very strange for a guy who was loyal to the emperor and exposed a plot against him. The conditions in the guy's prison room are excellent. He doesn't need anything. He is visited by San Wanye, and Yu Guo believes that he has hidden intentions towards him, and the emperor wants him to go to the state of Dajin and find a spy. It seems that the emperor wants to turn the boy into his agent, and he doesn't mind. Wang Sanye emphasizes that the killer of Yu Guo's father is in the country of Da Jin. That year, Yu Guo's father went on a campaign with the army and he fought well. The commander in chief of the enemy army, Situ Wushu, unexpectedly captured the heir to Nolan and agreed to release him in exchange for Li's life. Pounding his fist on the table, Yu Guo asks if this is why they betrayed his father because his father initiated the sacrifice. The boy sees a vision of his father standing in front of the emperor's throne and taking an oath to be faithful to him. The Da Jing dynasty killed many soldiers and did not even spare his father's body. Commander-in-Chief Situ Wushu took his father's body with him, made poison from it, and hid it in the state of Da Jin. The guy is furious with what he hears, hits the stone wall of the prison with his fist, and promises to reduce Sita Wushu to dust. The emperor tricked the boy into going to the state of Da Jin, and Yu Guo has to think things through. The boy agrees to go. The emperor says that Meng is already a princess, and the boy has to say goodbye to her. Yu Guo leaves home at night to avoid being noticed by anyone, and finds the house where his beloved lives. Without warning or knocking, he opens the door and enters the room. The girl sees her husband and rushes to meet him, and he is also happy to see her. The princess asks if the boy has accepted her father's offer to go to the state of Dajin. He will go to avenge his father. Landman wants to go with him, but Yu Guo is against it. She is now a princess, so she must stay by her father's side and wait for his return. Hugging him, she asks him not to forget about her. She will wait for him faithfully. The prince hugs his wife, recalls how warm and cozy they were together. Every time they say goodbye, the girl feels like it's their last time. It is morning. The imperial palace is illuminated by the morning sun and birds are flying overhead. Princess Nalan Meng is sleeping comfortably in her bed. The prince is already awake and gone. She wakes up and clutches the sign he gave her and promises to wait for him as long as it takes. The guy harnesses his horse and says goodbye to Bai Zhishan, who wanted to leave, but the guy leaves him to look after his wife. Sitting on horseback, Yu Guo turns his head toward the palace, mentally addressing his wife and asking her to wait for him. A small carriage for one person, accompanied by several horsemen, is traveling along a forest road. Arrows are flying at the carriage from different directions, quite a few of them. One arrow goes in and stops near the head of an older man named Wang Zheng. The robbers want to capture Wang Zheng so that they can exchange him for good money. An armed group of men emerges from the forest to defend the travelers. The carriage with the doctor was attacked by very dangerous mountain bandits. Wang Zheng asks them who they are and what they want, and the robbers apologize and promise not to bother him again. From the window of the carriage, unidentified men can be seen killing the robbers. Li Yuguo stands among the bloody bodies of the robbers, and the doctor's escort thanks him. Wang Zheng, a doctor who is traveling to Beijing to treat his daughter Sito Wushu, gets out of the carriage and Li apologizes for being late. The doctor once saved a soldier at the foot of a mountain, and the soldier was the boy's father. At that time, two armies were fighting, and he definitely saved several wounded, 
The boy's father died, but he bequeathed him to thank the doctor. Wang Zheng sees that the boy has high moral values and invites him to go to Beijing with him. The plan prepared by Yu Guo was so detailed that it worked perfectly. The mountain bandits were warned about Wang Zheng's movements and were waiting for him at a certain place. The carriage with the doctor and Yu Guo arrives at the Shido Palace and is greeted by the owner himself. He is happy to see them. His daughter has been unconscious for seven days and seven nights. The man takes them to his daughter's room, and he thinks he knows the young man. The girl is lying in bed unconscious, very pale and weak. Wang Zheng examined the patient. He can stop the disease but cannot cure it. The father asks him to find a way. He has only a daughter left. Three of his sons died in the war, and only his daughter remained. If Li Yuguo cures her, he will be able to win the trust of the Sith. The boy approaches the girl, takes her hand, and the father asks what he is doing now. Yuguo says that the spell spreads throughout the girl's body. She regains consciousness and is kept at a high temperature. This is the effect of voodoo magic. The boy can save the girl and cure her, but then he will expose himself. Yuguo decides to take a chance and save the young girl from certain death. Seeing the sword, Sido puts his sword to the boy's neck, demanding an explanation. Only this sword can overcome voodoo magic. Yuguo takes the girl's hand and makes an incision in it with his sword of the sun and moon. Blue fluid is leaking out of the patient's body through the wound in his arm. Along with it, the black mark of the voodoo magic of the far north leaves the girl. The guy explains that in the lands of the far north there are people who have voodoo magic, and only the sword of the sun and moon can help. Sito Wushu draws his sword. He is furious with the entire voodoo cult and vows to destroy them all. The emperor recognized the boy as Li Guanyi's son from Haoshan, and he was wanted in his own country, so he had to hide. Sito Chu wonders why he chose the state of Jin for his hiding place. Li's family sacrificed everything for Haoshan. The emperor sent his father to death. The new emperor accused the boy of murder, and he no longer wants to serve such a state. Si Tu Chu accepts his explanation, saying that the enemy of his enemy is his friend. He saved his daughter, and he can stay in his palace. Li Yuguo sincerely thanks the emperor for his hospitality and leaves the palace. The emperor instructs his servant to keep a close eye on this guest. The story takes place in Beijing, Dajin Oki, a crowded street with everyone hurrying about their business. Li Yugu has never been here before. He was walking around the city and got hungry, so he buys street food. Continuing his walk, he sees a man on the tower whom he had seen in the Emperor's palace. The guy is not afraid of being watched, and he has to figure out a way to win the trust of Sita Wushu. As he moves on, he sees a suspicious man, and he instantly has a plan. He follows the man, catches up with him in an alley. The man notices the surveillance and asks him who he is. Yuguo replies that he is the one who will destroy him, draws his sword, and cuts off the man's head. As he hides the sword, he basically says that traitors deserve to die and crosses the photo of the murdered man off the list. The Emperor's pursuers see that Yu Guo is very cruel. One of them continues to watch, and the other returns to report to the Emperor about the incident. The spy reports that the guy has already killed several of Xi'an's agents. He is tracking them down and killing them instantly. The Emperor asks where the boy is now, and is told that he has returned to his chambers. Zheng enters Yu Guo's room and asks him what he is doing, and he replies that he has important things to do and has to leave. Sito Wushu enters his room and asks if the boy is leaving because he has a mission to kill Jiantian's agents. Yu Guo says it's his business. The emperor has nothing to do with it. He's glad his plan worked. The emperor believes that the agents could have been given false information and used for their own purposes. He offers cooperation and together they can turn Xi'an's state upside down. Emperor Situ Chu's daughter comes out to them, looking much better. The guy says that she runs so fast that she seems to have recovered completely, and she thanks him for her treatment. The girl takes his hand and wants to swing with him on the swing, and he can't refuse and walks away. The emperor lets them go for a walk and asks the boy to think about his proposal. The girl is told that her father is bad, and Yuguo explains that he may be bad to his enemies, but to the country, her father is a protector and a support. The boy also hates her father, but he hates the hypocrite San Wanye even more. The Emperor and Dr. Wang Zheng are watching them walk, and they hear this conversation. Situ Wushu is glad that the boy hates him because he destroyed his father. If the boy said that he did not hate the Emperor, then he would be up to no good. Wang Zheng offers to entrust the boy with an important task, but the Emperor thinks it is too early. A guy sees men discussing something. He has to do something else to gain their trust. Yu Guo is rocking Sita Chu on a swing. 
The girl is hungry, her stomach is rumbling. The guy says she can satisfy her hunger by drinking yogurt. The girl likes the yogurt. It's sweet and tasty, and she hasn't tried it before. She likes to play with her boyfriend. She wants to go outside the palace to see what's there. The boyfriend says she's just started to get better. The emperor asked Chu not to tell the Nine Yin about her channels, so she never went outside. He was interested in the information about the channels. According to legend, such people are innate martial artists, but they do not live to be 30. The boy asks her if she went with her father to the far north to find a snow lotus that could help her. Lee reminds her that she must not tell anyone about this peculiarity of hers, she promises. The girl really wants him to take her for a walk. The boy gives in to her request, and they go for a walk outside the palace. For the first time in her life, the girl goes outside the palace to the streets of a big city. It's the first time she's seen so many people. She's been locked up for a long time, and the guy promises they'll have a good time tonight. Yugal brought her to a place where they sell ice cream, and the girl's eyes shone with happiness. The girl ate several portions of pasta with pleasure. She has a good appetite. The magician tried to trick Yuguo, and he got angry and yelled at him. In a jewelry store, the owner shows the girl a lot of beautiful things, and the boy watches nearby. The girl tries on the barrette and asks Yuguo if it suits her. He worries that he's falling in love looking at a girl's smile, and he understands people who are called old seducers. The girl asks to see if it's nice again, and the guy says that everything suits her. On an elevated platform, the master archer Ju Lan Huan is pointing his bow and arrow at his target. Yuguo's back feels dangerous, and lightning seems to appear behind him. He is covering the girl with himself, and an arrow hits him in the back and exits in the sternum. The archer does not know who this guy is, who could feel his arrow coming from a distance. Yuguo shouts at the attacker and says that he asked for revenge. He directs the tentacles of the thousand-armed man to the elevation where the archer is standing. This is the first time he sees such a monster destroying the stones under him. With his sword, he manages to cut the tentacles and prevent them from entangling him. He runs away. He has to report to the crown prince about this warrior who was not previously among the subordinates of Sita Wushu. Yu Guo regrets that their attacker escaped, but he promises that next time he will catch him. The girl says that the boy is seriously injured and needs to see a doctor immediately. He convinces her that he is fine, faints, and falls at her feet. The girl helps him up and insists that he needs to see a doctor. They find themselves in a hospital, and Sita Chu asks the doctor to help her. Her friend is injured. The doctor examines the wound. The arrow was filled with highly toxic poison and suggests they look for another doctor. He can cure her, but it will be very expensive. And she gives him the Jasper bracelet her father gave her and asks him to cure the boy. The doctor took the bracelet in his hand, twirled his beard, and said that he would try to cure the patient. In the Imperial Palace, Sita Wushu is angry that a boy has taken his daughter outside the palace. He orders to find Li Yuguo immediately and bring him to him. He will not forgive him. Li Yuguo is lying on the bed, his chest bandaged, with a doctor and Sito Chu standing next to him. The doctor asks the girl to look after the boy while he prepares the medicine. The girl dips a towel into the bowls of water and says that she has always wanted a brother. She used to have three brothers, but they sacrificed their lives and she doesn't even know what they looked like. She wipes the boy's forehead and says that she hates the war. Her father protects her, and she lives a safe life. Her father is worried about her and keeps her locked up at home, but she had a lot of fun with the boyfriend. Although they haven't been together long, she perceives him as a brother and wants him to be well and recover. The door to the room opens. The girl turns her head. She thinks it's the doctor who has returned. A doctor and two other men enter Vimnata's room and demand that she give them all her money. The girl has already given her bracelet back, and she thinks that should be enough. The thieves say that ordinary people do not wear such bracelets. She must have money. They will tie her up and sell her. The girl asks not to be touched. She says that her father is the emperor of this state, Sito Wushu. The robbers are afraid that if it turns out that this girl is the emperor's daughter and they have taken her prisoner, he will destroy them. The doctor pulls a dagger out of his sleeve and says he has an idea. He offers to kill Sio Chu and the girl screams and calls for help. The doctor's hand holding the dagger is intercepted by Yuguo, who is about to kill them all. The guy beats the thieves, he punishes them for trying to rob and kill the girl. He reassures the girl, promises to always be there for her, and she complains that these uncles were very scary. The doctor says that he put the wounds in a potion. Yuguo could not get up on his feet. The potion would work on an ordinary person, not on him. 
The guy puts his hand over the girl's eyes and tells her not to peek. There's a trick coming, and she obeys him. Yuguo summons a thousand armed man to deal with the robbers. The demon binds all three criminals, and their attempts to escape are unsuccessful. Yuguo removes his hand from the girl's eyes, and she asks if the trick is over. When she opens her eyes, she doesn't see the bad uncles in front of her and asks her brother where they are. Three heads of criminals are floating in the cauldron, and the prince says that the bad uncles have gone elsewhere. The girl asks how the guy's wounds are. He says that the poison did not work. He was unconscious because the process of self-healing started. They hear a noise outside. Someone is looking for Li Yuguo very loudly. The emperor and his retinue enter the room, and he yells at the boy because he could have harmed his daughter and dragged her into a dangerous situation. The girl defends the boy, asks him not to touch her. He is wounded because he was defending her. The emperor is thinking about what to do. He loves his daughter, so he will not upset her. He decides to let him go this time, but wants an explanation for why he was wounded at the Wu Huan level. Yu Guo says that he was attacked by a man with a bow, a fact that alarms the emperor. Wang Zhen explains to Sito Wushu that an archer of the Wu Huan level can only be the archer of Crown Prince Zhan Shengzhe. The emperor is furious with Zhan Shengzhe. He does not dare to attack his daughter. In the gazebo, there is a game console on the table, and two people are operating the joysticks. Li Yuguo tells Situ Chiu that her playing technique is bad, and she asks him to give in to her. This time the guy won, and he says that no one is spared in esports. The boy asks the girl if she is not angry with him. She drinks a milkshake and forgives him. The emperor does not like the fact that Yuguo is getting closer to his daughter. The emperor's aide, Liu Feilan, says that the girl used to be sad, but now she laughs thanks to the boy and asks if the emperor is not jealous. The emperor knows that this man is very cunning, so he is worried that this rapprochement is not due to good intentions. The adjutant reports that the boy has been practicing or playing with the girl all day, and he looks sincere, so you can check him out. The emperor entrusts him with the task of running the military ministry instead of the man who had been suspended. The aide-de-camp does not approve of this idea. They are watching Yuguo and the girl play. If the boy has evil intentions, they will be straightened out while running this ministry. Next, events are developing in the military ministry, which is now headed by Lu Yuguo. The deputy head of the military ministry, John Wuxin, is unhappy with this appointment, and the guy is wanted. The doors of the military ministry are opening and a new head is coming in. Yuguo asks what they are discussing and he likes that the work is already in full swing. Employees of the ministry bow in respect to him and welcome the new head. Deputy Jian Wuxin is disappointed with the newly appointed head, thinking that he is a nobody. Li Yuguo gives his first order as head of the ministry to capture the guard Zhao Wenguang. Strajnik is a veteran of the ministry, and the new head does not have to do whatever he wants. Yuguo explains that Zhao Wenguang is a spy for Dalao, the Imperador sent him to run the ministry to continue to keep an eye on him, and he needs to prove himself. The guard says that he is not a spy. Yuguo cannot openly act against the Haotian country. He is acting with the help of a hostile state. Yuguo's accusations are not unfounded. He has studied the protocols of military operations of the time. On the eve of the battle, a guard killed General Zhushan and escaped, and the guard must be detained. Before the battle, Zhao Wangguang received information that the enemy was going to attack deep in the rear, and he led the men out of danger. When the guard came running, the general had already been wounded by many arrows, so he could not have killed him. The general did die from arrows, but it was this Zhao who shot the decisive arrow into his back. Yu Guo accuses the guard of treason, but he insists that it is slander, he is innocent. Ministry officials say the general could survive in any environment, and they agree that Zhao is a spy. An order is given to detain the spy and an unarmed guard runs to Zhao. The spy responds to the order and immediately pulls his dagger out of its sheath. He presses a weapon to the unarmed guard's neck and tells him not to come near, otherwise he will kill him. Yu Guo asks if the spies are helping each other, only for Song Dahai to run unarmed through the crowd to help Zhao escape. Dao Wu Ching, one of the deputy heads, admits that Song Dahai is also a spy. Sun Dan looks at the members of the military ministry and realizes that he has given himself away. Zhao Wenguang was unable to escape, and he was caught and punished for treason and espionage. He throws a pill into his mouth, which is supposed to speed up his departure into the underworld. This pill is taken out of his mouth by the thousand-armed man's tongue, and his plan has failed. Yuguo unraveled his intention to commit suicide and avoid punishment. 
The tentacles of the thousand-armed man tightly intertwine the bodies of the traitors and prevent them from poisoning themselves. Yuiguo is pleased with the outcome of this operation, and the spies will be punished as they deserve. There are two pills on the tray that were taken out of the spies' mouths. These pills are poison. This is the poison of the Dalao state, and the person who took it bleeds to death. Zaputnikov recalls that the previous head of the ministry died in the same way. Yuguo says that the previous head gave himself away, so he took poison, and they need to interrogate the spies and get as much information as possible from them. The exposure of spies commands respect among the deputies, and they will do everything in their power to uncover the plot. The aide-de-camp reports to the emperor that Yuiguo has caught traitors. He thought he was a spy when he looked through the ministry's records. Adyutan concludes that even if Yuiguo is a spy, he will oppose Dalao in defense of Haoshan. The eight princes of Dalao have united, and only by limiting their information can they be defeated. The events continue six months later in the palace of the emperor of the Hyotan state. The emperor says that in six months, Yuiguo caught more than 300 spies and defeated corruption in Dajing. He asks his daughter if he would have restored the same order in their state if they had left him, and Landman says that her father had kicked him out. The princess gets up from her chair, says she is tired and will go to rest. The emperor asks her if she is still angry with him, and he does it all for the sake of the state and for her. Bai Zhishan tells the emperor that one day the princess will understand all his efforts for her. Wushu's city is appreciated by Li, and Bai is worried that this little intrigue will not turn into a real disaster. The emperor is furious, beating his palm on the table, not liking the boy's words, calling him an insolent. No one dares to judge his son-in-law, so he falls to his knees and asks for mercy. Kneeling before the emperor, Bai Zhishan regrets his statements. Bai is sitting at the table reading. He didn't expect his brother to be appreciated. A demon wakes up in his hand and asks him if he is jealous of Yuguo, and covered in sweat, the boy says no. He will win against him one day, and the demon's voice repeats the question of whether he is not really jealous. Even in a strange place, everything works out for Yuguo. But Bai is not appreciated. It's his thoughts. He's jealous. The demon tells him to let his envy run wild and then they will become stronger. The boy will no longer be inferior to Li Yuguo. Hu Meyer enters the room and she asks if he is okay. The girl notices that his look has changed and asks him once again if he is okay. The guy jumps on her, grabs her arms and throws her on the bed, and she has no strength to resist. He rips off her clothes, pins her to the bed and rapes her, satisfying his desire. The girl is crying, resisting, asking to be left alone, saying that she is in pain, tears streaming down her face. He slaps her on the cheek, demands that she shut up. He did not give her the right to speak. Bai Zhishan is disappointed that his wife does not obey him the way his women obey Yuiguo. He will not deceive himself. He is jealous of Yuiguo and wants him dead. Hu Meyer is still lying on the bed with her hands tied, helpless and completely at the mercy of the boy. There is a banquet in the palace of Emperor Sito Wushu. The guests are sitting at laid tables, and his daughter is standing on an elevated position. The girl is fifteen years old, and a woman puts a wreath on her head, congratulating her on becoming an adult. Yuguo drinks his glass, the girl calls out to him, but he doesn't hear. Ji Long Chen, the prince of the Daikin kingdom, asks the archer Jibei who the girl is calling. The guy says it's the one he fought with, Yuiguo got rid of all the secret agents. The prince asks the nine-tailed fox to go and have a drink with Li Yuguo. Dao Wu Ching, the deputy minister of war, raises his glass and drinks to Yuiguo. Everyone started to trust Yuguo, but Wu Tangguo did not contact him for a year, so maybe something went wrong. The nine-tailed fox approaches their table and wants to have a drink with Yuiguo. The minister does not want to drink with her and asks her to leave him alone. The girl asks if he likes her body, and if he listens to the prince, she will belong to him completely. The deputy military ministers discuss where this shameless whore came from and why she is hitting on the main guest. Yuguo tells the girl that he is the supreme military emperor and that for the sake of peace, he is sparing her life and demanding that she leave him. The girl leaves him, and Sito Chu comes to his table and asks what they are doing. No wonder he didn't answer her greeting. He was busy with other beauties. The guy says that this girl was hitting on him and he doesn't like that. The girl flirtatiously asks if she meets his tastes. The guy's eyes light up at her flirtatiousness and he pulls himself together. He offers to go shopping today as he promised. The nine-tailed fox lowered its head, offended by being sent away. Yugu and Chu are in a shop looking for bracelets. The girl had said earlier that she wanted a new bracelet. 
The girl puts on two bracelets and asks which one suits her best, and the man says they can buy two. A woman seller invites them to the second floor, where there is a large selection of jewelry. They follow a woman with a very unusual and rough voice. On the second floor, the girl begins to feel dizzy and the boy supports her. A woman seller lit a candle and a girl inhaled the smell and felt sick. Yuguo picks up the unconscious girl, draws his sword, and asks what happened to the girl. The saleswoman takes off her wig. It's Shifan Tuxing, and he asks the boy not to do anything. When Yuguo sees his friend, he laughs at his disguise as a girl and asks if the denaturation was successful. Shifan had no other choice. The emperor of Shitu was watching Yanjing everywhere. The sleeping girl is put in a chair, and the prince is interested in news from Wu Tang Yago. The three princes ask him to cooperate with Prince Daikan to get rid of Sita Wu Wushu. Prince Dajin agreed with San Wanye to destroy Sita Wu Shu together and put Dajin's heir on the throne. Yui Guona likes Wang Santir's ignorance. If he destroys the Wu Shu sieve, Dajin will be in his hands. Shifan says that the princess is very sad, does not talk about it, and constantly looks towards Dajin. Yuguo also wants to come back and see me as soon as possible and dreams that these terrible days will end. Wang Wanye put Bai Zhishan in charge and he sent people to follow Yuiguo and verify all the information. Ali Mom's trust system shows that San Wanye's trust has fallen, while Sita's has risen. Shidakin needs to go so that no one suspects anything. The guy lets him go. He knows what to do next. Sita Chu opens her eyes. She was sleeping, and Yuguo explains that she must have been playing too much. He hands her a box with a ring and says it's for her. The girl likes it very much. She is happy, and Yuguo says it is an adult gift. Situ Chu hugs his brother and says that he is very good. Yuguo wanted to keep it that way, but he has other plans. Emperor Sito Wusho has arrived at the wooden house with his guards. He is not going to say anything to Yuiguo. An old man comes out of the hut. The emperor asks about his health, and the man replies that it hasn't changed. He has changed his medicine. The emperor enters the room and says that he has come to pay a visit to his old rival. A man is sitting in a vat of hot water. The emperor informs him that his son is now in Beijing. He is as wonderful as his father. The son does not feel sorry for himself and continues to work for the Haotian state. Otherwise, he would have allowed them to meet. The emperor pours roots, seeds, and flowers into a vat of water. He knows that this time the guy came to take his father's body. He is interested in how Yuiguo will behave when he finds out that his father is not dead. If the emperor's three sons had not died, they would have been just as good, each serving his lord. A light two-wheeled carriage drawn by a single horse is traveling down the road. Ji Longcheng, Ten-Tailed Fox, and Jibe are sitting in the boat, and the woman says that Situ left Beijing with the army. A girl in a black cloak gives a tiger statuette that will help the soldiers. Ten-Tailed Fox says that Yuiguo refused to cooperate with the rebels. He does not listen to the Haotian emperor and Ji gives the order to surround the minister's palace and block the city gates. The nine-tailed fox is also waiting for orders on its further actions. She agrees to go with Ji Longchen to his father's house, and he agrees. In a boudoir with a Chiron carpet, there is a vase of fruit and wine, and a man asks the women not to run away from him. He is half-naked, blindfolded, surrounded by beautiful women, and the first one he catches will spend the night with him. A guard stands at the entrance to the house, and a man approaches the house. It's Prince G and Nine-Tailed Fox. The prince wants to see his father. He's having fun, and the guard won't let him see him. The uninvited guests kill the guard who stands in their way and go inside. In the room, a blindfolded man continues the game, asking the beauties not to run away and catch him. He touches his son with his hand, who says that the state is in danger now, and he is having fun with women. The man takes off his blindfold, looks at his boyfriend, and asks why he came. The guy pulls out a sword and says that he has come to carry out a coup. The boy chops off his father's head and says it's time to replace the ruler with a new one. He gives the nine-tailed fox the task of leaving no one alive, and it proceeds to fulfill it. Innocent women are paying with their lives because they were with the emperor at that moment. Ji Long Chen is pleased with their work and says that they are now moving on to the next step. Wang Santir tells the counselor that Dei Jing has taken action and asks if he has any regrets and the counselor has no doubts. Loyal to his master, he is ready to follow him, and the emperor promises to make him king. For the sake of his ambitions, the guy is ready to betray Yuiguo and get everything he wants. Two months before this event, Bai Zhishan knelt down to meet his majesty, the emperor. The emperor says that the servant is full of ambition. He can deceive Li Yuguo, but he cannot deceive him. On his knees, the boy expresses his gratitude and devotion to his emperor. 
Wang Sanye leans into the boy and tells him that he needs him to fulfill his great plans. But Bai needs to betray Yu Guo. Bai does not want to be a shadow of his brother. He is ready to go through anything to be the emperor. The emperor appoints Bai Zhishan as his advisor and prime minister of Haotian, and the servant thanks him. The advisor reports to the itmerator to earn Daijin's trust Li Yuguo has opposed Dalao. These states are on the brink of war. On the map, he shows that during the internal conflicts in Dazin, His Majesty attacked the city to find the rebels. By that time, Daijing will be under the control of Haotan, and then it will be possible to combine the forces of the two states and defeat Dalao. Wang Santha and his retinue leave, and the counselor remains in his chair. Turning to Li Yuguo in his mind, he says that a bird chooses its own tree, and a smart servant is a worthy master, so he should not blame. It's night over the imperial palace. The stars barely illuminate the front door. Emperor San Wanye pretended for a long time. It tired him out, and soon Li Guan would meet his father and son. People with torches surrounded the manor of Emperor Situ Wushu. They are following the order of Ji Long Chen. The rebels are led by Zhebei, an archer who attempted to assassinate the princess and wounded Yui Guo. On the roof of the house, Dao says that the rebels have stolen the tiger's talismans, and the palace is also uneasy. The princess is worried, her father is out of town, and Yuiguo reassures her. As soon as Master Xian left the city, the rebels appeared. It was planned. Jiang Wuxing is furious that the scoundrels attacked the palace and must be dealt with, but Yuiguo stops him. The Sithu family belongs to the Great Wars. They should retreat. He asks the girl what her father said about retreating, and she says that her father told her to run toward the kitchen. The first arrows penetrate the emperor's house, and he has to flee. Li Yuguo picks up the girl and runs away from the gate with her. He orders his deputies to escort the young lady toward the kitchen and look for an exit. The assistants take the girl and run with her into the house, while Li Yuguo remains in the yard. Zhebei aims an arrow at Yui Guo, and he cannot hide from this arrow. A red beam appears on the archer's forehead like a laser sight. The bullet hits the target, and the scarecrow dies, the arrow and bow falling from his hands. Li Yuguo puts down his sniper rifle, saying that snipers in the main positions do not work like this. There are a lot of soldiers in the courtyard of the house, and a grenade is flying at them. There is an explosion. The soldiers fly to the sides, and Yui Guo says goodbye to them. The boy finds a secret exit from the palace and climbs out of it. He sees Master Xiang in front of him and is surprised by this meeting. The emperor says that he was not mistaken about the boy. He was able to escape on his own. The emperor has even the death of the king under his control. The king is attracted to beauties, and his heir is too stupid to rule. The emperor is very cunning. Even the plot to change the government was voiced so well. The guy says that the prince has taken the tiger's talisman. The army no longer obeys the emperor. The talisman was a cover, and his army will not listen to the prince. Yuguo wonders why the emperor is telling him this. The emperor is willing to work with him because he trusts him. The boy did not promise to cooperate. He may refuse, but the emperor is sure that he will agree. The emperor gives the boy a letter and tells him to just see what's inside. Li opens the envelope, takes out a letter, and does not believe what he is reading. An army of thousands led by Wang Santir is on its way to seize the neighboring state. The emperor receives a letter in which he reads that King Dajin is dead and his advisor wants to receive the promise. Princess Lanman, who is traveling with her father, is thinking, her father is close to reaching the goal. The emperor gives the order to move immediately. The girl is looking up at the sky, thinking about her husband, wondering if he is okay. The army arrives at the Yanqin Palace and stops in front of the city gates. They are met by Prince Ji Long Chen, who is happy that the third king has finally arrived, and they must hurry and kill old Shi Tu. Addressing his troops, San Wanye says that they will easily enter the city. From behind the gate comes the order to open the gate. It is strange to open the gate in front of enemies. Suddenly the gate closes and two soldiers run in. Prince Ji Long Chen does not understand what has happened. He is standing in front of a closed gate. By order of the Iron Buddha, any warrior of the Wutan Kingdom who takes a single step into the city will die. Ji Long Chen shows the tiger talisman in his hand, hoping that it will save him. He is told that the real owner of the talisman is Sita Wushu. San Wanye presses his sword to the prince's neck and demands that he open the gate or he will kill him. The Iron Buddha is ordered to execute Ji Long Chen for the murder of the king and the rebellion he started. The emperor's sword is still at the prince's throat, and the prince asks the third king not to burn the bridges. The prince shouts to the soldiers to destroy Yan Jin for his sake. It is approaching the city. 
A column of dust and red flags are visible. Suddenly and swiftly, horsemen approach Yan Jin with banners. The clone is headed by Emperor Sido Wushu and War Minister Li Yuguo. The advisor tells San Waner that it is not good that Sido Wushu led the army himself to bypass them. The crown prince cries out to the emperor, and San Wanye does not believe that he has been outplayed. The two warring armies are standing opposite each other, and Emperor Sito Wushu tells the third king that many years have passed. He replies that it's too early to be proud of Sitao Wushu and asks his son-in-law if he is already successful. Yuiguo does not understand this appeal to him and does not respond. The father-in-law accuses Li Yuguo of treason and siding with his enemy. The boy has a letter in front of his eyes with a proposal to marry Lanman to Dalao, and he asks the motive for this act. The princess cannot believe her ears, and her father replies that he will do anything for the future of his kingdom. The guy says with contempt that the emperor is just an old scoundrel. The emperor has a surprise and orders his servants to take the woman out. The servants bring Li Yuguo's mother to the battlefield, and the boy recognizes her. He yells at Nalan Telun to get his hands off his mother. The emperor put his sword to the woman's neck. He should not listen to the words of the traitor, and he says not to blame him for his heartlessness. The boy is tormented by remorse. He cannot kill Sito Wushu, but for the sake of his mother's life he must do it. He raises his sword to the emperor's throat and looks away. The emperor closes his eyes and relies on fate. His subordinates want to help him. He turns his head to the boy and tells him to do it. He will save his mother, and the old man will not blame him. The boy cannot do this because then he will be like that, but there is no other way to save his mother. A demon wakes up in him and offers to give him his body, and he will take away all the problems. The woman tells her son that she has always blamed herself for her childhood abuse, and now this burden has fallen on him. She asks him not to worry about her, but to do what he has to do. The woman says he deserves a better life and turns a blind eye. The emperor cuts off the woman's head with a bottom blow and her body falls to the ground. The boy's face turns black. Tears run from his eyes. He did not save his mother. The emperor's action made Princess Nalan angry and she crouches down by the woman's body. A pendant falls from the victim's neck, which is also cut in half by the sword. Yuguo rushes at the emperor, held back by his two deputies. Bai Jishan gloats over the loss of his former friend and says that this is only the beginning. An explosion is heard outside the city. Smoke comes from the roof, and residents flee. A man with long blue hair falls from the sky into the house. The man gets to his feet. He looks very much like Yu Guo's father, General Li Guangyi. The emperor says that because of this woman he smeared his sword, Princess Nalanmen holds Li Yu Guo's mother in her arms. The girl turns her head to her father and says that he has had enough. Yu Guo shouts at Nalan Talon that he will destroy him and attacks him. The emperor looks at him calmly and says that he is looking for death. Yuguo holds a sword and starts a fight with his enemy. The princess is grieving for her mother, and Bai reassures her and says that it was a woman's choice. The girl orders the servants to take care of her mother as they should, and the servants obey her order. Sinowushu tells his adjutant that the time has come, and he replies that he understands. Adjutant orders all his soldiers to get ready for his command. Advisor Bai also orders the soldiers to prepare to attack on his command. Two large armies converge on the battlefield and a powerful battle begins. Archers shoot lighted arrows that set their enemies and everything around them on fire. Fire arrows reach the city and residents run with buckets to put out the fire. One of the soldiers runs past General Li Guanyi. He looks back at him again, thinking he recognizes him. The demon shouts again at Li, reminding him to give him his life. The third king defends himself against Yu Yu and says that he allows himself too much. The guy constantly attacks his enemy, but he is stronger than him. He fails to break through his defense and get closer. Wang Sanye gloats, but the boy has another option and uses it. The guy gathers his strength. He has to defeat his enemy. It's a matter of honor. The emperor accuses the boy of betraying his wife and the kingdom of Wutan. The boy replies that the enemy is the only one who started the war and failed the entire kingdom of Wutan. The emperor asks if the boy has given up everything his father has achieved in the kingdom. He shouts at the man to shut his mouth. He does not deserve the right to mention his father's name. The king shouts that the boy will soon meet his father in hell, and there is a puppet behind the emperor. The puppet points its weapon at the king, who must defend himself. A powerful explosion occurs, and the prince sees his opponent disappear in the blast. When the smoke clears, Yuiguo sees the emperor again, and he says that he is impressed with Li Yuiguo's work. A man asks the boy if he has a demonic puppet like a fighter. The guy replies that this puppet was made to destroy him. 
The Emperor raises his hand. A pillar of fire throws Yuiguo away, and the puppet runs to his aid. Three live grenades fly at the half-naked Third King. There is a powerful explosion, and Yuiguo shields his hand from the blinding light. Sanwaner is alive, he stabs the puppet in the back, saying that he underestimated his opponent. The boy is surprised that the Emperor was able to survive the grenades. The power of the demon awakens in the Emperor, and he is forced to do so by Li Yuguo. John Wuxin warns the minister to be careful. The Emperor's power is equal to martial saint levels. The boy will not allow the Emperor to gain enough strength to fight. He attacks the enemy with new strength with the Sword of the Sun and Moon. During the fight, the opponent is behind him, his eyes burning with fire. Another explosion occurs and the demon remains unharmed. The guy falls to the ground, he is wounded in the back, the sword has fallen out of his hand. His demonic puppet has been destroyed by a single blow, and he wonders if he has a chance to win. He tries to reach for his sword with the thought that he cannot die. The Emperor's foot steps on the yogi's hand, preventing him from taking the sword, and the boy screams in pain. The Emperor, in his demon essence, considers himself a victor, standing over the lying boy. Behind them, the battle of the two armies continues, with lots of fire and smoke. San Wanye in the body of a demon is in excellent physical shape, his eyes burning with fire. Yuguo tries again to get his moon and sun sun to continue the fight. There's another explosion on the battlefield, lots of smoke and fire on the horizon, and the Emperor is watching. Suddenly, after the explosion, General Li Guanye, Yuguo's father, emerges from the fire. His appearance surprises San Wanye, who thought the general had died long ago. The general quickly bridges the distance between him and his old enemy. The sword of the sun and moon is in his hands and he rushes at his emperor. A battle begins between Li Guanye and San Wanye with a lot of fire and lightning around them. There is an outbreak of two energies that met on the battlefield, a burst of fire burying the opponents. Fire is mixed with stones and the opponents strike each other. The deputies take Yu Guo away from the battlefield. Shifan Tongxing appears and asks him if he is okay. Yu Guo doesn't understand why this man has the sword. Jian Wuxin asks Shifan what the man from the Wutian kingdom is doing here. He is on the side of this Yu Guo. Emperor Sido Wushu informs Yu Guo that this man is his father, Li Guanye. For twenty years he slept and sustained his life with medicinal herbs to meet his wife and son. The story he heard amazes him. He cannot believe it is true. The battle between the two greatest enemies continues with fire and stones mixing in the air. None of them is going to give in. They have been waiting for the moment of revenge for too long. Hot stones knock the general off his feet. He loses his balance and falls. Soldiers from both armies are watching this battle, and they are appalled by what they see. Sitting among the stones, the general makes an effort to get up to continue the battle. The emperor hits him in the face with his hand and gloatingly asks if he wants to get up. San Wanye throws the general on a rock and shouts that he must die. The explosion again throws up stones that mix with fire and set everything on fire. A fiery demon descends into the abyss and everything is covered in fire. The general falls into this gorge and there are sharp stones at the bottom that cause wounds. The essence of the fire demon is behind the emperor, telling the general that he is weak. The ground opens up, red tentacles come out of it, and the general flies into the air. A fire spider with sharp claws and many legs appears from the ground. Yui Guo asks the owner what it is, and Sito Wushu explains that it is the liquid of a wolf spider and the genealogy of his family. If you use this wolf spider fluid, it will be a fight to the last. The third king sees that the general has used up his wolf spider fluid, and their battle will be to the last breath. Two demonic forces enter the battle, the emperor standing on the head of his fiery dragon. Soldiers on the battlefield are ordered to immediately retreat from their positions. Yuguo looks at his father with horror and hope, but he cannot help him. The warriors leave the battlefield, and the battle between the fire dragon and the wolf spider begins. A wolf spider fluid entity with glowing eyes and a mouth with sharp teeth is ready to fight the dragon. The fire dragon has met a worthy opponent. Its grace and beauty are fascinating. The dragon attacks first, grabbing the spider's paw with its teeth. He manages to bite it in half, and a green liquid flows out of the two parts of the spider's wound. He turns and sinks his teeth into the body of the fire dragon, biting through its skin. The damage of monsters is felt as pain in the bodies of the people to whom they belong. Jiang Wuxing tells Yu Guo that this is a battle between two strong gods. The wolf spider sinks its teeth into the body of the dragon, and the dragon bites the wolf spider with all its might. Standing on the dragon's head, the emperor asks if the general wants to die with him. 
The bodies of the two demons are intertwined. An explosion occurs between them, and everything around them is illuminated with green light. Shifan Tusan shields his eyes from the explosion and asks what happened. Emperor Sito Wushu replies that this is an internal pill of the bloodline. He orders everyone to step back. There is another explosion, similar to an explosion of atomic energy. Everything is illuminated with bright light, and a fireball appears in the sky. Yugu and his friends take cover from the bright light, trying to see the aftermath of the explosion. A large crater is formed at the site of the explosion, with weapons lying around it. When the smoke cleared, the wounded bodies of the Emperor and the General were seen on the battlefield. Princess Landman is frightened by the battle and the explosion and calls out for her father. Yuguo sees his father wounded and rushes to him, screaming. General Liguanye sits by the body of his wife, his son runs to him, and the princess also runs to her father. Guanye sticks his sword in the ground, embraces his wife, and his son stands beside him. The general closes his eyes and lies down next to his wife, life leaving his body. The soldiers of the Wutan kingdom surrender, and the counselor says that now their real enemy is Dalao. Princess Nalan Meng and a guard bring her father out of the battlefield, and Yuguo weeps over her parents. The girl turns her head and calls out to her husband, her eyes full of despair and compassion. The guy says that there is no need for words now, they need time to calm down. It's raining, and Yuguo is kneeling in front of his parents' tombstones, his new friends by his side. The guy is grateful for his parents' life. He will always remember them, and regrets that he could not protect them. Emperor Sito Wushu hopes that they will be brothers in the next life. Princess Situ Chu is kneeling next to the boy, promising to always be there for him. Yuguo is sitting at the table drinking wine, with two empty glasses next to him. Shifan says that recent events have had a bad effect on him, and his deputy doesn't like the fact that the master is not interested in the voyage. The emperor takes away Yuguo's wine, saying that drunkenness will not solve his problems, and the boy replies that it is none of his business. Sito throws Wushu to the ground and shouts that the boy has no right to do this to his father. The wounded father held on to the last just to meet him and his mother one last time. He suffered pain and was half dead for twenty years. His words bring the guy back to his senses, he agrees with him, and he has a lot of work ahead of him. The emperor says that even little Nalan was able to stand up to everyone and become the queen of Utan. He gives the guy a letter, and she sends him an agreement for a five-year peace. Li Yuguo thanks the emperor for his advice and now he knows what to do next. In the courtyard of her palace, Princess San Q swings on a swing. She misses and grieves for Yuguo. A lot of time has passed, and he is unknown. Li Yuguo comes to meet her from the palace in new, festive clothes. The girl asks him if he's okay, and he thanks her for her concern and apologizes for making her worry. Sido Chu suggests going out if he has the energy, and the guy agrees. They go for a walk to the Beijing Market Square. It's very crowded. The weather is great. The girl shows that there are a lot of people ahead of them and holds on to the boy's hand. They hear that after the execution of the princess, all her subordinates were arrested and marched through the streets. Yuguo suggests that the girl also go and see the princess's subordinates, and she agrees. Nine-tailed fox and goo are being dragged through the streets in open cages, with people throwing rotten vegetables at them and shouting derogatory words. The girls are holding on to wooden cages with cabbage heads and rotten leaves flying into them. Yuguo watches this action, his eyes full of hatred and anger. Gu recognizes him in the crowd and shouts his name throughout the square. The girls shout that they will definitely take revenge on him, and he hides behind the princess. The nine-tailed fox screams not to relax if it survives, and will definitely get even with him. The guy replies that in order to carry out her threat, she needs to survive first. Emperor Sito Wushu is sitting in bed coughing, and the medicine has been brought to him, and it's time to take it. He asks the doctor how much time he has, and the doctor replies that the emperor is in good condition. He lost Sito Wushu twenty years ago in a battle, and since then his health has been deteriorating, and he needs to know how much time he has left to make his orders. Bowing his head in reverence, the doctor says he has six months left at best. He has to find a successor who will defend the states of Wutan and Dajing. The doctor believes that generals Yan Huan and Song Qinglong, as well as Li Yuguo, can take on this responsibility. The emperor thinks that Li Yuguo might be his successor. He invented a test for all three, and whoever was the most successful would be his successor. Yuguo and the princess have returned to the palace. The boy can't play with the girl tomorrow. He has business, and nine-tailed fox and goo are kneeling in the yard. A boy and a girl see the girls who have just been taken through the streets. 
and they are surprised. Lysitsia and Gu's hands are in wooden handcuffs, and their mouths are covered with cloth gags. The adjutant received orders from the counselor to bring the girls to Yuiguo, and he could do whatever he wanted with him. The boy does not understand why Situ Wushu sent the girls to him and what he should do with them. He takes the gag out of the nine-tailed fox's mouth, and she screams that the day will come when she will be done with him. The girl sees the guy's sly look and asks what he is doing. He wants her to guess. Yuguo strokes Fox's tail, which really looks like fox fur and is pleasant to the touch. The girl needs to take a bath. She hasn't bathed for a long time. She stinks. The minister orders the guards to bring the girls to him and wash them. The girls are half naked. Their hands are handcuffed, and they wonder what will happen to them next. Yuiguo comes in and wants them to help him wash. Then he will take off their handcuffs. The nine-tailed fox says that she will be happy when he keeps his word. Yuguo is in the bathtub. The girls are washing him and he asks them to wash his buttocks. The fox rubs the boy's back and asks him how he got so many scars since he comes from a good family. He got these scars when he was defending his friends and family. Unfortunately, it didn't end well. If girls want to accompany him, he will protect them. The nine-tailed fox remembers how rudely he rejected her and how surprised he was by such an unexpected offer. Gu also doesn't remember the prince from the best side, so she didn't expect this from him. Yuguo gives the girls money and a list and wants them to buy him something for tomorrow. The girls don't have to buy anything. They can take the money and find good housing. The nine-tailed fox is reading the list. The guy asked to buy all sorts of things. She is interested in what he is up to. Generals Yan Huan and Song Qinglong discuss a plan to eliminate Yuguo with the help of a girl. Yan Huan gives Song Qinglong a needle that controls the human mind. This time, they will definitely get rid of their enemy. A nine-tailed fox walks down the street with a basket and is met by Song Ching Long. He says that she now has a new owner and offers to have a drink with him. She refuses the general, saying that she is no longer for him. Sun Ching Long quietly sends a needle into the girl to control her. The needle gets into the girl's neck and she loses control. The girl throws the basket and the shopping list she was shopping for on the ground. Li Yuguo sits in a chair in the military intelligence hall. The door opens and the nine-tailed fox enters. She approaches the guy stabs him in the chest, and he asks what she's doing. With her sword, the girl coldly cuts off his head, her hand firm and confident. She is holding Li Yuguo's head by the hair, and in her other hand she is holding a dagger. There is a nine-tailed fox near the temple of Fujin. It climbs the stairs to the temple. The generals are waiting for her, and they say that the girl quickly dealt with Li Yuguo, who is still weakened by the battle with the third king. The generals overheard the emperor's conversation with the doctor about a successor, and decided to remove the competitor from their path. They take the head out of the bag and think it's strange. A massive explosion rings out in the palace, throwing the generals against the walls. Li Yuguo appears in the hall and the generals ask how he can still be alive. The guy replies that they get what they want. He was watching a nine-tailed fox and noticed that it was under someone else's control and followed it. From the back of her head, he removed the restraining needle that controlled the girl. Nine-tailed fox asks how he got here. He says that he was stuck with a holding needle and was under the control of the generals. Li Yuguo wonders if there might be another retaining needle. The nine-tailed fox met the generals while they were shopping, and Li asks the generals why they want to remove him. Yang Huan says that the minister is a thorn in their side, and even his advisor wants to give him a title. Li Yuguo attacks the generals, and they are forced to defend themselves against him. For the sake of his advisor, the guy lets go of the generals who planned the assassination attempt. Next time he won't be so kind and will punish them. Li Yuguo leaves, leaving the generals alive. Song Ching Long asks why they don't chase him, and Yun replies that they can't. The nine-tailed fox wants to know why Li Yuguo let the generals who wanted to kill him go. The minister replies that they are the advisor's best subordinates, and that their destruction would deprive Dadzin of two talented generals. The emperor tells the aide that he has lost his favorite generals, and the aide replies that together they can defeat Li Yuguo. Li Yuguo grew up in battles. You can be a martial arts king but not be able to defeat even one puppet. Night descends on the land, and the lights are on in the minister's house. Li Yuguo is sitting at a table drinking wine, and the nine-tailed fox approaches him. He takes the girl and calls her by his wife's name. He is delusional and thinks it is Landman. The guy hugs her and tells her that he misses her. He wants to know how she is treated in the kingdom of Haoshan. He says he doesn't need this world. He only needs her and asks her not to leave him. The nine-tailed fox wants someone to love her and be sad, just like Yuiguo is now. 
She hugs the guy and tells him not to worry, promises to be there for him. He sits the girl on his lap and calls out his wife's name and asks her to relieve him of his grief. Thomas believes that there is a princess on Landman who hugs him and whispers gentle words. Their lips merge in a passionate kiss, and the boy wraps his arms around the girl's waist and holds her close. Yuguo wakes up in his bed, opens his eyes to his wife calling out to him. He sits up, sees that he is alone. It was a dream. He doesn't know if she thinks about him and how she is doing. He has a bad back, and his dream was sweet and quite close to reality. Yuguo is getting dressed while sitting on a stool with nine-tailed fox and Lu standing outside his room. Lu asks the fox why she doesn't want to say that she was with Yuguo that night. He can make her his concubine. The girl replies that she is not worthy of him. She is satisfied with life as a servant. A few days later, the advisor gathered the generals and Li Yuguo at his place. He asks them if they know the reason why he brought them together. Dalao has sent a large army to the border, and there may be an attack on Dajinya soon. The enemy is already on the way. He wants to send generals to the battlefield to capture Dalao's flotilla and defend the southern valley. It is also necessary to return the Pingqin Pass, which Dalao had previously conquered in a month. Sun Qinglong says that his family has lived on the sea for many generations, and he wants to take on the defense of the Red Sea. Yan Huan is good at military tactics, so he wants to defend the Southern Valley, which has a difficult terrain. The South Valley is dangerous but easy to defend. The Red Sea is united with the Navy to defend against pirates. The most difficult area of defense is left to Li Yuguo. The Emperor asks Li Yuigu if he will lead a hundred thousand elite troops to take back the scoop, and the minister agrees. The advisor orders the Subgulim to immediately comply with his orders. The adjutant reminds him that the Emperor was unable to retake the pass, which was important for the battle, so he gave it back to Li Yuiguo. The Emperor has a coughing fit, and the aide-de-camp is concerned about the health of the advisor. There are red marks on the handkerchief and the emperor says that Da Lao has chosen a bad time for his visit. The army of the Houtan state, armed with spears, demonstrates its skills. Nalan Men watches his army of thousands from the city walls. She became the queen of the Houtan state, and now she has all the power. Bai Jishan, the chief counselor, reports that the rebels in the capital have been eliminated, the kingdom is calm, and the serious guard has expanded to 200,000. The queen is interested in the news of the Da Jing kingdom, and the advisor replies that generals and troops are often at war in the country, and Dalao is planning an attack. Bai says that this is a chance to get her husband back. We need to send troops to Daijing and form an attack from two sides. The queen is against it. She will not attack for five years. The counselor is disappointed that the queen does not listen to his advice but follows her orders. Nalan Meng is glad that the mess has stopped, but she is unable to help Li Yuguo now. She wishes him well. Bai Zhishan is disappointed that he is the chief advisor of this country, and the princess still does not trust him. He smiles gloatingly and is sure Houtan will be his. An elite army led by Minister Li Yuguo to fulfill the task of advisor. As night falls, Yuguo decides that he needs to make a halt here. The soldiers set up a tent camp, light a fire, and leave guards near it. Li Yuguo and Shifan Tuxing are sitting by the fire. Yuguo says it's a beautiful night and offers to drink wine. Shafan agrees, but good wine should be accompanied by an appetizer, and Li suggests catching some good meat. Yuiguo overlooks the lake shore, and baked fish can be served for dinner. Near the lake, the prince notices something strange that arouses his interest. He sees women's clothes and wonders how he got here. The nine-tailed fox and Gunji took over the affairs of the military hall. It's not nice to peek. He doesn't want to seem rude and unpleasant, but he wants to know who this woman is. A beautiful girl with pink hair is bathing in the lake. It's Princess Sito Chu. The girl comes out of the water, sees that she is being watched, and screams for the pervert to go away, and Lee calms her down. The princess says that the guy scared her to death. He asks what she is doing here. She was sad to stay at home, so she deceived her father that she was going to visit her grandmother and mixed with the soldiers. This girl deceived her father to break free and have fun. She asks him what he just saw, and Yuguo replies that he doesn't see anything at night. Closing his eyes, he recalls her breasts and thinks that they have not yet fully formed. Shifan comes out of the woods. He has hunted a wild boar and asks the boy what he has. Li Yuguo hides the princess in his arms and asks her to be quiet so as not to give herself away. The guy turns his head to his friend and says that he has found a lake, will catch some fish and come back. The danger is over. 
and the girl asks Li Yugu what he has in his pants. The top of it touched her a little bit. He says it's a torch to make fire. The soldiers open wooden boxes with firearms. Shidachin asks what kind of magic weapon it is, and Yuguo has prepared this weapon since they are almost at the pass. He shows his friend how to use this weapon and what its advantages are. It is a gun that fires bullets when the mechanism is activated, so it is a kind of secret weapon. It will be easy to take the pass with this thing, but Li Yuguo only took a thousand guns, which will give the army an advantage. But we will have to rely on strategy. Li Yuguo gives Shifan instructions on how to use weapons. He will train soldiers. Li deals with the fox fairy's house. Shifan knows that there is a lot of fun to be had in that house, but he is busy training his soldiers. Princess Sido Chu heard their conversation and was interested in the fox fairy's house. Yui Guo received information that the spy Daliao was hiding in the house of the fox fairy, so he put on makeup and went there. The house of the fox fairy is a house of debauchery where those who wish can satisfy their sexual desires. Among the many girls, the guy found the one with the mark of a spy. It's Hu Sando. A guy approaches her, hugs her, and asks if she's free, and she replies that she's expensive and asks for ten spiritual stones. Li Yuguo shows her the stones, she agrees, and suggests that they go to a place of privacy. They are walking down the corridor to the boudoir, and Princess Situ Chu is spying on them. The princess thinks the girl is terrible. She is sure that Li Yuguo should belong only to her. She will not allow anyone to take him away. Other girls notice her, ask why she is alone, and invite her to join their group. Li Yuguo and Hu Sando are alone in a room, the girl flirting with her client. From the intimacy of the female body, Yui Guo is overcome with passion and desire. The girl calls him impatient, and he asks if she has heard the news that Da Lao is going to send troops to the Da Jing kingdom. A prostitute has no idea about war, she just wants to have fun. Her legs are wrapped around the guy's waist, she wants to continue, she is torn with impatience. The door to the room opens and Princess Chiu enters, forbidding Yui Guo to engage in indecency. The girl recognizes Li Yuguo from the kingdom of Dajin as her lover. He covers the spy's mouth and warns her not to scream because he will make her sick. He needs all the information about why La Dao sent his troops. Dalin is suffering from years of drought. There is nothing in the fields, so the queen decided to start a war to end the rich from Dalao. The boy is interested in the strength of the troops on the pass. The girl tells him that there are 300,000 soldiers inside. The walls are protected by catapults and archers, and it is defended by Jun Ni, the king of Dalinho. The king is good with the army. If Yui Guo doesn't have more than a million soldiers, he won't win, and the girl is holding a dagger. Li Yu Guo is more agile, and he strikes the girl, which sends her to the other side. The princess puts her hand over her mouth, unwittingly witnessing what she has seen, and asks Yui Guo why he did this. The boy is sorry that the girl saw it, but if he had done so, he would have been killed. Emperor Sito is sitting at the table reading a letter and coughing, and the doctor asks him to relax. The advisor cannot relax, he has a lot to do, he needs to solve the crisis. Yes. The emperor asks where his daughter is, he forgot that he had allowed her to visit her grandmother. It would be nice to visit his grandmother when everything is well, but he hopes that wherever she is, she is safe. Yuguo and the princess leave the house of the forest fairy. They have accomplished their task. The spy stayed in her room on the bed. She needed it now. Husando is not so simple, so it is better to hide this case from the public. We need to find a cure for the girl. She says that her father has been looking for it all over the world, trying to cure her. The guy says to follow him, and they come to the city in search of a hospital. According to legend, General Sun was badly wounded. He swallowed an immortal, which healed his wounds, and then he built a pass here. The girl is familiar with the name Sun, and she asks if the hospital is also called Sun, as it is the only name in this town. They enter the hospital, and the prince asks if Dr. Sun is there. The grandmother who meets them says that he hasn't come yet, and suggests they come back another time. She wipes the sweat from her forehead, and looks at the visitors carefully. He says that the guy is very sick, has heart problems, and that this is not something to joke about. After the battle with the third ship, Yui Guo often feels sick and weak. The girl asks if the boy is okay, and the grandmother replies that the girl is worse. She may live even less. Yu Guo asks her grandmother to help them. She is not very good at medicine, but she knows something and invites her to follow her. They follow their grandmother through the yard, which has many different plants. 
Li Yuguo would never have thought that such a small hospital could grow so many medicinal herbs. The grandmother sits the girl down at the table and asks her to hold out her hand, and the princess replies that she is a grown-up girl. The woman feels the ninth pulse, in which the vascular system is blocked in nine places. If cured of the disease, a person will be able to master divine methods. The boy asks if his grandmother knows how to cure his sister, and the girl doesn't like that the boy called her sister. The boy's heart disease is caused by valve blockage, so there is no need to spend money on medications, but the girl has problems. Yuguo is worried about the princess's health and asks the woman to ask Mr. Sun for advice. Old Grandpa Sun enters the house, the one Yuguo and Chu were waiting for. The man sees that it is the ninth pulse. Obviously, she is a descendant of the Mujun family. The girl's mother was from the Mujun family. The family broke up and her mother became an opera singer and later met her father. The Mujun family was the first family of healers in the Docking Dynasty, and they all died early because of a disease that could be cured by a snow lotus. Yuguo asks the doctor if there are other ways to cure the girl besides the snow lotus. The demon lord lives at the top of Mount Tangshan, and he has a jade spirit of nine yin that will help heal blood vessels. The mountain belongs to Dalao. They need to pass the pass. The beast is very strong and fierce. The Muzin family sent people, but no one returned. Yuguo is to receive the jade spirit of the nine yin. The girl is against it. She will be by his side for the next five years. The old man heard the name of his visitor and asked if he was really Li Yuguo. The guy is a hero of Dadzin. Everyone knows him. He doesn't need to hurry. He will get everything he needs. It's evening. It's getting dark. And the doctor's family offers to have a snack. The table is set for four people with baked chicken, wine, and vegetables on the table. Old Sun introduces his guest to his adopted son, Shui Ching Zhao. Yu Guo suspects that this man may also be a Dalao spy like Husando. He feels that the young man's body has the chi of a dragon, and his last name is Shui. The boy recalls that Shui's surname is the imperial surname of Dalao. The old doctor says that the boy is the younger brother of Queen Dalao. A man stands on the bank of the river. A bucket with a baby and a note floats in the river. A man rescues a child when an old man finds out about Qin Zhao, takes him in and raises him as his son. Yu Guo sees the medallion as a symbol of orthodox status in Dalao, and this guy should be on the throne. Holding a symbol in his hand, the boy says that the throne should be hereditary to him, not to Shua Chao. Qin Zhao asks them to wait here. He wants to take care of his guests. Looking at this young man, Yu Guo remembers that he is as pure-minded as Ye Qiong was. He must capture this pass. Yu Guo and Wu Yu stay in Fulao and ask them to let them know if Dr. Sun finds another way to cure the ninth pulse. Ching Zhao looks at the old man questioningly and Dr. Sun continues to eat. Li Yu Guo is standing on a street corner waiting for someone to approach him. Ching Zhao approaches him and asks how Yu Guo knew he was coming. The minister replies that after all these years, Zhuo should not have missed his chance to cooperate with him. Qin Zhao is supposed to be the king of Dalao but he cannot stand up to his brother because he has no power and authority. He will help Yu Guo conquer the Ping Qin Pass, and Yu Guo will help Qin Zhao regain the throne. The guy assures him that he can disguise himself as King Zhen Man, and when the time comes, his army will be at Yu Guo's disposal. Yu Guo likes the guy's plan, agrees, and they make a deal. Queen Lanman receives visitors in the main palace of the Kingdom of Heoshin. She sits on the throne and says that the agreement with Simmasa is considered signed. From now on, her kingdom will be a vacation spot for pirates, and the mountain seas will be under the protection of pirates. Simmasa notices that the girl is not too happy to become Queen Hyoten. He invites her to have fun with him and his beauties. The queen ends the reception. If he has no more news, he may be dismissed. The pirate takes his two girls and goes to have fun with them. Bai Zhishan asks the queen if she is sure that she wants to make a treaty with these pirates. Landman replies that he is not just an ordinary pirate, he has become the master of the sea. This man is ruthless. He is the supreme military emperor at the age of 26. The pirate's friend tells him that Nalan is very beautiful and asks if he is going to fall in love with her. Landman even uses her husband. He is not sure that she can be trusted. They need a place to rest. The adjutant reports that Landman has entered into a treaty with pirates, and the emperor is hesitant to lead the army south or attack the kingdom. Landman concluded a five-year peace, and Li Yuguo is still in Dajing. No piece of paper can hold back the army, and people are worthless to the authorities. The emperor issues an order to block all news from Haotan from Yuguo who has to recapture the pass. It's a nice sunny day, 
and the action moves to the Pingjin Pass, to a fortified and fenced city. Qing Zhao and Yui Guo report to the city guards that General Zhao is waiting for them for a medical examination. He is the nearest doctor. They were searched and allowed into the city. They have to act quickly. The army is ready to attack at any time. Qing Zhao tells the general that his spleen and stomach are fully recovered after the medication. He asks Li Yuguo to prepare a medicine for the Lord and gives him the recipe. The general's two guards are good at martial arts. They need to be taken out. Uyuyo should be able to do it. Yuguo is in the kitchen preparing the medicine, looking at the clock, and the time is up. There is a fire, screams that the owner is not well, and no water in the room. The general sends his guards to check what's going on. The guards leave the room, and Li Yuguo enters the general's room and gives him medicine. The man drinks the medicine, grimaces, and says it tastes strange. He faints, and Qin Zhao gives Li Yuguo the general's mask he made. The boys take off the general's clothes and mask, but the general is fat, the boy is thin. Yu Guo is not sure that the people around him will take him for a general. Qing Zhao scratches the back of his head. He gives Yu Guo a tiger amulet that belongs to the general to confirm his authority. The guards return and see the imposter, and they realize that it was a plan to lure them out of the room. Yu Guo has two revolvers and points them at the guards. The girls cover themselves with red spots from the shots. Their swords are powerless against the new weapon. Yuguo's men have already set up an ambush at the door, so we have to go according to plan. Yuguo comes out to the soldiers wearing a general's mask and clothes, announces that the reinforcements sent by the queen have arrived, and orders them to open the gates immediately. The liaison officer passes on the general's order to open the gates to the pass guards. An order is given to open the main gate along the perimeter of the wall, and Li Yuguo's soldiers descend from the walls unnoticed. They use guns, bullets fly in the air, destroying the wall, and stones fall to the ground. The king's army was not expecting the attack, and they could not give a worthy rebuff to the enemies. Another part of the army enters the city through the open gate. All the warriors armed with rifles and pistols are shouting that they will get their land back. They are eager to deal with the barbarians of Dalao, and there is shooting and shouting everywhere. The soldiers of the Yuguo army occupy the city walls and plant their flags on them as a sign of victory. Shifan Tongsen is excited about how easy it is to use the new weapon, and in half a day they have already passed Pingqin Pass. We need to find out why there are fewer soldiers in the city than in the intelligence. There are obviously many soldiers in other places. Shifang Tuxing and Li Yu Guo interrogate General Zhao about the location of the rest of his army. The southern fortress is attacked with fire arrows and a large army. The general is informed that the king of Zhengxi and the king of Zhengdong attacked at the same time, and without help the fortress will not stand for a month. Yan Huang cannot ask for help, otherwise the emperor will be disappointed in him. He shouts that the commander has received an order and he wants it fulfilled at all costs. It's hot in the Red Sea, there are fire arrows flying, and there are many shipwrecks. King Zheng Bei sent 300 warships, and the artillery was exhausted. Song Qinglong orders the formation of the barrier, which can be used only once for seven days. The general is pleased that Li Yugu could be in a worse situation, but he is still holding on. It is not over. Sito Wushu receives a letter with news, and the aide asks what the letter is about. The Red Sea, the Southern Fortress, and the Pass distracted the troops. The four great lords of Dalao sent elite troops to the city of Fengming. Fengming is located in the rear of Daikon. If it is captured, Daikon will disappear. Li Yuguo wants to use Dalao to attack Huang Long. The aide believes that if the letter is true, it is a good opportunity. Only a miracle can allow Yui Guo to continue to move forward, which will save Daikon. The action is transferred to the city of Tanshan, which is located high in the mountains. A ferocious monster lives on this mountain, and Princess Wu Yu does not want Yu Yu to be in danger. The guy wants to save the girl's life and asks her why she doesn't believe him. He strokes the princess's head and reassures her that everything will be fine so she doesn't have to worry. Li Yu Guo and Shifang Tuxing go to the mountain. Qing Zhao stays to take care of Wu Yu. It is raining heavily, and the friends go out to a clearing where a big monster is sleeping. The monster has a golden stone in its forehead, which is what they came to the mountain for. There are hairs running around the monster, and it doesn't look very fierce. Suddenly, the hairs near the monster on the lawn begin to mate. The monster wakes up from their actions and instantly turns from cute to fierce. This sudden change in mood surprises the boys and they run away. The monster hits the hairs with his fist, leaving no trace of them, and a cleft is formed. The guys are leaving. 
the change of character happened in less than a second. It will be difficult to deal with this monster. Li Yuguo wonders why the monster reacted so irritated to the hare's actions. He comes up with an idea of how to get close to the monster and stay safe. A hairy creature with the same hair as the monster appears in front of him. Li Yuguo's puppet asks a scary monster for permission to give him a gift. The monster sees the gift and is immediately filled with rage, throwing himself at the puppet. The puppet holds the monkey gift and runs away from it. The monster runs and hits the rock head on at high speed. A crystal falls out of his head, which is supposed to cure Uyuyo of her illness. Chavisco chases the puppet, and Shifan asks him to get rid of it as soon as possible, otherwise he will go blind. Yuguo asks the direction of Liao Jing and Shi Wang says northwest. The monster continues to run after the puppet and the toy that the puppet is holding. The guys are sending a puppet with a monster in the direction of Dalao, which will be a gift for them. Princess Wu Yu sits on a rock and looks toward the mountain, worried about why Yu Yu hasn't returned yet. Ching Zhao is watching her, and he notes that the girl is very beautiful and wants her to be his. He is the future Emperor Dalao and is convinced that no girl can resist him, and now Yui Guo has to help him. The boy is worried about whether Yui Guo will keep his promise and he has to make him work hard. Holding a bottle of poison in his hands, he thinks that Wu Yu is Yu Yu's younger sister, whom he loves very much. If she becomes Qin Zhao's wife, he will become Yu Yu's son-in-law, and he will help him. The boy calms the girl down, says that her brother is fine, and offers her a snack, but the girl refuses. Then he suggests they go for a walk, and maybe they'll meet Li's brother on the way. A couple is going for a walk, and they pass through a meadow with beautiful flowers. The guy discreetly plucks a flower and pours some liquid inside. He wants the girl to smell the scent of this flower, and she spins around. The girl accidentally touches the boy, and the flower ends up near his nose. Uyuyo apologizes she was spinning around and didn't mean to push him. The boy coughs, tears come out of his eyes, he turns red, and the girl asks if he is okay. Chia Zhao grabs the princess by the shoulders. She is hurt and frightened by his actions. He says that they are under the influence of poison and cannot control each other. If she does not resist, she will not be hurt. He will become King Dalao and she will be his queen. The princess recalls how Li Yuguo taught her to defend herself, to hit an important point of the enemy. The girl squeezes her eyes shut and hits the boy between the legs with all her might. He does not expect such a strong blow to the groin. An incredible pain grips his body. The boy screams in pain and accuses the girl of daring to hit him. A girl runs away from a rapist. Her foot slips on a rock and she falls down. Yu Yo and Shifan Tuxing return from the mountain. Li calls out to Yu Yo. He is already back. The guard reports to General Li that Miss U Yu Yo is missing. She was supposed to be waiting for him in the camp. Oranet says she went with the doctor, but he returned alone. The doctor's genitals are damaged. He lies on the bed and regains consciousness. Li Yu Guo asks what happened. And Ching Zhao says that while they were walking, soldiers attacked them and took the girl away. The general notices a container of medicine in the guy's pocket, which could be poison. He pulls out a jar and shouts that the boy is deceiving him. He has drugged the girl. Yu Guo demands that Ching Zhao immediately answer where the girl is now. The boy says that the girl was running away, stumbled, and fell off a cliff. The princess wakes up. She is lying in bed in a place unknown to her. The girl sits down, looks around, tries to guess where she is. A guy comes into her room, brings her food, and asks if she's awake. She is frightened by a stranger who comes to her and asks who he is. The girl asks where she is, and the boy says that she wasn't afraid to fight the monster, but he was afraid of her. The princess remembers a monster with red eyes and sharp teeth that she fell off a cliff on. The monster was running after the puppets as it was flying down. She recalled how the monster jumped from rock to rock, chasing its prey. Then she could not hold on to the monster's back and fell into the lake. A guy with a naked torso was sitting on the surface of the water and meditating. He saw a girl who had fallen into the water out of nowhere and distracted him. The princess mentioned a naked pervert, and the guy explains that he was meditating, and when he heard a scream, he went to the surface to see what happened. The girl apologizes, but asked to know where they are now and who her rescuer is. He says they are now in Tailani, in the city of Yun Zhong. His name is Mu Wuji. She can call him her second brother if she likes it better. Yuguo goes in search of the princess. He finds traces of a monster. Perhaps it ate Wu Yu. If this were the case, then there would be a trace. Obviously, someone rescued the princess. He sees a princess's sash on a tree and decides to look for puppets and a monster near the city of Yun Zhong. Emperor Sido Wushu is sitting in an armchair, and an aide informs him that his daughter did not visit her grandmother but went to the Pingqin Pass. 
The Lord is furious that his daughter has deceived him and orders her to be caught immediately, but the adjutant says that this may not be the case. The emperor does not understand what the aid means and demands an explanation. He says he has new information that Miss Uyuyo has disappeared completely. The emperor loses control of himself. He is angry and cannot believe that his daughter could have disappeared. He has a coughing fit. He needs to take care of his health. He is the backbone of the whole of Daikon. Sita Wushu orders him to start looking for his daughter immediately. Even at the end of the world, he must find her. If the princess runs away with Li Yuguo and something happens to her, he will skin him. The emperor opens the treasury door and takes out the report box. He asks to be given Huiguang powder. He is going to the gate of the Golden Dragon, even though it may shorten his life. The emperor is determined. He has been in this body for too long. Situ Wushu opens the box and says that she has to do this for Dai King and for her daughter. The city of Yunzhong is located in Da Lao State, in a valley surrounded by picturesque mountains. Yu Guo continues to search for Wu Yu, who thinks that if the girl fell off a cliff, the pharmacy might know about it. He finds the nearest pharmacy and goes inside, hoping to find out something. The pharmacist replies that he does not recall a 15-year-old girl among his customers until recently. The guy asks to find him at the Tong Fu Hotel in case the pharmacist has such information. When he went outside, he accidentally stood in the way of an obese woman and her bodyguard chased him away. The girl likes this handsome man and invites him home, but the guy refuses. She is angry with her guards for intimidating such a nice guy. Yu Guo hears her compliments about him and an offer to become her husband, but he refuses. He has a lot to do. The girl's name is Mu Shiking, and she is the daughter of Mu Tanhao, the ruler of the state of Tanlan. She once again invites him to be a guest in her home, hoping that he will accept. Yu Guo, that there are Tanglian members all over the world, maybe she can help him find Yu Guo. The guy explains that he came to the city in search of his sister, and he won't find this information in a small pharmacy. Mu Shiking will help him find the girl if he agrees to drink with her. The woman brings him to the Tingfeng Pavilion, which looks very beautiful and pompous. The pavilion is an intelligence center of the Tiananmen State, and it has a rather unusual appearance. The guy is surprised that the reconnaissance post is located in the very center of the city. Mu Shiking ordered her people to look for any news about the boy's sister. She was told that the pavilion could not find information about Mr. Li's sister, and the woman became angry. Yu Guo asks the girl to suppress her aggression, he cannot stay here for long and has to say goodbye. Since the intelligence pavilion failed to get any news about Yuha, the guy moves on. Mushir King wants to hold him close, takes his hand and tells him not to worry. He can join Tanlin and she can help him find his sister. The boy has already decided to move on. The girl stands on the balcony and watches Yui Gu Yu move away from her house. She orders her subordinates to find information about the guy who dared to reject her. Miss Mu is told that the man is a member of the Dakin Military Academy. Yu Guo continues to ask everyone about Wu Yu, but the shopkeeper says he has never seen her. The cafe owner knows nothing about the girl and kicks the guy out if he doesn't order anything. He will be able to help with the search if Yui Guo gives him money. The guy is furious. He has checked the whole city, but there is no news about Uyuyo. He can feel in the back of his head that he is being watched and that someone wants to do him harm. Yu Guo manages to jump back and block the selu that is aimed at him. He sees Mu Shiking accompanied by bodyguards and she says that he lied to her. The woman finds out who he really is, and the guy asks her what she's doing here. Mu didn't expect him to be the head of the Duncan Military Academy. She was convinced he was a spy. If the boy was a spy, he would have accepted her invitation to stay at the Tingfeng Pavilion. He would leave the city as soon as he found his sister. Mu does not believe him. Even Tanlin could not find any information about his sister. She wants to detain and punish the boy, and her guards catch up with Yuiguo. This senseless persecution made him angry, and he calls his demon for help. The guy is not guilty of manifesting his demonic nature. He is ready to destroy everyone. Mu King orders his soldiers to destroy Yui Guo, and they rush to fulfill it. The tentacles of the thousand-armed man entangle them, preventing them from approaching the boy, and Yu Guo buys a machine gun. His enemies do not plan to let him go. He will destroy them with the latest firearms. There are a lot of warriors approaching the boy from different directions to fulfill the order of their mistress. Thousand Hand skillfully binds their bodies, blocking any possibility of movement. Li Yuguo is figuring out how his new lethal weapon works. He fires the first shot, the enemies scatter, and a lot of smoke and fire rise. His enemies, even with a Wu Huan level, will have a hard time dealing with modern firearms. Mu Shir King says that Yui Guo is very capable because he could stand up to two martial artists. 
She uses flying knives against the guy, which are one of the ten hidden weapons. Yuguo is skilled with swords, but Mu is convinced that his end is near. The host stretches out his hand for the swords, and one of them obediently comes to him. As long as Yuguo is still alive, this trophy knife now belongs to him. The woman wants to know what technique Yuguo uses to calm himself down to resist the secret weapon. The guy doesn't want to cause her any problems, but he's willing to share his technique. He attacks her, and she is forced to defend herself against him with her sword. The subordinates are ordered to take advantage of this chance to destroy the guy. The soldiers sit on the ground, exhausted from the battle, and gather their strength for a new attack. Energy circles form around them, preventing them from approaching Yuiguo. He can't fight now. He has to find the missing princess first. Yuguo holds a grenade in his hands and is ready to use it against his enemies. He pulls off the fuse and throws a grenade into the crowd, and the soldiers dodge the blast wave. After the explosion, the smoke and fire dissipate, and the enemies see that the guy has escaped using the smoke screen. Yuguo is resting after the fight when a knife flies up to him and reminds him that the boy promised to save him. Lee can release his soul from the knife, which is not exactly salvation, but it is enough. Flying knives have souls, so they can follow orders, and the guy promised to save them. The soul of this knife has been imprisoned for a thousand years, and its greatest reward now is freedom. Someone approaches the guy from behind, and he turns his head to ask who it is. The great man senses an unusual vibe from Lee and asks permission to show him all his swords. The man invites him to go to his forge where he will learn everything. Lee realizes that this man has no basis for improvement. His power is stronger than other people's, but he does not threaten Lee. In the forge, the man shows him his swords and the boy wonders what will happen next. The blacksmith chose the right person because he has the sword of the sun and moon. Yuiguo is surprised to learn that the cavalier knows about the existence of the sun and moon machetes. The man shows the hammer to Moonmin, and the boy recognizes the blacksmith from his novel, and he did not expect this meeting. The blacksmith asks the boy if he would like to add a celestial sword to his collection of swords. He wants to make two knives that have similar characteristics and together will become a magical weapon. The knife doesn't want to be a weapon anymore, the guy promised to save it and Yuiguo keeps his word. If the boy frees the soul from the weapon, the weapon will be downgraded and the soul will die. Yuguo has his own way of protecting his soul, and for this he needs an empty house. The blacksmith sees the boy's confidence, says that there are ways to do this, and invites him to come along. Li Yuguo finds himself alone with a knife and begins the ritual of liberating his soul with the knife. It takes a lot of his energy, but he has to fulfill his promise. The girl's soul is released from the knife and rejoices in its liberation. Yu Guo has tears in his eyes, and he too is happy that he has succeeded so well. The girl is incredibly grateful for her release and flies around the guy. The blacksmith is standing behind the door. The guy has closed the door tightly behind him. Nothing is heard or seen. Yu Guo quickly opens the door, and the blacksmith excuses himself by saying that he was there just in case. Lee gives the blacksmith the flying knife and orders him to go to the forge, as he has other things to do. The man takes the knife and goes to the forge with it to carry out his plan. Two swords in the forge are waiting to be delivered to the blacksmith. The man is enjoying his work, and soon he will create the sword he has been dreaming of. A pleasant female voice comes from behind the closed door, saying that the girl is pleased. Kaval envies the guy because it's good to be young, no matter how you use your kidneys. The girl was captured in a knife. She will be able to survive again in such a realistic puppet. She circles around the guy. He asks her to slow down. He's dizzy. The girl thanks for the rescue. Her name is Mu Jun Ying Shui, and she is a little excited now. Mu Shi King has not accepted the boy's escape, and she hopes that she will soon be able to catch him. She sees Mu Uji returning to his home and bringing food to someone. The woman spies on him to see what is going on in his house. She sees a guy feeding a beautiful girl in his house. She is divorced and kicks the door to her boyfriend's house with all her might. Mu King skins Mu Wuji for secretly keeping a girl with him. The guy is surprised by Mu King's unexpected appearance in his house. The woman calls her guards and orders them to throw the girl into a dungeon. The men grab the distraught girl under their arms, and she asks the boy to protect her. The guy says she should talk to him first. He will explain everything. The woman will come back to talk to him later. She wants to talk to the girl first. The guy is confused. Mu King is terrible. We need to make sure that Wu Yu avoids this meeting. The blacksmith made the sword from the alloys of a cold, heavenly water knife and a flying knife. Yu Yu called it a cold, heavenly snow knife. The guy takes out a wad of money and gives it to the blacksmith, which makes the man angry. 
Yugu wants to thank the man for creating the magic weapon. The blacksmith thinks that this is a way of disrespecting him, but the man misunderstood. They stand opposite each other and find out who is right and who is wrong. The blacksmith gives the boy a letter. He reads it carefully, and the boy is confused by the information he receives. In the dungeon, Mu Shi King asks Wu Yu what her relationship with her subordinate is, and if she doesn't tell the truth, the woman will disfigure her face. The woman's face twists with hatred. She does not believe that Uji is her older brother. She continues to interrogate the girl tied to the pole and does not see anyone entering. The woman turns her head to ask who came and sees Li Yuigu and Mu Zhong Ying Shui. Holding his new sword, Yuiguo orders the woman to let the girl go immediately. Mu puts a knife to the girl's throat and says that she will destroy her if anyone takes a step forward. Li Yuguo repeats his request, saying that it is better for the woman to let go. Mu holds a knife at the girl's neck. She is sure that she is in control of the situation, and the boy can do nothing. Yuguo's sword cuts the rope that bound the girl, and the thousand-armed man picks her up and carries her to Li. The girl hugs her brother and is very happy that she is finally with him. He apologizes to her for being a victim of injustice. Old Mu Shiking does not intend to let them go so easily, she will fight. Her warriors warn Li that he is too proud. He will experience the full power of Tanlin's spell. Yugu asks Mu Jin Yingshui to run away and protect Wu Yu. The girl asks the boy to stay safe. All the soldiers who were with Mu Shiking are against the boy. He hopes that the magic sword will help him to fight them all off. The sword of cold heavenly snow has to pass its first test. A forbidden cage of yin and yang forms around Yuiguo, and the boy is trapped. With the help of a new sword, the boy freezes the spells that are directed against him. The yin and yang cage turns into an ice cage, and he has to break all the ice. Using a knife, he gradually breaks up the ice blocks, clearing a path for himself. The sword successfully copes with ice. It easily shatters from blows. Suddenly, the sword hits an obstacle and stops obeying its owner. Two people with their eyes closed held up two fingers and cast a spell on him. Yuiguo's body disobeys him and his arms and legs become immobile. Mu Shi King says that this is the formation of the forbidden yin and yang cage. No one has been able to break it, and soon he will become a weapon spirit. A third brother came to the city of the Golden Dragon Gate to see his older brother. Sito Wushu and the head of the Golden Dragon Gate have not seen each other for many years, and the emperor hopes that his brother will help him. A man comes out to the emperor and his doctor and asks them to stop screaming. He is the head of the Golden Dragon Gate, old and gray-haired, but still alive. The men have not seen each other for a long time, so the older brother does not recognize his third brother. The elder brother asks why the third brother came to him. He is responsible for his town. After the battle with Li Guangyi, the third brother became a living dead man. He was seriously wounded and lost all his strength. The older brother sympathizes, bows his head, and asks why his brother came to him. The third brother gives his older brother a box and asks him if he remembers what it is. Once they were in a dungeon, hungry and about to die, their third brother went somewhere. They could hear someone being chased in the street, and the criminal was running away. Then they heard people shouting that they should catch the thief who stole the bread. Their third brother appeared. His pants were torn and his legs were torn. His face was bruised, but he brought them food. He had bread in his hands. If the older brother hadn't stolen that bread, they would have starved to death. The third brother kneels down in front of his older brother. He has something important to ask. His only daughter is missing. She disappeared in Dajin, and he hopes that his brother will help him find her. The elder brother asks the third brother to get up. He promises to send someone to find the girl. The emperor says that his daughter disappeared because of Yui Guo, and he has no intention of pardoning him. The man runs away with the girl in his arms, and many guards catch up with them. An unidentified guy in a blue cloak, whose face is hidden in the cloak, flies toward them. He engages in battle with the girl's pursuers and destroys them one by one. The man hides behind the girl and asks the boy who he is. The guy takes off his hood, and Uyuyo recognizes him as Mu Wuji, who saved her. Mu is not in the Tanglin Pavilion. Mu wants to know what he is doing here. She asks how he can be Uyuyo if his last name is Mu. The guy says he is Uyuyo's older brother, but he doesn't know who Muzun is. The princess says that this is Sister Ying Shui. She is good because she saved her. Wuyu asks Mu Wuji to rescue her brother Yuyo, who is imprisoned in a dungeon and the boy cannot save him. The girl is determined. She will protect her brother. She will not allow him to be in danger. Ying Shui takes the girl's hand and asks her to stop and stay. She will save Yuguo. 
Hundreds of years ago, the girl's soul was imprisoned in a sword in the forbidden circle of yin and yang. It's Mizuna's problem, and she has to solve it herself, because it's going to happen. Li Yuguo sits motionless for half an hour. He does not resist, and Mu is convinced that he is up to something. To break this barrier, the boy must accumulate the spiritual power of the Curse of Golden Thunder. A powerful explosion occurs in the depths of the dungeon, and the guards scream for help. Mu Yingxie emerges from the explosion. The guards are confused, and Mu shouts at her to destroy the girl. Yugu sees Ying Shui and asks her why she has returned and where Wu Yu is now. The girl tells him not to worry, Princess Chiu is fine. Mu Ying Shui was caught in this barrier, and she couldn't break it alone, so she helped the boy. While her soul was in the flying knife, she listened attentively to the elders. A formation can only be destroyed by simultaneous forces from the outside and the inside at one point. The spellcaster saw that the girl was the spirit of the flying sword in Su, calling for resistance. Li Yuguo concentrates on his inner spiritual energy. His energy has reached its peak, and he tells the girl that he is ready to start. The girl applies her energy from the outside to destroy the formation. Li Yuguo is putting in the energy from within. He has to come out of here. They apply force at one point, and this action is supposed to break up the formation and free Yuguo. There is a powerful explosion. The formation collapses, and Li Yuguo is released. The explosion scatters everyone who was in the dungeon, and they lie motionless on the ground. Yugu is holding Mujin in her arms. She is very tired and can rest. Yugu will continue alone. An angry Mushitsin appears in front of him and shouts that she will send him to the next world. Yuguo is able to, so he summons his thousand-armed demon to help him. Li assures that Tanglin will soon join Mushir King in hell. A fierce monster appears in the city and chases the puppet. Mu wonders how the monster could come to Yun Zhong, and the girl says that it is her brother's puppet and he will be saved. Uji wonders how the puppet could have brought this monster here. The girl says that all of her brother's puppets are wonderful. They are on the level of Wu Zun. Mu Wuji sees Li Yuguo on the roof of the house, and he shows the girl that her brother has escaped from the dungeon. Wu Yu hugs Yu Yo happily and cries. He strokes her head and calms her down. Yugu asks Mu if the master still knows that he is alive, and the boy replies that he will find out soon. Mu thanks Yu Guo for helping him win Dai Kong and asks him to help him conquer Tanlin. Yu Guo hugs him and says that since it's all for Dai Kong, he will help him. But first he will destroy Tanlin and find out what Mu's secret plan is. Behind Mount Tanglin, you can feel the excitement of the aura. It looks like a powerful earthquake. The head of Tanlin, a red hairy creature with lightning flying around it, appears from the ground. The people of Tanlin are terrified by the appearance of this huge, fierce monster in their city. It grabs people and scatters them, and the monster destroys all those who get in its way. The head of Tanlin asks the naughty monster how it dared to destroy his Tanlin. The ruler wants to move the threat away from the city and calls the monster to follow him. Mu Uji is watching the conversation between the monster and the Tanlin chairman. Together with Li Yuguo, he watches the master tame the evil beast. The monster has sharp claws and it wounds the old head with them. The head builds a protective formation around himself hoping that it will protect him from the monster. The monster breaks the strong chains and breaks the Tanlin formation. The mayor sees that nothing can help him protect the city from the monster. The old head of Guan Yuan cannot resist the monster, and it is Mu Wuji's turn to enter the fray. The boy asks Yu Guo to take care of the puppet, and Li informs him that the puppet is already there. The monster makes a decisive blow, which finally destroys the foundation and injures the owner. Mu wants to help the master, who is lying on the ground with red spots showing through his clothes. The disobedient animal must die. Uji swings his sword, and the monster opens its mouth. Suddenly, the fierce monster feels the fluctuation of power, turns its head to where it is happening. A puppet stands on the roof of a house. A monster breathes fire and runs after the puppet. The wounded Guan Yuan is lying on the ground, calling out to Wuji, and his servants are also running to him. The head says to ask Uji to protect the city when the monster returns, and the boy swears to serve the city until his last breath. Guan Yuan hands him a sign of the power of the city of Tailan. Now it belongs to him. He has to take care of it. The head takes a last breath and leaves. The boy hugs him and cries over his body. He doesn't believe that after so many years of humiliation, Tanglian is becoming his. The army is in its tent camp. A fire is burning, and the soldiers are waiting for their general. Yuguo and Princess Uyuyo land on the lawn near the tent city. Shifan Tuxing is happy to see them back and that Miss Wuyu is safe and sound. 
The girl's abuser cannot look at the general in Uyuyo. He does not know how to behave with him anymore. He falls to his knees and apologizes for everything that happened. And Lee says that now is not the time to talk about it. Li Yuguo gives an immediate order to prepare the army and horses for evacuation. They have been in Yunzhong for too long and the four princes know of their whereabouts. Intelligence reports that the army attacked them ten miles from the camp and they need to flee. Li Yuguo orders people to split up and evacuate in small groups. The army was on the road for three days and three nights, and the soldiers were tired. They wanted to rest. The commander says it's not time yet. Dalao's army can attack at any time. Arrows are flying in the air. The enemy begins to attack. The army is tired from the transition and is not ready to take on the battle. The prince of Dajin, King Pingdong, orders his soldiers to spare no one. There are many dead people on the battlefield. Their bodies are damaged, and crows are circling the battlefield. The king of Pingbei, Prince Dazan, receives news from a pigeon that the eastern prince has not met Li Yugu either. Soldiers of the two armies meet on the battlefield armed with swords and arrows. The king of Pingxi, Prince Dajin, crosses swords with Shifan Tuxing. The king says that it is good that he was Shifan's opponent. He attacks the man, his strength exceeds Shifan's, and he injures him. Shifan Tusin is lying on the ground. He is wounded in the chest and does not want to die today. King Pinsi rejoices in his opponent's helplessness, and he will soon go to the afterlife. Changes are taking place on the battlefield, and the general is fighting on a par with his soldiers. An unexpected reinforcement arrives to help Shifan Tusin's soldiers. Lu's aide asks for permission to bring his army to support them. He wants to cut off the enemy's head together with Shifan Tusin. It is difficult to resist two armies at once, but the king tries to hold his ground. The forces on the battlefield are unequal, and the king orders his troops to retreat. Shifan does not catch up with the enemy because of the risk of being ambushed. Lu's assistant finds out that Yui Guo and Wu Yu have taken a different route. They pass through a village and see a dead horse lying in the street. Yuguo notices that this beautiful village is suddenly so empty. The princess draws his attention to the fact that one of the soldiers suddenly became ill. It seems that the patient has the plague, and the village is not doing well. They need to leave the area immediately to save their lives. Lumen described this plague in a book. The consequences could be terrible. They should leave this village immediately. Yuiguan buys medical masks and orders them to be distributed to all soldiers immediately. He helps Uyuyo put a mask on the girl and tells her that they need to leave immediately. Li Yuguo ordered to set up a hospital for plague patients. The disease is spreading rapidly among the soldiers and protective masks do not help. About 8,000 people are sick and there are no medicines that can stop the epidemic. Intelligence reports that things are bad King Pinan is leading an army and has attacked them. The disease is very prolonged. There are a lot of sick people among the soldiers. Qing Zhao suggests that Yui Guo decide what to do next. He will stay with the sick. This will be his atonement. The guy is aware of the possible consequences of his decision to stay in the field hospital. Shui Qing Zhao was unable to avoid the epidemic, and contact with the sick led to his illness. It cannot accompany the army, but it can be useful in a military hospital. Disease does not choose its victims, and Wu Yu is upset that Qing is ill. The guy apologizes to Yui Guo. He deserves the plague and asks all the healthy people to move on immediately. Several generals ask to stay. There is no escape from the plague, and they can take a few of Dalao's men with them. Yu Guo is angry to accept their sacrifice, but tactically it is the right thing to do, and he agrees. Li gives one of the generals his token, which his father left him, and it may come in handy. Li Yuguo and Wu Yu and some of the healthy soldiers immediately leave the camp. In the novel, six soldiers are just cannon fodder. In reality, things are different. He had to provide the army with a chance to escape the plague. Shui Ching Zhao hopes that Yui Guo will be able to take everything that belongs to Shui. Wu Yu Yu is upset, but Li explains to the princess that people are imperfect and sometimes you have to make certain deals. A full-fledged army of enemies is approaching the field hospital of Li's army. King Pinyan is convinced that the remnants of the enemy army will not be able to stop him. But Shui Ching Zhao has a different plan. He and his soldiers will not let the enemies go any further. The two armies are on the battlefield hoping for a slow victory. Soldiers suffering from the plague kept fighting despite their illness and exhaustion. Ching Zhao finds himself alone with the king of Pinan, and he rushes at him with a sword. The guy is not a good warrior, and the opponent manages to quickly knock the sword out of his hands. 
Qing Zhao is weakened by the disease, and fluid from his body falls on the enemy's face. Wiping his face, Pinyan tells the boy that he is unlucky. In fact, the king is also sick. In the Red Sea, we manage to stabilize the situation and repel the enemy army. Ching Long's son is sure that the master will look at him differently now. He dictates a report to General Sun that army soldiers have rushed to the fortress wearing Dakin's clothes. General Lee's army is approaching the walled fortress. The commander informs General Song that they are General Lee's subordinates and asks to be allowed into the fortress. Song Ching Long sees the army of his rival Li Yuguo in front of him. This is his chance. He thinks the soldiers are spies and orders them to be killed immediately. Shouts are coming from the palace of Sito Wushu. The emperor is arguing with someone. Opposite him are General Song Ching Long and Yang Huan. Although they are two idiots, they can be rewarded. Li Yuguo destroyed Dalao and thus forced them to withdraw. Otherwise, the general's fortresses would have been captured. Generals should declare a confidential war and punish an army of 10,000 soldiers. Song Qinglong reminds us that Li Yuguo put Wu Yu's life in danger and deserves to die. The emperor expels the generals from the palace and they go out into the street, embarrassed and confused. The master continues to defend Li, saying that if he returns to the city alive, there will be no place for generals. Sun Qinglong is thinking about further actions. They have to develop a plan. The best way out now would be to bury the emperor prematurely. Li Yuguo studies a map of the area. Avoiding pursuit, his army has traveled a long way and ended up in Dalao. This long march tired and exhausted his soldiers. They have to start with the grain storage facility, which is located next to Dalao. The scouts report to the general that Dalao's army with prisoners has been detected ahead. The prisoner is in a wooden cage he asks to be released. Yui Guo's army attacks the enemies and fires at them with firearms. Master Li approaches the cage with the prisoner and recognizes Peng Yunhai. The prisoner is happy to be recognized and rejoices in his release. This man has a low level and supernatural strength, and after being framed, he was forced to become a robber. The guy says he is Li Yuguo, the head of the Dajin Military Academy. The man doesn't care who saves him. He promises to give Yui Guo several wives. Yu Guo will open the cell if the man tells him where the army's provisions are. The question turns out to be easy. The provisions are in Lanchen and guarded by three dogs. Yu Guo decides to go visit the three great princes today. Peng Yunhai becomes Yu Guo's subordinate, observes military laws, and obeys his orders. The man agrees to all the conditions. He is happy and grateful for the rescue. You can see three princes in the scope of a sniper rifle, but you can only kill one in one attack. Yu Guo hopes that Peng Yunhai will not let him down and will live up to his expectations. The three princes discuss the current state of affairs, and they have to guard the granary. The guard reports that the patient is throwing himself at the city gate and they should check everything. Men from the protective walls see a man holding something incomprehensible. Peng Yunhai keeps a grenade launcher ready to destroy the walls. He fires several shots, three loud explosions are heard, and the walls burn. Yu Guo watches Peng Yunhai's actions. He is a real warrior. The general gives the order to launch an assault, and the troops under his command run to attack. The two armies converge on the battlefield, and Li Yuguo's army successfully attacks the enemy. Peng Yunhua likes his new weapon and proposes to destroy Dalao's food outlets. Yuguo sees that he is not stupid. He knew about the plan to destroy the food warehouses. The rider is watching the food burn, and this time Yuguo will not be able to escape him. Li gives the order to leave the city immediately, as Dalao's army is approaching. Ao Yu shows Yu Yuo the enemy army, which is very close. Their flags are visible. King Pingdong orders his troops to destroy Li Yuigu for destroying food. The minister gives a group of soldiers a task to cover the withdrawal of the main army, and they begin to fulfill it. The soldiers are armed with firearms and ready to defend the retreat. Their opponents die of gunshot wounds. They do not have such weapons. The king turns to magic weapons for help, surprised that such a bold man has captured the pass. He is not summoning his essence, the fire dragon. He is not like the king of Jingnan. The fire dragon opens its mouth and the whole area is engulfed in flames. Yuguo orders his troops to immediately retreat to a safe distance. He remains on the battlefield with King Pindong and his dragon. Their battle continues in the moonlight, the prince armed with his new magic sword. He decides to attack the king first and gain an advantage. The boy finds himself in the epicenter of a big explosion caused by the king. The explosion killed many soldiers who were in the vicinity. King Pindon says it's just a skill, there's no magic involved. This maneuver was unexpected for her Lee. The king has an average level of martial arts. The rivals once again meet in battle, the ground burning under their feet. 
In the battle against each other, rivals use two great elements, fire and ice. Yu Guo loses his balance and crouches down, and Wu Yu is worried about him. Pindan looks his enemy in the eye and says that he will go to another world today. Suddenly, a powerful stream of energy passes through King Pingdong. He turns his head to see the person who struck him unexpectedly. Jin Yulong and his army came to Li Yu Guo's aid. The guy was saved thanks to timely intervention, and he thanks Yu Long. He simply repays the debt and says that he will make sure that Yu Guo leaves the city safely. Yu Guo takes 3,000 soldiers with him, while the rest of the soldiers and Wu Yu are left behind. Princess Yu Yo does not want to stay, and the boy is forced to knock her unconscious with a blow. He cannot allow her to be in danger and there is no other way out. A busy city street, a fair with shopping stalls, a baker selling fresh crab buns. He packs the lady's buns in a bag and gives them to her, while a homeless man watches. A scruffy man approaches the pastries and reaches out to take a bun. A seller drives away a smelly beggar so that he doesn't interfere with his business. A woman's hand holds out crab buns to the beggar. The woman bought them for him. The girl recognizes Ye Chiang in the beggar, and he recognizes his Yuji. The couple hugs and the girl says that she has been looking for him for a long time and has finally found him. In the room, Uyuyo is being capricious. She doesn't want to eat and doesn't listen to her father. The girl accuses him of sending Li to Dalao, and the emperor assures her that the boy is brave. Li risked his life to find the jade spirit of the nine yin yangs. She wants him to be safe. The emperor's elder brother will help him. The father says he will fulfill this promise and asks his daughter to eat. The aide asks if the emperor is really planning to invite the head of the jin. Li Yuguo is on his way to Lao Jin. His fate depends on him, and the emperor wants to know what his generals are doing. Yang Xuan and Song Qing Long were contacting people and horses. They were up to something. The emperor is furious and he can no longer control himself. He instructs the aide to stay out of it and see what they can do. It's night in the city of the Heavenly Sword, and a human silhouette can be seen above the rooftops. Yuguo brought a monster to the city that destroyed everything, and he is also to blame for the destruction. The guy finds a ruined house with a big hole in the roof, and a light is on in the house. He confidently enters the yard and approaches the door of the house. Mu Wuji is waiting for him at the house, and he is happy that Yuguo has come. Yuguo tells the guy that they haven't seen each other for a long time. He knew that Mu would come. He is the son of the chief counselor and wants to be the ruler of the Heavenly Sword City. Mu warns Yu Guo that now is not the time to go to Lao Jing. The palace is guarded by Li Liao Ying. Yu Guo could die. At the beginning of the novel, Lian committed suicide to protect his daughter. The plot changes. Mu knows how to deal with Lian. Mu wants to be King de Lao, so he will share with Li Yu Guo what he knows. Li Jumen, the adopted daughter of Li Liao Ying, accompanies the chained beast that destroyed the city. She did not execute the monster on the spot because she wanted to send it to be executed in public. The monster is extremely strong and it breaks the chains that bound its body. The girl hears strange noises coming from the cage and asks what happened. The monster managed to break free of the chains, break the cage, and get out. The ferocious monster is out of control, striking down everyone who gets in its way. Li Jumen orders his men to take control of it immediately. But the monster is extremely strong and large, and several warriors are trying to calm it down. With its sharp claws, it scatters them in different directions, and the soldiers are injured. Li Yuguo takes the field and confidently and calmly goes to meet the monster. The beast rejoices in its new victim and puts its big paw over the boy. Suddenly, the monster calms down and falls to the ground, defenseless. Li Yuguo head gave the monster a soft toy as compensation, and the animal is cute. Peng Yunhai carries Li Ju Men on his shoulder and says that he will spend a good night with her and the girl threatens that he will deal with her stepfather. Yu Guo heard the girl say something about her stepfather. She is Li's adopted daughter. He orders the robber to immediately release the girl and not to touch her. Yu Guo asks if the girl is Li Liao Ying's stepdaughter and when he will leave the capital. But the girl does not answer. The boy asks Pen to take her away and have fun with her and the warriors all night. The girl reports that her stepfather will leave the capital in three days to gather military forces on the border. Li Yuguo is forcing the girl against him. She is resisting and trying to get away. He tears her clothes on her chest, and she is very scared. Peng Yunhai is watching this scene, and he asks Yu Guo if he's excited. The guy was just checking to see if the girl had a mole on her breast, so the rest of the story remained unchanged. Yu Guo throws a cloak over the girl's shoulders to hide her from prying eyes. He asks Pen to take her to the camp, to put her in a good place and not to touch her without his permission. Two girls discuss a young Mr. Hu who has recently appeared in their town. 
This tall guy is blonde, has a statuesque figure, and wears expensive clothes. When he arrived in the capital, he won the attention of all the girls with his intelligence, education, and nobility. A beggar passes by and accidentally hits Mr. Hu with his rekov. Ye Chiang's gaze scans Mr. Hu as if he has found his new body. The beggar falls to the ground, the girls don't know where he came from, and ask if Mr. Hu is okay. The guy tells his friends that he is fine. They shouldn't worry about him. The Lovelaces have recently found a new brothel and invite Hu to keep them company. The guy agrees. His friend says that he will order prostitutes and the beggar overhears this conversation. Under the cover of night, three friends come to a brothel. The boys are surprised that such a hidden place could be a brothel. Ye Chiang lies on his mistress's lap and tells her about his ordeal. He lost most of his strength, and it took him a long time to become a dying beggar. The girl says that Li Yuguo has left Wutan. He has a great opportunity. Maybe she has a plan for him. Next to Nalanmei, we have Prince Simi Marcel, who is gay and loves men. Ye Chiang has moved into the body of Mr. Lu. He is full of energy and intends to return to Wutan. On the outskirts of Lao Jin, the Yuguo army ambushes Li Lianing and watches him leave the city. The chief of the city looks out of the window of the chariot, and he thinks he has noticed someone. Li Yuguo also seems to have been exposed, and Mu Wuji says that it is possible to do what is planned. They are unaware of the situation in the city, and Li proposes to infiltrate the palace today and attack the city tomorrow morning. Night falls, and the brothers go to the palace to reconnoiter before the offensive. They need to find out how strong the guards are in the palace. From the palace, they hear men's voices telling them to take off all their clothes. Yugu is curious about what is really going on in the palace. He opens the door to the hall and sees many guys with naked torsos. He was noticed. He apologizes for being late. He cannot expose himself. He is a newcomer. He has to follow them and will serve the queen well. In the novel, the queen was more modest. A man comes out to them and tells them that everyone is here and they can start. The queen appears in the hall. The boys bow in respect. They are honored to greet her. A half-naked Xiu Chao lies on the bed, assesses the boys, and suggests that they begin. The guys in the audience begin to make synchronized dance moves. Li Yuguo is disappointed. He had hoped that the service for the queen would be different. This doesn't suit him, and he decides it's time to stop. The guy deliberately loses his rhythm, disturbs other guys with chaotic movements. Queen Xiu Chao is divorced. She does not understand what is happening in front of her. The dancers bow in respect, explain that it is a newcomer who has shown disrespect, and ask for mercy. The queen is disturbed by the boy's appearance and asks him to come to her. Lee did not plan this, but he has no right to contradict the queen. The queen likes his posture and figure very much. She is fascinated by him. The girl wants to get to know him better. She has a crush on this guy. He's very nice. Shui asks him his name, and the servant replies that his name is Ji Guo. The door opens, and a guy enters the room and apologizes for being late. He is so new and lost in this big palace. The servant says that the newcomer has already arrived, and Lee needs to run away because things could end badly. He rushes to the window, jumps out, and disappears into the darkness. The queen orders the guards not to catch up with the mysterious fugitive. She hopes that this meeting will not be the last, and that they will meet again. The army is lined up on the lawn, and Li Yuguo and Mu Wuji are discussing further actions. Mu gives Li a jade talisman. If it is broken, Mu will find out about it, and they will unite. Under the cover of night, the army approaches the walls of the Liao Jing Palace. The queen's guards guard the perimeter of the palace. The archers are careful and take down the palace guards, shooting them in the head. The first group uses special means to climb the walls and move toward the palace. The guards finally notice the strangers in the palace and ask who they are. Li Yuguo orders his soldiers to open fire on the enemy. The guards fight back with swords. Li Yuguo's soldiers use firearms. Yu Guo fights the guards with his sword in order not to waste his skills. This combined use of weapons gives Li's army a great advantage over the enemy. In the Liao Jing Palace, servants kneel and greet the Empress. A woman asks if there is any news about Li Yu Guo's whereabouts. She is informed that the guy is very cunning, and there is no news about him yet. She's furious, but the borders are closed and he can't escape the country. Noise is coming from the street, and the guards are concerned about what is happening. The messenger reports that Li Yuguo is leading his army to the palace, and the princess wants to know where her imperial guard is. In front of the queen, soldiers of the enemy army kill the guards with firearms. Li Yuguo enters the hall and says that the imperial guard is gone, Li Lianing is also gone, and no one can save the queen. Xuachao is disappointed that her guards allowed the enemy to enter the palace without her knowledge. 
The man who claimed to be her lover is now threatening her. Peng Yunhai is surprised that the queen has called his lord her lover. Li Yuguo offers the girl a live demonstration that he is her lover. The woman violently grabs him by his clothes, and in a flash, Yui Guo finds himself on her bed. She sits on him. Li is confused. He did not expect this turn of events. Peng Yunhai looks at this scene and notes that this girl is quite wild. Leaning over the boy, the queen touches him with her large breasts and asks if he is comfortable sitting under the dragon's mouth. While Yui Guo's troops are entering the city, the woman wants to do more interesting things. Li Yuguo does not accept her sacrifice. He is a decent gentleman, and he quietly breaks the jade talisman in his hands. A messenger brings the news that they have been attacked by Tanglin with about 2,000 injured. The boy suspected that Mu Wuji was doing everything for a reason, and the queen mocked that the situation was out of control. Yu Guo must decide how to proceed in order to beat Mu. An armed and equipped army enters the palace through the wall. Mu Wuduzi will save Li Yu Guo's life if they hand over their weapons and surrender. Tanglin is far from the border, and now he came to Lao Jin and met with Li for a reason. Empress Dadao's life is now in Li's hands, Mu will not bargain now. Two princes are in a hurry to get to Lao Jin, and Li Yu Guo can only survive if he cooperates. If the general believes the boy, he will be able to protect him on the way back to Daikin. Li Yu Guo asks Mu Wuji why they can't do it sooner. The supreme badge may arouse suspicion. Li Yuguo must understand the truth. Mu gives Li the supreme token, and the general realizes that his opponent is quite cunning. He is forced to accept the supreme token from the hands of his enemy. The general does not believe Mu Wuji, so he offers to make a fake performance. They go in different directions and start fighting with swords. Mu orders his soldiers to guard the queen and capture Li Yuguo. A powerful grenade launcher appears in Peng Yunhai's hands, with which he has made friends. He takes matters into his own hands and enters the battlefield with such a powerful weapon. Rays emanate from the Jade Talisman, filling its owner with energy. The queen watches the battle and notes that Li is excellent. No wonder he easily secretly entered the palace. Mu Wuji puts a pill in his mouth that will give him strength and help him defeat his opponent. Li warns that this pill fragments the soul and reduces life expectancy, as well as increases combat skills. Mu Wuji starts a real fight. He wants his opponent to go to the next world. Li Yuguo will not allow this wish of his enemy to be realized. The thousand-armed dragon suffers numerous injuries, but Mu cannot defeat him. Li Yuguo uses his secret weapon, a knife of cold heavenly snow. The knife easily cuts off Mu's arm and he screams in fear and pain. The guy can't admit his defeat. He shouts, Yui Guo must go to hell. A gun appears in his hands and he points it at his former friend. Mu pulls the trigger, but the shot does not go off. The gun misfires. Soap bubbles start coming out of the weapon, and Uji doesn't understand what has happened. Li foresaw this situation, so all the guns in the box were fake. As a sign of his victory, he puts his sword on Mu's shoulder, and Mu recognizes his victory. The guy bows his head in defeat and holds his injured limb. Dalao's palace is in complete chaos, and the soldiers, without leadership, flee the palace. Peng Yunhai is glad that these dogs have finally left. They attacked more than 2,000 of their troops. The rest of the army is not a threat. Li Yuguo takes a letter from Mu Wujing's pocket that he had been hiding there. The general carefully studies everything written in the secret letter. He saved the boy's life because he is Uyuyo's brother. He cannot use martial arts and is not a threat. Yuguo asks Peng Yunhai to take care of this boy. Queen Shui Chao has lost all her power, and now a bright light can appear in her life. Li Yuguo approaches the girl, puts his hand on her heart, and proposes to her. He pulls out a royal family token and offers to call a truce. Xu Chao recognizes the royal family's badge and asks the boy where he got it. He talks about Xue Qing Zhao, who is the queen's cousin and should have been given the throne. Li Yuguo painfully recalls the boy in his feet and sadly reports that he's no longer among the living. The general came here to preserve peace between the two states. He proposes to sign a statement and not to be at enmity. The girl can promise to sign an alliance with Daikin and not start a war for 30 years. Li Yuguo will help them regain her power and allow them to carry out her orders. The capital, Lao Jin, is less fertile than the cities and depleted of eight great lords. The city is still quite weak. The queen is interested in how Li Yuguo got into the palace since Li Lianing was absent. The general hands the queen a letter from which she will understand everything. The letter says that Li Lianing deliberately withdrew the army from the capital so that Yui Guo could capture the city. Lianing could have accused Yui Guo of murdering the queen and the two princes were to take her throne. 
Such a detailed account proves Yoiguo's willingness to cooperate, and Li will help restore the queen's power. The queen is courting the boy. She can give him pleasure when he restores her strength. Li does not want her to approach him. He has clearly told her that he is a gentleman. The guy is trying his best to restrain his desire and not get excited by the girl's actions. The queen is very intrusive. She puts the guy on the bed and sits on him. The woman does not hide her desire and says that she is excited and wants him very much. Yuguo asks her not to touch him and not to treat him as her lover. She shows off her lush breasts and asks if he is a virgin. The guy replies that he is quite picky and does not eat everything. He couldn't resist the charms of a professional seductress, and they surrender to passion. Lovers are not ashamed of the fact that sounds from the bedroom can be heard by others. King Pansy and Lord Lee are talking over dinner, and they decide it's time to set a trap. The Lord doubts their decision because the price is so high. Ping Shi asks not to worry. Dalao will definitely prosper under their management. In the morning, General Li Yuguo and Queen Xiao Kui woke up in the same bed. The guy recalls the previous night and realizes that he did nothing useful. Stretching in his arms, the queen asks if he is awake. He served her well last night and she wants to eat it again. A guy runs away from bed naked, saying that two princes will come soon and he needs to get ready. The queen is disappointed with his quick disappearance. She was expecting a sequel. Peng Yunhai is already waiting for him excited by the fact that the general spent the night with the queen. Yunhai shows a lot of magic weapons that Mu Uji collected. He became a real master. The general unfolds the scroll that was among the treasures and recognizes the image of the previous emperor, Dalao. The papyrus depicts Shui Tao's father, which surprises the men. They find his clothes. The previous emperor brought peace and stability to the country. Li wants to win the favor of the people using someone else's reputation. Using masks is a very dirty technology, but if you find a good application, no one will even notice. Among the treasures found by Mu Wuji, Li Yuguo was attracted to a very interesting thing. The soul doll was made by the clan of the Southern Witch. It is activated by the voluntary donation of a soul. Li Yuguo comes up with a brilliant idea for Insu, whose soul lived in a sword. Ji Wushuang has been helping Queen Lanman lately, and she appoints him to help the alliance that governs the country. The heads of other families disagree with the queen's decision. They remind us that there may be mutual restrictions between the main four families, and the G family should not be allowed to interfere now. The queen replies that the E family made big mistakes in the past. It was good to keep them all together. Now they want to rebel against the union. The girl gets up from her throne and harshly replies that everyone is free to leave the room. Chapter E says that if Li Yuguo had not confused people, his grandson would not have come here. The queen asked Ji Wushuang if he took care of Yui Guo. He did everything he had to. Unfortunately, she hasn't received any letters back from her husband, so she doesn't know if he's okay. Ji Wushuang heard that Li had infiltrated Da Lao. He may not have time to answer. He will answer when he can. The queen is jealous and convinced that her husband is having fun with beauties. The girl wants to know why Bai Zhishan was not at the palace today. Perhaps he's not feeling well. Bai is sitting in his room, happy, having received important information. Representatives of five families are gathered around the table discussing the state of affairs in Haotan. The head of the Yi family believes that landmen put pressure on the families and weakened their status as head families, and she has no right to do so. Some of the families are also heroes who are defending the country by supporting the government. Landman turned her back on him. And the newly appointed Ji Wushuang is also far from perfect. Bai Zhishan is convinced that a woman is not suitable for this position. He would not disappoint the elders. He's just a citizen. And if he doesn't live up to the trust, he can't escape Zheng's hands. His life is in the hands of his family. Family representatives are thinking, looking at each other. No one is ready to take responsibility for this decision. If Chapter E agrees to cooperate, Zhishan will not live up to the trust. He will deprive him of his power. They negotiate the details and agree to the following terms. Bai came to an agreement with all the advisors, and the rabbit owner Simi Masai remained. The boy asks his demon how he can conquer this Simi. Doman replies that it will be soon, but Abe Zishan is not satisfied with this answer and takes chopsticks from the table. Using chopsticks, he wants to get the eye out of his hand, and the demon says that someone will come soon to help him. It will be his old acquaintance, his fatal man. A chariot is traveling down a city street, and passers-by move out of the way to let it pass. A strong man is sitting in the middle, hugging two young boys. Through the window of the chariot, the man notices an interesting passer-by, a very handsome and attractive guy. 
The passerby is Mr. Lu, in whose body Ye Chiang actually lives. The man is delighted that there is such a handsome man in the world. He wants to meet him. He demands that the coachman immediately stop the chariot in the middle of the road. The man runs out into the crowded square and calls out to the handsome man, but he has mingled with the crowd. The man whips his head around, but the boy has already disappeared from his sight. He seems to find the person he was looking for, stretches out his hand to him and says that he is handsome. Voices are heard from the windows of the palace, talking about a cute little thing and wishing to let go. It turns out that Queen Shui Chao also humanizes cute toys, while Li Yuguo thought she only needed muscles. A servant comes to General Li and informs him that they have received a secret letter from Daikin. The letter refers to the disorder on the Dajin border, to General Song Ching Long and Yang Huan, and asks him to return to resolve the crisis. Yuguo does not trust what is written in the letter because his grandfather is very cunning. The general misses Uyuyo very much and hopes that the girl is doing well. A chariot drawn by two horses is traveling through the city in an unknown direction. Shifan reassures Uyuyo that her father will be fine. They will not bother him in the palace. He leans over to the girl and whispers that she is not really worried about her father but about General Li. The girl shares that Li Yuguo has not contacted her for a long time, and she is worried because she does not know how he is now. Emperor Sitho Wushu is having dinner when he has visitors. Two of his generals came to him, and he invited them to sit down at the table. After many years of training and mentoring, the generals do not want to be cruel, so they ask the emperor to step aside and give them daikin. The emperor continues to eat and asks them one question about how best to govern the country. Sun Ching Long believes that people can only be promoted and not demoted in any way. Yang Huan is convinced that there are no two mistakes no two in politics, and the rule of law is just a step away. Each of them has his own arguments, and only one can become emperor. They have to decide who will succeed him. The emperor puts a cup on the table and says that the first person to drink tea from it will become the successor. Yang Huan thinks that the tea is poisoned, and if he drinks it, he will die. Sun Ching Long does not believe that the position can be obtained so easily. Generals cannot agree among themselves who should drink tea from the cup. Yang Huang thinks that this time his brother has stopped worrying about him. Sun also doubts that his brother trusts him. Yang Huang drops the cup, it breaks, and he accuses the interloper of playing bad jokes on him. The emperor maintains an imperturbable appearance, regretting that the cup of tea fell and broke. The generals start coughing, and a red liquid runs out of them. They fall to the floor and realize that the emperor has poisoned them. The emperor calmly sips his tea and tells the generals that he gave them poison every day. Yang Huan goes to the doctor every day, and he hasn't noticed anything. Each of their dishes had poison in it, and the next one had an antidote, and the next one had an antidote in the cup. His soldiers run to the emperor with important news. The commander reports that all the rebels have surrendered. General Yuguo is looking through a spyglass at the approaches to the city. He sees that a large army led by princes is approaching him, and they want to seize power. Pansy warns the Lord that the general has many tricks, while Lord Lee is convinced that with a half-million-strong army they have nothing to fear. Pansy believes that it is better to warn about problems in advance, so they are easier to fix. The commanders order their soldiers to move forward and storm the city. The army reached the imperial city unhindered and surrounded the palace. The kings of Pingxi and Pingbei were expecting an ambush on the road, but they had to be careful because Lee was very treacherous. Lightning appears in the night sky, illuminating the people sitting on the palace tower. The rebels try to see who it is, and Pinzi warns that Li may have a surprise in store. At the tower, Li Yuguo and Queen Shui Chao meet the kings at a set table. The queen introduces General Li as the chief advisor in the cabinet, and asks why the kings are trying to rebel. King Ping Shi convinces the queen that General Li has confused her royal highness. He orders La Lian to arrest the criminal and save the queen. Yuguo expected this from his enemies, so he gives the order to bring the girl. The guards bring Li Jumeng, who is Li Lianing's stepdaughter, up to the tower bound and gagged. Li Yining wants Yuiguo to release his stepdaughter immediately, and Yuiguo promises to release the girl as soon as the fire starts. The King of Song does not understand why the head of the Li cannot kill his adopted daughter. The Lord shouts at him to shut up. The Lord cannot fulfill this order because Li Juman is his only daughter. The news surprises everyone present, and they wonder how the general could have known about it. When Li entered the palace, his wife was pregnant, and when the family mixed to protect his daughter, he passed her off as his stepdaughter. Li Lianning confirms that the girl is indeed his daughter, 
The queen will give his daughter a decent position if he lays down his arms. If he continues to resist, she will allow his daughter to be buried next to him. The man repents that he has realized his mistake and hopes that Her Majesty will release his daughter. King Ping Shi does not believe anyone, because even a half million strong army could not capture the imperial city. If these two rebels do not want to repent, the queen will summon the spirit of her father to punish them. King Pension doesn't like talking about the old emperor, so he orders his soldiers to destroy it for him. General Li raises up his knife of cold, heavenly snow and summons the spirit of the old emperor. The image of an old emperor appears in the sky, asking who summoned him to this world. The audience is amazed by the apparition of the first emperor, who passed away many years ago. Li Lianing falls to his knees. He misses his highness very much. Yu Guo and Shui Chao bow in reverence to the old emperor, who has been disturbed by his daughter. Li Yuguo came up with the idea for this truck, and the queen supported her and asked her to take care of her own safety. The old emperor looks stronger than he was, and King Ping Shi is convinced that this is a trick by Yu Guo who should not be believed. Addressing the princes from heaven, the emperor asks if they are not tired of living. They fall to the ground in front of him and admit their mistake. Peng Yunhai, dressed as an emperor in front of a tablet and a lamp, enjoyed playing this role. The old emperor reminds the kings that they were supposed to help the young queen, but they rebelled. The kings say that this is not the case and ask him to calm his anger. The old emperor is angry and orders the army to kill the two rebels. The soldiers did not expect the prince they had served for so many years to be so mean, and they want to kill the two traitors. Both princes see that the soldiers are determined and ready to kill them. They will not wait for their deaths. The two are opposed by their half-million-strong army, and the kings are summoned by their essences to help them. The red lynx demon fights with the army and protects King Ping Shi. The green dragon demon protects King Ping Bei from angry warriors. Caroline troops put up fierce resistance, trying to kill as many soldiers as possible. The princess did not expect that her father was so loved by the people, and just a few words made the soldiers turn their backs on their kings. Two hours later, the wounded and bloody kings cover each other's backs and try to escape from the crowd of armed soldiers. Arote's troops are belligerent, intent on fulfilling the order of their old emperor. Spears fly at kings, and every warrior considers it an honor to fulfill the order of his emperor. The army bows to the emperor and reports to his highness that the traitor has been defeated. The old emperor praises the army and orders them to be faithful to his daughter, otherwise he will punish them. With heads bowed in respect, the army obeys the emperor's order and takes the oath of allegiance. The story returns to the royal court of King Dalao. Queen Xu Xiao is in the hall. General Li stands behind her and the courtiers humbly greet her majesty. The queen announces that as of today, Dalao and Daikin have signed a ten-year peace and strengthened trade. The advisors approve the queen's decisions and admire her wisdom and foresight. Despite the fact that the conflict between Dalao and Daikin is over, Ye Chiang is still alive, the catastrophe has not yet been prevented. General Li did a good job accompanying the queen. She appointed him deputy advisor, and he can now hear all political conversations. Li Yuguo did not immediately understand what the queen had said to him. He reminds her that it wasn't real. He doesn't need this position. The queen wants him to stay with her for a few days. If he is not satisfied with this position, he can take the place of a eunuch at court. The woman leans over to the boy and seduces him to stay with her longer. Hugging him, she whispers in his ear that she is persistent and knows how to get her way. When Li Yuguo leaves the city, the queen will have to take care of everything herself, and she asks him to take over her shoulders. The general gives her a massage and thinks that she seriously wants to make him a eunuch. It is not easy to be an emperor, which means that Landman is working hard, ruling the state, and it is not known how Bai Zhishan was influenced by the eye of the lower world. A lot of time has passed, he decided to get in touch with Utan and hopes that Nalan men will not blame him. The general sends a message to his wife that he will soon return to Haotian. He warns her that the Eye of the Underworld is still in Bai Zhishan's hands. Bai listens to the message and breaks the phone so that Queen Landman cannot see the message. The queen comes to his house and asks if he is home. He responds, and Landman asks if Bai Zhishan has received any letters from Li Yuguo. The boy kneels down in front of the queen and calls her your majesty. She lifts him up and asks him not to call her that in private. Bai had not heard from his older brother since the death of the old emperor. He reassures the queen that perhaps his older brother has a lot to do and will return home in a few days. 
Among the guy's belongings, the phone turns on and a voice is heard telling Landman to wait for him. The queen seems to hear the voice of her beloved husband, Li Yuguo. A few days ago, Bai raised a parrot and taught it to talk, and the queen misheard it. The queen is upset, convinced that this is the real voice of Yui Guo. The guy assures me that if he gets any from Li, he will let her know right away. The queen gets into the chariot, and Bai Yuji Sheng bows in respect and sees her off. Simi Marcel rides through the city at high speed on horseback in search of a new love. He passes by Malo Bai and almost knocks him down, and the boy is scared. The eye of the lower world tells Zhen that the one who is supposed to help him is already here. It shows him his assistant, and he sees that this is a new love that this gentleman is looking for. He spies on Marcel through a peephole, and sweat breaks out on his face. Simi Marcel holds Lou in his arms and says that it was very difficult for him to find him. The eye of the lower world confirms that his assistant is the lover of this master. This handsome man has the same fierce thing in his body as he does. He has the same agent in his body, and this assistant is an old friend of his. Yuguo looks unhappy. He has been waiting for a response from Landman for several days and does not know what happened to her. The queen assures him that his wife is fine. Hugging him from behind by the shoulders, she doesn't understand how he can think about another woman when he is in her house. The queen asks why she cannot satisfy him. She's very angry today, so she will give General Li some of her energy. Li Yuguo and Xia Yukui come to the sacred fountain of the Lao Dynasty, which flows from the mountain. This fountain is opened once every hundred years. Its spiritual energy is much stronger than in the water cave, and only one person can improve here at a time. Li Yuguo helped Xiao cope with the crisis, and in gratitude, she allows him to improve here. The general is distrustful of such a gift, but considers it a very noble act. The queen's spies have information that everything is calm in Haotian, so Li can start training now so as not to waste hundreds of years of spiritual energy. When Yu Guo is done improving, he will be able to return to his Haotian and Daikin. Xiao will wait until he recovers his spirit and can satisfy her. Bai Jishan comes to see Ye Qiong, and Ye is surprised by his visit and Bai says that nothing has happened since their last meeting. From his words, Ye Chiang concludes that his enemy's associate knows everything. Two days ago, Yi learned that there are other agents in the city besides Mr. Rabbits. The surprise was that this agent was the one who followed Li Yuguo. Bai offers cooperation to make them masters of the world. Li is their joint punishment. Ye Chiang's arm did not heal by itself. Every world has its foundation, and Ye Chiang is the foundation of his world. He liked his world and he regrets that everything changed because of Yui Guo. He hates his old enemy and wants him to be destroyed as soon as possible. Having a common enemy, their cooperation should be fruitful, and Yi has already regained his strength. Since Bai Zhishan also has an agent in the body, they will have a nice banquet in the future. The Eye of the Underworld warns Bai not to be careless and to remember that Ye Chiang is quite cunning. The luxurious palace, with its windows reflecting sunlight, looks like a fairy tale. In the room, Simi Marcel is sitting on his bed, getting dressed, his partner is still asleep. A servant enters the bedroom, folds his arms across his chest, and asks for permission to address him. The Lord asks the servant if he has anything for him, and the servant answers that he does. He leaves, he needs to do something, the man stays in the room. His eyes are filled with surprise and fear, and what he sees causes him to panic. Ye Chiang is lying on the bed, his eyes and mouth open, his body covered with pink spots. A flotilla is approaching the ship, which is on the shore of the sea. A guard on the tower gives the order to prepare for the flotilla's return, while another sees something suspicious and tells them to wait. People are landing on the shore, their sandals do not look like sailors' shoes. Pirates led by a one-eyed leader are approaching the city walls. The guards have managed to close the city gates, and the pirates attack the wall that protects the city. Her Majesty is informed that a large number of fleets have entered the country's coast. The sea was supposed to be guarded by the Lord of the Seas, but he disappeared. His crew disappeared, and these fleets are already on the shore and will continue to move on. Nalanmen orders all the guards to gather, make sure that all the robbers are removed, and call Ji Wushuang to her. We need to find the reason why the fleets attacked so suddenly, where and why the Lord of the Sea disappeared. Bai Zhishan was angry that the queen did not ask him for help. He doesn't want to be a decoration and asks why the queen doesn't trust him. Li Yuguo even sent her a letter to warn her about Bai. He looks closely at the princess and says that they are really a couple from heaven. Kaleva recalls hearing Yuguo's head, and Bai confirms that it was he who took the letters. Li Yuguo also did not receive any letters from the queen. 
Landman wants to know the real motives behind Zishan's actions and his demands. If he tells her the truth, she might pardon him. The guy doesn't want to talk directly and offers her to guess his requirements. The queen's face changes at once with a terrible realization. She does not believe that Bai is so treacherous. Landman falls to her knees. Her strength is gone and she asks what he has done to her. He has a lot of his people in this palace. It was easy to get access to the queen's food. He mocks her and says that he is not as promiscuous as Li Yuguo. Taking the girl by the chin, Bai says that she is very beautiful and that she should love him. The princess mentally cries out to Yuguo to save her from trouble. Because of the distance, he felt that his wife was in trouble. As a general, he opens his eyes and listens to his feelings. He needs to feel his wife's energy. He feels weak in the body, coughs and other symptoms of poisoning. He begins to have a seizure, and Queen Shui Chao approaches him in this state. She asks if the improvements have been successful, and the general replies that his wife is in danger and he urgently needs to run. It's 200 kilometers to Liao Jing, and his wife could die while he's running there. The boy asks to borrow a fast beast that the old emperor had. The queen points in the direction of the beast and asks if it is suitable. This animal lives in a fountain and looks very similar to a turtle dragon. Queen Landman pushes the annoying suitor away from her with all her might. Bai Zhishan did not expect such resistance, hoping that she was weakened by poison. In addition, it is not vulnerable to many poisons, and its strength is slowly restored. He smiles gloatingly at her, convinced that she will not be able to leave him. The queen was angry with her subject's words, and she would not allow such treatment. There is a powerful explosion in front of the palace. Fire bursts out of the ground and stones fly. The queen is thrown to the ground by the blast wave and coughs. Landman sees the heads of the three families in front of him, and Head E sympathizes with her condition. If the queen had foreseen this development, she would not have shown such mercy to the families. If Chapter E had accused Li Yugo of fraud, Ye Chiang would not be on the brink of death right now because of him. The energy of the three families is directed at the queen and is intended to destroy her. One of her loyal subordinates rushes to Landman's aid. Ji Wu Shuang and his assistants came to Her Majesty's defense. Chapter E asks Ji Wu Shuang if he wants to be an enemy to the other families. If they want to harm the queen, they must first step over Ji's corpse. The head accepts his terms and fires fire swords at him. Ji Wu Shuang asks his assistants to take the queen to a safe place. Bai Zhishan saw that the queen was being taken away, and he could not let Nalan Men escape. His lower world eye tells him not to worry, it will help. The demonic energy of the eye comes out of his hand and is directed to its victim. It reaches the princess. Her bodyguards are wounded, and the princess defends herself. The queen is left alone with her essence. She concentrates her power. Its essence opens a mouth with sharp teeth and protects the princess from death. Bai Zhishan did not expect resistance. He was exhausted and on the verge of collapse. The princess's golden dragon and the purple eye essence of the lower world fight. The eye of the lower world strikes the dragon and Nalanmen feels it. Bai Zhishan tells the queen that this day will be her last in her life. The queen sits down to rest. She is not in good shape today. Bai continues to direct the energy of the lower world's eye at her. A bearded man drinks an energy drink and says that the battle should be handled by masters. Strong green plants sprout from the ground, throwing Bai Zhishan away and causing him to lose his balance. A poisonous fog rises into the air, and the heads of the families are confused. The king of poisons is sitting on the roof of the palace. He says that this place is surrounded by his poisonous fog. The queen and Ji Wu Shuang cover their faces to protect themselves from the fog. The king of poisons watches from the roof as the poisonous fog disperses over the territory. The king of poisons came to wake up his old friend, the wooden king, who was sleeping after another drinking session. He offers him a game, and the king agrees to a quick fight so that they can play chess. Everyone in the affected area dies from the poisonous fog, and the king of poisons watches the consequences. His son runs to the poison king, begging for help because he wants to live. The king is busy and asks what his son needs from him. The son breaks through the poisoned fog and shouts that he will kill his father. King Xian wraps the roots of his tree around his leg and impedes his movement. The immobilized guy flies in an unknown direction. The king of the forest has already caught the head of Lun, and she asks the boy why he is also here. King Xian is watching the battle between Chapter E and Ji Wushuang. It extends one of its roots to Chapter E and tries to avoid it. The king of the forest turned out to be stronger. The old head shouts to put him down immediately. Head Lun asks his brother to release their family from captivity. 
All three chapters are next to each other, and they are firmly enslaved by the roots of the forest king. Hedlun continues to beg for their family to be released. She will make the king happy. Her annoying request irritates the king of the forest, and he starts sneezing, his snot flying in all directions. The voices of the families are forced to breathe the exhaust of the king of the forest. They open their mouths wide, grabbing fresh air. The emperor of poison says that the Xian king drank too much and his gases stunned the three. Among the prisoners, Bai Zhishan remained the king of the forest, and Xian asks the queen what to do with him. Her eyes burn with hatred for the guy. She wants to get even with him herself and aims at him. Bai squints his eyes. He's not afraid of this weapon and is confident in his inviolability. The movements of the queen and her friends are constrained. They cannot breathe and do not understand what is happening to them. The queen feels sick, tries to keep her breath and raises her head to the sky. The eye of the lower world appeared in the sky, frightening and fascinating at the same time, and it is recognized as a devilish liquid. Bai has finally managed to free himself from the shackles of the king of the forest and is happy that this devilish entity has appeared. Together with the creature, the sea king, who was supposed to protect the city, descends to the ground. The queen asks to see the master of the seas, where he was and why he broke the contract. He says that now she and Haotan are in his hands, and today she will die. The time has come for the abyss to show its abilities, and it lets its teeth out of the petals. A large vortex rises, people and objects are pulled into the eye. King Xian holds the poison king and queen tightly, hoping to save them from the devil's eye. The king of poisons releases a new portion of poison into the devil's essence, which is supposed to stop it. The lord of the seas and Bai Zhishan rely entirely on the devilish essence they have nothing to do. The abyss receives an order to clear the entire space and sucks everything into itself in a vortex. The king of the forest could not resist the devil's whirlwind, and he lets go of the friends he tried to save. The queen was trying her best to hold on to the branch, but the branch broke off and she flew into the whirlwind. The devil's eye draws her closer and closer to it, and she tries to resist. The Lord of the Sea and Bai Zhishan are surprised to see Li Yuguo appear near the devil's essence. The general approaches the fiery stream of the demon eye. The queen is on the other side of the stream. Yuguo manages to catch the queen in his arms before she is sucked into a demonic vortex. She opens her eyes and cannot believe that she sees her husband in front of her. General Li gently holds his wife in his arms and smiles at her. They are standing on a big, big pterosaur bird, and he tells his wife that he is back. He apologizes to her for making her suffer, and he will take care of everything from now on. If Li Yuguo had come later, he might not have found his wife alive, the king of the forest, and the king of poisons rejoicing at his brother's return. Queen Nalanman asks if the general is in Dalao and what contributed to his unexpected return. He freezes his eyes and is happy because he returned in time to save his beloved wife. Queen Zhui Chao wants to know how the general knows about the existence of pterosaurs. He accidentally gives away a secret and doesn't know how to explain that he invented this world. The queen frees him from explanations, leans toward him in a passionate kiss, and from now on the bird becomes his. When the general finishes his business in high ocean, he must return and serve the queen. General Li thanks everyone for their help and attention, and he will take care of further matters from now on. The Lord of the Seas watched this picture. He did not understand how Li could return. His power had increased. There is no need to be afraid of the three heads of families anymore. They are all inside the eye of the lower world. Its magical and powerful energy continues to attract us. Queen Lun hopes that she will be able to get out of the demonic bottom. She asks the King of the Seas not to touch her. The King of the Seas enjoys his power over the heads of five families. His dream has come true. The heads of the families clutch their necks. They lack air. They begin to suffocate from lack of oxygen. General Li identifies parts that absorb magic, which is very bad. The king of the seas recognizes Ye as his grandson, Ye Chiong, for whose life he was worried. He sees a young boy in front of him who asks his grandfather if this is all the Wuzong power can do. Ye Chiong ruthlessly destroys his grandfather, and Li Yuguo is next in line. From the demonic maw of the Eye of the Underworld, he takes out a sword to fight his old enemy. Determined and supported by demonic power, he is ready for a decisive battle. Li Yugu is focused on his opponent, concentrating his strength and energy, and is ready to fight. The two old enemies once again meet in battle, hoping that this battle will be the last victorious one. Powerful streams of energy from two great forces diverge in circles, their friends watching the battle. 
Li Yuguo finds it hard to believe that Ye Chiang is still alive. Ye Chiang could not have died earlier, otherwise there would have been no one to destroy Li Yuguo. The queen sees this energy and realizes that the king of the seas who betrayed her was Ye Chiang. Clutching his sword tightly in his hands, Li Yuguo will be merciless to his opponent. General Li is as focused and concentrated as possible. He picks up his fire sword. He is ready for battle. Cosmic fire energy flares up between the rivals, capable of destroying anyone who comes close to it. Under the cover of the demonic eye of the lower world, Ye Chiang knows that this flame cannot harm him. A new vortex swirls around the eye, carrying energy from space, which keeps the system in balance. Ye Chiang knows that this vortex is difficult to resist, and he is prematurely overjoyed because he thinks he has won. The general sees that the advantage is not on his side, and he needs to use a different method. Three different elements are concentrated in Ye Chiang's hands, and he uses them against his enemy. These elements, amplified by the energy of the demonic eye, are capable of destroying the magical system of world formation. Li forms another large fire blast that absorbs some of the energy from the demon eye. Ye Chiang was confused, and the energy of his demonic essence weakened significantly. He stretches his brain to come up with a new way to counteract the fire. General Li summons his demonic self to help the ten-armed monster. Standing on top of his monster with a sword in his hand, he is ready to continue the fight. This is the strong demonic entity that Ye Chiang's eye warned him about. The demonic entity has once again saved Li Yuguo and insists that it wants his body. The liquid of Li's demonic essence materialized and is very similar to Ye Chiang's liquid in its demonic nature. The king of poisons believes his brother no matter what kind of liquid he has. Queen Lanman promises to be by Li Yuguo's side no matter who he becomes. It seems to Ye Chiang that his opponent has also enlisted the help of a monster and they are no different now. The use of monsters is appropriate when it does not pose a threat to the sky and mind. King Ji Wushuang believes in Li Yuguo's victory, and he was not mistaken in him. Ye Chiang considers himself the main character of this world, its ruler, and all his actions are right. He uses the support of his demon to gain power over the world. Li Yuguo is supported by his demon, and the decisive battle between the two ancient enemies continues. Ye Chiang summons another demonic force which Li must experience for himself. He enters the battlefield using two demonic essences at once. Li sees that the forces are unequal, and it will be difficult for his single entity to keep the fight going. Yi lets his two demonic selves loose and they are determined to destroy Li. General Li is on the defensive, hiding from the teeth of the eye of the lower world and the second demon. The thousand-armed demon has always been the most powerful entity in the universe. Li Yuguo calls on the demon to show his full strength and confirm his title as the strongest demon. A demonic entity inhabits Li Yuguo's body, and in his new guise he continues to fight. Li Yuguo has managed to hurt the ego of the thousand-armed demon's demonic essence and make it manifest. He deploys his maximum strength and proves himself to be the strongest demon. Ye Chiang did not expect such strength from his opponent, and he clutches his heart. Observing Li Yuguo's reincarnations, the eye of the lower world notices that he is being held at full strength. General Li developed red spikes around his head and body for defense and attack. Being under the power of a thousand-armed demon, Li Yuguo is ready to fight. Ye Chiang's demonic entities are confused and are forced to temporarily withdraw. Li Yuguo delivers a powerful blow to Ye Chiang's demonic essence, which leads to his injury. He falls to the ground exhausted and a sinkhole forms under him. Gathering his strength with the support of his demons, he attacks Li Yuguo again. Suddenly, someone's hand with sharp claws is plunged into his face and he screams in fear. Li Yuguo, in his demonic nature, enjoys inflicting damage on the enemy. The next explosion burns everything in its path and throws it to the ground with a powerful force. Ye Chiang, pierced by many red arrows, lies on his back and screams in pain. Li Yuguo stands over him and celebrates his victory over the enemy. Bai Zhishan approaches him from behind and reminds him that he can fight as well. General Li turns to him knowing his strength and smiles gloatingly. Bai Zhishan was not prepared for the sudden attack and he falls to the ground. Li Yuguo plays with the energy that is encased in a ball and concentrated around him. Ye Chiang and Bai Zhishan leave to recuperate but promise to meet again. They approach under the guise of their demonic selves to gain energy for a new battle. The thousand-armed demon has completely taken over the general's body and he is out of control. Around him, chaotic explosions of energy are occurring and causing destruction. The energy spins up in his body and tears his consciousness to pieces. 
Li Yuguo stands in the circle of this energy and cannot return to himself. Queen Nalanmen wants to help him, but Ji Wushan asks her to stay away. General Li does not recognize his wife and perceives her as his enemy. Lanman does not understand why her husband is behaving like this. She is crying. Li Yuguo suddenly attacks the queen and her friends run to her aid. He was completely absorbed by the monster and cannot realize his actions. Another explosion by Li takes place next to his wife and fortunately does not harm her. The forest lord binds Yuiguo's body with his strong roots and completely immobilizes him. The king of poisons jumps on his brother to wake him up to reality. The thousand-armed demon tears the roots with his power and strikes the king of poisons. He falls to the ground in surprise, completely helpless. Li Yuguo brings his sword over the head of the king of poisons. He is completely under the power of his demon. Queen Nalanman runs to her husband, convinced that she can restore his consciousness. He said that when he returned, he would always protect her. Li holds his sword near his wife's body and tries to remember if he knows her. He recalls how she slapped him when he tried to hug her. Then he recalls how tenderly they said goodbye when he was leaving her. His body, in which the essence of a thousand-armed demon lives, screams for freedom. The queen kneels before her husband as a sign of respect, and he points his sword at her. His consciousness returns to him, and he embraces his beloved wife. Li Yuigu returned to his body and to his consciousness through the love of his wife. In the queen's arms, he faints. His wife supports his head. He blacked out because of a heavy emotional load, and he needs rest to come to his senses. It is not safe to stay here any longer, although Bai Jishan and Ye Chiang have escaped. But the soldiers are still a problem. Ji Wushan has a good place to wait for a while until it is safe. The Eye of the Underworld brings Ye Chiang and Bai Jishan back to their reality. They find themselves in Ye Chiang's room where they are met by Yuji, Ye Chiang's mistress. No essence of Ye Chiang is capable of dealing with Li Yui Guo. If Bai knew this, he would have dealt with it himself. Bai did not warn Ye Kun that Li had such power, so his plan did not work. Since the power of the essence is mixed with time and space, Bai did not expect the thousand-year-old to give all of its power to Li, but they still have a chance to win. Ye Kun Yi used three sections of martial arts and was defeated, so he needs to find another way to destroy the enemy. Yuji took care of her lover and brought a doctor to see him. She asks him to hurry. The forces of Kaotan are in the hands of two rebels. Li can escape, and the essence of Yi has not been fully revealed today. Ye Chu recalls how he moved from the body of the handsome Lu to the body of Marcel, who had an unawakened essence. The thousand-faced ghost, an evil spirit, is very strong, but Ye Chiang wants to possess it. As long as Ye Chiang can increase his power, he can take ten entities for himself. He is quite greedy. When his essence was awakened, he felt strong. But his essence was not fully awakened, otherwise he would have won today. Bai Jishan tells Li Ye Chiang that he has an idea for a common victory. The secret mansion of the Ji family is located far in the mountains and hidden from the public eye. On the bed lies an unconscious General Li, who has not yet recovered from the battle. Bai secretly united military power to win people's hearts and planned this rebellion with Ye Chiang. The borders of Haotian are blocked by the army. There are many guards on the streets, and the Ji family has no soldiers who can form a combat unit. Queen Landman blames herself for what happened. If she had known about it earlier, it would not have happened. The King of Poisons and Zi Wushuang leave the room and wish Li to regain his strength and have a good rest. The queen apologizes to her husband for making him suffer again. Sitting next to him on the bed, she cries, tears streaming from her eyes, and Li wakes up and wipes her tears with his palm. Nalan Men is glad that her husband has regained consciousness, and he strokes her cheek tenderly. The girl lies down next to Li Yuiguo. She has waited for him to return and deserved happiness. Li Yuiguo promises his wife that he will never leave her again. She leans against his chest and is happy that he is safe and sound. The general wants to say something, but his wife puts her hand over his mouth, believing that he will never hurt or forget their shared memories. Clenching her hand into a fist, she regrets having trusted Bai Zhushan. Li regrets that he did not defend his wife well. He tried to prevent the union of Bai and Ye Chiang. He woke up early, but pretended to be asleep to spend more time alone with his wife. The queen blames herself for not being afraid of the ambitions of her entourage and trusting them. Nalan Men wants to know what happened to Li Yuguo during their long separation. Hugging his wife, the general says that this is a very long story. It took me a long time to tell him everything that happened to him. Nalan Men is interested in the details of her husband's communication with Queen Shui Chao. Yuguo says that she is very scary, not modern, with yellow hair, ugly, and no one likes her. 
The husband missed his wife very much during such a long, forced separation. The young couple waste no time in making love. They indulge in passion and pleasure. Suddenly the queen sees a long yellow hair on her husband's head, and she is disappointed. Naliman asks Yuiguo what color Shue's hair was, and he makes an excuse that everything is over between them. The queen is furious at her husband's deception. She does not want to listen to any of his explanations. She throws the boy out of the house. He flies into the street and smashes his head. The king of poisons jokes about his brother, who was accidentally caught cheating. He understands the general. It is difficult for a young and energetic man to have only one girlfriend. The king of poisons wants a magic pill that allows him to fly, but Li Yuguo's brothers have used them all. Men are walking through the deserted streets of the city, and this causes them anxiety. The king of poisons points out that this may be a curse. The city cannot be so empty. Li Yuguo suspects that there is a secret power behind this, and he needs to find it. On the street, they meet a man, his eyes looking right through them. He looks sick. He constantly repeats one phrase in which he wishes for a long, long life. He looks like he's been poisoned with a powder of a thousand poisons, but there is no poison in his body. The man shouts that he wishes the sun god a long life. His eyes are bulging and red saliva is running from his mouth. He looks like a man possessed, and Yuguo wants to understand who is controlling this man. Suddenly there is an explosion. A man explodes, he bursts into flames, and the blast wave hits Yuguo. The king of poisons approaches his brother and asks if he is all right. Men study the spot that formed after the man's explosion. A person does not explode for no reason. Ordinary poison cannot do that. The men are engaged in conversation, and they notice someone approaching them from behind. They are surrounded by several burly men in black clothes who want to destroy their friends. The attackers are holding daggers, and the two friends have to resist them and save their lives. The decision has to be made instantly and Li Yuguo asks the attackers if they want to die. He unleashes the hands of his thousand-armed demon, its tentacles piercing through the attackers. After a grueling battle, the thousand-armed demon fell asleep, but his blood became stronger, and the power of the Liao dynasty was benefited. The attackers turn into zombies. They inhale the purple fog that has filled the city. The King of Poisons notices a change in the men's symes. They become unlike human beings. When the purple fog has completely dissipated, the men are ready to fight again. The red tentacles of the thousand-armed man pierce through the men, but do not harm them. The Poison King releases his poison and invites them to try it. These are the people of the Flying Eagle Whistle. They are unusual and should not look like people. They keep repeating the phrase that the man who exploded said. Li Yu Guo warns the King of Poisons that these people are approaching him. The men simultaneously start exploding, and everything around them turns red with smoke. The general comes to my brother's aid, asks if he's okay. The king of poisons is convinced that another explosion will not harm him. He accidentally inhaled some powder, and Li Yuguo shouldn't be so worried about him. The queen meets the boys in the courtyard, and the king of poisons says that he is fine. General Li asks his wife to prepare an empty room for the poison king and not to follow them. The body of the King of Poisons has turned purple, and Yuiguo takes his pulse. If the King of Poisons survived the poisoned crowd, then this powder will not be able to harm him. The pulse is stable, but you shouldn't be careless. It's better to stay in bed and not go anywhere. Li Yuguo closes the door to the King of Poisons' room and checks its security. He informs the Queen and Ji Wushuang that the Poison King is fine, but he has some concerns. The Queen shares her husband's anxiety. She wants to know what is bothering him. Yuguo remembers the Empress of Medicine and wants to find it quickly. The King of Poisons lies in bed and convinces himself that there is no need to worry about him. He is fine. His pupils constricted and his brain heard other people's voices and words spoken by the sick man. Ye Chiang and Bai Jishan recite a magic spell in front of a large purple crystal. Preparations for the new stage are almost complete, and soon a thousand ghosts may wake up. Bai Jishan doubts that Ye Chiang will be able to defeat Li Yuguo. The eye of the lower world says not to worry because the mystical power has begun to spread. During this time, he will be able to take power beyond this world. After Houtan's capture, something changed. Someone is establishing control over groups of people. Perhaps Bai Jishan and Ye Chiang are doing it. Li Yuguo sits at a table outside, reflecting on recent events. He can feel energy flows approaching him and entering his body. Suddenly, Nine-Tailed Fox and Chiffon Toussaint appear in the yard. Their appearance caused considerable surprise to General Li and came as a surprise. He caught the nine-tailed fox in his arms and asked what they were doing here. 
The chief counselor held the news and sent it to Yui Guo's aide. To find him, they visited all the places that the chief advisor had indicated. The queen comes out to them. Shifan takes off his hat and asks if it is his daughter-in-law. Yu Guo feels the anger that grips his wife with his whole body. He immediately lets go of the nine-tailed fox he was holding in his arms and approaches his wife. The queen says they have never met before. Her name is Lanman. She doesn't want Li Yu Guo to call her his wife. He was wrong and she wants to explain everything. The governor of Haotan knew the situation and sent troops and horses to help Sirius's guards to destroy the bandits. The guests burn a poisonous thread and ask why there are always strange people in his Haotan. They have faded eyes and broken mouths. They look like ghosts. Suddenly, Shifan sees a man who looks like the ones he met in the city. The King of Poisons appears on the street. His eyes are empty and he repeats strange words. He suddenly attacks people having dinner on the street, and Lee tries to protect his guests. The area around the palace is immersed in a purple poisonous fog. Yuguo hands out respirators to everyone and shows them how to use them properly. He's forced to fight with his friend, the King of Poisons. As he had predicted, the King of Poisons had also fallen under someone else's control. Yuiguo holds a syringe with a green liquid in his hand, a tranquilizer to stop the King of Poisons. He apologizes to his friend, holds him tightly by the neck, and injects a tranquilizer into his body. The medicine takes effect immediately, the Poison King calms down, and the general sits him down by a tree. The tranquilizer won't help for long, and we need to find a cure so that the king doesn't do anything to himself. The Yadi King's actions scared everyone, and they want Li Yuguo to explain what happened. The King of Poisons is under control. If he touches someone, the person will become a walking corpse and explode. We need to immediately warn Dalao and Dakin to close the borders and not to contact Hyoshin. The queen is at a loss. She wants to find a solution that would prevent innocent people from suffering. Yuguo observes the changes that take place in the King of Poisons. The aura of his body begins to dissipate, still sanctioning danger for him. Gradually it disappears and eventually leaves his body for good. Someone is taking all the life force from the body of the King of Poisons, and we need to find out who is doing it. Three female figures in purple clothes gather energy into a stone above them. The women are completely wrapped in purple clothes, their faces covered by a mask. They are taking this magic performance seriously, and they have three more magic formations to go. Women believe that people are honored to make a donation in the name of a great cause. The sorceresses are tired, but they have to be patient. The peace they want to see will soon come. Women have red eyes, and they are attentive to what is happening around them in the world. Suddenly, red tentacles wrap around them and lift them into the air. Li Yugu approaches them, and he is happy that he was able to track these women. One of the girls says that this arrogant boy dared to attack her. Li Yuguo looks into her eyes. He is not subject to her charms and is indifferent to them. When the women begin to resist, the tentacles pull their bodies tighter. Women know how to manage energy, so they united for a common goal. They concentrate on taking away the aura of this strange guy. The women hold up two fingers and concentrate on this process. A purple snake appears above them, emerging from a purple ball. Li Yuguo recognizes the spirit of the purple snake, a skill he has not developed in himself. The spirit of the purple snake frees the girls from the tentacles. They warn that this guy is not easy. The purple stone takes away the life force of people within a hundred meters. This stone did not fall on the boy. The spirit of the purple snake is circling the clearing. It needs to take the boy's energy. He manages to resist this force. The women wonder why the stone on Nadia's left head and the spirit of the purple snake do not happen to it. Li Yuguo is covered in red spots. He says that an ordinary snake cannot handle him. Anyone who threatens their plan to change the world must be destroyed. The girls come to the aid of their purple snake spirit and use their swords to destroy the strange boy. Li Yuguo snatches a new instrument out of space, which spreads yellow light around him. He's tired of playing with them. He wants to deal with it quickly. He tears the girls' clothes to shreds, exposing their bodies. This does not stop the chief priestess. She attacks Li Yuguo, and he brings his sword over her. The general's gaze is focused on this woman, and suddenly she does a mean and unexpected thing. She is instantly shielded from him by one of the girls, and Lee's sword tears through her body. The girl says that no one should interfere with her master's plan. It lifts up to the sky and disappears in a golden vortex of energy. The witch is very cruel. She hides behind her people. The girls ask them not to kill them. Li Yuguo wants to know who they report to and what their ultimate goal is. One of the girls points her sword at Li and says that the glory of the sun god will last forever. 
The girl who had just asked for mercy suddenly grabs a sword and attacks the prince. He manages to avoid the blow, defends himself, and fights it off. He manages to throw the girl out. She falls to the grass and faints. Li Yuguo wonders why she suddenly changed her character and who the sun god she mentioned is. He tries to remember where he has seen this expression. In the book, there was a sun cult, and the only god its representatives believed in was the sun god. Representatives of the cult believed that they could make the world a better place if they followed the instructions of God. Then the author decided that this idea was not interesting and got rid of the cult. Li Yu Guo throws the girl over his shoulder and takes her with him. The real culprits behind the number of zombies on the street may be representatives of this cult. General Li brought this girl to get all the useful information from her. The palace door opens, the Empress of Medicine enters and asks where the King of Poisons is. She still worries about the Poison King, though she hides it well from others. Out loud, she wishes him misfortune and a quick passing into the afterlife. The King of Poisons opens his eyes, sees the Empress of Medicine in front of him, and is very surprised by her appearance. He continues to say a phrase about the Sun God, and the Empress is frightened by his appearance. She gags him, slaps him, and demands that he shut up. The spiritual power in the body of the King of Poisons is dissipating, and if this is not stopped, he may burst and disappear. She asks Li Yuguo for some high-grade spiritual stones to restore the Poison King. The Empress of Medicine asks the King of Poisons to hold on for her sake and begins treatment. The King's eyes roll, his mouth is open and full of saliva, and he continues to shout about the Sun God. The Empress of Medicine envelops him with the energy of high-grade spiritual stones, and he closes his eyes. Despite the treatment, the King of Poisons still looks like a zombie and keeps screaming. Suddenly he faints, falls on the bed and closes his eyes. The Empress of Medicines temporarily stopped the leakage of his spiritual power, but this is not enough for a complete cure. In order to effectively treat the Poison King, it is necessary to learn more information from the girl brought by Li. She is lying, tied up on the bed, frightened, asking not to be destroyed. Li Yuguo has a plan for what to do with it. General Li enters the girl's room and draws his sword, and she apologizes because she did not mean to hurt him. The queen asks not to scare the girl, and the general reminds her that the girl wanted to kill him. Representatives of the cult have a special stone that allows everyone to feel their power. They give power to the sun god and make the world a better place. Yuguo remembers a stone he saw on the lawn near the girls, and it seems to be him. The girls on the lawn were out of control because they were messengers of the sun god. The girl covers her head with her hands and begins to pray to the sun god. She loses control of herself. The empress of the healer says that the girl's meridians are working well. She is not under control. She seems to really believe in the sun god. Li Yuguo scares the girl, saying that he does not believe in the sun god. The girl begins to pray with tears in her eyes, and the queen asks them to stop experimenting on the girl. He takes away the girl's amulet, which is a protection given to her by the sun god. Members of the cult are not subject to control, which is facilitated by a protective amulet. If you get close to the stone, you can get under its control. The general is confident in the power of the amulet. Li Yuguo goes to the stone. He takes the pendant with him so that the stone does not affect him. A symbol of the sun god is glowing on the grass near a stone, and the body of a girl lies on it. Yuguo and Landman are looking for the stone the general was talking about. He feels energy flows ahead of him, and he has to be careful not to give away his presence. They come closer and see the cult members standing in a circle. The stone moved to the next position because the aura was moved. Representatives of the cult have to move forward, then everyone will obey the sun god. The men of the cult take the girl's body and carry it to their palace. Li Yuguo gently grasps the thousand-armed guardians with his tentacle. They take the men's protective pendants and plan to enter their palace. If they go inside together, it will be easier to escape, even if something happens. Li Yuguo and Landman dress up as cult members and enter the palace. The general cannot even see the spiritual waves in this place with his heavenly eyes. The complete darkness is experienced in a pearly way by a bright light that dazzles the eyes. This change is unexpected for Li and Landman, who squint and adjust their eyes to the light. What they saw ahead was surprising and shocking. There is a stone in the center of the room that takes away energy, and the cult members prey on it. A high priest stands near the stone and prays to it, wishing the sun god a long life. He says that the sun god felt their sincerity. He shows them high respect on behalf of the sun god. It is time for them to serve the sun god they serve. Representatives of the cult, dressed in red clothes, run up the hill to the stone. 
They surround the stone, touch it with their hands, and wish the sun god a long life. Everyone who touched the stone gave it their energy and exploded. Li Yuguo and the Lan men were watching, and this ritual struck them with its cruelty. The high priest announces that soon the fragment of the star will regain its power, and the glory of the sun god will shine everywhere. The cult members are cruel and have killed many people, so the general and the queen cannot act rashly. The cult collects life force in order to give power to the so-called fragment of the star. The high priest mentor says that recently a group of people prevented the arrival of the sun god. They stole the power that the cult members collected for the sun god. The magic ball shows that these people were Ye Ke and Bai Zhishan. Li Yuguo has to find out why his enemies need to steal his life force. The high priest speaks of another enemy of the cult who has harmed the precious messengers and has come to the temple. The priest's eyes are burning with fire. He is trying to find strangers in the temple. He indicates where the strangers are and orders the cult members to destroy them. Since the general and the queen have been exposed, they must leave the cult temple immediately. Queen Nalanmen is the first to fight these monsters. Yu Guo watches his brave wife with admiration. Zombies that obey the sun god are extremely numerous and difficult to destroy. There are more and more of them every minute, and we need to leave this palace immediately. Li Yu Guo and Nalanmen run to the exit of the ritual hall, chased by cult members. The general throws them a surprise in the form of a live grenade. An explosion stops the pursuers and prevents them from destroying the uninvited guests. The couple runs out into a hall, and they see a lot of different moves. Li Yuguo gives his wife a night vision device and asks her to put it on immediately. They are looking at these many tunnels in confusion. They look like mouse holes. The only way is to try all the exits to find the one that will lead out. They are again caught up by aggressive cult members who are ready to kill them all. Li Yuguo and Nalanmen are in trouble. They need to run away immediately. Suddenly someone grabs them and drags them into one of the aisles. They are taken to a quiet place, and the person who rescued them lights a candle. The couple sits on the ground and regains consciousness. They take off their night vision devices. Li Yuguo is speechless when he recognizes his rescuers. They are twin sisters San Chen and Yue Chen, and they are very happy to see him. Sisters San Chen and Yue Chen hug General Li. They are very happy to see him. It has been a long time since they met. Turning to San Chen, Lu Yuguo asks her if she has had a good time since their last meeting. When the three of them have finally talked, the girls suddenly notice Nalin's sister. The queen understands them, says that everything is fine, she is not angry, a lot of time has passed. The general wants the girls to tell the story of how they got into the cult. After the death of their father, their family became weak and would eventually be displaced by other families in the capital. They took the family students to a new place according to the ancestral map, where they isolated themselves from the world and practiced for a long time. Their students are strong enough to return to the top again. A group of strange people in red robes liked their place very much. They had a stone that controlled everything. And the girls were no exception. At some point, they entered a dark world behind an unpleasant sound. They felt each other and were able to resist the sound and come to their senses. They wanted to escape from the cult, but the mountain would not let them go because of the peculiarities of the stone. The girls discovered that believers had been brainwashed with a special stone and that those who regained consciousness were messengers of the cult. Li Yuguo asks if they know a way to destroy this special stone. If a special stone is destroyed, people will be able to regain their consciousness. Representatives of the cult piously pray to their god for a better world. They ask the Almighty Sun God to give light to this world and to redeem all the sins of the world with fear. During prayer, they hear that they are stupid and unpromising people, worse than pigs and dogs. The cult members raise their heads in the direction of the sound. Li Yuguo sits on their stone and says that they are stupid and cannot move it. The eyes of the cult's fans and supporters have no pupils. They are zombified and have no opinion of their own. The high priest shouts that the sun god has been insulted again and that this blasphemer must be caught and destroyed. All the cult members are running after Yu Guo, and it's the twins' turn. They have the advantage. The girls have to blow up the stone, and they use a lot of grenades and explosives for this. They put all the ammunition under a rock and run away from it. Nelliman has to detonate all the explosives with a sniper rifle. She aims the sights at the gunpowder barrel and pulls the trigger. There is a powerful explosion, and it destroys the stone that had been gathering power. Yu Guo manages to break away from his pursuers and runs to his friends. The girls ask him how everything went, but he needs to recover his breath to talk. 
People are coming to their senses. They don't understand why they are in this city and why they are wearing these strange clothes. The explosions do not stop. The tremors are getting stronger and stronger. The general asks how many explosives the girls have planted. The twins say they used all the explosives for the stone. We need to leave this place immediately because everything is about to collapse. They need to get all the people out of this dangerous place as soon as possible. As soon as people reach the exit of the temple, a powerful explosion is heard behind them. The girls didn't know that the explosives were so strong, otherwise they would have put less, and fortunately none of the innocent people were injured. The high priest survived, and he says that the followers of the sun god do not die. He has a part of a magic crystal that he directs at people. The crystal activates and starts absorbing energy again. The crystal is growing in size, which is bad and a threat. Lee Yugul gives the order to take the people away and leave, and he takes care of this old man. The man shouts that they should not run away because the sun god will find everyone wherever they are. He prays to his god and activates the energy that has accumulated in this part of the stone. Lee tries to get closer, but some force does not allow him to do so. This stone is very strong and you can't let the old man control it. The high priest continues to pray to his god, saying that the will of the sun god has come, and today, everyone will be destroyed. Li Yuguo has no choice but to call on the thousand-armed demon for help. The demon approaches the high priest and takes the sacred stone from him. The priest cannot accept this loss. Li has stolen the blessing that the sun god had given him. General Li teases the old man by lowering his tentacle hand close to him and then raising it. The tentacles of the thousand-armed man are more nimble and he fails to grab the stone. He is irritated because the stone is very close and he cannot take it away. The thousand-armed man falls close to the ground, and the man rushes at him to take his amulet. He hits the ground painfully, and Lee laughs that he is weak and can't even catch a stone. Finally, the old man manages to pick up the stone and shouts with joy. Li Yuguo destroys the stone that the high priest has, and it explodes. The explosion destroyed only the lower part of the man's body. A special stone temporarily increased his spiritual strength. Confused by this realization, Li Yuguo turns to his team. Li Yuguo, his wife, and his little girls return to the secret mansion of the Ji family, where they are met by Ji Wushuang. The general says that now is not the time for talking. He needs to go and check the condition of the Poison King. The King of Poisons is lying on his bed, his eyes closed, with the Empress nursing by his side. A special stone healed even the King of Poisons. A jade pendant can block the effects of this stone. With the help of a pendant, you can be cured. This is good news. Li Yuguo is happy that the Empress of Medicine has managed to find a way to cure his old friend. He gives her some jade pendants to help her with her treatment. Many people in Wutian are under the control of the stone. The jade pendant is too small to cure everyone. Li Yuguo promises his wife that he will definitely come up with a way to cure all people. General Li took to the streets of the city to cleanse it of the supporters of the Sun God cult. Shifan Toussaint, with his weapon, also helps his brother rid the city of zombies. Queen Nalanman considers it her duty to free her city from evil spirits. They fulfilled their task with dignity and got rid of all the zombies that came their way. A bony hand with long fingers rests on a holy book and addresses his fellow believers. The cult's supporters failed to protect the sacred stone and allowed people to kill cult members. They deserve the most severe punishment. The priest with the purple light coming out of his eye asks who is responsible for these losses. The cult supporters ask the honorable man to calm down. They will explain everything in a moment. It was all the fault of one person who violated the entire plan, and he is responsible for the destruction of the sacred stone. If this person submits to the cult, it will gain more power. It makes sense. The venerable one sends three members of the cult to talk to the person and convince him to serve for the good of the cult. Two people who also stole energy should also be dealt with. These two people are being asked by the cult's leader to deal with. In the Ji family's yard, Yue Chen asks Yu Guo to see how high she can climb on the swing. Sun Cheng hadn't seen such a sincere smile on her sister's face for a long time. The girl tenderly leans against Li Yu Guo. She hasn't seen him for a long time and misses him. Everything they had experienced before was worth spending time in his arms. She regrets that he has been working hard lately and has lost a lot of weight. Suddenly, a bright bolt of lightning appears in the sky on a sunny day. Everyone is surprised by the appearance of lightning on such a sunny day, which can be a bad sign. The bellows expands, forming a black hole surrounded by red flames. Several representatives of the sun god cult come out of this hole. 
The lightning bolt was a hollow crack through which the cult members were able to get into their estate. The cult representative says that Yui Guo should be punished by the sun god, but if he joins the cult, he will always be under his protection. Yu Guo asks what will happen to him if he does not want to join the cult. The cult representative replies that if he joins, the sun god will give him glory and make him the ruler of this world. The prospect of becoming the ruler of the world is actually very attractive. In order to receive the blessing of the sun god, Li has to come up and bow before a representative of the cult. Yu Guo raises his hands to the sky as if he agreed, but he has an old saying to tell. The proverb says that the thief died of long conversations, and with these words, he strikes a representative of the cult. He did not expect such treachery from Li Yuguo, and his face changed with surprise and anger. A representative of the cult threatens that Yu Guo does not deserve the blessing of the sun god and will be punished immediately. Representatives of the cult raise their hands in the air and call for help from the formation of light. The general is watching this action and wondering what tactics to use. As always, a demonic entity comes to the rescue in the form of a red thousand-armed demon. The demon captures the cult members and they are unable to escape. The general shows the representatives of the Jade Wand cult and tests its effect on them. This time Li Yu Guo is fully confident of his victory over the representatives of the Sun God cult. The tentacles of the thousand-armed man bind its victims, tearing at their red clothes. Almost naked representatives of the Sun Cult threaten Li Yuguo that the Sun God will definitely punish him for their humiliation. Standing next to the thunderous Li, he doubts that these threats will be carried out. The thousand-faced man begins to spin the naked cult members around like a carousel, and they scream in fear. After 30 minutes, he lets them go to the ground and says they can leave. Representatives of the cult threaten that the God of the cult will not leave him unpunished. Li Yuguo took away their protective amulets and threatens to shove their pants down their throats if they say another word. Ye Chiang and Bai Jishan are sitting in front of the red stone, and they recognize that the spiritual power of this stone is indeed unusual. They hope that soon the thousand-faced ghost of Sha will be fully awakened. The Eye of the Underworld warns Bai that the mystical power is somewhere here, and he must be careful. The priestess of the sun god comes out of the stone and asks how these lower people can interfere in the affairs of the wonderful sun god. She extends her hand to them, which radiates solar energy. Bai Jishan stares at the woman, fascinated, not knowing why she came to them. The priestess of the cult took them to punish them for the crime of stealing a magic stone. For Ye Chiang, this was the last step to wake up the thousand-faced demon, and these people prevented it. They are quite strong. Ye Chiang is angry with the aliens for disrupting his plans, and he is ready to fight them. The woman asks him if he is confident in his actions. Perhaps he has overestimated his capabilities. Ye Chiang cannot move. His movements are imperceptible, but they are suppressed without much effort. He can control everything with his mind. No one is his rival, but he doesn't realize it yet. The demon of the lower world's eye tells Bai that Chiang is stupid. They shouldn't stay in a hopeless situation. He proposes to start cooperating with this cult, and the demon will help him with this. Bai apologizes for their actions. They were in ignorance and interfered with the plan of the sun god. They ask for forgiveness. The priestess of the cult asks whether ordinary thieves deserve to be mentioned in the name of the sun god. She says that the theft of spiritual power is unforgivable, and she will get rid of the obstacles in the path of the sun god. The eye of the lower world did not help Bai, but when it was sealed, it felt the pure power from the shard of the star, which is why they are here. Bai Jishan tells the priestess that he knows where the wreckage of the star is. The priestess of the cult looks at him, trying to understand whether he is telling the truth. She lets them go from their motionless state, and they fall to the ground. The woman asks Jishan if he knows exactly where the wreckage is, and he confirms it. The responsibility for the theft of the spiritual power lies with the two of them. Bai Jishan wants to join the cult to find the fragments that are scattered around Hao Tan. Ye Chiang wonders how Bai Jishan knows so much about this cult, and he also wants to join it. The priestess informs us that the cult of light does not accept everyone. Bai reminds us that he can point out where the pieces of the star are. Hao Tan can no longer give spiritual power to the wreckage, but it has a large population, so it is a great place to gather spirits. He adds that this way you can not only gather the power of the spirits, but also find out the location of the wreckage that has solved two problems at the same time. This time, the woman believes them, but if they deceive her, 
they will definitely be destroyed. Bai Zhushan convinces the priestess of the cult that he will live up to her expectations. They pass through a portal in the crystal to another world. The Eye of the Underworld praises Bai and advises him to wait until he can take the shard for himself and gain the desired power. The Jade Cocoon contains the Herb of the Soul, which will help the people of Utan regain their senses. The King of Poisons opens his eyes. He does not remember what happened to him and says that he slept for a very long time. He suddenly sits up on the bed, sees the Empress of Medicine in front of him and asks how she got here. She throws curses at him. He tries to push her away and reminds her that he is a family man. Lee explains that the Emperor's mind was under control. If the Empress of Medicine had not arrived on time, he would have been gone. The Empress of Medicine told the Emperor of Poisons that she did not want to be with him in this life anymore, so he married her sister. They have a relationship and embrace, and Lee did not expect that the plot, which was thought out at the beginning, would develop even better. Representatives of the cult come to the city, paint a formation of light with red liquid on the walls and wish the sun god a long life. Suddenly, two golden comets appear in the sky above the city and approach the surface. Zombies look at these celestial flashes with their transparent eyes. Li Yuguo releases a jade cocoon into the air with his revolver, which is supposed to awaken the inhabitants. Residents return to real life and watch fireworks in the sky. Their consciousness returns, they begin to realize who they are. Looking at their red clothes, they wonder what they are doing here. Li Yuguo is satisfied with the outcome of the operation to save the city and return its residents. The Emperor of Poisons enters the house of a girl, a member of a cult, and she is afraid of him. He tells her not to be afraid, that he will not hurt her, but rather leave her in awe. Nalanmin says that the girl was brainwashed by the cult and it was cruel to do this to her. Li Yuguo assures me that there will be no problems with the Empress of Medicine this time. The Emperor of Poisons comes out of the girl's room and says that he has fulfilled his function. Li Yuguo comes to the girl's house and wants to know what their goal is and where the special stones are. The girl says that these special stones are scattered in different places. Yue Chen misses the city where she could eat hot buns. Yue Guo is met by familiar people. He did not expect to see them here. Ling Huan and his assistant are looking for Yue Guo because they need his help. Several people who called themselves ministers of God seized control of the entire Tianfu Academy. Li Yuguo asks them if they know where the special stone that controls people's minds is located. A day ago, the special stone was taken by Bai Jishan, along with other members of the cult. General Li did not expect Bai Jishan to be involved in this story. Suddenly, the sound of a phone rang in Li's pocket. The queen did not find the location of the special stone, but only a beautiful red magic circle. There are many red stones and representatives of the sun god cult on the Daikin border. The warriors are worried that they may fall under the control of this red stone, but they have red crystals prepared for them by the Lord of Sun. The troops demanded that the uninvited cult members stop and asked them not to blame them for the attack. A venerable priest of the cult directs a magical common at the cult members, which takes away their vital energy. They give it all their vitality and begin to explode. The priest watches what is happening on the outskirts of Daikin with an unwavering gaze. A pterodactyl is flying over the city with Li Yuguo's entire large team comfortably seated on its back. They are watching what is happening in the city, and perhaps the cult's goal is Daikin. It is likely that their base in Yutian was destroyed, so to reload the wreckage they changed their target due to the proximity of Daikin. The bird replies that they have arrived. Daikin looks charming from a bird's eye view. At the bottom you can see the city buildings, neat street lines, and the fog that hangs over the city. Li Yuguo and San Cheng watch the bloody events in the city with concern. One by one, the cult's adherents wish the sun god a long life and explode. This version of the events that unfolded in the city was the worst of all possible scenarios. The adjutant replies to Emperor Sit Wushu that the red crystal had no effect and that the power of theism had spread to Yanjing. In the past, the emperor had been warned about this by a letter from Li Yuguo, and he guessed that this day would come. The emperor gives an order to leave the contaminated area and escort people to evacuate in the direction of Dalao. It seems the emperor cannot spend his last hours of life doing nothing. He can do nothing in this eventful fall, so let Yui Guo take care of the rest. The emperor is sitting in his room at the table and senses his end approaching. The walls shake from the explosions. The palace begins to collapse and doors fly out. He is visited by people in red clothes, representatives of a cult. They greet him by raising their hand in the air and do business with him. 
They put the head of his aide on the table, who did not have time to fulfill his order. Representatives of the cult know that the Emperor knows the location of the star fragment. The Emperor covers his assistant's face with his hand and bids him farewell. He tells the uninvited guests that he will have to disappoint them. He does not know what kind of wreckage they are talking about. Representatives of the cult do not believe him. One of them knows that he has a daughter. He knows where his daughter is, so he advises us to tell him about the wreckage. The Emperor's face changes at these words. He is furious. No one dares to endanger the life of his daughter. A representative of the cult is convinced that Emperor Wu Shu knows much more than one can imagine. The Eye of the Underworld warns Bai Jishan to retreat half a step to the right, and he is surprised but heeds the instruction. Suddenly, a red thousand-armed demon appears next to him. General Li confidently enters the palace. He has come to the aid of his emperor. Li Yuguo apologizes to his master for being late. Emperor Sito Wushu did not expect help, but he is very happy and says that it is not too late. Bai Zhishan thinks General Li is boring and predictable, and he won't get out of here alive today. Yuguo now feels more confident than ever that he can handle the cultists and save the city. The cult member shouts to the general that he is looking for death because he dared to interfere with the sun god. These words do not express any emotions in Yui Guo. He is convinced that evil will be punished. A nine-tailed fox joins the fight against the cult's adherents. Bai Jishan is surprised to see her as part of General Li's team. The entire team that flew in with Li Yuguo joins the fight against the cultists. Bai anxiously asks the Eye of the Lower World what is happening. It promised that everything would be easy. He and several members of the cult are brought to Li, who kneels down and apologizes, saying that he was bewitched. Nalanman asks the general what to do with Jishan, and he replies that for him his brother has long since disappeared. The general decides to kill everyone they have captured. Yuguo and Nalanman feel that a new danger is emerging in the vicinity as the energy in space changes. Shifan Toussaint was the first to feel the emergence of a new power. Behind him, a nine-tailed fox was wounded. A great respected leader of the Cult of Light appears in space. He addresses his supporters and says that they are cowards and cannot deal with ordinary people. Li Yuguo tries to understand who he is and what power he has. The general asks his dust to immediately take the emperor to a safe place. A respected cult leader does not allow them to do so, saying that no one can escape him. With his sour hands, he activates his energy and directs it at people. Queen Nalanman and Emperor Xie Wushu are blown upward by the energy flow and take damage. Yui Gu challenges the great and respected cult leader to a duel. He is full of hatred and a desire to put an end to evil, and he turns to the thousand-armed man for help. Using the energy, the venerable man again uses two fingers to throw the opponent away. Yuguo didn't expect such a blow. He falls to the ground but instantly regains consciousness. His fall scared Nalanman and Sanchin, and they asked if he was okay. The general says he can handle it. This man was able to attack him in midair. A great respected leader of the Cult of Light says that there is no one stronger than him in this world. These words outraged the king of the forest, and he started to make his way to the head of the cult. King Xian will not allow anyone to speak like that in front of the virtuous king he thinks he is. A respected leader squeezes his hand. He needs to immediately free himself from the roots that prevent him from moving. He has never met a wooden man before, and he is curious about the sequel. The respectable king of the forest suffers from the fire sent by the head of the cult. Li Yuguo can do nothing to help King Xian. He watches with pain as he is destroyed. The head of the cult is convinced that inferior people do not deserve the blessings of the sun god. A large, respected cult leader squeezes Li Yuiguo by the neck, and Sito Wushu and Nalanman cannot help him. The emperor decides to make a decision that he has been preparing for a long time. He is not clear whether he really wants to do this and reminds us that it will lead to his death. The venerable one feels the change of energy in the space, and a new target should appear near him. Many firebirds begin to appear around them, merging into a fireball. They are actively attacking the head of the cult, who is crouching down and covering his head from them. Yuguo recognizes this new entity as his emperor. He did not expect help from him. He watches with admiration as it transforms into a beautiful bird. The essence of the Red Lord in the form of a red fire eagle is very strong. After the battle with Li Yuguo's father, the emperor was no longer able to use the force, and today he is in control of it again. The Red Lord throws a heavy purple bag to Li Yuguo, which looks like it contains stones. General Li is flying to meet him. He has something to say to the Lord. A fiery bolt of lightning flashed between him and the Lord, obscuring his view for a minute. The bag ends up in the hands of the cult leader, 
who hopes that it contains something important. The great speed with which the leader of the sun god cult caught the pouch amazed Yuiguo. The emperor says that this great, respected leader of the cult of light is known for his great speed. The Red Lord is ready to fight his final battle to free the world from the cult. He releases his eagle's talons and rushes down, catching up with his enemy. The eagle's essence is one of the strongest in this world, and perhaps it will be able to defeat the leader of the Kitu. The great respected cult leader is expecting an interesting battle with the Red Lord. It spins around its axis and a bright light emanates from it. The head of the cult rises higher. His purple energy fills the surrounding space. General Li is watching the battle in the air from below. His emperor orders him to return to his more important matters. The boy sees that the red-haired lord is being lifted up by the energy of the cult leader. But the lord, with the support of a large number of phoenixes, directs his energy to one point. Li Yuguo asks the emperor for permission to join the battle to increase his chances of victory. The latter reminds him of his promise and turns to the air to continue the fight. There were times when Daikin was exclusively subordinate to him. The pterodactyl flies away to safety with the rest of the big group. Li Yuguo holds the emperor on his lap and promises to take care of the lord. The bird tries to catch up with a large, respected cult leader to prevent them from escaping. The red lord gathers his strength. He was taken from the battlefield early. Surrounded by millions of burning phoenixes, he returns to the cult leader. A venerable cult leader calls two supporters to him and says that they go first. They obey his will. The battle continues. This time the Red Lord has the upper hand, and a ring of fire forms around the cult leader. The circle of fire is a threat to the Red Lord and he needs to defend himself. A large accumulation of energy leads to a powerful explosion with fire and stones being thrown out. A large red sign of the Sun God appears in the epicenter of the explosion. This explosion with the release of fire and stones will not be able to harm the cult leader. The opponents are close to each other and their fight moves to another stage. One of the cult members watching the fight says that Mayan is really chasing him. Bai says out loud that this stupid, respected cult leader is unlikely to be able to defeat Sido Wushu. He feels someone behind him, turns his head and sees the cult leader. He holds a severely wounded red-headed lord in his hands and says that it really took some effort on his part. The great, respected leader of the Cult of Light could have killed him, but he doesn't need to do that now. Bai Jushan kneels down in front of the honorable man and apologizes, saying that the most important thing now is to find out where the wreckage is. The defeat of Sitao Wushu was unexpected for Bai, the eye of the lower world warning him that this force was the strongest in the world. The sack caught by the great, respected cult leader was empty. Zishan was sure that there were stones in the bag, and this news scared him. The great and respected cult leader is furious at the deception and intends to punish Bai. A huge strong bird with passengers on its back continues its flight to safety. The king of poisons tells the two girls, a representative of the cult, that he wants to poison them, but they are useful now. The empress of medicine does not know how to help the king of the forest. She has never treated plants. The king asks for wine. Yuguo is upset because he was unable to save the lord and allowed the king of the forest to be badly hurt. The general recalls how the Lord saved him from the men in black, and now he has to think about what to do next. He tries to recall all the details of his last communication with the emperor. Suddenly he remembers something, puts his hand in his pocket and pulls something out. The Lord outsmarted everyone. That bag was to divert the attention of the cult leader. He carefully takes out a letter and a crystal from a real bag. Yuguo opens the letter. Nalanmen looks over his shoulder and asks him if he has a blank sheet instead. General Lee replies that the letter is not empty, and he carefully examines the paper. To read the Lord's message, I had to use my celestial vision. They have to hurry. They need to get to the Pingjin Pass immediately. At the pass, Yui Guo and his team are welcomed by his ministers and the Emperor's physician. The aide asks General Lee if he knows where the Emperor is now. Li Yu Guo is forced to report the sad news that he was unable to save the Lord. The adjutant listened attentively to the General's story and offered him to go with him. In the room, a young lady named Uyuyo sits in front of a table with food on it. Someone knocks on the door of her room, and she indifferently says that it is okay to come in. Her aide comes in and asks to see who has come to visit her. The girl can't believe her eyes. She's happy to see her brother Yuguo. Uyuyo asks him where her father is, and he says he will return with him. The general apologizes to the princess for failing to protect her father. The girl looks up, her eyes are full of tears, and Yuguo tries to comfort her. Hugging the princess, he swears that the Lord's sacrifice will not be in vain. The cult of light will pay for everything. In the fortress of the Pingjin Pass, 
Li Yuguo reports on the latest developments, and a decision on further actions needs to be made. Lu Feilan asks if no one really poses a threat to the big guy. We need to find out as much information as possible about the wreckage and why the cult collects it. Queen Nalanman asks what the Emperor left for General Li in the sack. The bag contained a letter with no information about the cult and a pill, and Yuiguo did not find anything unusual in it. Shifan Toussaint suggests that this is an accelerator that can destroy the Emperor. Some people assume that the pill will increase strength or remove fear of the respectable. The King of Poison says that the pill has no aura, so it will not increase strength. It looks like a magic weapon. General Li wonders if a pill can be a magic weapon. He focuses on the pill in his inner vision and feels the cosmic energy emanating from it. There is an explosion in the universe in the center of which a mirror vortex is formed. He finally realized why the Emperor had left him this pill. A lord appears in front of them and if they see him, it means that he has gone to another world. The Emperor does not have much time, so now is not the time for grieving. He asks us to listen to him carefully because the fate of the whole world depends on this information. Thirty years ago, in the battle between Hao Tan and Dai Qin, the Emperor led the army to Hao Tan, and he came to the city of the Dragon. There he found out that the property of the previous dynasty was hidden in this city, but the search yielded no results. He found a tomb that had a passage, and he led to a secret underworld of strange creatures that no one had ever seen before. There he met a man who called himself a guardian and guarded the treasure, a fragment of a star, which is the basis of the existence of the whole world. If the Cult of Light gathers all the fragments of the dawn, it will be able to return this world to the Sun God. They need to retrieve the fragments of the star before the Cult of Light finds them and save people. Pointing his finger at General Li, the Emperor says that only he can do this. Yuguo thinks about the Emperor's words that only he can save the world. Reality has long deviated from the original plot, he has changed the order of this world, so only he can prevent a global catastrophe. In any case, it is necessary to stop the cult of light and not allow them to continue to harm people. General Li asked the Empress of Medicine how the king of the forests is feeling. King Xian was cured after drinking two bottles of wine. Li asks General Lu to go with the king to the sage forest and stay there for a while for Wu Yu's safety. The general apologizes to Wu Yu and explains that General Lu will take her to a safe place. The girl knows that she cannot help him, so she would try not to interfere. When everything is over, he will take her to a place where there will be lots of delicious food. The king of the forest takes the princess in his arms and lifts her above the ground. He asks Yuguo to concentrate his forces on the enemy. It's time to say goodbye, and Queen Nalanmen tells them not to worry. They'll manage. Yuguo realizes that their strength is not enough to defeat the Cult of Light, and they need to find reinforcements. Then the events move to the night city of Liao Jing. A child is sitting on the street near the house. There are no adults around and he is scared. The city is in flames with explosions and street fighting going on all the time. Representatives of the Cult of Light flooded the streets and their slogans about long life for the Sun God were heard everywhere. Yuguo and Nalanmen have a bird's eye view of the city and note that it is under the control of a cult. The nighttime sacred fountain of the Lao dynasty is also home to zombies who wish a long life to the sun god. In the cave, Li Juman asks Queen Shui Chao what they should do next. The whole city is under control. The queen believes that she has no reason to worry. No enemy has ever made it to the sacred fountain. Peng Yunhai wants to go out and kill everyone in the cult. He's better off staying in order not to get under control. Suddenly, an explosion occurs in the cave and a hollow crack appears. Everyone turns their heads to the site of the explosion, and discovers that there was a cache in the cave. Yun Yi, the messenger of the Cult of Light, emerges from the void crack, holding a red crystal in his hand. Queen Xu Chao is interested in how he was able to sneak in unnoticed. The vital energy of the turtle dragon begins to flow into the crystal, and it rises above the surface of the earth. Yun directs the crystal at everyone in the cave so they can fall under his control. The turtle king begins to glow with red light and speaks words typical of the cult. Peng Yun-hai takes a machine gun and starts shooting at a representative of the Cult of Light. Firearms do not work on these monsters. Yang Yi holds a crystal in his hand, the energy of which is directed at the man. His face begins to sweat, his face contorted with rage and helplessness. Yan says that now it's his turn to show his skills. A pterodactyl flies over the city, and its passengers are horrified to realize that the city is under the control of a cult. General Li and Queen Nelliman look at the city in flames. 
They are greeted by Queen Xue Chao and Peng Yunhai, and they are happy to meet her. Yang Yi holds up a red crystal and says that no matter how many more people come here, they will not be able to overcome the cult. He brings the red crystal closer to General Li to take away his energy. But the power of the crystal does not affect the man. He is invulnerable to its effects. Yang Yi says that this is impossible and he is seized with rage. The general is fighting a cultist and they must be destroyed. Xiao Chao approaches Yui Guo from behind and begins to court him. She asks if he missed her and why he came back so quickly. The queen always behaves strangely around Yui Guo, and he doesn't know how to explain everything to his wife. While the couple is enjoying their lovemaking, Queen Nalanmen approaches them. She pretends that she is not concerned with their caresses and suggests that they get right down to business. General Lee gives the queen a jade pendant to help her maintain control when interacting with the cultists. The queen has never heard of the cult of light before, but she will do as the general says. Yui Guo and his wife return. Peng Yunhai and Xuo Chao hope to see each other soon. General Li asks his brother to take care of Queen Xuo Chao. The queen notes that Nalanmen is very beautiful, so it is not surprising that Yui Guo continues to think about her. Nalanmen made a scene with her husband, who says it's a misunderstanding, he's indifferent to Xue. The queen painfully takes him by the ear and promises to deal with him after they have completed all their business. Li Yuguo walks to the house, followed by San Cheng, who wants to talk to him. The girl asks what the man is worried about now, and he replies that he is worried that the battle ahead of him will be dangerous and that he will win it. She touches his arm and reminds him of his strength, and they can return to practice right now. Sanchin is incredibly excitable and gentle, sitting on the bed waiting for Yuiguo. After a long break in practice, the man tries to be gentle. Gradually, their caresses become bolder and more passionate, and they enjoy the intimacy. They fail to move to the next level, and Yuiguo says they have no hurry. Sanchin worries that she might not be the best woman for Yuiguo to practice with. Morning comes, and Queen Lamon goes out onto the balcony from her bedroom. She's in a great mood and enjoying herself, when suddenly she has a strange premonition. Her eyes fall on the railing, where a woman's ring and the sign of Yuiguo's power lies. There are many wounded in the city, and it's hard for residents to live in this state especially after the emperor left. Each of them can die at any time, falling under the control of the cult members. In the face of these conversations, General Li assembles everyone in the central square and addresses the residents. He knows that the Lord's departure has had a hard impact on all the townspeople, but now is not the time to shed tears. The city is suffering from the cult of light, and it is necessary to defend and protect the city Otherwise, the inhabitants will not be worthy of the Lord and their dead relatives. Residents agree with Yuiguo, but they are too weak to defend their homes now. The power of each of them is small compared to the power of the Cult of Light, and they need to combine their forces so that they can become stronger. Landman and Li Yuguo sent people to different cities to help them by force. Li suggests that they unite and deal with the people who have taken over their home. They have to take up arms and go to the City of Dragons to defeat the cult. Ye Chiang still hasn't fulfilled his promise to the Honorable One. He promises to make amends soon. The Venerable Ones are furious and no longer believe them, and they throw Ye Chiang and Bai Jishan to the floor. The whereabouts of the fragments are still unknown, and their words are worthless. They have a different plan. Li Yuguo is going to the Dragon City to look for the wreckage. We need to wait for him there. Pavajni believes that Bai is simply stalling for time. Bai kneels down and asks the Honorable Ones to pardon them, and the Honorable Ones decide to give them one last chance. Now the only hope is that Li Yuguo will help him show the way to the wreckage. Respected thinks that soon, the dragon's revenge will be very, very fun. The pterodactyl flies to the dragon city, and Li Yuguo asks the girls who are members of the cult to tell him everything. They tell us that the power of the Venerable is that they control the power of the mind and behavior of people, and they have created a special stone. Landman says that it's difficult with one respectable person, and there are three of them, and Yuiguo wants to know the weaknesses of the respectable ones. The girls try to remember what their respected men's weaknesses are. They stop talking, their behavior changes, and we need to find out why. The poisons given to them by the King of Poisons have run out, and Ji Wu Shuang has no more. Worms crawled out of the girls' foreheads, which the King of Poisons had placed there, temporarily blocking their zombification. The girls again turn into typical cult members with transparent eyes and torn mouths. The drastic change in appearance confirms how strong this cult is. While under control, girls can harm everyone who is near them. 
Li Yuguo orders everyone to step back, holding his sword at the ready. One of the girls shows that he is not in his right mind. The sword does not work against her strength. She throws him away from her with the power of energy, and the boy falls on the bird's back. Lenman asks how he feels, and Li replies that he is fine. He recalls that he wrote in the book so that he could control Moyan's behavior and even unite her consciousness in her body. He realizes that this girl might be a higher being, and she confirms his guess. She tells him not to be nervous. She wants to see what her new toy will look like. It will obviously be fun. Li Yuguo is annoyed by her behavior. She behaves as if she were already God. She says that from now on she doesn't need a toy because she has him. The cult follower stands up to her full height and says that she is leaving them and will wait for them in the city of the dragon. The girl explodes and dissolves into thin air, the pillar of fire gradually dissipating. Due to the blast wave, the team barely held on to the pterodactyl's back. Li Yuguo clenches his palm into a fist and swears that he will definitely find the girl and get even with her. In the Dragon City, the third honored lady sits on the throne. She is still a child, and Bai Zhishan stands next to her. Bai finds the girl and asks her how she is doing. She counts her toys on her fingers, and there are only four of them, so she is not having fun at all. Four toys is not enough for playing, but the rest went to save the soldiers. Pavajna agrees with Bai, but she believes that the more toys, the better. The weather is sunny on the outskirts of the City of Dragons, and guards are stationed at the gate. Li Yuguo is watching the guards through binoculars. There are only four of them, and the gate to the city is closed. Lanaman and Ji Wuji sit next to Li in the bushes, and the queen asks him what he sees. The cult has already captured the Dragon City, and they need to find a way to get inside. Wu Shuang says to rely on him, and he takes on a mission to get into the city. Four people dressed in red enter the city and the guards let them through freely. They are happy to see the ambassador in the city of the dragon, bowing before him in reverence. The venerable cult passes on the blessings of the sun god to its worshippers. The four of them need to find the wreckage as soon as possible and free all these people. The queen notices a noise. A fight is going on somewhere nearby. In an alley, three people in red clothes beat a man lying down and demand to know where his treasures are. This woman was described in the book. Her name is Wang Lao and she helped to find the tomb of the great master. Li Yuguo wants to rescue her, but in doing so, they risk being exposed. This woman lives in the city of the dragon. She might know what they need to do. Adherents of the cult continue to mock the woman, saying that if she does not obey the sun god, she will not live. One of the attackers is pierced by a spear and gives his soul to his god. This is the merit of Queen Nalanman, who stopped the abuse with one brilliant stroke. Jinka has many bruises on her face. One eye is damaged, and her body is mutilated. The woman turned out to be an acquaintance of Nalanman's, and the queen gives her a hand and helps her up. She says that this is not the place to talk. They need to leave the alley as soon as possible. Yu Guo detonates two hand grenades, imitating the explosion of cult adherents. A high-powered blast wave sweeps through the alley and destroys the evidence. The team is hiding in the house and hopes that no one will come for them for now. The woman was badly injured by the perpetrator's blows, and her strength is leaving her. Li Yu Guo holds her hand. Her meridians are damaged. She will soon leave this world. Wang Lao gives the queen a treasure inherited from her ancestors. It is connected to the treasure of the Dragon City, and it must be preserved. The women embrace Lao as losing his last strength. The queen is sorry that they met under such circumstances. They need to hurry up and find the wreckage. They can't let Lao's sacrifice be in vain. They need to go to the place marked on the map of the Dragon City. They entered the temple, and according to the map, the place they were looking for was in the temple. They carefully walk around the temple, studying every corner of it, and they have to find the treasure. Due to his carelessness, Lee steps on a piece of rain, which began to move under his weight. A statue of a golden dragon appears from the floor, and Yuguo tells everyone to flee. He cautiously walks closer, sees the button on the dragon, and decides to press it at his own risk. A secret entrance opens before them, and they have found what they were looking for. An aircraft is flying over the house where the friends are staying, and it is being monitored. A young lady is sitting in this airplane playing hide-and-seek and finding new toys. All four of them go down into the dungeons of the Dragon City, and on the way they come across many different bones. The air in the dungeon is damp, the smell of rot is palpable, and there are bones everywhere. Li Yuguo reminds everyone to be careful not to fall into the trap. The bones may be the remains of those who wanted to rob the dungeon and the queen feels that something is wrong. You can't relax in the dungeon. You need to find the wreckage as soon as possible. 
they are suddenly attacked by a skeleton, which scared the friends, but fortunately they managed to successfully fight it off. It's very strange that the skeleton could come back to life. There is a reformation that revives the dead when uninvited people come. Chiffon Toussaint shows us to look ahead. Something unusual is happening there. There are a lot of living skeletons ahead. Their eyes are glowing. They look like zombies. Yuguo takes out a mortar and offers the living skeletons a taste of the weapon. The explosions of mines break the skeletons into separate bones and mix them up. When the smoke clears after the shots, Yuguo sees another unusual thing. Nalanman also discovered that something was wrong with his bones. The bones begin to attract each other, the skeletons unite and become whole again, and energy passes through them. It seems impossible Li Yuguo thinks they are meeting in the right place. The reanimated skeletons look terrifying, their eyes glowing like lanterns in the darkness of the dungeon and their bodies conducting colored energy. The friends get together, arm themselves with spears, and decide to move on cautiously. They come across an unusually large number of skeletons on their way, which they chop up. While the bones are being reattached to the skeletons, the friends can move on. What they see in the dungeon scares them, but they support each other. The further they go into the tomb, the more terrifying skeletons they encounter. Finally, they reach the last room where there is a dragon skeleton, and it may take a long time to recover. Li Yugu feels that the thing he needs is close by. The energy around the dragon's bones increases, and they begin to gather into one solid skeleton. There is a box between the pelvic bones of the dragon skeleton, and when the bones come together, it will be impossible to get it out. The queen saw Yuiguo approaching the dragon skeleton and asked him to be careful. He comes closer, and he has to climb up to the top of the stairs to get the box. He knocks out the box, to which the dragon's bones have already begun to attach. He manages to get the box, and the skeleton starts to fall. Yuigoi manages to jump away before the dragon's skeleton falls. It was not easy to handle this thing. The queen wants to see what's in the box. Maybe there's something that can revive the skeletons. They open the box and find two connected golden puzzles. The queen asks what it is. She has never seen anything like it. Yuguo takes the puzzles out of the box. These are things that shouldn't be in this world. Something incomprehensible is happening. The general twists the puzzles in his hands and does not understand how they will fit together, so he takes them apart. The ground under their feet is divided into two grooves, and a chasm forms between them. They did not expect it to form, and all four of them fall down into this abyss. They are picked up by the tentacles of the thousand-armed man and cushion their fall. When the friends reached the bottom of the gorge and recovered from their adventure, Chiffon Tuxing saw something interesting. They enter a room filled with treasures left behind by the Holy Dragon Dynasty. Li Yuguo has a hunch that there are fragments among the scrapes. As they get closer, they feel as if someone is pushing them forward. Li Yuguo finds a box among the treasures and opens it. In the box, there is a juggernaut. It does not belong to this world. He tries to understand how these treasures will help them find the wreckage. Landman the Rabbit found a beautiful ancient spear among the treasures. It is a spear of primordial chaos. It is very valuable, just like the sword of the sun and moon. Shifan Tuxing finds a long-lost scroll of illusions. Ji Wushuang gets himself a wonderful sword. Everyone found what they needed, weapons or a secret book, which raises suspicions that someone might have known they were coming. Li Yuguo observes a strange phenomenon. The treasures begin to evaporate. The pile becomes smaller and smaller. Treasures disappear altogether which may mean that one person can take only one thing. A large golden chest appears in front of them, with a golden mist leading to it. At the Pingjing Pass, the emperor said that the tomb had a passage. Perhaps this is the passage to the underworld that the emperor was talking about. This will be their last battle. They have to take possession of the wreckage and not let the Cult of Light win. Li Yuguo bravely takes the first step, hoping to finally find the wreckage. All four confidently move forward with the belief that they will soon defeat the cult. Ye Chiang sits in the training room of the Cult of Light, holding a skull in his hands. Suddenly the skull cracked. Apparently it could not withstand the energy onslaught on it. Ye Chiang is forced to stop practicing. The yogi is very angry. He throws away the cracked skull. He does not know how to fully awaken this cursed thousand-faced demon. The reason for his failure is by... Who knows that the millennial demon will increase the power of body grabbing, but does not want to. Bai feels the energy fluctuations around him. Someone is approaching him. He kneels down and greets the great honorable man. And yet Cheong notices him, not expecting to see Bai here. 
A large, respectable man appears in the training room and asks Ye Chiang why he still has no results. For a great man of honor, all the people of this world are garbage. Bai asks the big man why he came here, and he replies that a few people below him found the wreckage. It's time for Bai Zhishan and Ye Chiang to act and fulfill their promise. Li Yuguo sleeps on a green lawn in the shade under a tree. He opens his eyes, wants to know why he fell asleep and where everyone else is. Apparently, the portal teleported them from the underground cave to different places. He notices a strange flower near him and leans closer to it to examine it. An unknown beast jumps out of the grass at him with this flower growing out of its forehead. The beast attacks Yuiguo and he is forced to defend himself using his sword to strike at his strong body. The beast has a cluster of purple balls in its mouth. Its teeth are too close to Yuiguo. He releases a stream of energy to Wu Yuguo, who moves to a safe distance. Conventional attacks cannot harm this monster. The spiritual power of the beast is concentrated in the flower, and it protects this monster from damage. The flower radiates energy and should be cut off as soon as possible. Yuguo needs a plan on how best to approach the beast and stay safe. He manages to reach the beast's head and chop off the flower, which causes great pain to the animal. Wonderful flees from the battlefield and buries himself in the ground where he came from. New flowers are growing in that place. They are red in color and have dangerous teeth. Yuguo runs away from them. They try to bite his legs, injuring him. He sends down on them the flames of the white sun in which they must disappear. The fire reaches the surface and burns the dangerous flowers they have to burn. When the flame has died down, the flowers continue to open their mouths and look for prey. They did not burn in the flames of the white sun, which violates the laws of the universe. It's good that Yuguo can ask Ali's mom for help and find a remedy for these flowers. He buys a barrel of herbicide and sprays it over a lawn of flowers. The herbicide rain causes the flowers to lose their strength. They sink to the ground, and a yellow liquid flows out of them. Dangerous flowers destroyed, Yuiguo goes out into the clearing under an umbrella. The monster did not disappear. It grew a new flower and returned. She attacks Li Yuguo, but he already knows how to defeat her and eliminates the danger with one punch. The general needs to hurry up and find his wife, as she might also meet such a terrible monster. The energy field around him is changing, indicating that a new danger is approaching him. He is surrounded by several new monsters that also need to be destroyed. Queen Nalan Min is holding her stomach. She has been cut and is covering her wound with her hand. Her condition is critical. She feels very bad. It seems that she will no longer be able to help her husband. She faces a huge monster, and she has to defeat it and save the world. As usual, Yui Guo came to her aid and he flew up to the dragon's head. Turning his head to his beloved, he tells her not to worry, he has already come. The queen can walk away. She continues to hold her wounded stomach. She is very sick. Every time Yui Guo comes to her aid, she feels that she is in his way and pulls him down. She feels worthless and does not want him to sacrifice his life for her. As she watches Yui Guo fight the dragon, she thinks that it will be better if she disappears. After defeating the monster, General Lee catches his breath. He feels that his wife is fainting. He finds himself at her side to help her and save the queen. Yu Guo takes his wife's exhausted body in his arms. He is confused, but he needs to save his beloved. The general buys Alamam the necessary medicines and tools to save his wife. In the clearing, using all his knowledge and skills, he provides her with medical care, convinced that he can save her. With tears in his eyes, Yu Guo asks his wife to return to consciousness. But his wife doesn't respond to his manipulations. She seems to have already left, and Yuiguo apologizes to her. Yuiguo realizes that he is powerless, unable to save and protect his wife. In his novel, Nalanman dies in the arms of her husband, and perhaps what is written in the book cannot be changed. The ocean ring, which San Chung had for hundreds of years, falls out of his wife's pocket. He picks it up, the ring begins to emit light, and he has a hunch as to why the ring has such power. A bright light comes from the ring, and he shields himself from it with his hand. His thoughts take him to another reality, where he searches everywhere for his wife. He realizes that this is just an illusion. He cries and asks Nalanman not to leave him. Memories take him back to the beginning of the relationship, when they were just starting their family. He recalls how beautiful his wife was during their marriage. It seems to him that this is all happening in reality, and he starts to cry from emotion. Yuiguo is overwhelmed with tenderness and love. He hugs his wife and tells her how he feels. It seems to be a dream, he called Landman many times. But she did not wake up. He was afraid that he had lost her. His wife is very beautiful. Even the clouds and flowers dressed up for her. 
He calls her to him to dress her in the best flowers and give her his love. Nalanman is the most important person in his life, and he will always find her. His wife also declares her love for him and promises to be by his side in all his trials. The kiss takes them to the seventh level of the mystery of love and concubine. Finally, Nalanman regained consciousness, and Uiguo managed to save her. They look at each other with loving eyes as if they were seeing each other for the first time. The ocean's eternal love rings of hundreds of years were meant for Yuguo and Nalanman. The guy makes a promise to himself to change the ending of the book and let his beloved live. They hug and Yuguo is happy that Nalanman is okay. Yuguo and Nalanman continue their search and move through the ruins of the sacred Dragon Canyon. The canyon is teeming with bats, which pose a threat and create additional obstacles. Yuguo looks back at his wife, worried that she is not keeping up with him. She is fine, she has mastered her wings and is keeping up with him. The two of them successfully fend off bats attacking them. Another huge bat is destroyed and falls to the ground. He remains lying in the middle of the canyon and the couple moves on. Finally, they reach the end of the canyon. It was very long, they spent a lot of time on it. They come to a clearing by a tree and Yuguo recalls that this is the place where he was transported from the dragon's cave. They need to figure out which direction to move forward and Yuiguo picks up on the energy. Yuguo sees a ray entering the ground near the tree. Landman asks him to look ahead. She saw something there. An old man is sitting by a tree with a board with black and white checkers in front of him. It turns out that someone lives in this secret place. Perhaps this man is the guard about whom the emperor spoke. Yuiguo approaches him and says hello, and the man says that he was waiting for someone to play a game of homka with him. He invites Yuguo to sit down at the gambling board and strokes his beard. Yuguo agrees, maybe this man can tell us where the wreckage is. The man places the checkers on the board, and they start playing. The first move is made by the man who takes a white checker and rearranges it on the board. Li Yuguo feels an unusual energy emanating from the board and the pieces. The man makes another move and says that he knows why the boy came. The figures on the board begin to radiate energy, as if they are subordinated to their world. Yuguo is surprised by this because he did not know what would happen in this place. The man says that the fragments of the star are the core of the world. It must be used wisely. He cannot give it away until he tells its story. Thousands of years ago, there was Yang Mo, a strong and cruel demon god. He committed a lot of lawlessness. People were afraid of him and avoided meeting him. To get rid of the demon, all the gods united sealed his power and put him into a deep sleep. Yang Mo's disappearance did not restore peace. His followers rebelled and searched for the wreckage, trying to bring the demon back to life. They organized a cult of light and used Yang Mo's forbidden skills to open a portal to spread their power. Their ultimate goal is to collect all the pieces and use their power to wake up Yang Mo. Yuguo realizes that the cult of light did not originate in this world, but in other worlds. Yuguo asks how to get the pieces. If her husband is a guard, he can give them to her now. The man explains that if there is a conflict between opposing forces, he has to hand over the wreckage to the winning side. This is the law of the world, and he is powerless against it. He is only fulfilling his duties and has no opportunity to interfere in this. The man says that it seems an opposing force has come. The monsters have indeed broken in and are running towards them. Yuguo and Landman keep their weapons ready. Voices can be heard through the smoke, asking them not to attack them. Shifan Tusen and Ji Wu Shuang came to them in the form of monsters. Yuguo doesn't want them to be enemies. He doesn't plan to go with his brothers to pick up the pieces. A large number of cult members are approaching with Ye Chiang in the lead and a small, venerable woman with them. Finally, the two forces will meet in their final battle for the wreckage. The cult supporters came very quickly. Apparently, a few important people were watching their movements. The young, venerable one is glad that they finally met again. She has heard that the reward in this game is wreckage. Ye Chiang is seething with rage as he meets his oldest and worst enemy again. He is sure that this time he will destroy it, so he immediately rushes into battle. The big honcho stops him, and he returns to his starting point. The big honcho kicks Ye Chiang out, saying that this garbage should not stand in his way. Yu Guo sympathizes with his enemy. He has a hard life in the cult. Ye Chiang is lying on the ground. He does not hide his hatred for Li Yu Guo and cannot do anything to him. The girl shouts that she wants to start first, but the older ones say that then they will have nothing to play with. The big respectable man tells the girl that they will start and then give way to her. The girl agrees. She wants the cultists to let their enemies play with them first. Everyone is ready to fight. Everything is happening very quickly. There will be no draw in this battle. 
The Great Venerable One is ready to use all his strength against his enemies and pick up the pieces. The Big Respectable is also ready to fight. They need the wreckage to bring back Yang Mo. There is an explosion and an order to disperse in different directions, and a big battle begins. Queen Nalanmen and Yu Guo fight side by side. The Queen holds the Spear of Primal Chaos. Li has his Mace of the Sun and Moon. They find themselves in front of the first big, respectable man, who makes no movements, waiting for the attack. They coordinate their actions and strike at him from different sides. The Spear of Primordial Chaos is approaching the respectable one, and it moves to a safe distance. Queen Nalanmen bravely fights back and shouts at the honorable man that it's time for him to go to hell. The first big honcho suddenly comes in from behind and stabs Landman in the back. He managed to catch the queen by surprise, holding a spear and flying down. Yuguo manages to catch his wife in his arms. She is not injured, and her spear sticks nearby. He looks at her with concern, asks how she feels, and she says she's fine. The big man was surprised that the girl was not even hurt by his blow. Their love and a very strong recovery technique helped them. They hold hands, and the great honorable one knows that their strength and gentle language are weapons. They reach the fourth style of the love and concubine secret. This style is eternal and cannot be changed by hand. It is able to withstand great strength. Their equipment blocked one of the strongest attacks of the big guy. Spouses can resist the attacks of a big man, but they do not have enough strength to completely suppress him. They use a new technique against him. Their energy is directed to one point. They fly in different directions. The big guy is trying to figure out what's going on and who to attack first. The couple used a technique called bells and whistles, which is used to distract attention. Suddenly, Yui Guo appears at his side, and the great honorable man must make the most of this chance. He says that he will take his life and throws a punch that goes through Li but does not harm him. The big guy won't understand why the opponent remains unharmed. Suddenly, a gun appears near his forehead, ready to blow his head off. Yui Guo hadn't used puppets for a long time, and the big guy couldn't recognize her. The shot to the head turns out to be fatal. The great venerable man closes his eyes and falls down. Yuiguo does not say goodbye to him. Shifan Tuxing and Ji Wushuang are fighting against the big one. The bigwig says it's ridiculous to try to take over the wreckage with such small forces. The two brothers are wounded and exhausted from the battle with the other big one. Gathering their strength, they try again and again to destroy it and send it to the next world. The power of the great venerable one is greater than that of the two brothers, so she easily repels them. She throws them away from her, and they get injured again. They are exposed to the cop's magic stone, and their eyes become transparent. This time they manage to resist and regain control. Shifan says that a slap from a big honcho can hit you right in the soul. The opponents of the second big one took a lot of damage, but they are still hanging on. Apparently they are using some strange upgrade technique. Sitting in a magical flower, Shifan offers the great honorable one to try a new kind of weapon. She thinks that he is trying to distract her and sneak up on her unnoticed. It easily monitors two enemies simultaneously and responds to their attacks in time. Ji Wushuang stabs her with his sword, and she entangles him in chains. Valika has already defeated one opponent, and she has another one coming up. She sends him to the next world for the glory of the sun god, chains tightly clutching his neck. The big honcho turns her head and sees that the one she had just chained up is attacking her from behind, unharmed. She says it's impossible, he should have been in the back of the house by now. The big honcho is furious, calling her opponent names and telling him not to underestimate her. Shifan Toussaint smiles slyly as he immerses himself in a viscous green mass. This mass begins to entangle the other big respectable one who is not familiar with this substance. Ji Wu Shuang says that a great honoree should feel the deep meaning of the martial arts of the Ji family. He uses his family's secret technique against her, called the Yan Mo Dark Dragon Strike. A powerful explosion occurs, and lava and hot stones erupt from its center. A crater is formed at the site of the explosion, and it turns out that Shifan has copied Ji's appearance and managed to pull off this trick. Before he left, Shifan took a branch from the old Sage King, added it to the treasures, and successfully controlled the second venerable one. Li Yuguo and Lanmin run to them, and Ji Wushuang says that they are fine. Li is happy that they managed to deal with the biggies and can pick up the pieces. They hear someone applauding them, and they turn to the sound. The young venerable woman is happy. She is amused that the four of them have defeated both of them. Unfortunately, the girl cannot play this game with them because she is too weak. All four of them are in the clearing, and Lee can't help but feel that they haven't done everything. 
Suddenly, a second large, respectable woman appears in front of them, with no injuries on her body. Shifan is surprised that this old woman didn't even damage anything. It's impossible. A little further on, the first big venerable one is restored. It is filled with energy. He is holding his head. There is a bullet mark in his head, but the energy is gathering to him. Li Yuguo underestimated his opponents. The battle is incomplete, and the fate of the wreckage is still unknown. The second great venerable one says that the opponents do not have enough strength to fight their cult. They will never be able to defeat them. The first big honcho threatens that they will now take the punishment of the sun god. The big venerable ones take to the air. The four friends prepare for an attack and another battle. The great venerable ark envelops itself with the power of the sun god and puts protection around it. A wall grows between them, preventing the four from striking out. A large, venerable woman throws large stones over the wall in different directions, capable of destroying anyone who gets under it. My friends can't see which direction the stones are coming from, and it's extremely difficult for them to dodge them. Shifan Toussaint and Ji Wushuang want to fly over the wall and attack the second big venerable one. The woman senses this maneuver and stops them with a wave of her finger. They hit the invisible barrier put up by the Great Honored One and fly back. Shifan Taosun and Ji Wushuang find themselves in a green, viscous substance again and are warned to be careful because the skills of the Venerable Ones are unusual. Ji Wushuang flies to fight against the Great Two Great Honorable Ones. He feels the fluctuations of the force around him. It is unusual. Suddenly he feels a blow to his stomach, a fiery gear spinning around its axis. A big one damaged his vital organs. He is very sick. The great venerable ones consider the game over. The wreckage of the star belongs now only to the sun god. The three brothers are disappointed with the outcome of the battle and do not want to accept defeat. Yuguo has a secret plan, and it's time to put it into action. He takes something out, and the respectable ones ask what he is holding. He found this mirror among the treasures of an ancient family of dragons. The rainbow mirror is the only magical treasure of this world. It can teleport on a large scale. The brothers' reinforcements appear on the lawn to help defeat the cult members. The big respectable ones laugh. They are convinced that even this many people do not pose a threat to them. Suddenly, an attack begins. The bigwigs are not expecting it. They will know what is happening. It seems that the great dignitaries are puppets in someone's hands, juggled by someone. The head of the southern witch kingdom, Wu Heiju, did not expect that the puppet technique could still be used. The strongest monk of the south, Nan Yun, joins the defense and will not allow this world to be destroyed. Shifan Tusan asks Li if he is okay, and he replies that he is fine. The Empress of Medicine asks Li Yuguo to stay still as she heals his wounds. Li had long known that this mirror was among the treasures, so he asks San Chen to gather the others to confront the forces of evil together. The young lady is happy that a lot of people have come and she is having fun. She calls on the cult's followers to join the battle and make the game even more fun. Adherents of the cult, wishing the sun god a long life, are ready to fulfill her whims. The backup team is ready to immediately send all the cult's adherents to hell. A fierce battle breaks out. Many of the cult's supporters explode, and many are injured. Ye Chiang appears on the battlefield, finds Li Yuguo, and intends to finally destroy him. But suddenly he gets caught in a stream of fiery energy and retreats. The next to enter the fray are twin sisters San Qin and Yue Qin. They oppose Ye Chiang and are ready to kill him. Two large fiery phoenix birds fly toward Ye Chiang. Ye tells Sang Qin that if she obeys him, he will let her live on. Yue Cheng replies that the fact that his sister dated him does not honor him. Ye Chiang is angry because San Qin left him for Yue Guo in the past, and today he will make her pay for it. The girl swings a sword at Kun, and he releases three living skulls in his defense. They do not save him. The girl's blow reaches its target and causes an injury. Yuechen says that today Ye Chiang will pay for all his crimes. The guy was enraged by her attack, and he is sure that he will kill both girls. Ye Chiang summons the mouth of the abyss to help, which directs its stream of energy at the girl. The guy steps aside, the flow of energy increases and burns everything he touches. The sisters stand as a mountain for each other, their essences always on the alert. Two fiery phoenixes block the flow coming out of the mouth of the abyss and block it. Someone is exhausting the power of the mouth. It irritates Ye Chiang. The girls should have been destroyed by now. Ye Chiang recalls Bai Jishan's strange behavior and suspects that he is the one who is taking his power. The girls strike with swords from both sides, and Ye Chiang is mortally wounded. They turn around to see if they have succeeded in destroying the enemy. Ye Chiang is lying on the grass. He is dead. The girls can go help the others. 
Adherents of the cult go to the other side en masse under their wishes for a long life. These people are not in their right minds. They are under control and are dying for other people's beliefs. Shifan Toussaint asks Ji Wushuang how many followers this cult has, and he replies that it is necessary to simply destroy as many as possible. Two great venerable men are watching the battle from a distance, and it seems to them that the cult is winning. The head of a southern witch kingdom sticks needles into a voodoo doll. The first great venerable feels these injections. They pierce his body and form holes through which his energy leaks out. The second big one makes certain manipulations and directs this energy in the opposite direction. The head of the southern kingdom of witches is injured. The big one is thoroughly satisfied with her work and is looking for her next victim. The stone giant throws stones at the heads of the great honorable ones and he punches them. Its power is extraordinary. Its power is very great. It is capable of causing destruction. He raises his fist over the big dignitaries and they build a protective barrier around him. The defense is doing its job. It becomes more and more difficult for her to do so and the stone monster increases its strength. The first big honcho came to the rescue. He healed his wounds and returned to the battle. Together, the two of them tackle the stone giant and destroy it. The greats are catching their breath after a hard fight. They realize that they underestimated the strength of the opponent. Emperor Sito's brother Wushu wants to avenge his death. He unleashes the power of the dragon on them, and the honorable ones here build a defense, but it does not help them. Yugo and Landman hold hands and run to his aid. They reach the next, sixth style of the secret of love and concubines. The second venerable sees this pair, and she feels that their strength has increased again, and it has become more difficult to fight them. Another powerful explosion is heard, and stones mixed with fire fly in the air. A huge crater has formed at the site of the explosion, with two elderly men lying in its center, and the smoke is gradually dissipating. Situ's brother Wushu says that the enemies were strong, but they managed... Yuguo is allowed to finish with the Honorable Ones. The Great Venerable Ones lie at the bottom of the gorge, convinced that one day the Sun God will be praised everywhere. Li Yuguo is standing in front of them, swinging a fire sword to cut off their heads and take their lives. Landman can feel the energy flowing away from his enemies. Li also felt that something unusual was happening to him. He touches his neck with the sword and changes occur in his mind. Landman feels that he is losing control, runs to him and asks him to come to his senses. He holds his neck and says they wanted to take control of him. The young honorable man states that two great honorable men have lost. It's his time. He can play. He holds the heads of the important ones, says that they are useless and he will definitely punish them later. The young honorable man flies away but tells his enemies to wait. He will definitely return. He shines his purple eyes slyly and says that he almost forgot something. Yuiguo and his entire large team are watching him from the ground, and he asks them not to forget him and to wait for his return. Suddenly, Li Yuguo and Nalanmen cross their swords and look at each other. A red vortex forms in the sky, and the young man disappears into it. He overthrows the two older respectable ones and says it's time to punish them. They ask to be given another chance to destroy their enemies, and the young venerable man says that they must not talk about their failures. Children who lose must be punished. They ask to let them go, but the young man says he doesn't want to. He demands that they obey, eat candy, and become very strong. In the sinkhole, Yuiguo and Nalan men begin to fight to the death in earnest. They cross their swords, which begin to share their energy and glow. Everything around them is pink, and they are influenced by this energy. Their lovemaking and concubine-to-concubine -concubine techniques have brought them back to consciousness, but the others are under control. Li Yuguo is attacked from behind by Shifan Tusin, who is also under control. Two phoenixes appear in the sky. Fire and moon dust. Zenshin and Yueken have returned. The girls tell him that they have dealt with Ye Chiang, and Li warns them to be careful, that the big man has taken control of everyone. Li Yuguo watches the fight between those who came to his aid, and wonders if he will be able to defeat them all. The young gentleman wants to start the second round of the game immediately. The greats are returning with renewed vigor and in new bodies. They mercilessly destroy everyone who gets in their way. The young venerable man watches the massacre from a height and is greatly amused by this game. Bai Jishan walks among the bodies. It looks like a real hell. He will not let Ye Chiang die. The cult's adherents have not discovered the true abilities of the special stone. And soon the power of E will become the power of Bai. All those who manage to get rid of the control enter the second round of the battle under Li Yuguo's leadership. The big one is now even more spectacular and brutal comes into play. 
She manages to wound Li Yuguo and Nalanmen, and they can get back under her control. The head of the Southern Witch Kingdom and the strongest monk in the South ask for permission to help them. A large stone monster returns to the battle, leading reinforcements. The stone monsters attack the big venerable one, who forms an energy defense around himself and defends himself. It's a lot of fun for a young big guy to watch such a big crowd fight. A nine-tailed fox grabs a large venerable woman and has sex with her. Yuguo points out that the venerable ones have become stronger, but their behavior has become worse, and the young venerable one controls them so that they destroy each other. He knows that the Supreme Honorable One can control only two Honorable Ones. He cannot control everyone. Yuguo gives the order to immediately kill the young Honorable Man who is leading this battle. Sung Chung and Yo Chung are ready to start implementing this order by joining forces. The young Venerable Man is happy that someone decided to play with him. The Great Venerable was able to absorb the attack of the two fiery phoenixes very easily. For some reason, San Chung saw the attack on the Great Venerable Yuguo late. There was an explosion nearby, and Yui Guo did not have time to react and was injured. He says that he is fine, but we need to think about how to deal with the big guy. Yui Guo asks the King of Poisons what poison can kill the King of Poisons, and he answers that the poison must enter his body through a wound. The King of Poisons gives Yui Guo poison for the big honcho, and the boy thanks him. He has planned everything and hopes that his plan will work. The big venerable one doesn't give up easily. He throws a punch to Yui Guo's stomach. Li Yuguo pretends to be injured and closes his eyes. The big honcho feels that he is suddenly using his power, although there is no reason for this. His body begins to cover with red spots. He screams in pain. Venerable has a portal that allows his fists to reach his enemies. The portal then instantly closes and creates the illusion of an airborne attack. It was the same with the bullets. He used the portal to block the bullets. The armor protected Yui Guo from the venerable man's blow, and he injured himself on the spikes in the armor. The Venerable One is an ordinary man, so the poison worked on him and he died. The young Honorable Man was disappointed that one of his toys had disappeared, but he had many more. The Big Honcho sneaks up behind Yui Guo and has lustful plans for him. It gets cold in the air, and the Queen of Snow and Ice appears. It turns a large, venerable tree into an icy bump. It freezes. Someone calls out to Li Yu Guo and he turns his head to see who is calling him. He sees Zhui, the Queen of Snow and Ice, and she has returned to him. The queen comes out to Li Yu Guo through the portal of the rainbow mirror. The young big man is happy that he still has his toys. The big honcho is trying to get up and see whose toy is stronger. He flies towards the opposing team to take revenge. Suddenly, a large turtle, the son of a turtle dragon, appears in the middle of the field. The young venerable man had never seen such a beast before and opened his eyes in amazement. Yu Guo is surprised to see him in such a city. He did not expect him. Queen Shuo Chao says that when the turtle heard that Yui Guo needed help, he drank all the water from the holy waterfall in one gulp. A young respectable man sees a large turtle and wants to know what is under its shell. If a big honcho begins to radiate the energy of a stone through his eyes, there is a great risk of getting under his control. Li Yu Guo notices this and warns everyone to be careful. The turtle creates a protective shell around itself and avoids the explosion. Li Yu Guo asks the turtle if he's okay, and he returns to the ground. The young honorable one is having fun. He takes the power from the two big honorable ones. It seems that the young venerable man is just a child, but you have to be careful. He is very strong. The boy says he is just a child and wants to be played with. Combining the power of the venerable, he is extremely strong and has dealt with many of his enemies on his own. The queen of ice and fire flies to them to protect her lord. She puts ice stones all over the field, and the young man is amused by this entertainment. His claws reach Qin Shui, he wounds her, and runs off to have more fun. The queen of snow and ice loses her strength, but she is allowed to recover. She activated the lonely cold of her icy soul and regained her strength. It continues to freeze everything around, and the young gentleman finds himself in a block of ice. A large turtle accidentally eats this piece of ice in which the young venerable man was frozen. The turtle says that the more he drinks, the stronger he becomes. Yuguo and Nalanmen combine their strength and use the double sword technique. The young gentleman managed to get out through the turtle's shell, and he says that this game is great. He likes it. The double sword technique is very strong. The energy of the two swords is combined into one and directed at the young gentleman. But its energy is stronger. It destroys the power of the swords and inflicts great damage on Yuguo and Nalanmen. 
Queen Shui Chao is horrified by what she sees and realizes that they have no chance of survival. The Queen of Fire and Ice, who has just returned, loses her lord again. Sisters Sanchen and Yue Cheng can do nothing to help Yui Guo and Lanmen. The young venerable man stands by the bodies of his enemies and says that the game is over. He has won. Yui Guo's angry friends want to take revenge for his destruction and attack the young honorable man. He crosses his arms, his deadly energy directed at them. With a few movements, he inflicts many different wounds on his enemies. Now he is finally confident of his victory. He has no opponents left. Yu Guo lies on the ground and says goodbye to his life. He was unable to defeat the Venerable One, unable to save anyone. He apologizes to his wife for failing to protect her. Nalanman says that there is no need to apologize. There are many different moments in human life. He defended her many times, and meeting him was the happiest event of her life. Yu Guo regrets that he could not change what was written in the novel, and they end their lives. With the last of their strength, they hold hands, and a golden aura forms around them. Yui Guo's energy is leaking out through the wound on his back, and he is getting weaker and weaker. A big, respectable man ran to the wreckage guard and said that he had won. The wreckage was his. The wreckage guard looks down and says that the game is not over yet. Two swords pierce through the body of the young, great, venerable man. He goes back to see who did it, and sees that Lanman and Yu Guo are still alive. He says that he is the main character. He cannot die. He will not give his wreckage to anyone. The swords are taken out of his body, and red liquid begins to run from his wounds. He falls to the ground. He's hysterical. He shouts that he won the game. They cheated. He destroyed them. The rank of Martial Emperor allowed Li Yuguo to unlock the parcel. Ali Mama switched his regimen to a state of life support for ten minutes. While he is still alive, he decided to use this technique to repair Nalanman's wounds. Ye Chiang asks Bai Zhishan if all the important people have been defeated. Bai says that the hidden roots will be hidden in the bodies of people who touch a special stone that can take their power whenever it wants. He was the only one in the cult who developed a spell that allowed him to control this stone. Now he is ready to eat it. He has been preparing this plan for a long time. Bai Zhishan takes away Ye Chiang's demon, the mouth of the abyss, and he becomes stronger. Li Yuguo and Nalanmen realize that everything is over, but they have sacrificed a lot. Suddenly, Bai Zhishan appears and tells Yui Guo that he has destroyed the Venerable and saved him from many problems. He thinks that Yui Guo is mocking him and looking down on him. But Bai will not be a loser for the rest of his life. He will destroy all his enemies. He has become stronger, and Yui Guo asks why he has the mouth of the abyss and Ye Chiang's energy now. Bai explains that he meant the eye of the lower world by power. He feels it, and now the whole world will belong to him. This toy is quite smart. It knows the secret of a special stone. He wants to play a game with it. Yu Guo recognizes the smile and tone of the young, venerable man. It's impossible he should have died. A long time had passed since he began to use the power of the sun god. Yu Guo doesn't like the fact that this boss has a third phase. By combining the power of two demons, Bai Zhishan invites them to feel his full strength. He strikes Li Yu Guo first and cuts him in half. Queen Nalanman is the next to do damage, with powerful energy destroying everything she touches. Li Yu Guo knows that this time he will not be able to recover as quickly. His demonic essence addresses him, offering him its power once again. Yu Guo asks if the demonic entity will take over his will again, along with his body. The entity says that without her, he will not be able to protect his girlfriend and the world. Yu Guo decides to handle everything himself. He doesn't like the demon's proposal. He asks Landman if she has strength, takes her hand and tries to lift her up. She asks me not to touch her. Her strength is leaving her body. Yu Guo appeals to the thousand-armed demon to release all his power. The thousand-armed demon wakes up and comes out, manifesting itself. The young, venerable man observes this transformation and rejoices in this new transformation. Queen Nalanman looks up to see what is happening and calls out to her beloved. Yu Guo turns into a demon who is ready to destroy his enemy. The young big man with a sly expression concentrates his strength and energy and is ready for battle. He says that he likes the Yui Guo horns on his head and wants to have the same ones. They start a battle over who will own the wreckage. The young gentleman thinks that such horns will look good on his head. The red demon points his sword at his opponent. He turned out to be very nimble, quickly changing his position. Yu Guo is annoyed by this technique. He can't concentrate and scatters his attention. The demon attacks the boy, but he slips away again. Then he suddenly appears behind him and shouts that he is here. Yu Guo feels clumsy next to such a nimble opponent. He is furious and wants to get rid of this boy as soon as possible. 
Finally, he manages to strike a respectable man, who fights him. The most respected man manages to intercept the next shot and asks him to be a little slower. In the process of fighting, the guy not only gains experience, but also gains more strength. The young venerable man says that he cannot take his opponent's horns, so he decides to end the game. He grabs Yu Guo by the horns and tries to rip his head off. Li Yu Guo loses his balance in pain and falls down, his demon weakening. His twin girls and wife are worried about him, and she will always be there for him no matter who he becomes. The young venerable man has finally managed to tear off the demon's horns, and he is holding them in his hands, with a red liquid running out of them. He is having fun and treats everything as a game and tries on horns to his head. Ye Chiang is watching the fight and he thinks that no matter what, Yui Guo will be crushed, he will remain a loser. A voice in his head asks if he really wants to do this. This scares Ye Chiang, and he asks who is talking to him. Suddenly he finds himself surrounded by all his previous images. They tell him that he should take the loss easier, that his old enemy is doing everything he can to save the world. The world can fall apart and he will remain a loser in it for the rest of his life. Ye Chiang covers his ears with his hands and starts crying. If Li loses now, this world will be destroyed. He cannot let Li Yuguo die now, but he wants to destroy his old rival in order to become the main character of this world. His mouth of the abyss is gone. His true blood is free again and can help him. Next to him, his old self, the fierce dragon wave monkey, whom he hasn't seen in a long time, appears. She suggests getting rid of enemies and showing the stupid, respectable man who the real hero of this world is. The young big honcho steps on Li Yuguo's head and tells him that he has lost. He asks him to relax because he wants to carefully tear off his head. Unexpectedly for Yui Guo, the essence of the fierce dragon wave monkey appears next to him. He is surprised that Ye Chiang decided to come to his aid. Ye Chiang says to shut up and watch. He is the protagonist of this world and will destroy Yui Guo after the venerable one. The young respectable man is not having fun because some guy is standing in his way again, and he is annoyed. Ye Chiang enters the battle with renewed vigor, so he easily strikes the young honorable man and suggests that he go to hell. A venerable man, endowed with the strength of two venerable men, copes with a fierce monkey. The boy shouts and dances in victory. He likes this toy. He says that the monkey ruined his clothes, and that's why he's very angry. In his rage, he hits the monkey on the head and strikes it hard all over the body. Li Yuguo looks up and asks if he is still alive. The demons did not expect him to regain consciousness after such a loss of strength, but it's over. No one can defeat the Honorable One. Li Yuguo stands up, a purple stone lying next to him, radiating energy. He feels a great power from this stone, which was accidentally dropped by a respectable man. Despite his numerous injuries, Ye Chiang continues to hold on and fight with vigor. Li Yuguo puts a crystal in his mouth. He wants to see what will happen next. The demon is against such an experiment. Ye Chiang is still fighting and shouting to the honorable man that he is the hero of this world. The young gentleman gets bored with the game, decides to end it, and strikes the final blow. He says that this annoying toy has finally broken down as well. The young venerable man is convinced that the battle is over, but he feels unusual energy fluctuations and is looking for their cause. He is attacked by Li Yu Guo, who should have already been in the other world. The boy feels his renewed strength and realizes that he has taken his crystal. The battle continues with the utmost ferocity, with Yui Guo having to save the world and the Honorable One having to pick up the pieces. The boy that Yui Guo dared to tarnish the power of his many-eyed mother. This made him very angry, and he lost control and threatened to completely destroy Yui Guo. They simultaneously apply the technique of the silent death ray, two identical energies converging in the middle. The Venerable One shouts that he has long planned to be the ruler of the world and has no intention of giving in. The next step is to use the sunless strike technique. This technique of sunless hitting scares the young Venerable Man. He says it's no fun to play this game. With the help of a sunless strike, Li Yuguo managed to defeat the young Venerable. There are many people sitting on the sunny lawn, and they can't understand what they are doing here and how they won. Sanchen and Yu Chung hug and ask each other if they are okay. The Empress of Medicine wakes up the King of Poisons and tells him it's time to wake up. Shifang Tuxing asks Ji Wushuang if he is okay. Through a slightly open eye, Li Yuguo sees his wife. She is glad that he has finally regained consciousness. He is surprised that he is still alive. He apologizes to her for making her worry. She asks him to stay still. He is seriously injured. She doesn't have to worry. He won't die. They have one more important thing to do. Nalanman says that he always likes to scare her. She doesn't know about any case. 
There are a lot of people on the lawn, treating their wounds and burying those who gave their lives. At Ye Chiang's tombstone, Yo Chung says that his death did not correct all his bad deeds. His departure can be considered a good thing. He had an ending worthy of the protagonist of the novel. Li Yugo and Landman come to a man who is a wreckage guard. They turn to him, he interrupts them, and says that the wreckage is now theirs. He gives them a fragment of a star. Its power is very strong. It can both create the world and destroy it. The guard asks how they are going to use this piece of the star. As long as the fragment remains in this world, it will be the cause of new wars and conflicts. It needs to seal itself and no longer be able to manifest itself. Lee's decision surprises and delights the guard who seals the fragment. He had guarded the shard for over a thousand years and had never met anyone who thought like Lee. The fragment will no longer cause wars and conflicts. It is sealed. Li Yuguo is glad that it's over, albeit at such a high cost. They leave the guards and walk away, and Yui Guo calls out to Sanqing. He turns around. All those who helped him are standing behind him, and it's time for them to go. Yu Guo looks at his wife, addresses her by name, and she asks what he wants. He hugs her and tells her it's time to go home. Suddenly, he started to feel dizzy, sick, and almost fainted. Yu Guo falls to the ground and everything happens in slow motion. He is very sick. He does not understand what is happening to him. As if in a fog, he sees his friends running to his aid. The story continues in the city of nine clouds in the land of the sages. Yu Guo wakes up, a book on his chest, and calls out to Nalanman. He sits up abruptly and accidentally hits his head on a man who was leaning over him. The man asks what he is doing. He is in great pain. He wants to know if Landman is the beauty from the book. Yu Guo confirms that this is the beauty who spent the night with him in the book. He knew it was very difficult to change the end of the book, but he thought it was possible. He is angry with GD, says he has had enough, and invites him to come down to Earth if he has the courage. Events are developing in the City of Nine Clouds, and the streets are quite lively. A teacher is telling his students an ancient legend. The legend tells of five guardian dragons that appear when danger arises. Sitting at one of the desks is Yuiguo. He is not listening to the lecture. He is very bored. His thoughts go back in time. He stands in front of a door, accompanied by two beasts. He is taken to Yan Wang, the King of Hell, and he does not understand what this means or why he is back in hell. The King of Hell congratulates him on successfully changing the ending of the book and sends him to another world to solve the crisis. Liu Man no longer wants to help the King of Hell and save other worlds, he wants to go back. Yan Wang reminds him that he does not belong to the world of Haotan. The King spent a lot of effort to allow him to travel to different worlds. This time, he will be reborn and live a life in a new world. This time, he will not have his memory erased, but will face more complex dangers. If he succeeds, Yan Wang will give him a special task that he has prepared for him. While under the influence of a good memory, Yui Guo hits the desk with his fist and curses. The teacher orders Yom to leave the classroom immediately for disrespecting him. Yui Guo gets up and leaves the school without objection or explanation. The teacher looks at him in confusion, not expecting the student to leave the class. Sixteen years ago, Yui Guo was born into a family of merchants, and he didn't have to worry about clothes and food. At first, he could not calmly recall how Haotani felt. He was very sorry that he could not return to Lanmen, Sanchen, and Wu Yu. Yu Guo decided that since he could not change reality, he would enjoy it. This time, no matter what crisis happens, he has no plans to do anything. The guy is lying on the grass under a tree, remembering his previous life, and hears someone calling him. He long approaches him, looking like Simon Lan. Yu Guo asks his friend what he's doing here. Lan could have left him here alone, and he suggests they go for a drink. The guys walk through the city in search of a tavern to sit and drink. Simon Lan is interested in when the next chapter of the Dokken Chronicles will be released. He wants to know if Sito Wushu will find a way out of the situation. Yu Guo reminds us that the book is updated every month. It's not time yet. In his chronicles, Daikin Yu Guo describes the events that happened to him in Haotan. The boys are met by a beautiful girl who is aggressive. The girl's name is Mu Wanner. They have upset her father again, and she wants to know what is wrong with them. Mu Wanner knew that they would go to the tavern, so she waited for them. It was time to teach them a lesson. The girl looks like Su Ning Yi, but Wano is more of a wild and straightforward character. Yu Guo, these two characters, give him comfort in this strange world. Yu Guo asks He Lun for permission to run away from the girl first. Mu Wanner is holding a whip and is ready to use it immediately. Long looks sadly after Yui Guo, knowing that he will be punished. Yu Guo runs away from the square and shouts to the two that he loves them. 
Vanier hits the boy with his whip at anything. He covers his head from the blows. Yuguo watches them and does not know if he will meet them again in this world. The story takes place in a rich mansion where the Lee family lives. Yuguo stretches. His wonderful day is over. Time to go back to his room to update his book. A guy who looks like a king of thieves tells him that the money for this month's book sales has arrived. The guy's name is Lee Jun. A few years ago, Yui Guo met him on the street, although he looks like his brother. But unfortunately, he doesn't remember him. His behavior is different from that of a king of thieves. Every time this guy laughs, he reminds Yui Guo of the king of thieves, and the servant reminds him that everyone is waiting for the book to be updated. Yu Guo's father gives him money every month. The servant asks him why he wants to write a book, and Li replies that it's his hobby. His father saw that the servant had given Yu Guo money for the books he had sold, and yelled at him for selling his books again. Li Jen is well off enough to support his son, and he says his books are terrible. The guy doesn't allow people to talk about his books like that. In his past life, Yu Guo respected Li Guanye very much, and in this life, he despises him. At the age of 12, the boy learned that his father was making money from human trafficking, and he did not want to use his money. This was the main reason he started writing and earning money, so that he would not be dependent on his father. His mother asks him not to speak to his father in such a tone. A servant approaches Yui Guo and asks him to come with him. Sher Shu asks the man why he is so cruel to his son and asks to talk to him. The father is convinced that his son is doing a great job on his own. Yu Guo regrets that he doesn't have a Lima here. He could write his book on the computer. He's sitting at the table in his room and hears some noise outside. He grabs a sword, goes outside, and jumps onto the roof of his house. He sees a girl being chased in the street, running away from several men who are shouting at her to stop. One of the pursuers uses a sound wave of space against the girl. This wave abruptly stops the girl. She feels a blow to the stomach. The persecutors say that she cannot hide from the Tong Ming Temple. And the girl replies that she does not know anything. They attacked the wrong person. Tumnin Temple is an organization that is connected to the royal family, and Yuguo is interested in what it does in a small place. He decides to return home and not take part in any conflicts. Despite the fact that it is night, the girl notices his movements on the roof of the house. She screams to him and asks him to save her, and the pursuers mistake him for an accomplice. Yuguo says it's a misunderstanding. He doesn't know this girl. He was just walking by. The persecutors decide that this guy might be a young master of a rich family, and they can take him to the temple and get a good ransom. He did not want to use martial arts against these men, but they left him no choice. He coolly and confidently destroys all the pursuers who attacked him. He has the aura of a martial arts emperor, but he shouldn't have attacked the people of the Tong Ming Temple. If he kills everyone, no one will know who did it. The girl asks if he will kill her too, and the guy says he wants to know what his wife looks like. He takes off her mask to reveal her face, and she doesn't object. Yu Guo is speechless when he sees a girl who looks very much like San Cheng. He emotionally hugs the girl and asks if she is San Chen. She is furious with him for this, calls him a pervert, and demands that he take his hands off her immediately. The girl kicks him in the groin and he writhes in pain. The fact that he saved her does not give him the right to treat her like that. The guy apologizes and explains that he has confused her with his friend, whom she looks very much like. The girl thanks Yui Guo for saving her, says goodbye to him, and wants to leave. She feels that the wounds inflicted by her attackers are still painful. Yu Guo sees her wounds and offers to go home with him to treat the wound, because if the temple's poison is not removed in time, her life may end. The girl wants to have a guarantee that he is not going to take advantage of her when she goes into the house with him. He jokes that she has already called him her husband and the girl explains that she had no choice and says that her name is Bai Guai. The guy tells her his name and says that she shouldn't worry because he is a gentleman. The girl thinks he doesn't look like a bad guy, and if he threatens her, she won't be able to resist him but decides to trust him. They come to Yui Guo's house, and he treats the wound, saying that it will hurt, but she must be patient. Bai Guai has torn clothes and many wounds, and he treats them with anti-venom liquid. Given his level of martial arts training, she can't believe he's only 17 years old. If he tells everyone about his power, the great powers of this world will follow him. The boy is really only 17 years old. His ideal is to have two parents, money in his hands, and to live in anticipation of death. This saint has the same levels of development as Hyotan. Here they are divided into the level of magic development and the level of martial arts development. 
The development of magic means the use of spells, and the development of martial arts means the use of martial arts. Due to the fact that he had a high level in his past life, in this one he reached the level of martial arts emperor at the age of 17. Despite the fact that the two worlds are interconnected, since the guy saved by Guai, she has to pay for his services with her body, and the girl replies that they can agree on the payment. Li Yuguo wonders why she was persecuted by the people of the Tuming Temple. The girl is looking for her twin sister, who robbed officials across the country to make a gift to the emperor's widow. The people of the Tongming Temple confused the girl with her elder sister and began to persecute her. The fact that the girl looks so much like San Chen cannot be just a coincidence. Perhaps they were simply reborn in this world. He offers her something to eat and asks her to tell him what kind of person her sister is. He and his sister were separated at a young age. They never saw each other. She is quite elusive and has a high zeal and destroyed a cult of 80 people herself. The guy summarizes that her sister is a demon who destroys without even thinking. He hears his father's voice. He is involved in business and politics, and he has some connection to the church. Yuguo decides to hide her new friend so that her father won't see her. His parents come into his room and ask if he is okay. The father heard strange noises nearby, maybe thieves. He asks if the boy heard anything. The girl says that she is cramped. The boy shows her that she has to be quiet. If her father finds out, it will be bad. Yuguo says he hasn't heard anything and wants to go to sleep. If his parents have no more questions, they can go. Under the table, the girl sees that the guy has an erection and his pants are bunched up. He blushed and tried his best to stay calm, but it was beyond his control. She asks him what the bindweed is doing in his pants and hits him in the groin. An awkward moment comes and the girl comes out of her hiding place and greets Yuguo's parents. The parents want to know who this girl is and how she got into their house. The guy says that this is Bai Guai. He met her today on the street. She looked unhappy. So he decided to take her as a maid. He wanted to tell his parents about it tomorrow. The girl explains that she is an orphan, that she has been walking around the city of nine clouds and asks to be taken in. The father laughs that his son picks up beggars. Yuguo tells his father that he sells people and the boy saves them, so he has the right to do what he wants. The man is angry at this answer. He does not find words to express his thoughts. He says that his adult son can do whatever he wants, and his wife notes that their son has grown up. Bai Guai hides behind Li Yuiguo's back. She was uncomfortable with the conversation with his father. The girl asks why the boy put the bunting in his pants. It scared her. Yuguo replies that he likes to eat it raw and fresh for dinner. He goes out of the room to let the pack out and returns. Fifteen minutes later, when the boy returned to the room, the girl asked if he had released the prisoner. She leans over to the boy and notices a strange odor coming from him. Yuguo suggests that they go to bed, and tomorrow morning, they will go to look for her sister. It's the middle of the night and Bai Guai might run into the Tongmen temple people again, so it's safer to stay. The guy allowed the girl to sleep on the bed, but he will sleep on the floor, Bai Guai asks why he is helping her. She thinks he's a good guy and jumped to premature conclusions. Yuguo is lying on the floor, doing what a husband should do for his wife. The girl gets angry with him, calls him a shyster, and swings to hit him. She wanted to step over the bed he had laid out on the floor, stumbled over it, and fell on him. She finds herself lying on top of him. The guy hugs her, and she feels his erection again. Bai Guai kicks the guy again in the groin and tells him not to touch her. One of the ministers reads a book that describes the situation of Sithu Utu as if the author was a participant in it. With the help of someone like this author, the minister would be successful. The minister sends his servant to find the person who wrote the book. In the City of Nine Clouds, there are signs with a photo of Bai Guai's sister. Yuguo doubts that the girls are sisters. They have very different personalities. Bai Guai replies that they are sisters. Her sister is very high level. On the way to school, they meet He Lun, who asks Yuguo if he is going to school. He Lun draws attention to Bai Huai. He asks who this girl is, and Yuguo worries that his friend will not recognize her. Lun says she's gorgeous. Yuguo has good taste in girls. They hear Mu Wanner's voice accusing Yuguo of flirting with other girls in broad daylight. The girl beats the boy. He tries to avoid her blows and covers himself. Long says that Yuguo can't fight back because he doesn't know martial arts, so he has to run away. Bai Guai notes that Yuguo is good at martial arts and can pretend well. Yuguo runs away from Mu Wanye, teasing her, telling her to try to hit him. Someone puts a foot down for Yuguo, but he doesn't notice it, stumbles and falls face first onto the asphalt. Lun helps his friend up and asks if he's okay. 
Fan Jian, the guy who tripped him, calls Yuiguo a little monkey from the trafficker's house. Friends stand up for Yuiguo. Fan Jian has no right to look down on other families if his family is stronger. The abuser asks if this young man from the Lifeng house, Hu Long, is now with Mu Wanner. The girl reminds him that he has an open case of harassment of a girl from a good family and she can arrest him now for disturbing public order. Fan Jian is disappointed that two grown men are hiding behind a girl's back. His biggest disappointment is Yui Guo, who constantly runs away as soon as he sees danger. Bai Guai wanted to object, but Yui Guo put his hand over her mouth. No one must know that he is a martial artist. Fan Jian asks why the girl is covering her face. She must be very scary. He rips the bandage off her face and is speechless at her beauty. The girl is very scared of his reaction to her appearance. Fan Jian says that he has fallen in love with this girl and asks Yui Guo to sell him her maid. Li Yu Guo asks Fan Jian if he really wants to buy his maid. He shows Fan Jian five fingers, saying that he wants this much for the maid. The girl went through many trials until she met him. She felt trust, and he turned out to be not what she expected. Fan Jian says that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yui Gu has started to trade people. He will buy this maid. Li Yu Guo says that these are five slaps and immediately proceeds to fulfill them. A fight breaks out between the boys and they mercilessly beat each other. Fan Jian is lying on the ground with a swollen face, his servants trying to help him up. Li Yu Guo does not sell people. Bai Guai started accusing him early on. They are running away from Fan Jiang's company, waiting for them to come up. Everyone stops and catches their breath, and Mu Wen'er asks if they manage to break away. Jian's family is very strong. He long did not expect Yui Guo to risk hitting. Obviously, the topic of selling people irritates him. Mu Wanner explains to Bai Guai that Yui Guo learned at the age of 12 that his father was a human trafficker, and he hasn't used any of his tales since. Fan Jian acted very despicably when he spoke about human trafficking. The friends go about their business and say goodbye. Bai Guai admits that she really thought she was going to be sold, and Li asks if she was satisfied with the price. He adds that he will not sell it, but rather protect it. They are walking down the street, and the girl says that her hair is very tousled. Yu Guo ducks into the subway. He notices a squad of police up ahead. The police ask them to stop and come closer so they can look at them. Yu Guo hugs the girl and tells her not to worry. He's there for her. The policeman compares the girl to the photo, saying that they look the same but have different auras. The police decide to take the couple in for questioning. Yu Guo tells the policeman that his maid is a person of crystal clear soul. She could have harmed them. He gives the police money and says they can talk about it. The police say that the 13th team is working on this case, and this girl does not look like that devil. Yu Guo overhears that they have gone to arrest someone who writes popular books. They get a reward when they arrest the author. A man with a hawk approaches the police and asks what they are doing here. The man's name is Fan Sha. He is the head of the Tongming Temple, and he is interested in books. The police say that there was a misunderstanding. They thought they had met Huai Guai, but they were mistaken. They need to go back and look at popular books to catch the author their boss wants to arrest. Bai Guai is very worried when she sees the police talking to the head of the temple. The head of the Fan Sha temple has a suspicious and unkind look. She is a girl who is worried about her sister. What if these people catch her? Yu Guo promises to help with the search. He will ask the brothers from the printing house to find information about his sister. When they find Setra Bai Guai, Yu Guo will be able to find out if the girls are reincarnated Yun sisters. Before visiting the printing house, Yu Guo wants to clean up the girl's appearance. They enter an underground printing house, where workers are sitting at tables wearing masks. Yu Guo reports that they are already there and lets Bai Guai put on the mask. The girl is annoyed by her new hairstyle and the way she looks. The printing house is owned by Li Yu Guo, and she didn't know that he could run such a place at such a young age. The guy asks Bai Guai if she is ready to be his, and she says that a couple of compliments don't change anything. The girl's attention is drawn to a book lying on the table, which has a beautiful binding. Yu Guo explains that this is a collector's edition that will be in limited quantities, and its price will be high. There are many customers who are ready to buy a collectible book and then make money on it. Li Yu Guo asks his servant Li Zhong to come to him. He gives him the task of finding the whereabouts of a girl named Hui Guai. Li Zhong informs his master that Mr. Li Jiang has arrived, and he asks him to take him to him. Zhang takes Yu Guo to the office where Mr. Zhang is sitting at his desk. He gets up from the table, bows in obeisance to Yu Guo, and says that he is glad to see the young master here. Yu Guo puts the box on the table and opens it, and the contents of the box make Zhang feel better. But Li Zhang came to the printing house not only to pay, 
Yui Guo could have paid sooner or later. He went to report that there's an official who wants to catch the author of the novel. People from the Tongming Temple have been sent to search for him, and Yu Guo should be careful. Yu Guo thanks Zhang for the warning. Since the temple people want to arrest him, he will have to hide for a while. He asks Zhang if he has heard anything from Hui Guai. This girl has committed several crimes and stolen the royal family's belongings. Yu Guo thinks this is good material for a book and asks him to let him know if he has any information. Li Zhang, who will be watching, takes the box with the money and leaves the printing house. Yu Guo decides to stop publishing the book, and Li Jun asks whether he should give up the business. Yu Guo is inspired and is thinking about writing a new book. Children are playing in the backyard of the school, and Yu Guo suggests that Bao Guai go to them. He is late for school and hopes that the teacher is in a good mood today. Yu Gu walks into the classroom, his classmates are sitting at their desks, and the teacher is not there. He Long says that representatives of the Fan family are talking to the teacher about the morning's incident. Long asks Yui Guo not to go out into the yard and create unnecessary problems for himself. Given the teacher's reputation in the school, Fan's family won't be too hard on him. In the schoolyard, Fan Jian demands that Yui Guo be brought to him. The teacher defends his student and says that Yui Guo does not provoke people who do not deserve it. Fan Jian has insulted his family and paid the price. Yu Guo goes out into the courtyard and tells us that Fan Jiag wanted to buy his maid by force. Bai Gua is a member of his family. No one dares to offend her. Bai Gua accidentally overheard their conversation, and she liked that the guy called her a member of his family. The teacher reminds him that next year he will be taking his exams in Beijing, so he doesn't need any unnecessary problems. For Fan Jian, it was news that Li Yu Guo was valued at school. Yu Guo appreciates the teacher's concern for him, but he went out to see the dog that came to bark. Fan Jian is offended by the comparison to a dog, and he is ready to destroy Yu Guo with a single glance. Such disrespect for his person makes him want to publicly humiliate Yu Guo. He offers him a bet. There will be a fair in a few days, and they can compete in the art of poetry, and the loser will never be able to take exams in Beijing. The teacher says that without passing the Beijing exams, it will be impossible to build a career, and the bet humiliates the school's students. Fan Jian thinks it's just a bet in which the academy can't lose, and if Li doesn't want to participate, he can just call John Daddy. Li Yuguo decides to participate in this competition and defend the school's honor. If Yuguo wins, Jian will give him their family's black steel armor. Fan Jiang refused to participate in the competition as soon as Li Yu Guo agreed. Fan Jian has changed his mind. He agrees to the bet. If he wins, he wants Yu 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 Guo to call him daddy. Li Yu Guo agrees to the terms of the bet, and he will do his best to win. Fan is also confident of his victory. He is boiling with rage and hatred for this guy. Gathering their support group, they walk away from the school, angry, with the teacher and students watching them. Lu Shang warns Li Yu Guo that if he loses, he will lose the opportunity to make a career, and he is happy to live in his town. Teacher Lu is one of the people who know that Yu Guo writes books and support him. Bai Guai is hungry during the day. She asks for food from the kitchen. She and Yu Guo go to the kitchen to eat. Li San Yuan, the house manager, asks Yu Guo to wait. He has a conversation. The bet made with Fan Jian is rash. His father expects him to get a good grade on the exam. The steward explains to the maid that she must not allow the young master to create problems. Her task is to stop him. Li Yuguo tells San Yuan not to worry. He has accepted this challenge and will definitely win. Yuguo and Guai go into the kitchen and find the pasta there, and they like it very much. They took their plates full and enjoyed eating after an eventful day. Li Yuguo sees that Bai Guai is eating slowly and says that if she is not going to eat, he will eat everything. The girl asks him what this bet means to him, and he replies that he has personal reasons and that he should wait a little longer and enjoy the result. Bai Guai eats the pasta with such an appetite, as if he had never tasted anything tastier. The bodies of the six spies are burned on the lawn. Li San Yun tells Li Zhen that he has checked everything. The Tong Ming Temple did not come for them. Zhen says that it is good that Yui Guo buried the bodies. One must be more restrained. The manager is concerned about Bai Guai's appearance in the house, but Jen emphasizes that Guo likes her. She is smart, and she will make a great wife in the future. Yui Guo is attentive to her. He did her hair, bought her new clothes. Yui Guo's level of martial arts emperor at his age is a real gift that no one should know about. Li Jen hopes that Guo will not expose himself during the poetry competition. Their main event is not yet ready. Jen orders the servant who burns the bodies to smear them into pieces and throw them into the lake to feed the fish. 
A few days after the dispute between Yui Guo and Fan Jian, a fair is held in the city. Fan Sha investigates a place on the ground that seems suspicious to him. He smells a faint odor and traces of earth being turned over, and he wonders why they bury the bodies and then take them out. The police assume that it was different people, or that whoever did it first left a lot of mistakes that needed to be corrected. Hui Guai suddenly appeared in the city and disappeared without warning. This small town has many secrets. The police decide to go to the fair, although it is not their business, but the spies of the Tongming Temple have been destroyed, and they cannot do nothing. Yu Guo and Bai came to the fair, and the girl says there are a lot of people here. A guy buys a girl sweets, candied hawthorn fruits on a stick. There are a lot of people at the fair, and Bai Guai might meet spies. She shouldn't have gone. The girl disagrees. She hopes to meet her sister at the fair. Li is in a romantic mood and shows how beautiful the full moon is, and the girl complains that she feels very bad on the full moon. The guy puts his hand to the girl's forehead, worries if she has a fever, and asks how she feels now. She replies that it's because she doesn't worry. She eats delicious hawthorn fruits, and she doesn't go anywhere, so she's not so bad. If she is hungry and wants to eat, Yui Guo is the one who will buy whatever she wants. The girl wants coconut cake. On one of the counters, he was interested in a beautiful piece of jewelry. He shows her a beautiful pin, and she asks if he wants to give it to the one he loves. A guy buys a pin and asks to try it on. A girl refuses to try on an item intended for someone else. Yu Guo asks her to close her eyes, and she warns him not to take advantage of this opportunity. He pins this hairpin on her hair, and the girl is surprised that this jewelry was meant for her. Yu Guo confirms that this jewelry was bought by him for her, and he gently hugs her. Li senses that danger is approaching, so he embraces the girl and hides her in his arms. Fan Sha and a few policemen pass by, but they don't pay any attention to the couple. The policemen walk past them, and Fan turns around and looks at them again. One of the policemen says it's just a couple of kids. Fan Sha says he's imagining things. As soon as the people from the Tumnin Temple pass them, Yu Guo protected Bai Guai from them. The guy takes her hand and they walk through the fair holding hands. The time for the poetry competition is approaching, and we can't be late. We have to hurry. The jury sits on a stage covered with a red cloth. Chairs for the participants stand on both sides, and many fans have gathered in front of the stage. One of the judges looks disdainfully at the audience and at his colleague on the panel. Yui Guo is waiting for his time to participate in the competition. He is worried, and Bai Guai supports him. The judge of the Feng Family Academy. Feng Qinggu says that no one can beat Fan Jian. Teacher Lu forbids him to disparage the rest of the contestants and devalue them. Fan Jian has not yet come. Feng Qinggu says that the Feng Family Academy is one of the best among the four academies in the City of Nine Clouds. He points to his elder brother Fan Jian, who is the leader of the Tongming Temple and came to cheer for his brother. It came as a surprise to Yui Guo that Fan Jian's older brother turned out to be the leader of the Tongling Temple. He long wants to take Mu Wanner's hand, but she asks him not to touch her. The girl is afraid that her father might notice. The boy says that no one will see it. They are just holding hands. Bai Guai noticed that this couple is not indifferent to each other. Yui Guo explains, Mu Wanner was reborn from a tigress. No one can restrain her except he. The girl feels sorry for Yui Guo. If there are three childhood friends and two of them get together, the third will remain lonely. Tears well up in her eyes, and Yui Guo strokes her nose playfully. He cannot be lonely because he has her. Suddenly, the girl starts crying, holding her chest and rubbing her eyes. Li Yu Guo holds her and asks her what's wrong, and she says that she has days of particular weakness once or twice a month. He gets worried and asks if he should send her home, and she says she's not that bad. He has to go on stage. She'll be waiting. Li Yu Guo asks his servant Li Zhong to take care of Bai Guo Yu. He has to go on stage. On the way to the stage, Yu Guo asks his friend when he will tell the old man about his business, who says it's not time yet. The host officially announces the opening of the poetry competition in the city of Nine Clouds. The first part of the competition will be devoted to oppositions. The first speaker is Fan Sha, who says that he knows a little bit about poetry and has come to make a fool of himself. He is one of the three best students at the Fan Family Academy and a pretty strong competitor. Yu Guo doesn't like his introduction. He long reminds him that Feng Jiang is the boss of his circle, and Yu Guo is the boss of theirs. The competitors stand on stage opposite each other, and the host announces the start of the competition. Fan recites the first pairs, which consist of sky versus earth, rain versus wind, mainland versus big sky, mountain flowers versus sea trees, 
red sun versus sky. The judge says that these are wonderful, neat, and elegant pairs, and he is suspicious that Fawn came and formed such difficult pairs, and he hopes that He Long will not disappoint him. He Long collects his thoughts and is also ready to voice his bets. He recites pairs of river versus man, green versus red, tall buildings in a cloud of smoke versus a snowy cave. He Lun's pair wins. The teacher is happy that his favorite student is very good in other parts of poetry, and their school has a chance to win. Fan says that he was lucky he won't be so lucky in the next round. Fan begins the next round with contrasts such as morning versus afternoon, summer versus winter, day versus evening, youth versus day. His friends support him, they say the couples are great and express their admiration for them. He long realizes that his opponent is very good. The sentences have become much more complex and it's time to tell him. Muwaner asks why he is silent and Yuguo replies that he long has time to think about the answer. Yuguo wonders why his friend is dragging his feet. There must be a good reason. An incense stick is lit on the table. It looks like someone wants to use airwaves to speed up the burning of incense sticks. The rivals stand opposite each other. He long continues to remain silent. He thinks he can't let his opponents win, so he has to get his act together. Suddenly, a stream of energy hits the table on which the incense stick is standing and reflects off it. This did not go unnoticed by Fanshaw, the head of the Tungling Temple who came to cheer for his brother. He instructs his assistant to find out who it was. He long closes his eyes, collects his thoughts, and is ready to continue the competition. He folds his hands in front of him, as if he has caught his muse. He begins to recite such pairs as spring against stone, trunk against branch, bamboo flute against silk string, gazebo in the mountains against gazebo on the shore. The judges consider these phrases to be the most beautiful of all. A teacher tells his colleague that his student is much better. The host announces the results of the first round, and he long wins, receiving a cinnamon cake as a reward. He long gets off the stage, walks up to Muwaner and smiles. She shows him the classroom. Yuguo says that he has become closer to his girlfriend and that it takes talent to form such couples quickly. Fan Jin asks to be allowed to go with Yuguo. He has a few personal grudges. The host says that warriors use swords to fight, while writers use words and the power of knowledge. It was Yuguo's turn, and his friends asked them not to disgrace the Mu Family Academy. He comes on stage and is ready. The host can give tasks, and the second round is the best of all three. The first task of the second round of the round is to voice six emotions, six desires. Jian has a wonderful poem for men and women, and he asks us to enjoy it. The host claps his hands and says that the boy can start. The speed with which Fan Jian prepared for the task raises suspicions of his dishonesty. He begins to say that he will leave the end of the sky today and wait for it tomorrow, and the woman falls like a flower on a tree with a single wave. His words are surprising to the host and others, and he does not believe what he is reciting. His teacher, Feng Ching, blushed and hid his eyes from his colleague. Fan continues his poem and says that he will leave today to look for him tomorrow. What a heartless person! Feng Qinggu says that this poem is terrible, although it is neat, and now it's Yui Guo's turn. Yu Guo thought for a minute and is ready to talk about the seven emotions and seven desires. He talks about three years of pain, five years of cold, seven years of pinching, and ten years of searching for insults on an abandoned hill where truth and lies lie. He continues that he dreams of returning to the place where he wakes up at midnight with a knife in an autumn garden, and nothing more only love aboard a dried-up boat. His poem was heard by all those present. It was beautiful and reminded someone of his love. The host says that it was great and asks where he got the inspiration for it, and the guy is inspired by a book. Li Yuguo won this round, and his next task will be to write a poem in honor of the Daikin Chronicles. Fan Jingbe talks about the rain and the pure light of Daikan, about the loneliness that torments the soul, about the beauty of a courtesan. His teacher did not expect such a disastrous performance from one of his best students. It was Lee's turn, and he said that in the novel it was Ji Gu who wanted revenge, so the poem would be about revenge. He talks about brothers who came together and relied on power and conspiracies, and now the tigers are lying on the slopes and are being tormented for it. They lost their real power before the war. They cannot stay in the mud. Their generation will take revenge and the city will be tarnished. The audience says that this guy is very talented, and one woman was reminded of her brother by this poem. The host concludes that the poem contains hatred and reluctance, as if the author's own experience, which is very insightful. 
He announces Yui Guo as the winner of the second round and presents him with a gift. Fan Zhang was not prepared for such a crushing defeat, and Yui Guo asks if Fan can afford to lose like this. Fan Zan was red with anger and hatred. He planned to win easily and humiliate Yui Guo. Li Yu Guo looks anxiously into the crowd, unable to find Bai Guai. He sees that his servant Li Zhen, who was supposed to take care of Bai, is lying under the tree. He is red in the face with despair and powerlessness, trying to maintain his outward calm. Yu Guo addresses the audience, apologizes, and says that he has an urgent matter. He quickly runs off the stage, shouting after him that the competition is not over yet. Jian yells at him to come back. They are not finished yet. His teacher says that only losers leave the competition inside. Yuguo sits down next to Li Zhong and asks him to wake up. He found no traces of a struggle, so the level of the enemy was quite high. Yui Guo makes his servant friend more comfortable under the tree and leaves him to rest. He runs through the night city in search of Bai Guai to help her. There is a full red moon in the sky. It looks ominous. Li wonders how, in such a small town, where few people have reached spirit-level martial arts, someone could steal a bai. He feels that he is on the right track, that the girl is somewhere nearby. Yuguo finds a clearing. In the middle of it is a girl, surrounded by police officers who say they have been looking for her for a long time. They ask if the spies from the Tongming Temple who mysteriously disappeared are on her conscience. Men do not expect that such a fragile girl can master martial arts and are scattered by her blows. She asks if they are sure they can destroy it. Hui Guai looks similar to Bai, but has a different character. Apparently, they are sisters. Perhaps she is a reincarnated Sanchen. Fan Sha says to the girl that she is mistaken if she thinks that they went unprepared. They brought with them a special soul destroyer formation that covered the clearing with green light. This formation, when used, muffles the life force. The girl asks if that's all they can do, and Fan Sha doesn't like the tone of her conversation. Hui demonstrates his martial art again throwing healthy men across the lawn. In a strange way, Fan Sha's neck is entangled in a thorny green vine which causes him pain. Fan Sha puts a few fingers in his mouth and whistles, as if he's making a secret sign for someone. At his whistle, a creature appears in the sky, but it does not frighten the girl. Fan Sha asks him to let him go, to give him the gift, and not to kill him or add to his sins. If the girl destroys Fan Sha, his disappearance will be discovered and more people will come for her and Yu Guo must stop her. He looks at the tree, and suddenly an idea comes to him how he can stop this fight. A voice comes from the top of the tree, asking who dared to interrupt his meditation. Using the aura of the tributary, Li managed to make his voice sound older. He hopes he managed to fool them. Hui Guai senses the level of a martial arts emperor next to the tree and wonders who it is. Fan Jian also senses the aura of a martial arts emperor and wonders what this person is doing in such a small town. He bows down respectfully in front of the tree and explains that they are from the Tongming Temple and have come to arrest this girl for stealing a gift. They didn't want to disturb anyone. Hui Guai says that this gift is the sweat and tears of people who are robbed by officials. She returned the money to the people to whom it belonged and considers it right. The voice from the tree says that he doesn't care, but if she annoys him, she will pay, and he says that he will use her for alchemy. The voice asks him to leave words of curse for the alchemical furnace. Yuguo switches to voice transmission through waves. He asks them to pretend to be dead for the sake of the Sistra, since the temple will haunt them for the rest of their lives. The voice says that his sister is his maid. The girl believes him. She pretends to be wounded by a tree god, imitates stomach pains, and falls down. Hui Guai is lying on the ground and looks lifeless. Fan Sha does not believe that you can use the air to destroy an enemy. At the level of a martial arts emperor, you obviously can. He leaves the girl lying on the lawn and hurriedly leaves with the falcon. The crown of the tree turns red, and Fan wonders why the omnipotent guru would go to the city of nine clouds. He guesses who this almighty can be by imagining one image. He asks to use the girl to make pills out of her and to give him one finger as proof. The voice from the tree says that the body must remain intact if they do not want to become pills as well. Li Yuguo sends lightning to the ground from a tree and frightens the soldiers. Fan Sha says that he understands everything, and the voice orders him to get out and not to be seen again. The head of the temple asks whether the Almighty is the ancestor of Mount Yin, which ruled the world hundreds of years ago. Yuguo does not know who the ancestor of Mount Yin is, and replies that if he knows a lot, he will soon become a landlord. Fan Sha is not happy with this answer. He is disappointed but cannot influence it. He orders everyone to leave the clearing immediately. 
and the men run away as fast as they can. Fan suspects that this is the mountain's ancestor, who escaped from the siege hundreds of years ago and should return immediately to report on it. Lee comes down from the tree and approaches the girl, telling her to get up because the enemies are gone, and she forbids him to come closer. He asks not to be afraid. He is not the ancestor of the Burning Yin. The girl does not seem to remember him, and the reincarnation was just his fantasy. Hui demands to know immediately how he met her sister and how she became his maid. It's starting to dawn, the sun is rising, and Lee says it's a long story. The girl realizes that she acted impulsively and brought trouble on her sister, while the boy says that there is nothing wrong with her actions. The girl thanks him, and Li Yuguo turns his head to her and hopes she recognizes him. Hui Guai asks why he is so kind to her sister if she is not his wife. Yuguo says that she is his wife, but the girl does not believe it and wants to know when her sister became his wife. He says she was his wife at first sight. Bai is fine. She's in the eastern part of the forest, and the guy invites Hui to stay with them. The girl leaves and asks me to tell her not to look for her sister, but that she will always be there for her, and that Li has something to say. Hui replies that he will say that next time and reminds him to take care of his sister. The girl instantly disappears, as if dissolving into thin air before the guy can say anything to her. He holds up a leaf from a tree and says that he too misses Sanchen. Finally, he finds Bayu Guai, who seems to have slept all night. He tries to wake her up and she opens her eye and sees Li Yuguo. He asks her why she left him. It broke his heart. She hugs him and tells him that she is still alive. She does not believe in the honesty of his words and bites him on the shoulder. He says it hurts, but he perceives this bite as a seal of her love. The girl does not know how she ended up in the forest. The boy saw that she was missing, ran to look for her, found her sister, and apparently her sister brought her here. Bai Guai realizes that he refused to participate in the competition for her sake, and now he won't be able to take the exam, and he says that he now has a wife. The girl looks at him sternly and asks whom he called his wife. All of Bai's clothes are damaged and need to be replaced, but she has no clothes. Li has brought everything here. He gives the girl things and turns away. Bai asks why he carries women's clothes with him. Maybe it's his hobby. Li jokes that he took her measurement on purpose to make clothes for her. She sleeps like a dead pig at night, so he didn't just take a measurement. He says her fried pies are too small to eat. She is choking with rage and has no words to express her anger. She starts beating him. He says he was joking, just recycling her old clothes. Bai is offended that her pies are small. She thinks they are not small at all. He asks if she will allow him to try her on. Bai orders her to run away and close her eyes, and she changes her clothes. The girl hides behind a tree and twirls her finger at her temple, indicating that Li Yuguo is not in her right mind. The guy wants his heavenly eye to be with him so he can see her little pies. The girl says that she is already dressed. Li returns, and he is delighted with her beauty. The new clothes favorably emphasize her pretty figure and make her a real beauty. Yuguo compliments her and says she looks beautiful. Suddenly, Bai feels sick. She says she slept for a long time and her legs are numb. The guy takes her in his arms and tells her it's late and it's time to go back. He sees nothing wrong with her holding the essay. She is his maid and he has to look after her. They enter the empty city of the Nine Clouds and walk to their home. Yuguo said he saw her sister, and she wanted to know where she was now. Her sister told her that she didn't want Bai to look for her, that she would always be there for her. They are standing outside the house. The moon is shining in the sky. The girl is missing her sister. Li Yuguo does not know when she will see San Cheng again. Li Yuguo feels the energy fluctuations and notices that someone is in a hurry. It's his servant Li Zhong who runs to meet them and is glad they've returned. He kneels down, says he couldn't protect Bai and asks to be punished. Li picks him up. When Yui Guo withdrew from the poetry competition, it meant a loss, but the dean came out and declared Yui Guo the winner. The guy walks into the room where his family is sitting, says hello, and says that he is already home. His mother asks why he is so late and asks him to say hello to all the guests. The dean of the city of Nine Clouds Academy says the young man is very talented. He hands Li Yuguo a gift, a box containing his winnings. The guy eagerly opens the box. He was expecting a gift. The box contained the armor he won in this competition. The dean is convinced that Yui Guo has a talent for writing poetry, and Li Jen says that his son likes to play with ink and brush. The boy thanks the dean for his victory saying that poetry competitions are judged on talent and asking why he left the stage so early. His maid fainted and he rushed to take her to the doctor. The dean is admired for his worthy deed. He is admirable.
The man says it's late, he has to go, and his father walks him to the door and asks him to be careful. The Nine Clouds Academy is the largest academy in the city, and the parents did not expect the dean himself to come to congratulate them. The boy has earned some fame for his father, and his mother asks him to take his father into account. Bai Guai comes to them and says that the water for bathing is ready. Shu asks him not to cause any problems and reminds him that Bai should take care of his body. The guy is sitting in the bathtub and says that the water is not just right, thanking his wife for that. She pours hot water on his foot and burns his foot. The girl asks him not to talk nonsense. She is not his wife. Bai Guai says that she smelled a strange odor next to those men and doesn't understand why some men smell like they are wearing makeup. Yugu also noticed the feminine smell from Dean Yin, and Sister Bai smells good too. This time, the girl pours cold water on his head. Yuguo says that her and her sister's names are quite strange. The girl is worried that her sister is in the same city but hasn't come to see her. Gur reassures her that her sister must have had a reason. She was secretly protecting her and that she might be watching her from the window. Bai approaches the window and sees a female figure running away from being seen. She tells her boyfriend about it and he thinks she probably imagined it. Shu Xu sits on the ground outside the house and catches her breath. She almost got caught. She hears everything that happens in her son's room. He says that bathing is over. It's time to do something else. There's a new armor on the table, and Yuiguo tells the girl that he wants to give her his treasure, but the girl thinks it is too big. His mother hears Guer asking Bai to come closer and see if he thinks her son is a scoundrel. Bai Guai cannot accept such a gift, and Li offers to be the first to accept it, or he will get rid of it. The mother's imagination paints terrible pictures of how this will be the end of their family. She hears that her sister agrees and says what she wants. The girl's voice says that he is so strong. The guy explains that it has to be strong and Bai agrees to try it. Delighted moans and screams come from the window to the mother. The mother says that her son is very impatient, like his father was in his youth, and she did not expect to be able to hold her grandchildren. Bai Guai closed her eyes in pleasure and moans. Lee asks if she is comfortable, and she says that he is warm and nice. To get a better feel for everything, he suggests changing his pose, but Bai Girl doesn't know how to change her position. Yuguo tells her to put her left foot forward a little and asks how she feels. Her foot steps on the puddle left after the bath. She loses her balance and falls on top of Yuiguo. He can't hold on. The boy ends up on the floor and the girl on top of him. The girl complains of pain. Gur denies it. He is on the bottom, so it is worse for him. Bai Guai is to blame for the fact that they fell because he wanted to change his pose. The guy asks if the girl is hungry and he makes her something to eat. My mother runs away from the window. She thinks that the young people are having a strange time and she should leave so as not to disturb them. They felt that there was someone outside the window, or they thought there was. Lee says he gave her the armor to protect her when he was away. The girl is sitting on top of the guy. She feels his arousal. She asks him why he hid the wine in his pants again. He still hasn't gotten over his habit of eating live bunting. One of the ten commanders of the Tongming Temple asks his subordinates if they have found it yet. Fan Sha reports that his subordinates are not attending to their duties well, and that the author of the book has not been located, but Hui Guai has been found. He says that she died at the hands of a descendant of Mount Yun, and that her body was taken for alchemy. All emperor-level martial arts masters are listed in the temple's records. Only a descendant of Mount Yin was seen here. The commander of the temple says to put aside the author of the book for now and search for the location of the descendant of Mount Yin. Mu Wanner enters the school and says that teacher Mu is late so she will watch the class. The students have to obey her, otherwise she threatens to use the whip if they don't. Yu Guo is reading the story of the Nine Clouds. He has nothing to do, so he reads to pass the time. More than a hundred years ago, there was one killer in the city of Nine Clouds. He killed everyone from a rich lady to a poor man, and the city suffered from his crimes. The king ordered an investigation, but the messengers never returned. In the end, ten temple commanders forced the king to go up the mountain himself, and he was seriously injured. He hid on Mount Yin, and there was no more information about him. Then he was called the ancestor of Mount Yin. Yu Guo asks He Lun and Mu Wanner if they have heard anything about it. He had an idea to go up the mountain and learn more about his ancestor. He could use it to his advantage and take the treasures. A teacher comes into the classroom and says that the mountain is a forbidden place. There are many monsters there. Yugo plans to go to the lake, which is located next to the mountain, and the teacher suggests that the whole class go to the lake, which is very beautiful. 
The students support his idea and seem to be planning a good time. He long Mu Wanner exchanges glances, a picnic awaits them ahead. On a beautiful summer day, residents of the city park walk by the lake. Yu Guo runs away from Bai Guai, he wants her to catch up with him. The girl's foot steps on something hard, she feels a crunch and stops. The guy thinks she's playing a trick on him, that she wants to catch him, grab him and kiss him hard. Bai Guai found the remains of a man under her feet and she stepped on a skeleton. He Long and Mu Wanner come running to hear her scream, asking if Yui Guo has offended the girl. The boy and the girl come closer, now they can see the terrible discovery. He Long has a hysterical reaction to what he sees, screaming in horror. He falls to the ground, vomits, and He Long brings him to life. Yu Guo asks his friend to take care of himself and his life, because after the wedding his life will be very difficult. Vanier has experience in many cases. She says it's a skeleton of a person with a pretty good level. The legend says that the higher the level, the more golden threads in the bones, and this skeleton has many golden threads. Vanier has to report this discovery. There shouldn't be any skeletons. Yu Guo asks not to worry and asks how long ago the person died. The girl says that these bones are decades old. They may be related to the ancestor of Mount Yin. The place is located near a mountain. Perhaps the masters here surrounded and suppressed the ancestor of Mount Yin. A case has already been opened on this episode. You don't have to report it. You can go around and look for clues. Bai and Li are walking through the forest. Li tells us that the bones have traces of natural fractures. They fell from a height and were washed away by water. Mount Yin is the closest to the lake. Yu Guo did not tell Mu Wanner about this so that no one would suspect that they were heading toward the mountain. They are walking along a narrow path, and suddenly a snake falls on them from a tree. Yu Guo has time to react, cuts it in half and throws it away. There are a lot of poisonous insects and snakes here. This place is dangerous. Bai is a little scared. The guy hugs her and tells her not to worry. Her husband will protect her. Bai's sister was on this mountain. It was too dangerous there, and Bai Guai did not follow her. Now she can look for her sister's trail. The ancestor of Mount Yin was here a hundred years ago, and the girl doubts that they will find anything. Yu Guo says that you can't really find anything by conventional means. Bai Guai has a good level of magic refinement. She is sensitive to spiritual energy. He lets her feel the energy of the bone and asks if there is a similar aura nearby. The girl doesn't like that he treats her like a little dog. She closes her eyes and focuses on her feelings of the energies. The spiritual aura they need is some distance ahead, and the boy runs into the depths of the forest. Bai Guan tries to catch up with him. She runs after him and asks him to wait for her. 